Section 33 of Annual Reports to the Massachusetts Board of Education by Horace Mann. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Seventh Annual Report, 1843, Part 9. Whatever may be the especial object of the American citizen in going abroad, still, if his mind is imbued with the true spirit of the institutions of his own country, he cannot fail, in traveling through the different nations of Europe, to find material for the most profound and solemn reflection. There is no earthly subject in its own nature of higher intrinsic dignity and interest than a contemplation of the different forms into which humanity has been shaped by different institutions. This interest deepens when we compare our own condition with the contemporaneous condition of other families of mankind. Tracing back, by the light of history and philosophy, these respective conditions to their causes in some period of antiquity more or less remote, we behold the headsprings of those influences which have given such diversity to the character and fortunes of different portions of the race. We are enabled not only to see the grand results which have been wrought out by certain agencies acting through long periods of time, but we are brought into immediate contact, and we commune, as it were, face to face, with those great principles which bear the future destinies of mankind in their bosom. Whatever now is, whether of weal or of woe, is the effect of causes that have pre-existed, in like manner, what is to be, whether of glory or debasement, will result from the causes put in operation by ourselves and others. The past is a unit, fixed, irrevocable, about which there is no longer either option or alternative. But the future presents itself to us as an infinite of possibilities. For the great purposes of duty and happiness— Tomorrow is in the control of the weakest of men. But yesterday is beyond the dominion of the mightiest prince or potentate. It is no longer changeable by human or divine power. The future, then, is our field of action. The past is only valuable as furnishing lights by which that field can be more successfully entered and cultivated. For this purpose we study the history of the particular parts of our globe— of particular portions of our race, of Europe, for instance, for the last thousand or two thousand years. We learn what manner of men have borne sway, we discern the motives by which they have been actuated, we study the laws they have made and the institutions they have established for shaping and molding their unformed future. We go to Europe, or by other means we examine and investigate the present social, intellectual, and moral condition of its people, and here we have the product, the grand result, of men, motives, laws, institutions, all gathered and concentrated into one point which we can now see, just as we see the fabric which comes from a piece of complicated machinery when the last revolution of the last wheel rolls it into our hands for inspection. And what is this result? In a world which God has created on such principles of wisdom and benevolence that nothing is wanting, save a knowledge of his commands and an obedience to them, to make every human being supremely happy, what amount of that knowledge is possessed, what degree of that happiness is enjoyed? It is no adequate representation of the fact to say that not anything like one half of the adult population of Europe— can read and write in any intelligible manner, and hence are shut out from a knowledge of all history, sacred and profane, and of all contemporary events, that not one-third are comfortably housed or fed or clothed, according to the very lowest standard of comfort amongst the laboring classes in this country, that not one individual in five hundred has any voice in the enactment of the laws that bind him, or in the choice of the rulers who dispose of his property, liberty, and life, and that, excepting in a few narrow and inconsiderable spots, the inalienable right of freedom in religion and liberty to worship God according to the dictates of conscience 
is not recognized or known, nay, that the claim of any such liberty is denounced and spurned at, and its advocates punished, not only by a denial of the right itself, but by the deprivation of all human rights whatever. All these facts, deeply as they affect human happiness, greatly as they derogate from human dignity, present no living picture of Europe as it now exists. All this is negation only. It leaves wholly untouched the side of positive, boundless suffering and wrong. In the Europe of the nineteenth century, the incomputable wealth that flows from the bounty of heaven during the revolving seasons of the year, and is elaborated from the earth by the ceaseless toil of millions of men, that wealth which is wrought out by human labor and ingenuity, in conjunction with the great agencies of nature, fire, water, wind, and steam, and whose aggregates are amply sufficient to give comfort and competence to every human being, and the joys of home and the sacred influences of the domestic circle to every family, that wealth, by force of unjust laws and institutions, is filched from the producer and gathered into vast masses to give power and luxury and aggrandizement to a few. Of production there is no end. Of distribution there is no beginning. Nine hundred and ninety-nine children of the same common father suffer from destitution so that the thousandth may revel in superfluities. A thousand cottages shrink into meanness and want to swell the dimensions of a single palace. The tables of a thousand families of the industrious poor waste away into drought and barrenness that one board may be laden with surfeit. And yet the great truth has scarcely dawned upon the mind of a theorist or speculator that the political application of doing as we would be done by is to give every man entire equality before the law, and then to leave his fortunes and his success to depend upon his own exertions. That there must be governors or rulers when there are communities of men is so self-evident a truth that it is denied only by the insane. Yet under this pretext a few individuals or families have usurped and maintained dominion over almost two hundred millions of men. That a nation must possess the means of defending itself against aggressors or submit to be vanquished, despoiled, and enslaved has been equally obvious. Yet under the pretense of doing this, naval and military armaments are kept up at incalculable expense, and men are converted into the soulless machinery of war far more to uphold thrones and to subjugate all independence of thought and action at home than to repel assaults from abroad. Religion is the first necessity of the soul, but because every human being, though he were heir to all the glories and profusions of the universe, must still be a wanderer and an outcast until he can find a supreme father and God in whom to confide, because of this instructive outreaching of the soul towards some almighty power, crafty and cruel men have come in and have set up idols and false gods for its worship, and then, claiming to be the favorites and ministers of omnipotence, have dispensed the awful retributions of eternity against any questioners of their authority, and brandished every weapon in the armory of heaven, not merely for the slightest offenses against themselves, but for the noblest deeds of duty towards God and of benevolence towards men. Hence, throughout wide regions of country, man is no longer man. Formed in the image of his Maker, the last vestiges of that image are nearly obliterated. He no longer breathes that breath of independent and conscious life that first animated his frame and made him a living soul. The heavenly spark of intelligence is trodden out from his bosom. In some countries which I have visited, there are whole classes of men and women whose organization is changing whose whole form, features, countenance, and expression are so debased and brutified by want and fear and ignorance and superstition that the naturalist would almost doubt where among living races of animals to class them. 
under governments where superstition and ignorance have borne most away, the altered aspect of humanity is assimilating to that of the brute. But where resistless power has been trampling for centuries upon a sterner nature and a stronger will, the likeness of the once human face is approximating to that of a fiend. In certain districts of large cities, those of London, Manchester, Glasgow, for instance, such are the influences that surround children from the day they are brought into the world, and such the fatal education of circumstances and example to which they are subjected, that we may say they are born in order to be imprisoned, transported, or hung, with as exact and literal truth as we can say that corn is grown to be eaten. Not in a single generation could either the cruelties of the oppressor or the sufferings of his victim have effected these physical and mental transformations. It has taken ages and centuries of wrongs to bend the body into abjectness, to dwarf the stature, to extinguish the light of the eye, and to incorporate into body and soul the air and movements of a slave. And the weight and fullness of the curse is this— that it will require more ages and centuries to efface these brands of degradation, to re-edify the frame, to rekindle in the eye the quenched beam of intelligence, to restore height and amplitude to the shrunken brow, and to reduce the overgrown propensities of the animal nature within a manageable compass. Not only is a new spirit to be created, but a new physical apparatus through which it can work. This is the worst, the scorpion sting in the lash of despotism. There is a moral and a physical entailment as well as a civil. Posterity is cursed in the debasement inflicted upon its ancestors. In many parts of Europe, the laws, both of the material and of the moral nature, have been so long outraged that neither the third nor the fourth generation will outlive the iniquities done to their fathers. Again, the population of a country may be so divided into the extremes of high and low, and each of these extremes may have diverged so widely from a medium or standard of nature, that there are none or but a very small intermediate body or middle class of men left in the nation. The high, from luxury and its enervations, will have but small families, and will be able to rear but few of the children that are born to them. The intermediate class, whom affluence has not corrupted, nor ignorance blinded to the perception of consequences, will be too few in number, and too cautious about contracting those matrimonial alliances which they cannot reputably and comfortably sustain, to contribute largely to the continuation of the species. But the low, the abandoned, the heedless, those whom no foresight or apprehension of consequences can restrain— these, obedient to appetite and passion, will be the fathers and mothers of the next generation. And no truth can be more certain than this, that after the poor, the ignorant, and the vicious have fallen below a certain point of degradation, they become an increasing fund of pauperism and vice, a pauper engendering hive, a vital, self-enlarging, reproductive mass of ignorance and crime." And thus, from parent to child, the race may go on degenerating in body and soul, and casting off one after another the lineaments and properties of humanity, until the human fades away and is lost in the brutal or the demoniac nature. While the vicious have pecuniary means, they have a choice of vices in which they can indulge. But though stripped of means to the last farthing, their ability to be vicious and all the fatal consequences to society of that viciousness still remain. Nay, it is then that their vices become most virulent and fatal. However houseless or homeless, however diseased or beggarly a wretch who is governed only by his instincts may be, marriage is still open to him— or, so far as the condition and character of the next generation are concerned, the same consequences may happen without marriage. This also the statesman and the moralist should heed, that however adverse to the welfare of human society may be the circumstances under which a foredoomed class of children are born, 
yet the doctrine of the sanctity of human life protects their existence. Public hospitals and private charities must step in and rescue them from the hand of death. Hence they swarm into life by myriads, and crowd upwards into the ranks of society. But in society there are no vacant places to receive them, nor unclaimed bread for their sustenance. Though uninstructed in the arts of industry, though untaught in the restraints and obligations of duty, still the great primal law of self-preservation works in their blood just as vigorously as in the blood of kings— it urges them on to procure the means of gratification. But having no resources, in labor or in frugality, they betake themselves to fraud, violence, incendiarism, and the destruction of human life, as naturally as an honest man engages in honest employment. Such, literally, is the present condition of large portions of the human race in some countries of Europe. In wide rural districts, in moral jungles hidden from public view within the recesses of great cities, those who are next to be born and to come upon the stage of action will come fifty to one from the lowest orders of the people, lowest in intellect and morals and in the qualities of prudence, foresight, judgment, temperance, lowest in health and vigor, and in all the elements of a good mental and physical organization— strong only in the fierce strength of animal nature, and in the absence of all reason and conscience to restrain its ferocity. Of such stock and lineage must the next generation be. In the meantime, while these calamities are developing and maturing, a few individuals, some of whom have a deep stake in society, others moved by nobler considerations of benevolence or religion, are striving to discover and devise the means for warding off these impending dangers. Some look for relief in a change of the administration and in the change of policy that it will ensure. With others, compulsory emigration is the remedy, a remedy by which a portion of the household is to be expelled from the paternal mansion by the terrors of starvation— there are still others who think that the redundant population should be reduced to existing by means of subsistence, and they hint darkly at pestilence and famine as the agents for sweeping away the surplus poor, just as famishing sailors upon a wreck hint darkly at the casting of lots. Smaller in numbers than any of the preceding is that class who see and know that while the prolific causes of these evils are suffered to exist— all the above schemes, though executed to their fullest extent, can only be palliatives of the pain and not remedies for the disease, who see and know how fallacious and nugatory all such measures must be towards the recreation of national character, towards the laying anew of the social foundations of strength and purity. They see and know that no external appliances can restore soundness to a fabric where the dry rot of corruption has penetrated to the innermost fibers of its structure. The only remedy, this side of miracles, which presents itself to the clear vision of this class, is in a laborious process of renovation, in a thorough physical, mental, spiritual culture of the rising generation, reaching to its depths, extending to its circumference, sustained by the power and resources of the government, and carried forward irrespective of party and of denomination. But a combination of vested interests has hitherto cut off this resource, and hence they stand, appalled and aghast, like one who finds too late that he is in the path of a descending avalanche. Under circumstances so adverse to the well-being of large portions of the race, the best that even hope dares to whisper— is that, in the course of long periods yet to come, the degraded progeny of a degraded parentage may at length be reclaimed, may be uplifted to the level whence their fearful descent began. But if this restoration is ever effected, it can only be by such almost superhuman exertions as will overcome the momentum they have acquired in the fall, and by vast expenditures and sacrifices corresponding to the derelictions of former times. It was from a condition of society like this, 
or from one where principles and agencies were at work tending to produce a condition of society like this, that our ancestors fled. They came here as to a newly formed world. In many respects, the colonization of New England was like a new creation of the race. History cannot deny that the founders of that colony had faults. Indeed, the almost incredible fact that as soon as they escaped from persecution, they became persecutors themselves, that while the wounds were still unhealed which the iron fetters of oppression had made in their souls, they began to forge fetters for the souls of others. This fact would seem mysterious and inexplicable, did we not see in it so vivid an illustration of the established order of nature and providence, signalizing to the world the power of a vicious education over even virtuous men, exemplifying the effect of tyrannical institutions on human character, by an instance so conspicuous and flagrant that it should be remembered to the end of time, and should forever supersede the necessity of another warning. But on the other hand, history must concede to the founders of this colony the possession of exalted, far-shining, immortal virtues. Not the least among the blessings which they brought were health and a robustness of constitution that no luxury had ever enervated or vicious indulgences ever corrupted. In all that company there was not a drop of blood which had been tainted by vice, nor an act of life that had been stained by crime. Arriving here at a period when winter had converted the land into one broad desert, the inclemency of the season and the extremity of their toil swept away all the less healthful and vigorous, and left not man or woman save those whose hardy and powerful frames, the perils of the ocean and the wintry rigors of the clime, and the privations of a houseless and provisionless coast, had assailed in vain. In physical energy and hardihood, such were the progenitors of New England. It was said above that this settlement of our country resembled in some respects the creation anew of the race. But had Adam and Eve been created under circumstances so adverse to life, we cannot suppose they would have survived the day on which they were animated. Yet these men and women were the first parents, the Adam and Eve, of our republic. Mighty as were their bodies, their spirits were mightier still. Some of the former did yield to privation and peril and disease, but in that whole company not a heart ever relented. Staunch, undaunted, invincible, they held fast to what they believed to be the dictates of conscience and the oracles of God, and in the great moral epic which celebrates the story of their trials and triumphs, the word apostate is nowhere written. This transference of the fortunes of our race from the old to the new world was a gain to humanity of at least a thousand years. I mean, if all the great and good men of Europe, from the 22nd of December, 1620, had united their energies to ameliorate the condition of the human family, and had encountered no hostility, either from civil or religious despotism, it would have taken ten centuries to bring the institutions and population of Europe to the point where the great experiment of improving the condition of the race by means of intellectual, moral, and religious culture could be as favorably commenced as it was commenced on the day when the pilgrims first set foot upon the rock of Plymouth. What mighty obstructions and hindrances to human progress did they leave behind them? What dynasties of powerful men, and the more firmly seated dynasties of false opinions? But in the world to which they came, there were no classes upheld by law in feudal privilege and prerogative. There were no laws of hereditary descent, upholding one class in opulence and power, irrespective of merit or vigor, and degrading other classes to perpetual indigence and servility, without demerit or imbecility. Here was no cramped territory whose resources were insufficient to furnish a healthful competence to all, nor any crowded population struggling so earnestly to supply their cravings for daily necessities 
that all the nobler wants of the soul were silenced by the clamor of the appetites. No predatory barons had conquered the whole land and monopolized it, and by a course of legislation as iniquitous as the original robbery itself, had predestined its descent in the line of their particular families through all coming time, so that not one in the hundreds of all who should be born into the state could own a rood of ground which he might till for subsistence while living, or beneath which he could have a right of burial when dead. Our pilgrim fathers also possessed intelligence, not merely common learning and information on common affairs, but most of them were men of accomplished education, conversant with the world's history, profoundly thoughtful, and as well qualified as any equally numerous community that had ever existed to discuss the deepest questions of state or church, of time or eternity. Hence we are not the descendants of an ignorant horde or pauper colony, driven out from the parent country in quest of food, and leaving all metropolitan art, intelligence, and refinement behind them. Besides, almost coeval with the settlement of the colony, they founded a college, and established common schools. In the first clearings of the forest, by the side of the first dwellings which they erected for a shelter, they built the schoolhouse, and of the produce of the first crops planted for their precarious subsistence, they apportioned a share for the maintenance of teachers and professors. This they did, that the altar lights of knowledge and piety which they had here kindled might never go out. This they did, hoping that each generation would feed the flame to illumine the path of its successors, a flame which should not be suffered to expire, but should shine on forever to enlighten and gladden every soul that should here be called into existence. I repeat that the transference of the fortunes of the race to the new world under such auspices were a gain to humanity of at least a thousand years. By that removal we were at once placed at a distance of three thousand miles from any spot where the Inquisition had ever tortured or the faggot of persecution had ever blazed. By that removal the chains of feudalism were shaken off. The false principle of artificial orders of castes in society were annulled. The monopolies of chartered companies and guilds were abolished. Proscriptions by men who knew but one thing, of all knowledge they did not themselves possess, no longer bound the free soul in its quest of truth. Rapacious hordes of vicious and impoverished classes no longer prowled through society, plundering its wealth and jeopardizing the life of its members. There were no besotted races occupying the vanishing point of humanity to be reclaimed. A free, unbounded career for the development of the faculties and the pursuit of knowledge and happiness was open for all. Ample and open as was the territory around them, their spiritual domain was more ample and open still. On the earth there was no arbitrary power to forbid the establishment of righteous and humane institutions and laws, and as they looked upward the air was not filled with demon shapes of superstition and fear interdicting their access to heaven. Opportunity was given to discard whatever old errors should remain, and to adopt whatever new truths either the course of nature or the providence of God might reveal. Whatever of degeneracy was to come upon themselves or their descendants in later times was to come not from hereditary transmission, not from nature or necessity, but from the culpable dereliction or allowance of themselves or their posterity. Surely never were the circumstances of a nation's birth so propitious to all that is pure in motive and great in achievement and redundant in the means of universal happiness." Never before was a land so consecrated to knowledge and virtue. Never were children and children's children so dedicated to God and to humanity, as when in those forest solitudes, that temple of the wide earth and the overarching heavens, girt round with the terrors of ocean and wilderness, afar from the pomp of cathedral and court, in the presence only of the conscious spirits of the creatures who made and of the Creator who accepted their vows. We, their descendants, were devoted to the cause of human freedom, 
to duty, to justice, to charity, to intelligence, to religion, by these holy men. It is in no boastful or vainglorious spirit that I refer to this heroic period of our country's history. It is in no invidious mood that I contrast the leading features of our civil polity and our social condition with those of the transatlantic nations of Christendom. Rather, I must confess that the contemplation of these historic events brings more humiliation than pride. It demands of us whether we have retained our vantage ground of a thousand years. It forces upon our conscience the solemn question of whether we have been faithful to duty. Stewards of a more precious treasure than was ever before committed to mortal hands, are we prepared to exhibit our lives and our history as a record of our stewardship? On the contrary, do we not rather cling to the trust and vaunt the confidence wherewith we have been honored, without inquiring whether the value of the deposit is not daily diminishing in our hands? Subtract the superiority, which under our more propitious circumstances we ought to possess, and how much will remain as the element of pride? It is not enough for us to say that we are exempt from the wretchedness of the masses and from the corruptions of the courts in other lands. With our institutions and resources, these should have been incommunicable evils, evils which it would have been alike unmeritorious to avoid and unpardonable to permit. It is no justification for us to adduce the vast, the unexampled increase of our population— the question is not how many millions we have, but what are their character, conduct, and attributes. We can claim neither reward nor approval for the exuberance of our natural resources or the magnificence of our civil power. The true inquiry is in what manner that power has been used, how have those resources been expended. They were convertible into universal elevation and happiness— have they been so converted? Neither a righteous posterity nor a righteous heaven will adjudicate upon our innocence or guilt on the same principles or according to the same standards as those by which other nations shall be judged. A necessity for defense convicts us of delinquency, for had our deeds corresponded with our privileges, had duty equaled our opportunity, we should have stood as a shining mark and exemplar before the world— visible as an inscription written in stars upon the blue arch of the firmament. The question is not whether we have ruled others, but whether we have ruled ourselves. The accusations which we must answer before the impartial tribunals of earth and heaven are such as these. Have we, by self-denial, by abstinence from pernicious luxuries, by beneficent labor, by obedience to the physical and organic laws of our nature— retained that measure of health and longevity to which, but for our own acts of disinherison, we had been rightful heirs. Where temptations are few, vice should be so rare as to become monstrous. Where art and nature lavish their wealth, a pauper should be a prodigy. But have we prevented the growth of vice and pauperism amongst us by seeking out every abandoned child within our borders, as the good shepherd seeks after the lambs lost from his flock, and by training all to habits of industry, frugality, temperance, and exemplary life? Have we remembered that if every citizen has a right to vote when he becomes a man, then the right of every child to that degree of knowledge which shall qualify him to vote is a thousand times as strong? Have the more fortunate classes amongst us the men of greater wealth, of superior knowledge, of more commanding influence, have they periodically arrested their own onward march of improvement, and sounded the trumpet, and sent back guides and succors to bring up the rear of society? Have we insulated ourselves, as by a wall of fire, from the corruptions and follies engendered in European courts, and practiced only by those who abhor the name of republic, have we caused the light of our institutions so to shine before the world that the advocates of liberty in all parts of the earth can boldly point to our frame of government as the model of those which are yet to bless mankind? Can we answer these questions 
as the myriad sufferers under oppression in other lands would have us answer them. If not, then we have not done to others as we would that others, were circumstances reversed, should do unto us. In the mines of Siberia, at Olmutz, at Spielberg, in all the dungeons of the old world, where the strong champions of freedom are now pining in captivity beneath the remorseless power of the tyrant, the morning sun does not send a glimmering ray into their cells, nor does night draw a thicker veil of darkness between them and the world, but that the lone prisoner lifts his iron-laden arms to heaven in a prayer that we, the depositories of freedom and of human hopes, may be faithful to our sacred trust, while, on the other hand, the pensioned advocates of despotism stand with listening ear to catch the first sound of lawless violence that is wafted from our shores, to note the first breach of faith or act of perfidy amongst us, and to convert these into arguments against liberty and the rights of man. There is not a shout sent up by an insane mob on this side of the Atlantic, but is echoed by a thousand presses and ten thousand tongues along every mountain and valley on the other. There is not a conflagration kindled here by the ruthless hand of violence, but its flame glares over all Europe from horizon to zenith. On each occurrence of a flagitious scene, whether it be an act of turbulence and devastation, or a deed of perfidy, or a breach of faith, monarchs point them out as fruits of the growth and omens of the fate of republics, and claim for themselves and their heirs a further extension on the lease of despotism. The experience of the ages that are past, the hopes of the ages that are yet to come, unite their voices in an appeal to us. They implore us to think more of the character of our people than of its numbers, to look upon our vast natural resources not as temptations to ostentation and pride, but as means to be converted by the refining alchemy of education into mental and spiritual treasures. They supplicate us to seek for whatever complacency or self-satisfaction we are disposed to indulge, not in the extent of our territory or in the products of our soil, but in the expansion and perpetuation of the means of human happiness— they beseech us to exchange the luxuries of sense for the joys of charity, and thus to give to the world the example of a nation whose wisdom increases with its prosperity, and whose virtues are equal to its power. For these ends they enjoin upon us a more earnest, a more universal, a more religious devotion of our exertions and resources to the culture of the youthful mind and heart of the nation— their gathered voices assert the universal truth that in a republic ignorance is a crime, and that private immorality is not less an opprobrium to the state than it is guilt in the perpetrator. In conclusion, the board will allow me to express my gratitude for the opportunity they have afforded me of investigating that class of institutions in other countries to whose prosperity in our own I feel so deep an attachment. I need not ask a body of gentlemen from whom I have uniformly experienced such candor and kindness to distinguish in this report between those sentiments and views which I have advanced as my own and those of other persons which I have recorded as subjects of interesting or useful information. I am aware that it may be said that six months are too short a period to authorize anyone to visit countries so numerous and so remote and to speak of institutions so difficult to be understood. But to this it may be answered that I was not wholly unprepared for the investigation beforehand, and that the time, though short at best, was prolonged by diligence. The better to accomplish my purpose, many of the great thoroughfares and most of the attractive objects which the throng of travellers in pursuit of mere personal gratification commonly selects were left. Always heedful of my mission, I kept my mind in perpetual contact with the great interests of mankind, and after seeing those institutions in other countries out of which human character arises, as vegetation rises out of the soil, I have come back to my native state more ardently attached to her institutions than ever before, 
and animated with a more fervent and undying desire to see her noble capabilities of usefulness and of happiness developed and cultivated. To be able to return to my post of labor at the appointed time, I have permitted no pain or peril to retard my progress, and if the observations which I have made and recorded shall produce those impressions of obligation to our country and our kind upon other minds which they have made upon my own, the remembrance alike of the pain and the peril will be sweet. End of Section 33《Section 34 of Annual Reports to the Massachusetts Board of Education by Horace Mann. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ninth Annual Report, 1845, Part 1. Gentlemen, the extraordinary facts exhibited in my last report, respecting the manner of apportioning school money among the districts, have turned public attention to that important subject. Footnote. The details of this unequal distribution have not been republished here, as they are not of present interest. End note. Those facts have already induced some towns to make very material modifications in the manner of distributing their money, and they promise to do the same thing in many more. The great doctrine which it is desirable to maintain and to carry out in reference to this subject is equality of school privilege for all children of the town, whether they belong to a poor district or a rich one, a small district or a large one. A general interest has been awakened in some towns upon which a deep sleep had fallen before. During no year since my original appointment have my advice and assistance been so frequently requested, respecting the best methods of arranging and improving our school system, nor is the movement confined to our own commonwealth. Several states in the South and West seem to be awakening from their lethargy and inquiring into the detail of means necessary to be adopted for the general education of their people. Within the space of a single month during the last autumn, I received inquiries from a dozen distinguished men belonging to a single state respecting the organic structure of our system its general administration, and its internal arrangements and management. In the meantime, the great state of New York, by means of her county superintendents, her state normal school, and otherwise, is carrying forward the work of popular education more rapidly than any other state in the Union, or any country in the world. Within the last year, the state of Rhode Island has entirely renovated her school system, under the auspices of that distinguished and able friend of the common schools, Henry Barnard, Esquire, she is preparing to take her place among the foremost of the states. Within the last few weeks, also, the state of Vermont has reorganized her school system by passing a law which provides for the appointment of town, county, and state superintendents, prescribing the course of duty of each class of officers in regard to the examination of teachers, the visitation of schools, and the general administration of the system. These indubitable evidences of progress are not only a reward for past exertions, but an incentive to future efforts. But let not complacency in successes already obtained tempt to the relaxation of a single fiber in our endeavors for future advancement— what has been gained must be converted into means for future acquisition. The faithful steward being entrusted with five talents, therewith gets other five talents. Our common schools are a system of unsurpassable grandeur and efficiency. Their influences reach with more or less directness and intensity all the children belonging to the state, children who are soon to be the state. They act upon these children at the most impressionable period of their existence, imparting qualities of mind and heart which will be magnified by diffusion and deepened by time, until they will be evolved into national character, into weal or woe, into renown or ignominy, and at last will stamp their ineffaceable seal upon our history. The natural philosopher looks at the silky envelopment which an insect has woven for itself, he marks its structure, he recognizes the laws of life which are silently at work within it, 
and he knows that in a few days or weeks that covering will burst, and from it will be evolved a thing of beauty and vivacity, lovely in the eyes of all, or an agent of destruction, fit to be a minister in executing God's vengeance against an offending people. With a profounder insight into the laws of development and growth, and with an eye that embraces an ampler field of time in its vision, the philosopher of humanity looks at the institutions which are molding the youthful capacities of a nation. He calculates their energy and direction, and he is then able to foresee and to foretell that if its course be not changed, the coming generation will be blessed with the rewards of parental forecast or afflicted with the retributions of parental neglect. Happy are they who, knowing on what conditions God has made the welfare of nations to depend, observe and perform them with fidelity. Improvements in schoolhouse architecture, including in that phrase all comfortable and ample accommodations for the schools, is only an improvement in the perishing body in which they dwell. A more perfect organization of the schools themselves, by a wisely graduated classification of schools and scholars, and by the assignment of such territorial limits as will best combine the individual convenience with associated strength, is only an endowment of that perishing body with a superior mechanism of organs and limbs. The more bounteous pecuniary liberality with which our schools from year to year are maintained is only an addition to the nutriment by which the same body is fed, giving enlargement and energy to its capabilities, whether of good or of evil, and empowering it to move onward more swiftly in its course, whether that course is leading to prosperity or to ruin. The great, the all-important, the only important question that remains, by what spirit are our schools animated? Do they cultivate the higher faculties in the nature of childhood, its conscience, its benevolence, a reverence for whatever is true and sacred, or are they only developing upon a grander scale the lower instincts and selfish tendencies of the race, the desires which prompt men to seek and the powers which enable them to secure sensual ends, wealth, luxury, preferment, irrespective of the well-being of others? Knowing, as we do, that the foundations of national greatness can be laid only in the industry, the integrity, and the spiritual elevation of the people, are we equally sure that our schools are forming the character of the rising generation upon the everlasting principles of duty and humanity? Or, on the other hand, are they only stimulating the powers which lead to a base pride of intellect, which prompt to the ostentation instead of the reality of virtue, and which give augury that life is to be spent only in selfish competition between those who should be brethren. Above all others must the children of a republic be fitted for society as well as for themselves. As each citizen is to participate in the power of governing others, it is an essential preliminary that he should be imbued with a feeling for the wants and a sense of the rights of those whom he is to govern, because the power of governing others, if guided by no higher motive than our own gratification, is the distinctive attribute of oppression, an attribute whose nature and whose wickedness are the same, whether exercised by one who calls himself a Republican or by one born an irresponsible despot. In a government like ours, each individual must think of the welfare of the state as well as the welfare of his own family, and, therefore, of the children of others as well as his own. It becomes, then, a momentous question whether the children in our schools are educated in reference to themselves and their private interests only, or with a regard to the great social duties and prerogatives that await them in after life. Are they so educated that when they grow up they will make better philanthropists and Christians, or only grander savages? For however loftily the intellect of man may have been gifted, however skillfully it may have been trained, if it be not guided by a sense of justice, a love of mankind, and a devotion to duty, its possessor is only a more splendid, as he is a more dangerous, barbarian." We have had admirable essays and lectures on the subject of morality in our schools. In perusing the reports of school committees from year to year, 
nothing has given me so much pleasure as the prominence which they have assigned to the subject of moral education, and the sincerity, the earnestness, and the persistence with which they have vindicated its claims to be regarded as an indispensable part of all common school instruction. Considered as general speculation, nothing could be better. And yet no one will deny that the want of a corresponding action on this subject still beclouds the prospects of the schools, and oft-times causes us to tremble for the fate of those who are passing through them. Practically, the duty of cultivating the moral nature of childhood has been neglected, and is still neglected. Profound ethical treatises are written for the guidance of men, after the habits and passions of ninety-nine in every hundred of those men have become too deep-rooted and inveterate to be removed by secondary causes. Volumes are published on the nicest questions of causistry, questions which probably will never arise in the experience of more than one in a thousand of the community, while specific directions and practical aids in regard to the training of children in those everyday domestic and social duties on which their own welfare and the happiness of society depend are comparatively unknown. How shall this great desideratum be supplied? How shall the rising generation be brought under purer moral influences by way of guarantee and suretyship, that when they become men they will surpass their predecessors, both in the soundness of their speculations and in the rectitude of their practice. Were children born with perfect natures, we might expect that they would gradually purify themselves from the vices and corruptions which are now almost enforced upon them by the example of the world. But the same nature by which the parents sunk into error and sin pre-adapts the children to follow in the course of ancestral degeneracy, Still, are there not moral means for the renovation of mankind which have never yet been applied? Are there not resources whose vastness and richness have not yet been explored? Of all neglected and forgotten duties in all ages of the world, the spiritual culture of children has been the most neglected and forgotten. In all things else, art and science have triumphed. In all things else, principles have been investigated and instruments devised and constructed to apply those principles in practice. The tree has been taken by the germ and its growth fashioned to the wants or the tastes of man. By the skill of the cultivator, the wild grain and the wild fruit have been taken in the seed and have had their dwarfishness expanded into luxuriance and their bitter and sometimes poisonous qualities ameliorated into richness of flavor and nutrition. The wild animal, and even the beast of prey, if domesticated when young, and from the lair, have been tamed and trained to the service of man. The wild horse and the buffalo changed into the most valuable of domestic animals, and the prowling wolf into the faithful dog. But man has not yet applied his highest wisdom and care to the young of his own species. They have been comparatively neglected, until their passions had taken deep root." and their ductile feelings had hardened into the iron inflexibility of habit, and then how often have the mightiest agencies of human power and terror been expended upon them in vain. Governments do not see the future criminal or pauper in the neglected child, and therefore they sit calmly by until roused from their stupor by the cry of hunger or the spectacle of crime. Then they erect the almshouse, the prison, and the gibbet, to arrest or mitigate the evils which timely caution might have prevented. The courts and the ministers of justice sit by, until the petty delinquencies of youth glare out in the enormities of adult crime, and then they doom to the prison or the gallows those enemies to society, who, under wise and well-applied influence, might have been supports and ornaments of the social fabric." For sixteen centuries the anointed ministers of the gospel of Christ were generally regardless of the condition of youth, and the same remark holds true in regard to the last two centuries, with the exception of three or four only of all the Christian nations, and by far the greater part even of these must be accepted from the exception. The messengers of him who took little children in his arms and blessed them have suffered juvenile waywardness or perversity to mature into adult incorrigibleness and impenitency, and then they have invoked the aid of heaven 
to subdue that ferociousness of the passions which even a worldly foresight would have checked. How often has heaven turned a deaf ear to their prayers, as if to rebuke the neglect and blindness which gave occasion for them? Who will deny that if one tithe of the talent and culture which have been expended in legislative halls in defining offenses and in devising and denouncing punishments for them, or of the study and knowledge which have been spent in judicial courts in trying and sentencing criminals, or of the eloquence and the piety which have preached repentance and the remission of sins to adult men and women, had been consecrated to the instruction and training of the young, the civilization of mankind would have been adorned by virtues and charities and Christian graces to which it is now a stranger." What an appalling fact it is to every contemplative mind that even wars and famines and pestilences, terrible calamities as they are acknowledged to be, have been welcomed as blessings and mercies because they swept away by thousands and tens of thousands the pests which ignorance and guilt had accumulated. But the efficiency or sufficiency of these comprehensive remedies is daily diminishing, a large class of men seem to have lost that moral sense by which the liberty and life of innocent men are regarded as of more value than the liberty and life of criminals. There is not a government in Christendom which is not growing weaker every day so far as its strength lies in an appeal to physical force. The criminal code of most nations is daily shorn of some of its terrors. Where, as with us, the concurrence of so many minds is a prerequisite, the conviction of the guilty is often a matter of difficulty, and every guilty man who escapes is a missionary going through society and preaching the immunity of guilt wherever he goes. War will never again be waged to disburden the crowded prisons or to relieve the weary executioner. The arts of civilization have so multiplied the harvests of the earth that a general famine will not again lend its aid to free the community of its surplus members— Society at large has emerged from that barbarian and semi-barbarian state, where pestilence formerly had its birth and committed its ravages. These great outlets and sluiceways, which in former times relieved nations of the dregs and refuse of their population, being now closed, whatever want or crime we engender or suffer to exist, we must live with. If improvidence begets hunger, that hunger will break into our garners. If animal instincts are suffered to grow into licentious passions, those passions will find their way into our most secret chambers. We have no armed guard which can save our warehouses, our marketplaces, and our depositories of silver and gold from spoliation by the hands of a mob. When the perjured witness or the forsworn juryman invades the temple of justice, the evil becomes too subtle for the police to seize— it is beyond legislative or judicial or executive power to redeem the sanctuaries of religion from hypocrisy and uncharitableness. In a word, the freedom of our institutions gives full play to all the passions of the human heart. The objects which excite and inflame those passions abound. And, as a fact, nearly or quite universally, there is intelligence sufficient to point out some sure way, lawful or unlawful, by which those passions can be gratified. Whatever children, then, we suffer to grow up amongst us must live with us as men, and our children must be their contemporaries. They are to be our co-partners in the relations of life, our equals at the polls, our rulers in legislative halls, the awarders of justice in our courts. However intolerable at home, they cannot be banished to any foreign land— However worthless, they will not be sent to die in camps or to be slain in battle. However flagitious, but few of them will be sequestered from society by imprisonment or doomed to expiate their offenses with their lives. In the history of the world, that period which opened with the War of the American Revolution and with the adoption of the Constitution of the United States, forms a new era. Those events, it is true, did not change human nature— but they placed human nature in circumstances so different from any it had ever before occupied that we must expect a new series of developments in human character and conduct. Theoretically, and to a great extent practically, 
the nation passed at once from being governed by others to self-government. Hereditary misrule was abolished, but power and opportunity for personal misrule were given in its stead. In the hour of exultation at the achievement of liberty, it was not considered that the evils of license may be more formidable than the evils of oppression, because a man may sink himself to a profounder depth of degradation than it is in the power of any other mortal to sink him, and because the slave of the vilest tyrant is less debased than the thrall of his own passions. Restraints of physical force were cast off, but no adequate measures were taken to supply their place with the restraints of moral force. In the absence of the latter, the former, degrading as they are, are still desirable, as a straitjacket for the maniac is better than the liberty by which he would inflict wounds or death upon himself. The question now arises, and it is a question on whose decision the worth or worthlessness of our free institutions is suspended, whether some more powerful agency cannot be put in requisition to impart a higher moral tone to the public mind, to enthrone the great ideas of justice, truth, benevolence, and reverence in the breasts of the people, and give them a more authoritative sway over conduct than they have ever yet possessed. Of course, so great an object can be reached only by gradual approaches. Revolutions which change only the surface of society can be effected in a day. But revolutions working down among the primordial elements of human character— taking away ascendancy from faculties which have long had control over the conduct of men, and transferring it to faculties which have long been in subjection, such revolutions cannot be accomplished by one convulsive effort, though every fiber in the nation should be strained to the endeavor. Time is an essential element in their consummation, nor can they be effected without an extensive apparatus of means efficiently worked. Yet such revolutions have taken place, as when nations emerged from the barbarian into the classic and chivalrous and romantic ages, or when they passed from these into the commercial and philosophic periods. By a brief retrospect of the condition of the more civilized nations of ancient and modern times, it can be easily shown that such a change has already taken place on the subject of education itself. It is the mission of our age— to carry this cause one step further onward in the progress of its development. Among the ancients, physical education was deemed of paramount importance. A preparation of the masses for war was the grand, almost exclusive object of national concern. War being carried on and battles decided, mainly by muscular strength and agility, by the distance and accuracy with which the javelin could be hurled, or the vigor and dexterity with which the falchion could be wielded, the desire of physical celerity and force predominated among men. It was not the cultivation of the great heart of the nation, it was not even the development of the intellect of the masses, but it was the invigoration of the frame, the growth and the strengthening of the limbs, that constituted the object of national policy and ambition." Bodily hardihood, the power of physical endurance, the ability to make long marches unfatigued, and to fight hand to hand for the longest period unterrified, these were the qualities which won the spoils and the plaudits of victory, and kindled to enthusiasm the aspirations of the emulous youth. Who can fail to see that the tendency of all this was not only to weaken the intellectual nature and to narrow its range of action, but to degrade and demoralize the spiritual affections. The man was sacrificed to the animal, his soul was deemed of less value than his sinews. As the nobler qualities of his nature sunk to the level of brute force, it happened, naturally, that the horse became as valuable as his rider, and the elephant that went out to battle was of more consequence than the dozen warriors whom he bore in the tower upon his back. During the Middle Ages, and until the introduction of firearms, which to a very great extent neutralized the inequalities of physical strength, the great barbarian idea that the body of man is the only part of him worth cultivating retained unquestioned ascendancy in regard to the masses of the people. The soul was not consciously excluded from culture, 
for it was not sufficiently thought of as an object of culture to raise the question. Even down to the present century, the rulers and aristocracy of England have always encouraged athletic sports among the people, wrestling, running, leaping, boxing, as a part of the national policy, because, as it was said, these exercises tended to invigorate the breed, and thus to make better soldiers and sailors. The very language which was used, betraying the sentiment that it was the animal and not the spiritual part of man which was the object of national concern. Not even in our own times, nor in our own country, have philosophy and Christianity dispelled this fatal idea, an idea which is proper to the savage and the heathen only, and which we have inherited from them. In all the nations of Europe, the regulations of military schools, in regard to training the body for vigor and robustness, and the capability of endurance, are entirely different from those of the classical, medical, legal, or theological schools, and in the military academy of our own government at West Point, the cadets are inured to exposure and their bodies hardened by camp duty, while in our colleges and higher schools there are no regulations which have the health of the student for their object. On the contrary, so far as the body is concerned, the latter classes of institutions provide for all the natural tendencies to ease and inactivity as carefully as though paleness and languor muscular enervation and debility were held to be constituents in national beauty. The introduction of the Baconian philosophy wrought a great revolution in the education of mankind. Since that epoch, the cultivation of the intellect has received more general attention than ever before, and just in proportion as the intellect has been developed, it has seen more clearly and appreciated more fully the advantages of its own development. In Prussia and a few of the smaller states of continental Europe, the action of the intellect, for reasons too obvious to be mentioned, has taken more of a speculative turn. In Great Britain it has been turned more towards practical or utilitarian objects, and in the United States it has been preeminently so turned. The immense natural resources of our country would have stimulated to activity a less enterprising and less energetic race than the Anglo-Saxon, but such glittering prizes, placed within reach of every fervid nature and such capacious desire, turned every man into a competitor and an aspirant. The exuberance that overspread the almost interminable valleys of the West drew forth hosts of colonists to gather their varied harvests. The tide of emigration rolled on, and it still continues to roll, with a volume and a celerity never before known in any part of the world or in any period of history. Unlike all other nations, we have no fixed but a rapidly advancing frontier. The geographical information of yesterday has become obsolete today. The outposts of civilization have moved forward with such gigantic strides that their marches are reckoned not by leagues but by degrees of longitude, and cities containing thirty or fifty thousand souls have sprung up before the relics of the primeval forests had decayed on the soil they had so lately shaded. In the space of half a century, vast wildernesses have been organized into territories, and these territories erected into states, to take their place in the great family of the Confederacy, and to be heard by their representatives in the council halls of the nation. But scarcely had the immigrant and the adventurer surveyed the richness of vegetation which covered the surface of the earth, before they discovered an equal vastness of mineral wealth beneath it wealth which had been laid up of old in subterranean chambers, no man yet knows how capacious. Thus every man, however poor his parentage, became the heir apparent of a rich inheritance. And while millions were thus appropriating fortunes to themselves out of the great treasure-house of the West, other millions on the Atlantic seaboard, with equal enterprise and equal avidity, were amassing the means of refinement and luxury, in one section, where nature had adapted the soil to the production of new and valuable staples, the planter seized the opportunity, literally a golden one, and soon filled the markets of the world with some of the cheapest and most indispensable necessities of life. In another section, foreign commerce invited attention, and the hardy and fearless inhabitants went forth to the uttermost parts of the earth in quest of gain. 
They drew wealth from the bosom of every ocean that spans the globe. They visited every country and searched out every port on its circumference where wind and water could carry them, and brought home for sustenance or for superfluity the natural and artificial productions of every people and of every zone. Meantime, science and invention applied themselves to the mechanic arts. They found that nature in all her recesses had hidden stores of power, surpassing the accumulated strength of the whole human race, though all its vigor could be concentrated in a single arm. They found that whoever would rightly apply to nature by a performance of the true scientific and mechanical conditions for the privilege of using her agencies should forthwith be invested with a power such as no Babylonian or Egyptian king with all his myriads of slaves could ever command. With the aid of a little hand machinery at the beginning, water and steam have been taught to construct machines, and out of their matchless perfection, when guided by a few intelligent minds, have come the endless variety, the prodigality, and the cheapness of modern manufactures. In the northern states, too, one universal habit of personal industry, not confined to the middle-aged and vigorous alone, but enlisting the services of all, the old, the young, the decrepit, the bedridden, each according to his strength, has never ceased to coin labor into gold, and from the confluence of these numberless streams, though individually small, the great ocean of common comfort and competence has been unfailingly replenished. Gathered together from these numerous and prolific sources, individual opulence has increased, and the sum total or valuation of the nation's capital has doubled and redoubled with a rapidity to which the history of every other nation that has ever existed must acknowledge itself to be a stranger. This easy accumulation of wealth has inflamed the laudable desire of competence into a culpable ambition for superfluous riches, to convert natural resources into the means of voluptuous enjoyments, to turn mineral wealth into metallic currency, to invent more productive machinery, to open new channels of intercommunication between the states, and to lengthen the prodigious inventory of capital invested in commerce, has spurred the energies and quickened the talent of a people, every one of whom is at liberty to choose his own employment, and to change it when chosen for any other that promises to be more lucrative. Nor is this the only side on which hope has been stimulated and ambition aroused. Others of the most craving instincts of human nature have been called into fervid activity. Political ambition, the love of power, whether it consists in the base passion of exercising authority over the will of others, or in the more expansive and generous desire of occupying a conspicuous place among our fellows by their consent. These motives have acted upon a strong natural instinct in the hearts of all. The chief magistrate and legislators of the nation, the chief magistrate and legislators of the states, the numerous county, town, parochial, and district officers, are with but few exceptions elective, and therefore the possession of all such offices implies the confidence and regard of a great majority at least of their respective constituencies, so too of a great proportion of the militia offices. In addition to all these, there are voluntary, civil, social, philanthropic, and corporate organizations, each presided over and its affairs administered by officers of its own election. Probably there are at the present hour in the United States as many persons holding offices bestowed upon them by the votes of others, and therefore indicative of some degree of respect and estimation, as existed through all the centuries of the Roman Republic when its domination was coextensive with the then known world. Doubtless there are more such elective offices at this time among the twenty millions of this country than among the two hundred millions of Europe and far more than in all the world besides. Many of these offices are sources of emolument as well as of power, and hence they present to competitors the double motive of a desire of gain and a love of approbation. If most of these innumerable fountains of honor are too small to slake the thirst of aspirants, they are sufficient to excite it. They create desires that are often unappeasable, desires that embroil towns, states, and the nation itself in the fiercest contentions of party. 
Now it is too obvious to need remark that the main tendency of institutions and of a state of society like those here depicted is to cultivate the intellect and to inflame the passions, rather than to teach humility and lowliness to the heart. Our civil and social condition holds out splendid rewards for the competitions of talent, rather than motives for the practice of virtue. It sharpens the perceptive faculties in comparing different objects of desire. It exercises the judgment in arranging means for the production of ends. It gives a grasp of thought and a power of combination which nothing else could so effectively impart. But on the other hand, it tends not merely to neglect the moral nature, but to an invasion of its rights, to a disregard of its laws, and in cases of conflict, to the silencing of its remonstrances and the denial of its sovereignty. And has not experience proved what reason might have predicted? Within the last half-century, has not speculation to a fearful extent taken the place of honest industry? Has not the glare of wealth so dazzled the public eye as often to blind it to the fraudulent means by which that wealth itself had been procured? Have not men been honored for the offices of dignity and patronage they have held, rather than for the ever-during qualities of probity, fidelity, and intelligence, which alone are meritorious considerations for places of honor and power? In the moral price current of the nation, has not intellect been rising, while virtue has been sinking in value? Though the nation as a nation, and a very great majority of the states composing it, have performed all their pecuniary obligations and preserved their reputation unsullied, yet have there not been great communities acting through legislators whom they themselves had chosen, that have been guilty of such enormous breaches of plighted faith as would cause the expulsion of a robber from his brotherhood of bandits. And who will say, even of the most favored portions of our country, that their advancement in moral excellence, in probity, in purity, and in the practical exemplification of the virtues of a Christian life, has kept pace with their progress in outward conveniences and embellishments, can virtue recount as many triumphs in the moral world as intellect has won in the material? Can our advances towards perfection in the cultivation of private and domestic virtues, and in the feeling of brotherhood and kindness towards all the members of our households, bear comparison with the improvements in our dwellings, our furniture, and our equipages? Have our charities for the poor, the debased, the ignorant, been multiplied in proportion to our revenues? Have we subdued low vices, low indulgences, and selfish feelings? And have we fertilized the waste places in the human heart as extensively as we have converted the wilderness into plenteous harvest fields, or enlisted the running waters into our service? In fine, have the mightier and swifter agencies which we have created or applied in the material world any parallel in new spiritual instrumentalities, by which truth can be more rapidly diffused, by which the high places of iniquity can be brought low, or its crooked ways made straight. Must it not be acknowledged that, morally speaking, we stand in arrears to the age in which we live, and must not some new measures be adopted, by which, as philanthropists and Christians, we can redeem our forfeited obligations? While then the legislator continues to denounce his penalties against such wicked desires as break out into actual transgression, and while the judge continues to punish the small portion of offenses that can be proved in court, the friends of education must do whatever can be done to diminish the terrible necessity of the penal law and the judicial condemnation. In view of these considerations, I propose to speak in the residue of this report of school motives, and of some means for avoiding and extirpating school vices. End of section 34 Section 35 of Annual Reports to the Massachusetts Board of Education by Horace Mann. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ninth Annual Report, 1845, Part 2. School Motives and School Vices. 
In the order of events, the first thing which demands attention is the choice of school committee men. We need school committee men who will scrutinize as diligently the moral character of the proposed teacher and his ability to impart moral instruction, as they do his literary attainments and his ability to impart knowledge. This official prerequisite in every member of our school committees is not only necessary on account of the general influence which his character will exert upon children, but on account of the particular duties the law requires him to perform. How would consistency be outraged, what a brand would be affixed by the general verdict of the community, upon the character of a town which should elect as school committee men to decide upon the literary qualifications of the instructors of their children, those who could neither read nor write. And yet is it not obvious that an immoral man is as little qualified to pronounce upon moral character as an illiterate man is to decide upon the sufficiency of literary qualifications? The general exemption of the teachers of Massachusetts from immoral habits is a fact to which the committees cheerfully and confidently testify, and it is one which my acquaintance with them enables me to confirm. But freedom from actual vice is not sufficient. In the character of one who is to train up children, a positive determination towards good, evinced by his life as well as by his language, is an essential attribute. No talent can atone for want of principle, no brilliancy of genius compensate for a stain upon the character. The perceptions of a teacher between right and wrong should be as unclouded by interest or passion as the lot of humanity will allow, and his conscience should be trained to an affinity for truth and an abhorrence of falsehood as quick and sure as the elective attractions and repulsions of chemistry. Knowledge is power, talent is power, but they are powers which may be enlisted on the side of evil as well as of good. Nature bestows talent, living among men confers some knowledge, and mere instinct is sufficient to make known to the appetites and passions their related objects, and therefore, unless a moral sovereign and lawgiver be enthroned in the breast, whose eye can watch and whose arm can defend, these appetites and passions will be to all the sanctuaries of liberty, of reputation, of life, and of chastity, what wolves are to the sheepfold. If talent were sufficient, why are not the greatest men the best men also? If knowledge were sufficient, why does it not always become the handmaid of virtue? Or why does much learning ever make men mad? Not nearer to the day of its destruction is a community without knowledge than a community which relies upon knowledge alone as sufficient to preserve it. According to the present constitution of the human mind, and of the world in which we are placed, knowledge is a necessity in the pursuit of happiness, but morality is a preliminary necessity, elder-born and eternal. We can conceive of a state of existence where we could be happy without knowledge, but it is not in the power of any human imagination to picture to itself a form of life where we could be happy without virtue. Generally speaking, I believe there is a commendable desire on the part of teachers to impart moral instruction, but there are obstacles in the way of doing it, and for various causes the ability or the opportunity does not equal the exigencies of the case. Some of these causes I proceed to notice. The manner in which school examinations have heretofore been conducted has tended to make the moral progress of the children secondary to their literary attainments. Perhaps there is something in the nature of the case conducing to a result so lamentable. If so, it should be sedulously guarded against by a preventive foresight. The scholars are ambitious to win the approval of the committee but in what way are they to satisfy the committee that they deserve this approval? Let us glance for a moment at the course of proceedings, as it usually takes place in some of the best of our schools. The committee visit the school soon after its commencement, as they are required to do by law. Their object is to ascertain the condition of the school, as it stands at the time, in regard to the studies pursued. For this purpose, the classes are called upon to spell— 
and the percentage of misspelled words is noted. To read, and the facility and intelligence with which they read are attended to. To exhibit their writing books, and the neatness and legibility of their handwriting are observed. To answer questions in geography and grammar. To work sums or draw maps upon the blackboard and their proficiency and accuracy in these several studies are noted down, at least in the memory, if not in a book. Occasionally, during the term, a committee man may call in to watch the progress of the school, but at its close a more formal and thorough examination is made necessary, both by the law of the land and by public expectation. The committee appear, the classes again spell, and the diminution in the percentage of errors, as compared with what it was at the opening of the school, is recorded. They read and define words, and the more living and natural expression of the voice, the greater ease and elegance in the elocutionary part of the exercise, together with their enlarged understanding of the scope and drift of the piece selected, and their ability to explain its historical, biographical, or scientific allusions, all these are susceptible to some extent of a numerical notation, and can be reported to persons not present at the exercise. The classes are called to the blackboard, and by a swift process the answers to difficult arithmetical questions are evolved, or, on requiring a map of a particular country to be drawn, a miniature representation of it, with its boundaries, its mountains, its rivers, and its cities, starts into being before their eyes. Indeed, if the class be large and has been competently trained, then by assigning a different part of the globe to each member of it, in ten minutes a very respectable atlas of the world will be depicted upon the walls of the schoolroom, to the honor of the pupils and the delight of all spectators. The committee and the parents participate in the general joy, and both teachers and scholars receive the meed of praise, the teacher wins or confirms an enviable reputation, the district solicits his acceptance of the school for another term, other districts hear of his success and become competitors for his services, and as a natural consequence of the competition he obtains both increased honor and emolument. But suppose, at the time when the school began, low, perverse, and ungentlemanly habits and manners prevailed among the pupils, which the teacher, by the dignity and impressiveness of his own example, and by the energy and kindness of his expostulations, has extirpated, and has substituted decency and propriety and manliness for them. Suppose profaneness polluted the lips of his children, and he has made them see the beauty and the truth of the saying that a Christian should be afraid to swear and a gentleman should be ashamed to. Suppose falsehood overt or falsehood in some of its thousand forms of equivocation, deception, or suppression, had cankered the vitals of the school, and threatened to consume all the honesty and ingenuousness of the young heart. But the teacher has made it a loathing and an abomination, and has inspired his school with some adequate conception of the moral beauty and the moral necessity of truth. Suppose a love of parents, brothers, and sisters, and a compassion for the poor and the unfortunate, have been warmed into being, and nourished into strength, in bosoms where they did not exist before. Suppose a reciprocation of kind offices among schoolmates has been substituted for alienation or hostility, or that some ancient and long-descended feud has been harmonized by his pacific counsels. Every school of children, as much as every community of men, has a public opinion, which, though unwritten, is a self-executing law among the pupils, and descends from one school generation to another. Suppose this public opinion of the school has been brought over, from the side of insubordination to voluntary acquiescence, and from trickery to open dealing. Suppose any or all of these blessed results to have been effected by the teacher— how are they to be brought forward for exhibition at the closing examination of the school? No general answers to general questions, no volubility in the rehearsal of moral precepts can display them. They cannot be exhibited on the blackboard, but they are graven upon the heart. They cannot be recorded in the school register, 
but they are written in the book of life. All attempts at display, indeed, will refute and corrupt the whole, for there is no more offensive vice than the ostentation of virtue, and the most disgusting of all hypocrisies is a humility ambitious of display. True virtue is lowly and retiring, and finds its highest gratifications in its inward and silent delights. But the moment that a sentiment of pride, on account of its supposed possession, is consciously allowed, or an impulse to boastfulness indulged, then virtue falls from its high and pure estate, and can no longer be numbered with the angels of light. And yet is not such a change, or anything approximating to such a change, in the moral character and conduct of scholars, as I have here attempted to describe, worth infinitely more than if the teacher, by a miracle of art, could transfer into their minds all the knowledge of all the philosophers who have ever lived. Now an unhappy consequence of the prevalent course of things is that the teacher who withdraws some part of his time and attention from the intellectual training of his pupils to devote it to their moral culture may be unable to exhibit so great a degree of proficiency in the studies pursued at the end of a short term or even of a single year as the one who forgets the existence of a moral nature in his charges and devotes himself exclusively to their intellectual progress. Whatever time the faithful moral teacher spends in cherishing sentiments of honor, truth, generosity, and magnanimity, the unfaithful one will spend polishing and perfecting the recitations in grammar, geography, or some other study. The former will use no motive, however efficacious, if its ultimate tendencies are injurious, but the latter will make all motives equally welcome, provided they conduce to his immediate end. The object of the one teacher is remote, consisting in the welfare of the children in after life. That of the other is immediate, consisting in the reputation and the pecuniary value of the reputation that will redound to himself at the end of his engagement. And hence it clearly follows that if the committee attend only, or attend mainly, to the proficiency made by the children in their accustomed studies, then a direct and palpable temptation is held out to the teacher to attend only or to attend mainly to this inferior part of his duty, because by so doing he will win a higher degree of success and a higher reputation for skill. His future services will be in greater demand, and he will not only enjoy his fame as fame, but be able also to coin it into money. Here, then, there seems to be a disastrous alliance of worldly motives, and they unite to weigh down the teacher who aspires to lofty and noble views in the discharge of his duty. Is not a change in this part of our school system imperatively demanded? Is not here a point where positive improvement may forthwith begin? Ought it not to become an axiom and a proverb that no amount of mere knowledge in a school shall ever be accepted as an equivalent for an uninstructed conscience, but on the other hand, that the formation of good habits shall be an acceptable apology for inferiority in attainments? Let committees, then, look vigilantly. Let them inquire anxiously day by day into the effect produced by the teacher upon the conduct, the manners, and the disposition of his pupils, and let censure rather than commendation be awarded to the teacher who has carried forward his pupils ever so rapidly in mere knowledge, if he has neglected the culture of the affections, or purchased proficiency in school studies by means which put their moral nature in jeopardy. How unworthy the sacred office of a teacher if he incites his pupils to effort only by displaying before them the brilliant prospect of worldly honors and distinctions, or the power and the pride of wealth, while he neglects to cherish the love of man in their bosoms, or to display before them daily the evidences of the goodness and wisdom of God. I care not how promptly the classes may respond in the schoolroom if I hear profaneness and obscenity in the playground. I care not how many textbooks they have mastered if they have not mastered the passions of jealousy and strife and uncharitableness. It is not indispensable to the happiness of children that they should know the length of all the great rivers or the height of all the great mountains upon the globe. 
but it is indispensable to their happiness that they should love one another and do as they would be done unto. A life spent in obscurity and supported by daily toil may be full of blessings, but no worldly honors, however high, or wealth, however boundless, can atone for one dereliction from duty in acquiring them. But the great agent in carrying the benign work of reform into our schools must be the teacher himself. No fullness in the qualifications of others can be the supplement of any material deficiency in him. Essential requisites in a teacher's character are a love of children and a love of his work. He must not be a hireling. It is right that he should have a regard for his compensation, but his compensation being provided for, it should be forgotten. To exclude the feeling of monotony and irksomeness, he must look upon his work as ever a new one, for such it really is. The school teacher is not, as it sometimes seems to be supposed, placed upon a perpetually revolving wheel and carried through a daily or yearly round of the same labors and duties. Such a view of his office is essentially a low and false one. What if he does turn over the leaves of the same book from day to day and hear the same lessons recited from year to year? What if he is required to explain the same principles and to reiterate the same illustrations until his path in the accustomed exercises of the schoolroom is as worn and beaten as the one by which morning and night he travels to and from it? Still, in the truest and highest sense, his labor is always a new one, because the subject upon which he operates is constantly changing. Every day he is developing new faculties, or carrying forward the old through new stages of their course. Though the books which he uses and the instructions which he imparts may be the same, yet his real work consists in his taking up class after class, and conducting them onward through new portions of their progress. The charge committed to his care is weak, ignorant, immature, and constitutionally subject to error. He imparts vigor, he supplies knowledge, he ripens judgment, he establishes principle, and he then sends them on their way to fulfill the great duties of earth and to be more and more prepared for another life. But so soon as he has fulfilled his duty to one company of the ever onward moving procession of young life, another company steps in to occupy the place of the former. Their need of guidance, their capacities of improvement, are as great as those which have gone before them. They, too, are bound on the same perilous journey of life, and for the same goal of an immortal existence. He is to guide their steps aright. He is to see that, before they pass from under his hands, they have some adequate conception of the great objects at which they are to aim, of the glorious destiny at which they may arrive, and that they are endued with the energy and the perseverance which will make their triumph certain. As soon as this labor is done to one company, he bids them a hasty farewell, that he may turn with glad welcome to hail another, more lately arrived upon the confines of existence, who ask his guidance as they are crossing the narrow isthmus of time, on their way to eternity. Such is the teacher's duty, to welcome each new group, to prepare them for the journey of life, and to speed them on their way, and again to welcome, to prepare, and to speed. And, I repeat, it is, and forever must be, a new work, while new beings emerge into existence, to receive benefit and blessing from him, to be rescued from what is wrong, to be consecrated to what is right. No teacher, therefore, who regards his duties in the light of reason and religion can look upon them as repulsive or monotonous or irksome. The angel that unlocks the gate of heaven might as well become weary of the service, though with every opening of the door a new spirit is ushered into the mansions of bliss. Let the teacher, then, who cannot draw exhaustless energies from a contemplation of the nature of his calling, let the teacher whose heart is not exhilarated as he looks round upon the groups of children committed to his care, let the teacher who can ever consciously speak of the tedium of school-keeping or the irksome task of instruction, either renovate his spirit or abandon his occupation. 
The repining teacher may be useful in some other sphere. He may be fit to work upon the perishable materials of wood or iron or stone, but he is unfit to work upon the imperishable mind. The teacher should enter the schoolroom as the friend and benefactor of his scholars. He is supposed to possess more knowledge than they, by the utmost diligence and stretch of faculty, can receive from him. But yet no fact is more certain, or law more universal, than that they will make no valuable or abiding acquisition without their own consent and cooperation. The teacher can neither transfuse knowledge by any process of decanting, nor inject it by any force into the mind of a child, but the law of the relation subsisting between them is that he must have the child's conscious assent and concurrence before he can impart it. He cannot impart unless the child consents to receive. What, then, is the state of mind most receptive of knowledge, and most cooperative in acquiring it? Surely it is a state of confidence, of trustfulness, of respect, of affection. Hence it follows that the first great duty of a teacher is to awaken these sentiments in the breasts of his pupils. For this end he can do more the first half-day he enters the schoolroom than in any week afterwards. But if a teacher presents himself before his pupils with a haughty or a contemptuous air, if he introduces himself by beginning to speak of his power and his authority, he will soon create the occasion for using them. The pupils themselves are first to be prepared, to be put into an apt condition for the work that is to follow. If we take a survey of any department of nature or of art, illustrations and analogies will crowd upon the mind in confirmation of the universal truth that if we would exert an influence upon any object, we must first bring it into a condition receptive of that influence. Does not the farmer break up the soil and open it to the sun before he commits the seed to its bosom in expectation of a harvest? Have not celebrated artists owed their fame as much to the careful preparation of their materials as to the skill with which they afterwards combined them? By the softening agencies of fire or steam, the mechanic overcomes the rigidity or inflexibleness of his materials before he attempts to mold or bend them to his purpose. Yet the chemical changes affected by heat through the innermost particles of the bar of iron which the smith wishes to fashion anew upon his anvil are not deeper or more transmuting than the spiritual changes wrought upon the inmost emotions of a child's soul by a demeanor of dignity and by looks and tones of affection on the part of the teacher. When the all-bountiful giver of the seasons wills to overspread our hemisphere with vegetable bounty and luxuriance, he does not scatter abroad his treasures of snow and of hail, nor bind the rivers in the death-like embraces of frost, but he causes the sun to draw near and the genial rain to descend. He scatters the infinite drops of dew over the earth and summons the warming winds from the chambers of the south. Whatever is to be done, whether in the works of nature or of art, the material which is to be wrought upon must first be adapted to the work. All teachers look upon books and apparatus as indispensable to the highest progress of a school, and hence the sending of a child to school, with a demand that he should be taught, but without the common instrumentalities for teaching him, they justly regard as a pharaoh-like requisition. Yet how much more indispensable are a desire and a purpose to learn in the breast of a child than a book in his hand? A spelling book, a geography, and so forth are very desirable, but a disposition to use them is indispensable. Parents must supply the books, but teachers, with the help of the parents where they can have it, and as far as possible without that help where they cannot have it, must supply the disposition. Let this be done, and we may safely affirm that the laws of nature are not more certain than that the child will learn, for it is a law of nature that he will. Footnote In the number of the Bibliotheca Sacra for February 1846, pages 110-111, we find the following observations from the pen of the Reverend Noah Porter, Jr. of Springfield, Massachusetts. 
They are so valuable in themselves, and tend so strongly to fortify the views we have expressed, that we cannot forbear to copy them. You cannot drive a boy to study, least of all can you drive study into him. The attention must itself awake and pant with eagerness for knowledge. The affections must lay hold of it with a grasp that nothing can unlock, and the man must appropriate it, turning it into the very substance of the mind. You cannot force upon the attention, as you must the jaw that is locked, nor bind on enthusiasm, nor infuse the results that come, if they come at all, from the personal activity of the scholar. The appliances of masters and textbooks and illustrations and rules and supervision, and the most perfect system of gradations, one and all of them, are in vain, unless you can find or make a generous enthusiasm and a wakeful spirit. Still less at college will the scholar carry forward the work, however well begun at school, unless, with his growing capacity to labor and to learn, there grow likewise the desire to labor and to learn. Still less, after he leaves the university, will there be an overmastering desire to be the thorough and finished man, unless there be an iron energy and a burning enthusiasm. To success in acquiring, then, there is needed a strong and active spirit. Indeed, without it, study becomes a mechanical process— Books overmaster the mind that should overmaster them. The love of learning is a morbid habit, an unnatural craving, and the highest attainments of scholarship are as useless and as unnatural as a monstrous lion, or a heart that palpitates when it should beat. End footnote. If securing the goodwill of scholars is preliminary to their attainment of knowledge— Far more important is it to the cultivation of their moral sentiments and to the growth of good habits. It is an invariable law of nature in regard to the young mind that the affections are developed before the judgment. How woeful and desolate would be the condition of a child if it could never love its mother until it had arrived at an age capable of mastering such a process of reasoning as should convince it that she was deserving of its love. Happily, this law of instinctive love prevails until an age when the reasoning powers can be developed and the conscience enlightened. Then, and not till then, can a child make his affections intelligently obedient to his duties. All the circumstances and conditions, therefore, which attend the first introduction of a teacher to his pupils, should conciliate regard and predispose to a mutual good understanding." Is it not too obvious to need exposition that the principles of duty can be superinduced upon a state of affection and sympathy more easily than upon one of antipathy and distrust? Is it not so self-evident as to make the idea of confirmation absurd that a teacher who possesses the love and confidence of his pupils will reclaim them from error or establish them in good principles more readily than if he were obliged to break through a rampart of hostile feelings and carry the citadel of the judgment and conscience by assault, and thus to found his ultimate authority upon the right of conquest, instead of having the gates thrown open to him with welcome and gratulation, and being received and hailed as a friend and deliverer. Every pupil who loves his teacher will feel that love soliciting him to obedience, just as certainly as every true disciple finds the love of Christ constraining him to good works. Every teacher, animated by the spirit which is alone worthy of a teacher, will enter into possession of his school, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, not as being a lord over his pupils, but as being an example to them. The idea that there are two antagonist powers in the schoolroom, each struggling for mastery over the other, like the rival houses of York and Lancaster contending for the English throne, will be as fatal to the prosperity of a school as is a civil war to the prosperity of a country. But primary and essential is the idea that there is one sacred, all-pervading law to which the teacher and pupil alike are subject— the law of duty and affection. All the rules of the schoolroom are but corollaries or consequences from this paramount law. If the authority and power of a teacher are not offensively set forth, 
they will rarely be questioned. If, instead of flattering a despicable pride by a proclamation of his own supremacy, if, instead of arrogating sovereignty to his own personal will, all his words and actions proceed upon the supposition that there is one serene and majestic power to which all alike are bound to render allegiance and to pay homage, a law by which the judge is to be judged and the ruler ruled, and above all, if the teacher shows himself to be a living and shining example of the doctrine he inculcates, the number of pupils will be few indeed who will ever bring the question of authority to a practical issue. When have soldiers ever undergone such privation of the necessities of life as when their commander was known to stint himself to the same meager allowance? When have they ever performed such forced marches as when they saw their leader moving in the van of the column, or made so valorous an assault as when they saw his plume waving at the head of the charge? Or, to draw examples from the highest source, does not the Apostle say that the goodness of God leadeth us to repentance? And the Savior's emblem was that of a true shepherd, who does not drive but leads forth his flock." However it may be with sheep, we know that with children, as with men, the difference is unimaginably great between leading and driving. It was intimated above that if the proper influences constantly radiate from the teacher and pervade the schoolroom, the cases of insurgency against him will be rare. Such cases, however, may occur, and when they do occur, they suggest their own remedy— if the talent and skill of the teacher are not sufficient to arouse the indolence or restrain the waywardness of the pupil, if his commanding dignity and benevolence cannot change perverseness into docility or melt down obstinacy into submission, in fine, if the teacher's mind cannot overmaster the pupil's mind in its then present condition, and if the teacher's heart be not of such superior moral power as to overcome and assimilate to itself the heart of the pupil, there is still one resource left. The teacher's physical power is superior to the pupil's physical power, for the teacher has a legal right to summon all necessary assistance to his aid, and with this superiority he must begin his work of reform. Order must be maintained, this is the primal law, the superiority of the heart, the superiority of the head, the superiority of the arm. This is the order of the means to secure an observance of law. As soon as possible, however, the teacher must ascend from the low superiority of muscular force to the higher and spiritual ones, and he must forever cultivate the higher, that they may the sooner supersede the lower. I think one cannot have been long accustomed to visiting schools— without being able to determine almost at a glance on entering a schoolroom what the relation is which exists between the teacher and his scholars. If, as soon as the teacher turns his back upon the scholars, in order to approach and to salute his guests, the whole muscular system of the school seems to snap the fetters in which it had been bound, and to break out into mischievous activity, but as soon as the teacher reverts his face, all is again subdued and hushed into death-like stillness— if, as the teacher moves about among his scholars and gives his directions, they exhibit a deference that almost runs into timidity, but as soon as he has passed by, they make grimaces behind him, or fill up spitballs at his back, if, as he turns from time to time towards different parts of the room, that portion of the school which is under his eye is constrainedly quiet and submissive, while that portion which he does not see starts out into a hundred disorders— as wild beasts rush forth when the light of day is withdrawn, if such be the general aspect of the school, then an intelligent spectator becomes as certain at the end of five minutes as he would be at the end of a week, that the teacher holds his place only by the law of force. But on the other hand, if the scholars seem almost unconscious of the teacher's presence, if they are unobservant in what part of the room he stands, or in which direction he may be looking, if he can step out at the door to speak to a visitor, or into a recitation room to inspect a class, and remain absent for five or ten minutes without there being any buzz or whirring in the schoolroom, 
then one may feel the delightful assurance that such a school is under the sway of a serene and majestic authority, the authority of the great law of duty and love. I have seen many schools of each class in Massachusetts, and I feel warranted in saying that in point of numbers the latter class is rapidly gaining upon the former. There is a small class of schools intermediate between the two above described, where the teacher, through a false ambition of having it said that he can govern by moral suasion, or through fear of losing his place, or from some equally unworthy motive, seeks to govern without resort to corporal punishment, but has not the skill that can interest children in their studies, nor the spiritual ascendancy that can control their waywardness. But no low motive can ever perform the office of a high one. The laws of nature will not be circumvented. High influences without can only come from high principles within. If a teacher would govern by intellectual and moral power, he must possess intellectual and moral power, and no spurious or counterfeit similitudes of them can borrow or steal their efficacy. There is great beauty in the Romish superstition that the moment consecrated water is sold, it is desecrated. It loses its quality of holiness by the unhallowed motive that transfers it. The spirit of the sentiment applies to the present case— the teacher who would govern by the law of love must have faith in the law of love. In the absence of this, he will be compelled to resort to coaxing or wheedling or hiring children to be good, which is like the sin of laying a false offering upon the altar of the Lord. Immediately on opening a school, an important question arises as to the expediency or inexpediency of promulgating a code of laws for its government. It is the practice of some teachers to announce orally during the first day or half-day of the school the rules whose observance they shall require and whose infraction they shall punish. Others prepare written statutes sanctioned by specific penalties, which they post up in some conspicuous place in the schoolroom, so as to give a warning to transgressors and to provide themselves with a ready answer should the plea of ignorance be urged by any offender. Other teachers anticipate the commission of no offense, but wait until one occurs before they expound its demerits or prescribe its consequences. It seems to me that very serious objections lie against the promulgation of a code of laws, either oral or written, in advance or at the commencement of the school. If this be done, the scholars instantly adopt the well-known principle of legal construction, that what is not included is excluded, and hence that everything is permitted which is not prohibited. But as he is a bad citizen who has no higher rule of action than the law of the land, so is he a bad scholar who has no other restraint against wrongdoing than the prohibitions of the teacher. No code ever framed by the ingenuity of man, however voluminous and detailed it may have been, ever enumerated a tithe of the acts which an enlightened conscience will condemn, and no language was ever so exact and perspicuous as to be proof against sophistry and turgiversation. The jurisdiction of the conscience is infinitely more comprehensive than that of the statute book. Is it right, and not is it written, is the question to be propounded in the forum of conscience. Each scholar brings a conscience to school. If it has not been previously enlightened on any given point of duty— then there is no punishable blame in the breach of that duty. If it has been previously enlightened, then the tribunal is already open before which the culprit should be arraigned. Besides, as most of our schools consist of scholars differing very much from each other in regard to age and intelligence, the rules applicable to one portion of them may be very unsuitable to another. And yet, if relaxed and suspended in one case— the idea of their permanency and immutability will be destroyed, and with that all their moral efficacy ceases. So there may be cases where peculiar circumstances will take an action out of the spirit of a rule while they leave it within the letter. Suppose, for instance, in consideration of the many mischiefs which follow in the train of whispering and other modes of communication between scholars, they are peremptorily and altogether forbidden 
and suppose that the next day a child exhibits symptoms of extreme distress or of fainting, or is exposed to some danger which requires instant warning, shall the general rule be observed at the expense of any consequences, or, if violated, shall it be punished? Doubtless, too, it has happened, and not very unfrequently, that the idea of the offense was originally suggested by the prohibition, and thus the law has led to its own infraction. As with ignorant and superstitious persons, predictions often procure their own fulfillment. Footnote. The story of the Catholic priest and the ostler is not in a posit. When an ostler had finished making confession of his sins, the priest inquired of him if he had ever greased the teeth of his customers' horses to prevent them from eating their oats. The ostler not only replied in the negative, but said he had never heard of such a thing. The next time he went to the confessional, the first offense which he had to acknowledge was that he had been greasing the teeth of his customers' horses. End footnote. But there is a great variety of duties to be performed in a schoolroom, as well as of offenses to be avoided. Would it not be more appropriate to go into a detail of these duties, and expound their reasons and their rewards, rather than to set forth an array of offenses with penalties? And are there no methods by which a teacher can commend the duties beforehand to the good will of the scholars, ingratiate them, as it were, into the mind of the school, and thus exclude much of what is bad, by a pre-occupancy of the ground with that which is good. I would commend a course by which not only have some excellent schools sustained their character for excellence, but by which some indifferent schools have been made excellent. It is that of employing the first hour, or perhaps more, of the first day of a term, in a familiar and colloquial exposition of the objects of the school, and the means which it is indispensable to observe for the accomplishment of these objects. Certainly all the older children, in all schools above the rank of the primary, are capable of understanding something, both of the advantages and the pleasures of knowledge, of the connection between present conduct and future respectability, of the different emotions which arise in the mind after the performance of a good and of an evil action, and of the inherent tendencies, both of virtuous and of vicious habits, to accelerate their course towards happiness or misery. Excepting the comparatively few cases of implicit faith, a child will not be deterred from wrong unless he sees it to be wrong, any more than he will shrink back from a precipice from whose brink he is about to step, if he is ignorant of its existence. If the moral precipice were made as visible as the natural can be, might we not hope that fewer victims would be precipitated into the abyss of ruin? End of section 35、section 36 of Annual Reports to the Massachusetts Board of Education by Horace Mann. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ninth Annual Report, 1845, Part 3 A vast deal of the success of a school depends upon the first impression made by the teacher upon it, and by a well-conducted conversation with the scholars at its commencement, and before any prejudices against its requirements have sprung up, or any temptations to disobedience have been presented, the good will of many, to say the least, may be propitiated. There are some points, indeed, absolutely essential to the prosperity of a school, respecting which the teacher is in the hands of the scholars, wholly dependent upon their cooperation, such as the punctuality and regularity of their attendance, and, not infrequently, their being provided with textbooks and other instruments of learning. And in regard to other points falling more directly within a teacher's control, his only hope of reaching the highest success depends upon securing their assistance. A few hours, therefore, at the beginning of a school, and an occasional one afterwards, as the age and capacities of the scholars may require, may be most beneficially spent in a familiar exposition of the great purposes for which the school has been opened, and of the means and observances by which alone its highest prosperity can be secured." 
A teacher can hardly enter a school of children collected from various families and subjected to various home influences without finding some at least who have an essentially false view of the object for which they are attending. He must throw light forward to show them the true nature of that object. Among the topics introduced by him in his first friendly discourse to the youthful group collected around him may be the duty of cultivating the spirit of honor and of kindness to each other, a desire for each other's improvement as well as for their own, and a determination generously to assist their companions in improving the advantages of the school. Let him deprecate the meanness that would try to put off blame upon another for the sake of shielding oneself, that would even risk the concealment of a fault for which another might be unjustly blamed or suspected, that would triumph in any success which would give pain to the innocent, and let him fill their bosoms with a noble scorn of deception or falsehood. Let him make his company of hearers perceive that knowledge should only be trusted to those who will use it conscientiously, and this he can do by a graphical description of some immoral great man who has used power and knowledge for selfish and wicked purposes. Let him convince them that he intends to bring into the schoolroom none but the highest motives, and that it is alike their duty and interest to bring into the school none but the highest motives. Let more or less of these topics be introduced again, particularly on the accession of new members to the school, and before time has been allowed them for practicing or inventing any adroit measures of defiance or deception. If new children, when they come into a school, find its tone a high one, and its habits generous and manly, they will almost invariably be assimilated into the prevalent sentiment. Extraordinary cases of perversity may indeed occur, but if the new pupils see that the denizens of the school make it a matter of honor to govern themselves, instead of being governed by a set of arbitrary rules— if they see such confidence existing between teacher and pupils, that each is ready to trust the other, and that the interests of both sides are the same, instead of clashing like those of enemies, they will be ashamed to stand out as exceptions, as ugly, misshapen creatures in a company where all others are beautiful. One of the highest and most valuable objects to which the influences of a school can be made conducive consists in training our children to self-government. The doctrine of no government, even if all forms of violence did not meet the first day to celebrate its introduction by a jubilee, would forfeit all the power that originates in concert and union. So tremendous, too, are the evils of anarchy and lawlessness, that a government by mere force, however arbitrary and cruel, has been held preferable to no government. But self-government, self-control, a voluntary compliance with the laws of reason and duty, have been justly considered as the highest point of excellence attainable by a human being. No one, however, can consciously obey the laws of reason and duty until he understands them. Hence the preliminary necessity of their being clearly explained, of their being made to stand out, broad, lofty, and as conspicuous as a mountain against a clear sky. There may be blind obedience, without a knowledge of the law, but only the will of the lawgiver. But the first step toward rational obedience is a knowledge of the rule to be obeyed and of the reasons on which it is founded. The above doctrine acquires extraordinary force in view of our political institutions— founded, as they are, upon the great idea of the capacity of man for self-government, an idea so long denounced by the state as treasonable and by the church as heretical. In order that men may be prepared for self-government, their apprenticeship must commence in childhood. The great moral attribute of self-government cannot be born and matured in a day, and if school-children are not trained to it, we only prepare ourselves for disappointment if we expect it from grown men. Everybody acknowledges the justness of the declaration that a foreign people born and bred and dwarfed under the despotisms of the old world 
cannot be transformed into the full stature of American citizens merely by a voyage across the Atlantic, or by subscribing the oath of naturalization. If they retain the servility in which they have been trained, some self-appointed lord or priest on this side of the water will succeed to the authority of the master whom they have left behind them. If, on the other hand, they identify liberty with an absence from restraint and an immunity from punishment, then they are liable to become intoxicated and delirious with the highly stimulating properties of the air of freedom. And thus, in either case, they remain unfitted until they have become morally acclimated to our institutions to exercise the rights of a free man. But can it make any substantial difference whether a man is suddenly translated into all the independence and prerogatives of an American citizen from the bondage of an Irish lord or an English manufacturer, or from the equally rigorous bondage of a parent, guardian, or school teacher? He who has been a serf until the day before he is twenty-one years of age cannot be an independent citizen the day after— and it makes no difference whether he has been a serf in Austria or in America. As the fitting apprenticeship for despotism consists in being trained to despotism, so the fitting apprenticeship for self-government consists in being trained to self-government, and the law of force and authority is as appropriate a preparation for the subjects of an arbitrary power as liberty and self-imposed law are for developing and maturing those sentiments of self-respect, of honor, and of dignity, which belong to a truly republican citizen. Were we hereafter to govern irresponsibly, then our being forced to yield implicit obedience to an irresponsible governor would prepare us to play the tyrant in our turn. But if we are to govern by virtue of a law which embraces all— which overlays all, which includes the governor as well as the governed, then lessons of obedience should be inculcated upon childhood in reference to that sacred law. If there are no two things wider asunder than freedom and slavery, then must the course of training which fits children for these two opposite conditions of life be as diverse as the points to which they lead. Now, for the high purpose of training an American child to become an American citizen, a constituent part of a self-governing people, is it not obvious that in all cases the law by which he is to be bound should be made intelligible to him? And as soon as his capacity will permit that the reasons on which it is founded should be made as intelligible as the law itself— this view of the subject does not trench one hair's breadth upon the great doctrine of order and subordination. It only contests the claim to arbitrary power on the one side, and its correlative blind submission on the other. It discards these as substitutes for moral power and voluntary obedience, and there it stops. The great question is, to whom or to what is the obedience or subordination due? It is primarily due to the law, to the law written upon the heart, to the law of God. The teacher is the representative and the interpreter of that law. He is clothed with power to punish its violations, but this comprehends only the smallest part of his duty. As far as possible, he is to prevent violations of it, by rectifying that state of mind out of which violations come. Nor is it enough that the law be obeyed. As far as possible, he is to see that it is obeyed from the right motives. As a moral act, blind obedience is without value. As a moral act, also, obedience through fear is without value. And not only so, but as soon as the fear is removed, the restrained impulses will break out and demand the arrears of indulgence as a long-delayed debt. To prevent misunderstanding, however, I wish to define the term fear as here used. It is here used to signify a dread of bodily pain or injury or of personal loss. In reference to the divine being, the term is used in a widely different sense. That fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, 
includes the emotion of awe and reverence. It is not a servile but a filial fear. It is a sentiment which an enlightened conscience can never experience toward an unworthy object, and which, therefore, an unworthy object can never inspire. But the mere dread of personal harm as a consequence of wrongdoing is not curative, it is not restorative. It may warn, it may arrest, it may check the outward commission of wrong, and its use for these purposes, to any extent which circumstances may require, is legitimate. But with the prevention of wrong, its functions end. Though it may make an offender cease to do ill, it can never, by its own efficacy, make him love to do well. As poison may arrest a disease, though it cannot restore a patient to health. By suppressing outbreaks, by restraining waywardness, fear may prepare the way for the introduction of higher motives of action. But if the aid of these higher motives be not then invoked, the ground of justification for using the fear is taken away. A reform in character may be begun by fear, but if it ends in fear, it will prove to be no reform. When the spendthrift finds he is approaching the last dollar of his patrimony, and gaunt hunger and want begin to stare him in the face, he is admonished to desist, and under the terror of these impending evils, he arrests his course of riot and dissipation. But this terror does not inspire him with the least love of temperance and industry. A habit of diligence and sobriety must come, if it comes at all, from the working of other motives within him. Without the restraint of higher motives, should another inheritance unexpectedly descend to him, he would return to his wallowing in the mire. The bond-servants of fear always do as little as they can, because they do nothing for the love of the thing done, but only to avoid some painful consequence if it be not done. Work, whether of the hand or of the mind, which is not performed from a love of it, is never performed with that zest or alacrity which the love of it inspires. An external act of duty may be done, but it is done not from a willing but from a repugnant, not from a dutiful but from a rebellious heart. The mind will disown what the hand performs, while each movement and each moment will deepen disgust towards it. This is so clear, even to the intellect, that some of the more sagacious slave-drivers in the South are substituting motives of personal profit, of appetite, and the love of tawdriness, for the scourge. They have been led to this not from compassion, but from cupidity. They find the sum total of the profits at the end of the year to be greater under the use of pleasurable motives than under the use of painful ones. Formerly, and to a great extent even at present, they use the motive of bodily fear and smart, the motive by which the tyrant maintains his power, by which the savage enforces obedience to his will, by which the brute secures its prey. But the eyes of some of them have been opened to see the neighboring motives, as they lie arranged along the great scale from the brutish to the angelic, and they now avail themselves of the love of appetite, the love of approbation, the desire of being bedizened with gaudy colors and so forth, as more efficient agencies than pain. Doubtless the quantity of their work will be increased, and its quality improved, as the masters ascend higher and higher in the scale of motive powers. Teachers should be children of light, and they should not permit the children of mammon to be wiser in their generation than they. It should never be forgotten that the highest duty of a teacher is to produce the greatest quantity and the purest quality of moral action. Fear, then, is no more to be proscribed from the teacher's list of motives than arsenic and henbane from the materia medica of the physician, but the teacher or parent who uses nothing but fear commits a far greater error than the physician who uses nothing but poison. Let all wise and good men unite their efforts so to improve both the moral and the physical health of the community— as gradually and regularly to diminish, and finally to supersede, the necessity of either. The maxim embodied in the law of the land, and sustained by the good sense of all communities, 
that the teacher stands in loco parentis, that is, in the parent's place or stead, has been a thousand times repeated. By virtue of this relation, he is authorized to do, for all the purposes within his jurisdiction, what the parent might rightfully do under like circumstances. But he stands in the parent's place for love as well as for power, for duty as well as for authority. If a father has any right to punish a child whose reason he has never attempted to enlighten, whose conscience he has never sought to develop, it is a right founded upon the previous commission on his part of the highest wrong. If preventives and milder remedies have not been used to avert the ultimate necessity of violent applications, then the parent, in regard to every offense which demands the application of violence, is an accessory before the fact, a suborner to the crime, and justly incurs the largest share of its guilt. If the rights of the teacher, as to the exercise of power, are commensurate with the rights of the parent, so are the teacher's duties also, in regard to the motives from which he acts, commensurate with parental duties. A question connected with this subject has been often discussed, and the practice is different in different parts of the state. It is whether refractory and disobedient scholars should be dismissed from the school or retained in it and subdued. If a teacher stands in the place of the parent, why should he dismiss any scholar from his school, unless temporarily, any more than a parent should expel a child from his household? There is no botany bay to which such a child can be banished. Instead of crossing the ocean to another hemisphere, he remains at home. For all purposes of evil he continues in the midst of the very children from among whom he was cast out, and when he associates with them out of school there is no one present to abate or neutralize his pernicious influences. If the expelled pupil be driven from the district where he belongs into another, in order to prevent his contaminations at home, what better can be expected from the people of the place to which he is sent than a reciprocation of the deed by sending one of their outcasts to supply his place, and thus opening a commerce of evil upon free trade principles? Nothing is gained while the evil purpose remains in the heart. Reformation is the great desideratum, and can any lover of his country hesitate between the alternatives of forcible subjection and victorious contumacy. In extreme cases, however, the school committee have an undoubted legal right to expel a scholar from school. But in those cases where the dangerousness of the symptoms will no longer permit delay, there is an immense difference in the modes of treating a malady. We know that a mere pretender to medical or surgical knowledge will aggravate the puncture of a pin into a mortification fatal to life, while by anodyne and restorative the skillful practitioner will cure the gangrene itself. So, in the case of a distempered will, it may be inflamed and exasperated by fiery and passionate appliances into incorrigibleness and misanthropy, or, on the other hand, it may be restored to soundness and docility by reproofs or chastisements administered in wisdom and love. But after the school has commenced, when classes have been formed and the routine of exercise is begun, it is then that opportunities without number and without end will present themselves for inspiring sentiments and cultivating habits of order, of decorum, of honor, of justice, and of truth or, on the other hand, of engendering a brood of base and dissocial feelings, unkindness, evasion, hypocrisy, dishonesty, and falsehood. Nay, the teacher may be entirely honest and sincere himself, and yet, from having his mind too intently and exclusively fixed upon the intellectual progress of his pupils, he may be regardless of the moral impulses which secure that progress, and of the emotions which attend it. Every true teacher will consider the train of feeling not less than the train of thought, which is evolved by the exercises of the schoolroom. Here opens a most important and difficult subject. So far as I know, it has never been comprehensively or minutely treated by any writer. 
it is impossible for me to do it justice. I enter upon it with undissembled diffidence. Yet such is its intrinsic importance, and so often when visiting schools have I seen exemplifications of wrong, where I was sure the teacher intended only what was right, that I can no longer forbear to attempt an elucidation of its merits. May others be led to investigate and expound it until it assumes a prominence and commands an attention corresponding to its magnitude. After the provisional classification of a school, the first business ordinarily consists in setting lessons and hearing recitations. In all schools having any claim to respectability, imperfect recitations incur some unpleasant consequences. In some, it is only a forfeiture of the teacher's approval. In some, it is a record of the failure. In some, after a fixed number of failures, it is corporal punishment, the infliction of which cancels the old score and opens the books for a new account. In all decent schools, an imperfect recitation is a thing which the pupils deprecate. But the means of preventing it or of avoiding the appearance of it are various. In the first place, the teacher can ensure any number of imperfect recitations by giving too long or too difficult lessons, lessons beyond the ability of the scholars to learn. And thus a mere mistake in judgment on the part of the teacher may lead to discouragement or fraud on the part of the pupils. Lessons should be such that they can be competently mastered by all the scholars in the class, unless in cases of remarkable dullness. Some of the less forward or less bright may require a little extra assistance, which should be freely rendered to them. But if there be any members of the class who cannot make themselves tolerably well acquainted with the lessons, they should be removed to a lower class. Habitually to break down at a recitation has a most disastrous influence on the character of a child. It depresses the spirits, takes away all the animation and strength derived from hope, and utterly destroys the ideal of intellectual accuracy, which is next in importance to moral accuracy, on which, indeed, moral accuracy often depends. It is still worse when the whole class fails. Shame never belongs to multitudes. It is a feeling which arises when we contrast our own deficiency or misconduct with the opposite qualities in others. But where all are equally deficient or equally wrong, there is no opportunity for such a contrast. Common deficiency at the recitation begets a mingled feeling of contempt for the study and recklessness of reputation which is fatal to all advancement. It may begin by merely disheartening the pupil, but it will soon become disgust towards the study and aversion from the teacher. Few things are of more baneful tendency than to have a scholar or a class leave the recitation stand after a half hour of blundering and darkness with no sense of shame or regret at the dishonor. Few things are of more evil augury than for children to become so inured by frequency to having marks of discredit entered against their names that they grow indifferent and callous to any recorded censure. Such children lose all that delicacy of feeling, that fine sensitiveness to honor, which are strong outposts of virtuous principle. Day after day, to have a dishonorable mark set upon the body or the hand or on the name, without any feeling of regret or effort at amendment, is as deplorable for a boy or a girl as it would be for a man or a woman to receive, without shame and without compunction, a tenth or a twentieth sentence to the house of correction or jail. The former, indeed, foretokens the latter. But suppose the character of the lesson to be rightly adjusted to the capacity of the learner. Still a brood of temptations lurk around. In the first place, there is the device of getting one part of the lesson better than the rest, under the expectation of being questioned on that part. How often has this been done? In some of the studies it is to be forestalled and excluded by the method before described of putting each question to the whole class, waiting a sufficient time for each pupil to think out the answer in his own mind, 
and then calling upon some one by name to answer it. The naming of the scholar to give that answer should be in no set order, but promiscuous. This method especially applies to grammar, to oral spelling, to oral recitations in geography, and to mental arithmetic. In written arithmetic, a question for solution may be propounded, and one pupil required to state the first step in the process, and then another pupil in another part of the class the second step, and so on until the explanation is completed. Where there is, as there should be in every schoolroom, a sufficient extent of blackboard to allow the whole class to stand before it at once, a separate question may be given to each member of the class to be wrought upon it. Occasionally, when the solution is half completed, the pupils may be transposed, and each one required to examine and complete his neighbor's work. Such are some of the methods, to be constantly varied and interchanged, by which the temptation to deal treacherously with the lesson may be met and defeated. And yet the teacher should make no avowal that he entertains any suspicions against any individual, and designs to baffle his plans for deception. He uses these means only for banishing temptation where it exists, and for shutting the door against it where its invasion is threatened. Temptation may be analyzed into two elements, desire and opportunity. Take away the desire, and the opportunity can work no harm. Take away the opportunity, and the desire is baffled. The former course is better, where it can be taken, but the latter is recommended as one means of accomplishing the former. It sometimes happens that scholars experiment upon the numbers or terms of an arithmetical question. In proportion, for instance, if they have no knowledge of the principle which should guide them, they may try the effect of multiplying two of the numbers together and dividing the product by the third. But if that does not yield the right answer, they may transpose the order and try again. And in the end, having exhausted all the errors, they will obtain the truth. But it is only by a comparison of their result with the answer in the book that they will know when they have arrived at the truth. They will not know on what principle that true answer was obtained, and on attempting a solution of the next question they will be as ignorant as ever, and be again obliged to go through with the same experimental process. In order to prevent this appeal to chance instead of an appeal to principle, the class may be occasionally required to lay aside their slates and to work out all the questions contained in a lesson on paper. Here they will not be able to obliterate what they have done, as they can do on the slate. And therefore the teacher, by a single glance of the eye, can see the track which the mind has made, whether it were straight or circuitous, in its search after the answer. He will also see the mechanical correctness with which each step may have been performed. Frequent reviews, by carrying the pupils a second time over the ground they have traversed, will be another means of determining whether they have left any part of it unexplored. Devices or excuses to escape the lesson altogether, when the pupil is conscious of not having faithfully learned it, are an aggravated form of the evil above mentioned, and it should be guarded against by an examination of the absentee upon the omitted lesson at another time. I fear that this slurring or shirking of the lesson is sometimes regarded in no other light than as a clog upon the progress of the pupil, or as an abatement from the success of the coming examination. The substance of the argument, often used as a warning against this species of misconduct, is that whoever leaves a lesson of his course unmastered leaves an enemy in ambush behind him, an enemy who will at some day rise up to molest his peace and perhaps to defeat his most cherished hopes. But though this is a legitimate consideration, yet the subject has relations far more important. It is not so much the lesson which is omitted as the wrongful act which is committed. The knowledge that is lost is an insignificant matter compared with the trickish habit that is gained. The avoidance of the lesson has deprived the intellect of so much exercise, and therefore has prevented whatever of strength that exercise would have given. But the means by which the lesson was avoided have given exercise and strength, 
to motives of deception and fraud. Herein lies the lamentable character of the deed. It is only a misfortune to be ignorant, but it is an unspeakable calamity to be dishonest. However vigilantly the teacher may look after the intelligence of his charge, he should use a thousand times more vigilance in preserving their integrity. Limited attainments are not incompatible with a high degree of happiness, but every immoral act diminishes the capacity for happiness forever and ever. Another means of avoiding study, and I am sorry to say I have found no little evidence of its existence, is, after procuring some fellow pupil or other person to perform the work which the teacher has assigned, to present the work thus performed by another as the product of one's own labor. The intellectual loss and injury of such a course are great. It leaves the mind unexercised when it was one of the principal objects of the lesson to exercise it. It also disqualifies the pupil more and more for mastering subsequent lessons. A scholar who did not get his lessons last week through indolence may be unable to get them this week through incapacity, and next week he may give them up in despair. But the most deplorable quality of such conduct is that it is an acted falsehood, and as subsequent lessons are mastered with so much more difficulty after the omission of the preceding ones, the power of the temptation increases in a geometrical ratio at each succeeding step. The cases above referred to are generally those where assistance is obtained out of school, but the prompting of a fellow pupil in school and during the recitation comes under the same general head, and incurs the like mischievous consequences. To guard against the latter species of misconduct, the teacher should be all eye and all ear. He should be so familiar with the lesson that he can devote his whole attention to the class, instead of occupying the time in preparing himself by looking at his book to hear the successive answers. His eye should be on them on their account, and not on his book on his own account. To guard the pupil against taking fraudulent measures out of school, he should instruct as faithfully in regard to the object of the lesson as in regard to the lesson itself. The attention of the pupil should be forever turned towards the state of his own mind. Have the lesson, the fact, the principle, the scientific relation, been reproduced within himself? Are they recorded on the tables of his intellect? Are they so clearly and enduringly written there, that if the slate and the blackboard were broken to fragments, if the book were to be consumed, he would still possess them as his own, ineffaceably inscribed on his mind? Is the lesson so luminously recorded in his memory that he can see it there in the darkness of midnight, and revive it in the solitude of the desert? Every pupil should be made to see that to transfer or to copy an answer or a process from a textbook to his own slate or paper, or to take it from another's dictation, is valueless in the way of acquisition, of improvement, that it is in its nature the various task work or treadmill service ever performed. He should be made to see that he might as well learn the art of swimming by getting another boy to swim for him, that he might as well increase his stature and strength by employing another to eat his meals, or that he might as well expect to gain wealth by forfeiting all his daily earnings to the more industrious. Perhaps the most appropriate punishment in cases where a punishment is deemed advisable for stealing the solution of the sum from a book, or for transferring it from another's slate, or for borrowing another's composition instead of writing one, would be to make the offender copy off figures in logarithms or the letters of some algebraic process about which he knows nothing, or to transcribe passages in the French or Latin language. This would be a parallel to his own vain knowledge, and would show him how pleasant it is to feed upon the cast wind. But the forfeiture of privileges and of knowledge which the pupil incurs by such a course as is described above is not the principal evil. It is not the loss of utility merely, but it is the departure from honor and honesty. Why should not the scholar who now cheats his teacher in the recitation room cheat his master in his work when he becomes an apprentice or a clerk, and cheat his customers in their utensils or their goods when he becomes a mechanic or a merchant? 
all great robbers begin by stealing small things, and the foulest assassins and murderers commence their career by inflicting petty injuries. I fear the little departures from rectitude and truth which sometimes pervade a school, or are practiced by particular members of it, are not regarded in their true light, as seminal principles or germs, which, if not eradicated, will grow up to maturity, and bear the fatal fruit of falsehoods, perjuries, and frauds. How narrow the range of a school-child's thoughts, compared with the vast compass and combinations of an adult mind! How slow the mental operations of the former, compared with the celerity with which the latter passes from premises to conclusions, and from means to ends! The child is obliged to commence his calculations with visible and tangible units, and for a long time he moves feebly and totteringly forward, constantly seeking the support of another's hand. Yet what vast and complicated schemes that same mind in its maturity will project! When we thus witness the capacity of growth and expansion with which the intellect is endowed, why should we doubt that the appetites and propensities have at least an equal power of expansion and activity? Nay, is it not conceded in every system of mental philosophy ever promulgated that the appetites and desires are endowed with an ardor and a vehemence to which the intellect is a stranger, that the passions, if unregulated and unchastened, rush to extremes infinitely more wide and more ruinous than the understanding can ever reach? Why, then, when we find the mind, which was once so feeble, now capable of concerting vast plans for wealth, for ambition, or other forms of personal aggrandizement, why should we doubt that the little tricks and prevarications of the schoolroom may grow up into fraudulent bankruptcies or stupendous peculations and embezzlements? States and empires are no more to the man than the toys of the nursery to an infant— why, then, should not corruption in politics and hypocrisy in religion grow out of the artifices and pretexts of the playground? If we would enjoy an immunity from the latter, we must suppress the former. How much easier and safer to crush the brittle egg than to kill the coiling serpent! The act of furnishing arithmetical solutions, or translations in the classics, to a fellow pupil before recitation, or of prompting him during it, is to be treated as a wrong in the giver as well as in the receiver. Yet always, or nearly so, the subject presents itself in a different light to children, and generally, I believe, even to mature minds. It is commonly regarded as an act of kindness, as a social pleasure, if not a social duty, to give to one who wants what we, without any loss, can spare." Shall a pupil who has neglected his lesson until the hour of recitation approaches be subjected to punishment when we can supply his deficiencies in ten minutes and save him from harm? Shall a friend and classmate who has suffered the time of probation to pass by unimproved, shall he be subjected to mortification, if not to rebuke or chastisement, when we, merely by a whisper in his ear, can save his feelings, his character, and perhaps his skin? Such is the aspect in which the subject presents itself to most minds, especially to the minds of school children. So, to the natural eye, the earth appears to be flat. But what do we do as soon as the child arrives at a proper age for understanding its true shape? Do we not spend the time, use apparatus, and give explanations again and again, until the natural error of the senses is corrected? Why should not as much time be spent in correcting those moral errors into which all children naturally, if not necessarily, fall? No reason can be assigned, unless it be the infinitely false one, that moral culture is less important than intellectual. The first impressions of children on this whole subject of prompting answers and of supplying solutions can easily be shown to be illusory and false— the true question goes far deeper than the scholar's appearance at the recitation. The recitation is only a means to an end. In itself it is valueless. The only question of any importance is what is the state of the pupil's mind. Does that which he writes down upon his slate or speaks with his tongue come from his understanding? 
or does it only come mechanically from his fingers or from his lips by the dictation of another, and not from his own mind? The pupil who submits himself to the ordeal of a recitation, like a witness in a court, is under a moral obligation to make true answers from his own knowledge to whatever questions may be propounded to him. And is that pupil an honest one who, under such an obligation, gives either the work or the answer of another as his own? If the deficiencies of others are to be recorded, or if there is a competition for places or medals or parts, and one pupil escapes a mark or gains a credit by indirect means, is it fair towards his fellow pupils, or doing as he would be done by? If two children collude together and agree to help each other by private signs or otherwise during the recitation, ought we to be surprised if afterwards they agree to run up stocks in the market in order to cheat innocent purchasers? Besides, where is the iniquity to stop? If one pupil may be assisted or prompted once, why may not all go to the same extent? This, however, would reduce the whole to their original equality, for if all take the liberty to cheat once, they stand in the same relative position as at first. He, therefore, who means to get a dishonest advantage over his fellows, must now cheat twice in order to gain his end, and so on indefinitely. If the grocer adulterates his sugar and his flour to the amount of ten per cent of its value, and the purchaser pays him ten per cent counterfeit coin or bills, neither is a gainer in money, and both are sufferers in morals. So it is with children who cheat each other and their teacher at the recitation. Now is not the moral spirit with which the lesson is studied and recited of as much consequence as the knowledge it confers? And if so, ought not the teacher to spend as much time on the former as on the latter? I exhort teachers and committee men to ask themselves the question whether this is done. The hour of recitation is the hour of reckoning. The place of recitation is the place for weighing and gauging the amount of acquisition made by the pupils. Emphatically, therefore, it is a place for fair dealing, for truth, for uprightness towards the teacher, and for equity between the fellow pupils. Any deception there is like the use of false balances, and the teacher should no more wink or connive at it, however anxious he may be that his school should appear well, than that he should instruct his scholars how they may use false weights and measures in their traffic with men. I think the nature of a recitation can be so unfolded and explained to all, excepting perhaps the lowest class of minds, and that the recitation itself can be so conducted as to save it from the frauds to which it now gives birth. Invested with the associations of honor and good faith, it may be made to assume something of a sacred character. I have known scholars who would not give an answer with which a prompter had supplied them, any more than they would receive stolen goods or pass counterfeit money. The inherent absurdity of one pupil's getting up a lesson for another may be made so obvious and glaring, even by a moderate degree of ability to a moderate capacity of understanding, as to excite contempt and abhorrence for it. The objects of a child's studying are usefulness, respectability, eminence, happiness. These objects are reached through the acquisition of knowledge, and through an increase of mental activity and energy. But each child's mind must grow for itself, as much as each child's body must grow for itself. I may as well be warmed by another man putting on my garments, as be improved by another man getting my lessons. If a child is idle or squanders away his time— he, in his own proper person, must suffer for it. No friend can bear the burden of his future ignorance or imbecility. One person may as well bear another's toothache, or transfer another's consumption to his own lungs. Nor does the fraud bring any profit to the defrauder. Suppose the children, instead of gathering the richer treasures of knowledge, were only gathering gold dust, which day by day should be brought to the scales— that the amount of their gains might be ascertained. Would any sluggard become richer by concealing a worthless pebble in his heap? Would not the assayer detect the fraud, and expose both it and its author? 
and would not every one who supplied, or who only assisted in supplying, this spurious substance be justly regarded as an accomplice in the guilty act? Time is the great assayer, and it will surely expose the folly and the ignorance of all those who cheat at the recitation, and impose upon the teacher the semblance of knowledge for its reality. End of section 36「Section 37 of Annual Reports to the Massachusetts Board of Education」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Annual Reports to the Massachusetts Board of Education by Horace Mann Ninth Annual Report, 1845, Part 4 I fear that too much value is ordinarily attached to the recitation. I fear that it is often regarded as an object and not as an instrument, as the goal and not as the path that leads to it. The daily routine of exercises and the examinations of the school committee may cause all the forces of the school to converge to this point. When such is the case, the pupils, especially the ambitious ones, will devote themselves to the words of their lesson rather than to its meaning. They will aim at readiness and volubility rather than at depth and discrimination. They will confine themselves within the author's train of thought instead of taking discursive views, tracing analogies, and sending the mind out to the right and left in quest of materials for confirmation or for questioning from all collateral and related topics. So, too, under such a mistaken view of the object of a recitation, the pupils will be tempted when it is over to discharge the subject from their minds, that they may make room for the next exercise. All this is delusive. It grasps at the shadow, but misses the substance. To exhibit to the teacher the state of the pupil's mind is the true object of the recitation, so that whatever is right may be fastened there securely and forever, so that deficiencies may be supplied, and so that whatever is erroneous may be rectified or obliterated before the impression is deepened beyond effacing. If the arrangements and the general spirit of the school are such as to make the pupils desire a brilliant recitation only, then they are tempted to manage adroitly to conceal their ignorance in order to escape degradation, and to gain a credit upon the teacher's books. But such a course will redound to their own discredit, and will entail enduring degradation upon the moral sense. Closely akin to the above subject is the use of keys in mathematical studies. To avoid cumbrous enumeration, I shall refer to arithmetical keys only, although the remarks on this topic will apply to algebra as well as to arithmetic, in our old arithmetical textbooks, the answers were regularly appended to the questions, each to each. The complaint of the pupil who studied the old arithmetics in the old way was, I cannot get the answer. He did not say he could not understand the principle, but the answer, as given in the book, was the thing he sought for. By observing the denomination in which it was expressed and the number of places of figures which it contained, he could conjecture the process by which it might be reached. The pupil thus made an illicit use of the answer itself as a means of obtaining it. This was obviously preposterous. The answer was the unknown quantity which was to be obtained from known data on known principles. But as soon as the answer was included among the known data, the pupil might arrive at it by repeated experiment— although each time he should proceed on unknown principles. The knowledge of the answer beforehand, therefore, became to some extent a substitute for such a knowledge of principles as would command the true answer, not only in the given case but in all analogous cases. Had it been the only object to arrive at the answer contained in the book, then any additions, subtractions, multiplications, or divisions which would secure that end would be sufficient, and the result would be equally satisfactory whether the answer contained in the book should be correct or erroneous. Now it is obvious that there is no more legitimate exercise of the power of calculation in such a procedure 
then there is true piety in those contrivances of the Japanese whereby, turning a crank, they wind off a long scroll of written prayers from one cylinder onto another. The arithmetical faculty is as little employed in the one case as the heart is in the other. To obviate this difficulty, arithmetics were prepared containing the questions only. But lest the teacher should not be able for want of time, or for some other reason, to determine the correctness or incorrectness of the answers as they should be found by the pupil, the author prepared a second book, a book for the answers as well as a book for the questions. This second book is called A Key. Both questions and answers are numbered so as to correspond. According to the theory, the key is to be used only by the teacher. It is a labor-saving instrument, designed to supersede the necessity of the teachers looking over each sum. But it being known to the scholars that there is a key, containing not only the answers, but solutions or partial solutions of the most difficult questions, a grievous temptation is presented to them to get it and use it. So far as this is done, it defeats the very object of separating the answers from the questions, and makes the increased cost of two books over one a gratuitous expense. But what is infinitely more to be deprecated than any cost or any diminution in intellectual attainment is the moral delinquency which is involved in the act of using the key clandestinely. If the use of keys be prohibited, then they must be obtained surreptitiously and examined by stealth. The key itself must be kept in some secret place where the teacher will not be likely to discover it, hence a system of frauds. The purchasing of a book, the selection of a covert place for its concealment, the stealthy step or look by which it is examined, the transfer of the answers, perhaps upon a piece of paper, to be carried privately about the person— the plans laid to satisfy or circumvent the teacher should he make any inquiry into the subject, and finally the presence of the pupil at the recitation with the questions all correctly solved, but with a lie visible to himself lying at the bottom of every solution. All this planned and consummated deception it is indeed fearful to contemplate. It is a practical training of the young heart to iniquity, each commendation obtained under such circumstances is a reward for past deception and a lure to its repetition in the future. Why should not the child who does this, and who perhaps is not reprehended for doing it, if done when the committee and visitors are present, why, when the opportunity comes, should he not overreach his neighbor in making a bargain, or put two votes into the ballot box to secure the election of his favorite candidate, or defraud the post office and the custom house. And how much is the virulence of the temptation increased when prizes are offered to the foremost pupils, when perhaps badges of honor are bestowed upon the most successful competitors, and their names are brought forward with eclat in reports, or proclaimed to the world through newspapers, while a proportionate degradation awaits the unsuccessful? and all this is made to depend upon the marks of credit or discredit received at the end of the recitations. What the world seems to regard with honor, ambitious children will of course strive to obtain. And when intellectual attainments take precedence over moral qualities, how cruelly will they be tempted to sacrifice the latter to the former? In foreign universities, where a subscription to creeds is a prerequisite to the honors and emoluments of professorships and presidencies, do we not know that men, for the sake of a conspicuous and lucrative station, will subscribe to theological dogmas and articles of church government which their souls abhor? For such bold treason against God and man they were prepared in childhood, by slight and gradually increasing deviations from truth and duty— under temptations whose force they could not be expected to resist. Is it not the worst form of sacrilege to invade the unsophisticated consciences of children with temptations to evil before which it is almost certain they will fall? For years past I have made particular inquiries of teachers and others on this subject. I have endeavored to ascertain to what extent keys are allowed or forbidden in our schools, and also whether they are used although forbidden. 
I am satisfied that a startling amount of deception is practiced, and that not a few of our children are learning those arts in school which, we have reason to fear, will be matured in after life into flagrant immorality and turpitude. In some cases it has been discovered that a class owned a single key in common which was passed round privately among them. In some, the sons of a family go to one school and the daughters to another, and although in one of the schools keys may be strictly prohibited, yet in the other they are openly allowed, or at least they are not forbidden, so that all the children have equal access to them. I believe it would be far better than that things should continue in their present condition, that all restriction on the use of keys should be removed, in which case, of course, it would be better to return to the old system of inserting the answer with the question in the textbook. But the only effectual remedy, while such helps are prepared and are accessible, is to cultivate the moral feelings of the pupils to such a high tone as will make them disdain and abhor those acts of deception by which one pupil obtains advantage over another, or by which the pupils succeed in deceiving the teacher. It is fervently to be hoped that teachers will look more carefully into this subject than they have been accustomed to do. Better that we should go back to counting on the ten fingers and remain there, than that the learners of arithmetic should imbibe the spirit by which they will hereafter make fraudulent invoices or false entries in the books of banks or of the government. It might prove a preventative to the fraudulent use of keys, and save children from some of the temptations which now spring from the use of them, if teachers would make it a frequent practice to dictate original questions from their own minds. However great the pupil's proficiency may be, a competent teacher could easily frame questions equivalent and analogous to those contained in the book, and the impossibility in such cases of getting at the answer by the use of a key would preclude the thought and prevent the desire of doing so. Is this not in consonance with the spirit of the prayer, at once so religious and so philosophical, that we may not be led into temptation? The only objection that can be made to the preparation of questions by teachers is that they may not have time to examine the solutions and decide upon their correctness, and must therefore submit to the necessity of taking questions where the answers are at hand. But surely to an accomplished teacher it can be the work of but a few moments to look over even a long demonstration and to determine whether the successive steps have been correctly taken. As to what may be regarded as the mechanical part of the solution, the addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, he has no need to trouble himself with that. He knows the nature of the question he is given. He perceives in the twinkling of an eye what the necessary steps are to arrive at a correct result, and a single glance from point to point, even in an extended process, is sufficient to show him whether the correct course or one of several correct courses has been pursued. As to the rudimental parts, he may occasionally at least set some of the younger classes to examine them. They will be able to detect errors, if any exist, in the work of the older pupils, and the older pupils, mortified at being exposed by the younger, will be incited to greater care. In advanced Prussian schools, where arithmetic was so remarkably well taught and learned, though if it were well taught, it is almost tautology to say it was well learned, instead of an octavo volume or a series of duodecimos imposing burdensome expenses upon the parents, I generally found arithmetical textbooks which did not contain more than fifty or sixty pages, mere skeletons, and yet amply sufficient for the use of the schools. Probably nineteen twentieths, if not forty-nine fiftieths, of the questions were supplied extemporaneously by the teacher from his own mind. Under such a system, no temptations to idleness and no provocations to fraud could enter in to weaken the intellect and to deprave the morals. Children should also be encouraged to frame questions for themselves, for their own working, and within certain limits to frame questions for each other. In some parts of arithmetic, such an exercise would be of great utility, as it would help them to understand more thoroughly the nature, the number, and the relation of the terms necessary to form a practical question. Preparing questions would fasten more securely in their mind the principles for their solution. 
I leave this topic with the expression of an intense desire that those who use, as well as those who prepare, mathematical textbooks will take into consideration the moral tendencies as well as the intellectual bearings of the methods they adopt and of the works they publish. If each day's addition to arithmetical knowledge is to be a subtraction from the authority of conscience, it would be better that such days should never dawn. I have sometimes found the preservation of good order in the schools, especially the prevention of whispering, attempted by means which seem to me to incur great moral and social hazards. In some schools, a pupil caught in an act of delinquency is made to take a place upon the platform or other elevated site in the classroom, and there to watch for other delinquents. When he detects any one of his schoolmates in a violation of any of the rules of the school, he is expected to announce the name of the offender and the offense. If he is not contradicted, or, although contradicted, yet if confirmed, he is absolved and returns to his seat, and the new culprit succeeds to the post and the office of sentinel. Here he is expected to remain until, in his turn, he can obtain his discharge by successfully inculpating another. Such a watchman is usually called a monitor, but his real office is that of a spy. If indolent, he may prefer this post to one which obliges him to study— he stands guard under no responsibility. If he sees one of his friends about to commit an offense, he can overlook it, or even connive at it by turning away so as to afford an opportunity for its commission. I have seen such an overseer violating, with those immediately around him, the very rules which he was stationed there to enforce. If, however, he entertains any grudge against a schoolmate, he may there find an opportunity to indulge it. I think the practice here described has injurious influences, both upon the school and upon the sentinel himself, whose only qualification to watch others consists in his own offense. It obviously tempts to concealment, which is unfaithfulness, and to partiality, which is injustice. The old proverb, set a rogue to catch a rogue, needs, even for the public safety, some additional direction by which the public may be guarded against the collusion of two rogues when they come to understand each other. At best, the proverb is founded on a low principle, and it inculcates no lesson of wisdom or benevolence in regard to the reformation of either party. Some teachers adopt the above plan, but include another element of danger in it, if the original culprit does not succeed in detecting a fellow pupil in some offense, he receives a punishment. If he discovers another, and that other a third, and so on, until the session of the school is closed, the punishment falls upon the last. Now to escape punishment by subjecting another to punishment brings into active exercise the most unkind and dissocial propensities of human nature— it makes our welfare and our immunity dependent upon another's wrongdoing. It connects our escape from suffering with another's subjection to it. It makes it for our immediate interest that an offense should be committed, and thus tempts us to rejoice at the error or misconduct of our neighbor, instead of obeying the commandment to love him as ourselves. Is this a Christian relation in which to place children in regard to each other? Suppose it had been so ordained by the Creator that one man could escape from his wounds or diseases only by touching the person of another and thus transferring them to him. How few good Samaritans would be found who would suspend the journey or the business of life that they might heal their neighbor! And would not such a law turn the world into Levites who would pass by on the other side of the way? In the end, such a law would be ruinous even to those for whose benefit it was devised, since it would make it the interest of all to inflict mutual harm. When one drowning man attempts to save himself by grasping another, the consequence almost invariably is that both go to the bottom. I trust that all teachers who, either through example or inadvertence, have been led to adopt this course whose evils are here exposed, will abandon and never resume it. Whispering is very justly and almost universally considered to be one of the greatest mischiefs that can infest a schoolroom. In small schools, consisting of very old or very young scholars, it occasions less inconvenience, but in large schools, especially if composed of scholars of all ages, 
It is a very serious annoyance, and energetic teachers usually strive to suppress it. In a room containing sixty scholars, if each should only whisper one sixtieth part of the hour, not an inordinate allowance if whispering be permitted at all, it would be sufficient to make the buzz of noise perpetual. The mischief of whispering, however, is by no means confined to the noise it makes. If one be allowed to whisper, another must be allowed to listen, and it is too much to expect that the neighbors of the parties will be indifferent hearers of what is going on around them. Sometimes, too, a plan or a joke started in one corner will be telegraphed round the room almost with the rapidity of a lighted train of gunpowder. The course of thought of the whole school will thus be interrupted, and though the act of whispering may occupy but half a minute, it may occasion the loss of several minutes to each pupil. But objectionable as is the practice of whispering in schools, some of the means used for avoiding it seem to me to be far more so. In some schools, all whispering is prohibited under sanctions more or less severe, while the teacher, conscious of his own inability to detect all the offenders, and discarding the practice by which the guilty are set to watch for the guilty, establishes another rule by which the offenders are required to report their own offenses. At the close of each day or half-day, the roll is called, and each pupil is required, when his name is announced, to confess the number of breaches, if any, which he has committed. One of the objections to this mode of prevention is that it hazards the commission of a greater offense in order to avert a lesser one. To prevent the whispering, it tempts to falsehood. Now, though whispering is mischievous, yet who, considerately, would suppress a thousand cases of it at the expense of one lie? But consider the force of the temptation— at the appointed time, the teacher calls upon the pupils to declare whether any violation of the rule has been committed by them. He calls upon them to plead guilty or not guilty. To acknowledge that they are guilty is a public avowal of wrongdoing, and if the feelings are not blunted, must incur some mortification. A penalty or forfeiture of some kind, such as noting the case in a record book, or reporting it to the parents, or at the least the teacher's disapproval, must be attached to the act, or the whole will soon degenerate into a farce. Under these circumstances the pupil is called upon to avow a breach of duty. He is to do it publicly, which involves some degree of shame. He is to do it voluntarily, which requires some moral courage. And he is to do it promptly, which demands such a vigorous impulsion of conscientiousness as belongs to comparatively few." On the other hand, by silence, or by a moment's delay, during which he may perhaps simply be debating within himself what course to take, the occasion will pass by, and immunity from outward censure be secured. Is this not a snare to conscience? Is this not leading children into temptation? Does it not, in fact, lead two persons, perhaps even more than two, into temptation? For if one pupil has whispered, he must have whispered to another— generally to a friend sitting at the same desk. For the friend, to betray the offender may wear the aspect of unkindness. Besides, to betray a fellow pupil is held, whether justly or not, according to the moral code of the college and the schoolroom, to deserve great odium. Perhaps both have offended, and therefore stand in equal need of each other's forbearance. There is one aspect belonging to the course above described which is peculiarly painful to contemplate, that of the child debating within himself, either before the commission of offense or when called upon to confess it, respecting the chances of his escape, and making the commission of the offense in the first instance or the denial of it in the second, dependent upon the balance of probabilities in favor of detection or exemption. A falser condition of the mind cannot be conceived. Probably the fiend who tempts to crime by the hope or promise of concealment outnumbers all his fellow fiends in the retinue of his victims. A wrong consciously perpetrated by the heart is neither made greater by exposure nor less by impunity. The question which conscience puts respecting a guilty act is not whether it is known or unknown, but whether it has been done and before her awful tribunal the judgment is the same, whether it is concealed by darkness and silence from the eyes and ears of all created beings, 
or whether all the stars of the firmament have arranged themselves for the revelation and condemnation of the deed into a language of everlasting and unquenchable light. Now I can conceive of a school, I have seen such schools, where the moral sense of the pupils has been so enlightened and trained that it would be safe to put a question of the kind above supposed without jeopardizing the integrity of the pupils. But how much more frequently, in the present state of our schools as to morals, would the solicitations to wrong be an overmatch for fidelity to truth, and thus begin a habit of falsehood, or confirm one already begun, which, before the end of life, by the confluence of hundreds of little streams into one deep current of corruption, would prove the ruin of the tempted. As a guardian of the morals of youth, and especially of their veracity, that central point of morals, no teacher should allow his own convenience, or his pride in the appearance of the record of his school, or his fear of incurring the displeasure of the parent of any pupil, for one moment to weigh down the scale against the perpetration, or even the imminent danger of the perpetration, of an untruth. The love of truth is a primal element in moral character. Truth is the cement of society. Without it, all friendships, partnerships, communities themselves would be dissolved. Without some degree of mutual confidence, no two men, whether virtuous or vicious, could look each other in the face for a minute. Complete distrust at all points would segregate each individual of the race from all the rest— and like an unbalanced centrifugal force, would impel each to fly away and to seek some vacant part of the universe for his solitary abode. There is a natural adaptation between the love of intellectual and the love of moral truth, to confirm and strengthen each other. One should never be set in opposition to the other. Circumstances should never be so arranged that the pursuit of an intellectual good may conflict with that of a moral one. Not antagonists, but co-laborers for the happiness of man, the teacher should unite and marry them into an inseparable union, and thus lay an imperishable foundation for the virtues and duties of life. In regard to the prevention of whispering in school, the following important questions arise, and I do not see how they can be answered in the negative. If it be practicable to train a school to such a high point of principle and of honorable feeling— that its members will promptly acknowledge the transgression of a rule, then may not the same members be so trained as not to be guilty of the transgression itself? Or, if children cannot be deterred from whispering by the reasonableness of the requisition, are they not likely to be guilty of falsehood under the pressure of so violent a temptation? And finally, does not falsehood surpass whispering as an offense too much, to allow us to secure our schools from the inconvenience of the latter by incurring serious hazard of the baseness of the former. The chances of success in preventing whispering by an exercise of vigilance on the part of the teacher will be increased or diminished by the number and ages of the scholars and by the good or ill construction of the seats in the schoolroom. The smaller the school, other things being equal, the more easy to banish this invader of its quiet. Not easier in the ratio of the diminished numbers merely, but, to express it mathematically, the case is as the square of the diminution. Any school, however, may be considered as only of a moderate or medium size, if the number of the teachers is fitly proportionate to the number of the scholars. The construction of the schoolroom bears directly upon this subject. The old-fashioned schoolhouses, with seats on three and sometimes on four sides of the schoolroom, leaving only a space on one side unoccupied by seats sufficient for a door, could not have been more ingeniously contrived to invite disobedience and trickery had the genius of deception been the architect. In such a room, one half the children, at least, were always without the range of the teacher's eye, and so within the sphere of temptation— where circumstances were so skillfully contrived to entice them into transgression, who can wonder that they so often became its victims? Even schoolhouse architecture has a palpable connection with moral culture. Various remedies have been suggested for the prevention of whispering in school, besides the extreme one of corporal punishment in any one of its forms. Occupation is one of the most effectual— 
While each scholar has employment on his own account, he has neither the time nor the inducement to trespass upon his neighbor. This is the case for two reasons. His own occupation precludes the desire of communicating with his fellow, and the occupation of his fellow will repel any approaches should he be tempted to make them. The privation of some customary privilege, such as being kept within doors at recess, is another expedient. If a single act of communication in school, occupying but half a minute, causes the forfeiture of a five-minute privilege of communication at recess, then the balance of advantage is so obviously on the side of self-restraint as to be a powerful motive for abstaining. Such a forfeiture for such an offense seems unobjectionable, but in all cases where it is inflicted, the offender should have a recess by himself at another time, for the recess is demanded by the laws of health, and the teacher's punishment should never endanger health. Recognizing the strong natural desire of all children to communicate with each other, and the inherent difficulty of repressing this inborn and powerful impulse, some teachers adopt the expedient of an intermediate recess, rather a suspension of exercises in the schoolroom for a period of five minutes at prescribed times in each half-day's session. During this suspension, pupils are allowed to rise, to walk about, and to converse, and thus to give vent to their pent-up desire for muscular action and social communication. This may be allowed twice during each half-day, once before and once after the customary recess at the middle of the session. Of course it becomes less necessary as the scholars are older. But from my own observation and experience, I am led to believe that all methods for preventing communication between scholars in school, however skillfully devised or energetically executed they may be, will prove inadequate to the intended purpose, unless they include another element, the assent and cooperation of the scholars themselves. The natural propensity to speak, the inborn social instinct to make known our thoughts and feelings to our fellow men, is so vigorous that it requires the most powerful motive of fear or interest or duty to smother them. In infancy it is as vain to command a child to stifle the expression of its desires and emotions as to command the gushing waters of a fountain to cease from their uprising. Later in life, though the inward propulsion of feeling, seeking some form of outward expression, may be regulated, yet it cannot even then be wholly suppressed. Probably no two animals of any kind were ever together for two minutes, unless asleep or profoundly absorbed in something else, without some transmission by look or sign of sympathy or aversion. With the human species, if the lips are sealed, the fingers will be made the medium of communication. If the hands are confined, the eye will become the subtle messenger of thought. But the voice is the natural sign-maker, and therefore it is through the voice that the will acts most promptly and energetically. In prisons, where the inmates work in company, but under rigorous prohibition, sanctioned by terrible penalties, against intercommunication, either by word or gesture, cases have occurred where the tortured spirit within would give vent to its natural instinct by a tremendous shriek or yell, and then submit to flagellation with patience as expiation of the offense. In this, therefore, as in all other cases, whether pertaining to the government or to the proficiency of a school, the teacher's best resources, the only allies he can enlist who will in all cases secure him the victory, are the pupils themselves. No threats, no forfeitures, no fear, no pain, though the teacher should summon these to his aid in formidable hosts, will ever expel whispering from school, unless superadded thereto is the scholar's consent. I have witnessed proofs of the truth of this assertion too numerous to be contested. In schools where authority and superior physical power were mainly relied on, I have witnessed cases of transgression even while the teacher was assuring me of the sufficiency of his own sovereign command to prevent them. But if the pupils have confidence in their teacher, if they respect his talent and his attainments, and are constantly drawn towards him by the attractions of a filial affection, their cooperation can be obtained, and that will prove all-sufficient. 
Indeed, if only every other scholar, that is, if no more than one half of the school, should unite in placing a ban upon the practice, it would be suppressed. For as a scholar will rarely, if ever, be whispered to without his own permission, it follows that if every other scholar should join the League of Abstinence, the other half would be debarred from addressing them, and thus an interdict would be placed even upon willing transgressors. It is hardly necessary to observe that under the generic term whispering, I here include all forms of illicit communication, whether carried on through the medium of the voice, the finger language, writing on paper or on a slate, marking words or letters in a book so as to make a sentence, or by any of the other ingenious devices which fear and fraud have contrived. Their object is the same, and their mischief is the same. They all train the mind to base an unmanly artifice, for which no amount of knowledge is any equivalent, artifice which only confers more formidable powers of mischief upon the highly developed intellect. Perhaps no other combination of circumstances pertaining to a school furnishes so favorable an opportunity as the one under consideration for the inculcation of self-denial and for habituating pupils to its practice. Self-denial is not so much a preeminent virtue as it is the parent of all the virtues. To be able to resist the present solicitations of passion or of appetite in consideration of a future good, to be able to postpone or forego immediate gratification in obedience to a principle of duty, to be able, in the solitude of a desert or in the darkness of midnight where no human eye can see us, when no obstacle or bar save the eternal law of right comes between the object of our unlawful desire and our enjoyment of it, to be able, under such circumstances, not only to abstain, but to feel that our resolution would be no stronger though all the universe were gathered around us in a circle of which we were the luminous center, this may be justly regarded as the acme of moral power and grandeur. How vast the distance between this moral altitude and the low region of weakness, of temptation, and of peril in which the child is born! But just in proportion to this distance are the reward and the glory of the teacher who leads the young spirit onward in its sublime ascension to the heights of virtue. The very scheme and constitution of human nature demonstrate that we have as deep an interest in any portion of futurity, hour for hour and day for day, as in the same portion of time now passing, for the simple but decisive and perfectly intelligible reason that future time is to become present time. Indeed, our personal interest preponderates in favor of that portion of time which lies beyond us, rather than in favor of that now present, because the current of our life widens and deepens as it advances, and because new capacities and sources of happiness and of misery are perpetually pouring in their confluent streams to increase the volume of our future existence, thus making that existence more desirable for enjoyment or more terrible for suffering. We know, too, that the present not only has its concomitants of weal or woe, but that it will modify and color all that is to come after it. To the eye of reason and conscience, therefore, the stages of being through which we are hereafter to pass have as close a relation to ourselves, to our identity, as those through which we are now passing. It is the eye of sense only which magnifies the near, but sees the distant in the diminished proportions of perspective— as has been strikingly illustrated in the saying that a straw placed near the eye seems as large as an oak a hundred years in the distance. But the difficulty is that with a spiritual nature perpetually existent, we have appetites and desires that demand immediate gratification. And to give plausibility to their demands, it is also true that those appetites and desires must to a certain extent be gratified, or our temporal existence would cease. The teacher, then, should put the future visibly into the scale that it may counterbalance the present. For this purpose, the connection between the present and the future must be explained. The tendency of habits, whether good or evil, to increase in velocity and momentum, the tendency of all indulged desires and thoughts to redouble their strength and their control over the will, 
The danger, therefore, of uttering a profane word or venturing upon the terrible experiment of a falsehood, of dissimulation, of envy, of unkindness, of disobedience. The competent teacher adopts this method in regard to all the studies pursued in his school. He shows the relation between what is present and visible and what is distant and unseen. Physical geography can never be learned unless the child is first led to form adequate conceptions of space, where he can assign locality to objects and give arrangement to all the facts he learns. History can never be learned unless the learner has an adequate conception of past time, of successive centuries, along whose years and decades he can distribute and arrange the events which history brings under his notice. So the duty and utility of self-denial can never be adequately enforced or appreciated unless the future be opened and the relations of passing events to the fortunes of afterlife be exhibited. Why, then, should so great a proportion of the school hours be spent upon studies and so small a proportion upon motives? Why should the reputation and the patronage of schools depend more upon what the scholars know than upon how they act? Why should the public inquire more frequently respecting the school or the college where a great man has been educated than respecting the influences under which a good man has been trained? In the vast majority of our schools throughout the length and breadth of the land, are not the laws of orthography more carefully taught than the laws of justice and equity between man and man? Is the duty of forgiveness as much insisted on as the rules of grammar? Are the elementary ideas of right and wrong as laboriously explained as the elements of arithmetic? Or are the mighty results of good and evil principles as they are evolved in society and in the affairs of government and in the intercourse of nations with each other as perseveringly expounded as are the higher combinations of arithmetical numbers? Are not errors in textbooks or even in the language of visitors sometimes brought forward with care and exposed with vanity, while obscene carvings or emblems of pollution around the premises or on the walls of the schoolroom itself are suffered to remain unmolested. These frightful inconsistencies must be terminated. Their continuance is suicide. Self-preservation as well as religion demands a change. Neglect moral and Christian culture in the schoolroom— and if the exchange is shaken by stupendous frauds, or if perjuries invade the tribunals of justice, if hypocrisy and intolerance are installed in the sanctuaries of religion, if political profligacy reigns in the council halls of the nation and sends its streams of corruption through all the channels of government, we shall reap only as we have sown. There are some schools in Massachusetts, and the number is increasing, where, without invading the conscientious rights or scruples of a single denomination, social and Christian principles have been so wisely acted on by the teacher, have been so clearly and convincingly brought down and brought home to the minds of the pupils, that not only whispering but other sources of disorder and misconduct have been almost entirely banished from the schoolroom. Cases have occurred where, voluntarily, without any solicitation, the older and more influential scholars have signed a pledge obligating themselves to abstain from particular school offenses and to use their influence to induce others to practice the like abstinence. How high the point of self-respect and of principle which the pupils have reached when such a measure emanates spontaneously from them! How greatly is the power of acquisition promoted when the power of self-control is enthroned in the breast! and how far-reaching and decisive in its influences upon after-life is a successful resolution in childhood to seek counsel of duty and to abide by its decisions. Blessed is the fortune of those children who are led by wise and benignant hands to some moral eminence where they can survey the path that will conduct them to happiness, and are inspired with the motives which will prompt them to pursue it. Note as a specimen of the utter oblivion into which a love of intellectual acuteness and skill may throw the moral relations of a subject, I quote the following question from a modern arithmetic. A sea captain on a voyage had a crew of thirty men, half of whom were blacks. 
Being becalmed on the passage for a long time, their provisions began to fail, and the captain became satisfied that unless the number of men was greatly diminished, all would perish of hunger before they reached any friendly port. He therefore proposed to the sailors that they should stand in a row on deck, and that every ninth man should be thrown overboard until one half of the crew were thus destroyed. To this they all agreed. How should they stand so as to save the whites? Doubtless this question was prepared by the author and has been laboriously studied by thousands of pupils, without any distinct contemplation of the fiendish injustice and fraud which it involves, but only with admiration for the ingenuity with which it originated and for the talent that can solve the problem. Yet the idea which the question has lodged in the mind may become the parent of a fraud as base, if not as appalling, as its prototype. End note. The vice of truant ship is to be regarded under the same moral aspects. The truant, it is true, loses privileges which can never be recovered, because no revolution of the wheel of time ever brings back an hour that has been wasted. By foregoing his opportunity of acquiring knowledge, the truant forfeits at least a portion of his chances for future usefulness and success in life, and he also forfeits those enduring satisfactions which are the rewards of intellectual culture. Loitering by the wayside but for a single day, or deviating into illicit paths for but a single hour, he allows those who were behind him to pass by, and to seize upon the advantages or the honors which, by the use of diligence, he might rightfully have made his own. He enrolls himself with the most wasteful of all prodigals, those who are prodigal of time. But the positive good which is lost is trifling compared with the positive evil which is incurred. Every act of truantship is a twofold falsehood. It is a falsehood committed against the parent who sends, and against the teacher who expects. Worse than either of these, it is a violation of the culprit's own sense of duty. To waste the seed time, and to consume the seed from which a rich harvest might be reaped, does but condemn the fields of afterlife to barrenness. But the pretense, the equivocation, the deceit, and occasionally the outright lie, and what is worst of all, the perpetual holding of the mind in an actively lying state, that is, in a state ready to lie, these thickly strew those tares of vice over the fields of youth whose harvest will be ruin. It is not, then, the squandering of school privilege which gives to this offense its most malignant type. It is not the loss of money expended for books or for tuition. It is not the indignity offered to the teacher. It is the positive wrong self-inflicted upon the pupil's own moral nature. It is that struggle between his own illicit desires and his sense of duty in which the former are victorious. It is the stratagem and the putting of the mind into a frame to invent stratagems, in order to secure impunity or to avoid suspicion. It is this inward training of the soul to the contemplation and devices of iniquity, which gives to the evil its magnitude and frightfulness. But is it so regarded by those parents who never visit the school from the beginning to the end of the term, in order to examine the teacher's register or to learn by personal inquiry whether their children have been delinquent? Is it so regarded by any teacher who records absences half day after half day without ever visiting the parents to know whether the absence was necessary or fraudulent? Is it so regarded either by parents or teachers who, when the offense is detected, inflict chastisement upon the offender as the penalty of his misconduct, but take no other measure to reach the secret workings of his mind, and there to rectify the springs of action themselves. In rural districts where the population is sparse, cases of truantship are rare occurrences. In cities and larger towns, especially in manufacturing villages, the offense is not infrequent. Various devices are resorted to for its successful commission— in most schools, no written excuse for absence or tardiness is required, and therefore a truant has only to fabricate some excuse for being late or absent, and the teacher too often dismisses the subject without further inquiry. When written excuses are required, parents often give one without a date, which the pupil will keep as long as he dares, perhaps for several days, and then present it. 
Sometimes a child is necessarily detained at home for half an hour after the commencement of school, and having obtained an excuse for this from his parent, without any specification as to time, he plays truant for the greater part of the session, and then goes in and presents it. Or the parent sends written word that he wishes his child to return home before school is done, without specifying how long before, and an hour or two of playtime is gained by obtaining dismissal too early. Instances have occurred where a child has had the wickedness to forge an excuse and present it as genuine. But if a child will forge his father's name to an excuse in order to get an hour of play, ought we to be surprised if the same child, when grown to manhood, should commit the crime of forgery to obtain the means of a criminal indulgence? Is it a vain apprehension that a child, thus false to his own interests and to the claims of duty, will be false to all the interests and duties which may afterwards be committed to his keeping? If we think we foresee, in the remarkable answers of a schoolboy, remarkable only because so little is expected at so early an age, proofs of the power and splendor which shall aggrandize and adorn the future man— why may we not also foresee, in these juvenile offenses which are so lightly passed over, proofs of those enormous misdeeds which afterwards shall bring distress upon a family, a community, or a country? With pleasure it is admitted that there are cases of reformation, cases where the evil that was betokened by a youth of error is averted by repentance and followed by a life of uprightness. On the other hand, also, it must be conceded, that there are instances where all the hopes that were cherished by a childhood of innocence have been blasted by a manhood of profligacy. But on both sides these cases are exceptions to the general rule, and they are no further to be recognized as grounds of action than as they admonish us never to sink into the inaction of overconfidence in regard to the good, nor into the hopelessness of despair in regard to the bad. A venerable clergyman belonging to this state, always watchful of the condition of youth and regarding the conduct of the child as foretokening the character of the man, has informed me that he taught school for many years in the town where he was afterwards settled as a minister, that it was his practice while in school to keep a detailed record of the diligence, proficiency, and moral deportment of his pupils, which record he has preserved, and now, upon recurring to this school diary, he finds, with but few exceptions, that it would answer very well as an index or table of contents for the acted volume of their subsequent lives. There is one vice, indeed, or rather a prolific parent of all vices, which disturbs this great law of probabilities, and often falsifies the indications given by an exemplary youth of an honorable old age. It is the vice of intemperance. This vice is a horrid alchemy which transmutes everything good into evil, and not merely changing affinities, but corrupting the very elements on which it works, renders it impossible ever afterwards to restore them to their pristine strength and purity. It is the theological opposite of regeneration, for it depraves depravity itself. In the new register book which has been prepared by the board, and which will be in the schools the ensuing summer term, provision is made for the entry of each pupil's name. If the teacher performs his duty in keeping the register, as it is to be presumed he will, then every parent upon visiting the school can learn by mere inspection whether his child is charged on the book with more cases of tardiness or absence than the parent has authorized, and by a vigilant use of this check the vice of truantship may be generally extirpated. End of section 37. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 38 of Annual Reports to the Massachusetts Board of Education. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ninth Annual Report, 1845, Part 5. The question, By what motives shall children be incited to study? opens a vast and most interesting field of inquiry. That the human mind was pre-adapted by its benevolent creator for the acquisition of knowledge and the exercise of reason is not merely an inference drawn from the wisdom and goodness of God, 
but it is ocularly demonstrated by the constitution of our nature. It is not merely what we should expect, but what we actually see. Before the human lungs are brought into the world, how admirably are they prepared for the air that is to surround and to fill them? Not only are the lungs tubular and vesicular, in the highest degree, for the reception of the air, but the air has a property which the blood must imbibe, or it would perish in five minutes. And further, the blood has a property which it must cast out through the lungs into the air, or again it would perish in five minutes from another cause. What need has the unborn child of that exquisite mechanism the eye, of the iris invested with power to enlarge or diminish itself by a spontaneous movement, of its crystalline lens, and of its different humors, to cause the rays of light to converge, of the finely wrought network of the retina, spread at the true focal distance over its interior surface, of the wonderful nerve that lies behind it, holding mysterious communication with the secret chambers of the brain, and of the solid masonry of bones which is built up as a wall of protection around it. This marvelous contrivance is prepared in reference to the sun, an object almost a hundred millions of miles distant from it. It is prepared in reference to sidereal systems lying at incomputable distances from our system, and he who in the beginning created the greater and lesser lights of the firmament, and who now selects and arranges the subtlest particles of matter for the formation of the human eye, established of old the relations between them, and pre-adapted their powers and their properties to each other. How curiously has the Creator fashioned the mechanism of the ear! He has planted it so deeply and securely within the protecting walls of the cranium, that it needs no bars or portals to defend it from external encroachments. He has made it to stand forever open, by night as well as by day, and whether sleeping or waking, so that there is scarcely a natural agent of harm that can approach us without warning us of its coming. With what a delicate equilibrium is its tympanum balanced, vibrating at the buzz of an insect's wing or at the tread of an insect's foot, yet able to bear uninjured the ocean's roar or the thunder's crash. And it is made to delight in all the variety of sweet sounds that lie between those far distant extremes. And so of all the other senses. Is it not intuitively obvious that they were designed to bring us into communication and relationship with the infinitely varied objects of the world around us, with the food and drinks which nourish and sustain us, with the solid substances that shelter and the textile ones that clothe us, with the various races of animals over which dominion has been given us, with the dry land which abideth in its place, and with the waters which make their perpetual circuit, from the mountains and hills into the rivers, from the rivers into the sea, from the sea into the clouds, and from the clouds to the mountains and hills and rivers again. Nor is utility the only purpose of these beautiful relations which exist between ourselves and the external world. The goodness of God is as pervading as his power, and hence he has everywhere intermingled pleasure with advantage. Golden threads are thickly interspersed in every web which nature has woven. How conspicuous is this truth in regard to the property of color! Most of the other properties of matter seem to have a primary reference to utility, the inflexibility of stone and the elasticity of steel, the combustibility of wood, and the relative incombustibility of the metals, the hardness of flint and the softness of wool and silk, seem primarily designed for use rather than for pleasure, and so of innumerable other objects. But what profit can the cold utilitarian extort from all the variegation and changeful beauties of color? The rainbow, the orient sun, the evening clouds, the plumage of birds, the flower-strewn fields, the hues of the blossoming spring and of the foliage of autumn, joyful in its death. These add no gold to his coffers, nor acres to his lands, nor fruit to his garners. Yet this beautiful property of matter is spread upon the surface of all things, as if to attract our attention to them, and to win our regard for them, 
not only before but after the age of reflection, and no other property is at once so universal and so varied as this. In almost every instance the gracious author of this property of matter, and of our capacity to perceive it, has made it pleasurable, and probably no child ever consciously looked even for the thousandth time upon the moon, or a sun-illumined cloud, or a stream or lake, without an emotion of joy. Such is the relation which our senses bear to the external universe. And in the second place, the faculties by which we reason stand in the same relation to the perceptive powers and to the images or notions of things which they collect, as the perceptive powers themselves do to the objects of the external world. Through the senses we collect notions, more or less accurately or extensively, of the boundless variety of things that constitute the world around us, of all that is great or small, high or low, solid or fluid, cold or hot, moving or motionless, odorous or inodorous, savory or vapid, hard or soft, loud or low, and so forth. But all this knowledge of properties would be of no more service to us than to the beasts of the field or the fowls of the air, did not the illuminating reason preside over them, discerning the relations between them, disentangling consequences by referring each effect to its cause, and out of new arrangements and combinations, educing new uses to increase the physical comforts and the spiritual elevation of mankind. It is only by the safer light of reason, indeed, that we rectify the mistakes into which the senses would inevitably and constantly lead us. To the senses, the earth and sun are flat. Reason declares them to be spheres. If we ask the senses, they affirm that the earth is thousands of times larger than the sun. If we consult the reason, we are assured that the sun would contain within its circumference more than thirteen hundred thousand globes, each as large as the earth. The senses declare that the earth is stationary, and that the sun revolves around it every day. But reason gives stability to the sun, and a diurnal revolution to the earth. So, from the beginning of life, reason rectifies the errors of the senses, and without its aid we should be in a world of illusions, each one leading us astray. Reason also teaches us to discover those things which are too remote or too minute for the senses ever to reach, the magnificent bodies and distances of astronomy, and the imperceptibly minute atoms and motions of chemistry. Who, then, let me again ask, can doubt that the great author of our reason designed that it should be used, and that it should be developed and cultivated in order to be used. As the senses were created to receive images or perceptions of things belonging to the external world, so the reason was created to work upon those images or perceptions once received, to correct and modify and assort them, to discover the insensible qualities they possess, and to penetrate to the very laws they obey. Hence it is obvious, from our very constitution, that the deity meant that the science of optics should be understood, as much as that the sensation of light should be felt, that the atmosphere should be analyzed into its different ingredients, and the properties of each ingredient determined, as much as that the atmosphere itself should be breathed, and that the laws of life and health should be discovered, as much as that we should desire to live." And in all these exercises of the reason upon the crude materials of knowledge, not less than in the acquisition of knowledge itself, there is pleasure. Nature has not constituted this portion of the mind upon the principles of utility alone, but upon the principles of utility and pleasure combined. How intensely have all the great intellectual luminaries of the world loved the sciences in which they labored, and who has ever understandingly surveyed any part of the creation of God without being thrilled with delight? Is not the course of nature, then, which is a lesson given by the Creator Himself, full of instruction and wisdom in regard to the school motives which should be brought to bear upon children? First, in order to win attention, the objects of knowledge should be made attractive— as nature, by bestowing upon her objects the pleasing qualities of form and color and motion and sound, makes them attractive. 
As the powers of perception precede the powers of reasoning in the order of development, the sensible qualities of things should first be presented to the learner. Afterwards, and when the reasoning powers are developed, the profounder relations that exist between the things and the laws by which they are governed should be unfolded to the reason in the same manner in which the sensible properties had been exhibited to the senses. In this clear light of nature, too, we see where language should come in. Words are but the signs of things, not only useless but burdensome and pernicious without the knowledge of the things themselves. For all mankind the course of nature is things and then their names. For a year, and not infrequently for two years after a child's birth, the deity forbids to it, withholds from it, the use of language— at that period of life, so cumbrous and uncertain an instrument as language would confuse and bewilder the mind, and divert it from the perception of qualities to signs. Yet during that time, how much does a child learn respecting the properties and distances and relative positions of the objects about him? What more stupendous folly, then, can be conceived than to teach children to read without seeing that they understand what they read? to teach them the pauses and cadences and emphases which are designed to aid the intellect, and the modulation and tones which are expressive of the passions, while they themselves receive but little more conscious intelligence or emotion from the lesson than do the benches on which they sit. Still worse it is, if coarse and harsh appliances are used as substitutes for those true and genuine sources of interest which are thus withheld. But notwithstanding this original adaptation of the faculties for acquiring and using knowledge, it must be conceded that there are cases in actual life where the natural tendency of the mind to become acquainted with the things around it has been marred and sometimes almost obliterated. As the stomach, with its instinctive longing for healthful food, may be so abused as to loathe the most appropriate nourishment— so the mind, with its inborn love of knowledge, which seems to be not merely an attraction for knowledge but a repulsion from ignorance, may be so abused as to look with disgust at what it should have longed for, and this is not unfrequently done, by parental ignorance or perversity, before the child passes into the hands of the professional teacher. In such a case the teacher may appear to do a vast deal more by stimulating the verbal memory of the child, and by giving him the show instead of the substance of knowledge, than if he should strive to reanimate the apparently dead powers of acquisition and thought. Yet the latter should be done, at whatever seeming delay, and the faithful teacher will do it, irrespective of the consequences to his own reputation. It is only the unfaithful teacher who will adopt the course which will make the child appear the best at the end of the term— irrespective of his permanent welfare. It was the opinion of Pestalozzi, that wisest of schoolmasters, that the children's want of interest in their studies in his day was almost universally referable to a want of skill in those who had charge of them. There is scarcely any circumstances, he says, in which a want of application in children does not proceed from a want of interest— and there are perhaps none under which a want of interest does not originate in the mode of treatment adopted by the teacher. I would go so far as to lay it down as a rule, that whenever children are inattentive and apparently take no interest in a lesson, the teacher should always first look to himself for the reason. Undoubtedly, in expressing this opinion, Pestalozzi must have referred to permanent teachers only— and not to such as keep the same school only for a few weeks or for a single term. And in many cases, certainly, the parents as well as the teacher should be included in this stricture. Yet if any person had a right to say this, it was Pestalozzi. For however stubborn or stupid children had ever been found to be under other masters, they became docile and improving under him." but every teacher cannot become what Pestalozzi was with his extraordinary natural endowments and with his life of experience, any more than every man can become what Lord Bacon or Sir Isaac Newton or Dr. Franklin was. What, then, shall be done by such teachers as we have and are glad to employ? Shall they not, as far as possible, imitate him 
and by pursuing similar means approximate to the same results? Shall they not, as he did, determine what they will not do as well as what they will do? The motive of fear, says he, should not be made a stimulus to exertion. It will destroy interest, and it will speedily create disgust. The interest in study is the first thing which a teacher should endeavor to excite and keep alive. And again, speaking of that class of children who are subjected to mere mechanical training, and who therefore need some collateral stimulus to spur them to study, he says, The common motive by which such a system acts on those whose indolence it has conquered is fear. The very highest to which it can aspire, in those whose sensibility is excited, is ambition. It is obvious, he continues, that such a system can calculate only on the lower selfishness of man. To that least amiable or estimable part of the human character, it is, and always has been, indebted for its best success. Upon the better feelings of man, it turns a deaf ear. How is it, then, that motives leading to a course of action which is looked upon as mean and despicable, or, at best, as doubtful when it occurs in life, how is it that motives of that description are thought honorable in education? Why should that bias be given to the mind in a school, which, to gain the respect or the affection of others, an individual must first of all strive to unlearn, a bias to which every candid mind is a stranger? I do not wish to speak harshly of ambition, or to reject it altogether as a motive. There is, to be sure, a noble ambition— dignified by its object and distinguished by a deep and transcendent interest in that object. But if we consider the sort of ambition commonly proposed to the schoolboy, if we analyze what stuff tis made of and whereof it is born, we shall find that it has nothing to do with the interest taken in the object of study, that such an interest frequently does not exist, and that, owing to its being blended with that vilest and meanest of motives, with fear, it is by no means raised by the wish to give pleasure to those who propose it. For a teacher who proceeds on a system in which fear and ambition are the principal agents must give up his claim to the esteem or affection of his pupils. Motives like fear or inordinate ambition may stimulate to exertion, intellectual or physical, but they cannot warm the heart. There is not in them that life which makes the heart of youth heave with the delight of knowledge, with the honest consciousness of talent, with the honorable wish for distinction, with the kindly glow of genuine feeling. Such motives are inadequate in their source and inefficient in their application, for they are nothing to the heart, and out of the heart are the issues of life. In remarking upon school motives, the use of emulation as an incentive to study cannot be overlooked, and yet I mean to abstain on this occasion from touching upon the debatable ground which it covers. To discuss that subject fully would require not a paragraph merely, but a treatise. In regard to the general question, the expediency of a system of means to excite emulation between scholars, there are distinguished advocates on both sides— but it will be my endeavor at the present time only to elucidate some points respecting which there is, so far as I know, an entire unanimity of abstract opinion, although with no inconsiderable diversity in practice. May we not expect the assent of all intelligent men to the doctrine that it is the teacher's duty to effect the greatest general proficiency of his pupils? It is not the remarkable progress of a few scholars, while the others remain in a stationary condition, or are even retrograding, that is desirable or allowable. The spirit of all our institutions coincides herein with the spirit of humanity and religion, all enforcing the duty of succoring the destitute, of instructing the ignorant, of elevating the lowly. As it would be a violation of the soundest principles of political economy to make the rich richer and the poor poorer, so it would transgress the plainest dictates of republican duty and Christian ethics to give knowledge to the learned at the expense of suffering the ignorant to remain in their ignorance. To present this idea with arithmetical precision, let us suppose that in a class of twenty children in one school, the improvement of ten of them 
shall be equal to five each, or fifty in all, and that the other ten shall be nothing, so that fifty shall represent the improvement of the whole class. In another school, suppose a class of the same number, but an improvement of two and a half for each of the whole. As in the former case, fifty will be the product. Yet who will not acknowledge that the greatest good has been accomplished in the latter instance? Who will deny that the teacher in the latter case has accomplished a far nobler object than in the former? When schools are very large, and it is the custom of the committee to examine only the first class, or perhaps only a part of the first class, the temptation to carry forward those who are to be examined, even at the expense of neglecting the residue, is peculiarly strong, and it needs all the guards of an active conscience in the teacher and a vigilant superintendence in the committee to prevent it. As a spur to emulation, it is not an unfrequent practice to make a record at the end of each recitation of the number of mistakes which each scholar may have made. In the great majority of instances, so far as I have witnessed, this record is made without any reference to the quality of the mistake committed. Yet can anything be more unjust than to recognize no difference between a mistake in fact and a mistake in principle? In arithmetic, for instance, one scholar, with his mind intently fixed upon the principle according to which his problem is to be wrought, makes a mistake in the subtracting or dividing, and fails, therefore, of arriving at the true answer. Another, regardless of principle, performs the mechanical part of his work correctly, but proceeds upon such an erroneous hypothesis as will ensure error in every question which comes under the same heading or rule. In geography, one makes a mistake of a few hundreds in the census of a great city. Another does not perceive that there is any connection between the great slopes of a continent and the courses of its rivers. In history, one has forgotten the date of an unimportant event. Another makes General Washington a Frenchman. Yet in these cases, or such as these, the mistakes are all reckoned numerically, no difference being made between a mistake which a wise man might have committed and one which stigmatizes its author as a dunce. To estimate the demerit of mistakes by sheer number, instead of quality, is as rude a way as it would be in the transactions of the bank or marketplace to receive and pay all the various coins of our common currency by tail instead of weight and fineness. Again, will it not be conceded by all that the degree of emulation is excessive when it induces scholars to study for recitation rather than for knowledge? The difference between the two modes is great, and it diffuses its consequences over all the future life. To learn, for the purpose of repeating or reciting what is learned at the end of an hour or a few hours, supposes a state of mind entirely different from that which is necessary in order to learn the same thing with a view of treasuring it up in the mind to be remembered forever. The mind approaches, surveys, and grasps the subject in these two cases by modes that are wholly unlike. If a thing is to be remembered only for an hour, there are many auxiliary helps, which are useless and even pernicious if the object be to ensure its retention for life. The order in which the lesson stands upon the pages of the textbook, the sequence of the paragraphs or sections, the accident of a principle being stated at the top or bottom of a page, on its right or its left hand, the fact that a place in the lesson has been rendered conspicuous to the eye by a proper name or a date, all these and many other accidental associations may be temporary helps, although they are permanent obstructions. They are like the tricks and devices of those professors of mnemonics, who in ten lessons will teach their classes the greatest quantity of things— which, however, are like records made upon the beach, whence the tide has receded to be washed away by the refluent wave. The pupil who studies for recitation merely is tempted all the while to use the artificial memory. The pupil who studies for knowledge will use the philosophic memory only. Knowledge acquired by the artificial method remains only while the arbitrary associations on which it was founded remain. But knowledge acquired by perception of the philosophic relations, being inwrought into the very structure and constitution of the mind, will be perpetuated, 
until the happening of such a catastrophe as shall shatter to pieces the mind itself, and even then it will still be seen shining among the fragments. Who ever heard of a great philosopher or jurist or mathematician, a Franklin, a Marshall, or a Bowditch, whose vast sequences of thought were linked together only by a brittle chain of an artificial memory? Among the graduates of those institutions of learning where emulation is one of the main incentives to study, is it the general rule that the scholars who obtain the highest honors of their class achieve a corresponding rank in society? On the other hand, is it not a fact that the exceptions to the contrary rule hardly amount to a respectable number? Not only is the state of the mind different while studying and while reciting, if the only and main object be to make a brilliant recitation, but there is a still greater difference after the recitation than before it. If superior rank at recitation be the object, then as soon as that superiority is obtained, the spring of desire and of effort for that occasion relaxes. The pupil knows that the record perfect is set against his name. It will stand, whatever fading out of the lesson there may be from his mind. He dismisses, therefore, all thought of the last lesson, and concentrates his energies upon the next, and this becomes his history from day to day. Instead of spending an extra hour or half hour in collateral reading for the purpose of fortifying and expanding on the views contained in the textbook, he spends it increasing the volubility or polishing the style of his recitation. But to the pupil who studies for the sake of understanding and retaining the subject matter of the lesson, the recitation is only one of the early stages in the progress of his investigations. As he goes abroad and views the works of nature and of art, he revives and applies the principles he has learned, until they become so familiar that they rise spontaneously in the mind on every related occasion. If he reads anything in a book or a newspaper— or hears anything in conversation involving the same principles or explicable by them, the principles become consciously present to his reflection, until frequent repetition, seconded by the ready welcome they always receive, domiciliates them in his mind and enfranchises them as members of the household of his thought. The spirit of the above remarks applies to all cases of studying for review as well as to studying for recitation, now, that I may avoid on this occasion all points of controversy in regard to the use of emulation in schools, I desire only to commend the following rule of practice to teachers. If they perceive that the use of emulation as a motive power tends to increase the bulk and showiness of acquisition rather than to improve its quality, if it leads pupils to cultivate a memory for words rather than an understanding of things, and if it be found that the knowledge acquired through its instrumentality is short-lived because it has been acquired for the temporary purpose of the recitation or examination, rather than for usefulness in afterlife, if teachers find all or any of these mischiefs resulting from the use of such a motive, they should restrict it within such limits as will effectually avoid them. But the most serious objection which can be urged against this agency is of a moral character— I suppose no one will deny that emulation may be plied to such a degree of intensity as to incur moral hazards and delinquencies. Addressing each teacher on his own ground, whatever that may be, I would, with deference, submit to him the following considerations. If the object of a pupil be to learn, if he compares himself with himself, which may be called self-emulation, and asks whether he knows more today than he did yesterday, or has acquired more during the current term or year than he did during the corresponding part of the last term or year, if he has some elevated object before him which he desires to reach, and rejoices in his progress towards it, all of this seems to be not only lawful but laudable. But if the pupil rejoices not because he has acquired so much knowledge, but because in acquiring so much he has excelled over another, and therefore would have grieved, even though he had made still greater acquisitions than he has, if another had surpassed him, if he indulges a feeling of exultation, not because he has shown, but because he has outshone a rival, 
if he yields to the temptation of disparaging a competitor, whom he would not have disparaged but for the competition, and is not as prompt to defend or justify him as though the rivalship did not exist between them, if he enjoys his own triumph with a keener zest because of the mortification of a fellow aspirant, in all and in each of these cases I suppose it will be admitted by every one that the law of Christian and even of heathen morality is violated. Bishop Butler defines emulation to be the desire and hope of equality with or superiority over others with whom we compare ourselves. And he then adds, to desire the attainment of this equality or superiority by the particular means of others being brought down to our own level or below it, is, I think, the distinct notion of envy. Abstaining, then, from all discussion of the general question, I would still say that wherever teachers perceive the above described consequences, or any of them, to be produced by emulation, they should be admonished that it has gone too far. It is obvious that the question respecting the propriety or the impropriety, the justifiableness or the unjustifiableness of using emulation as an incentive to intellectual progress, will be decided in different ways by different persons, according to the relative rank which they respectively assign to mental as distinguished from moral qualities. Whether talent should be admired above virtue or virtue above talent, the weaker affection will be sacrificed to the stronger, just as certainly as a parent whose bark is in danger of sinking will throw his treasures overboard to save his firstborn if the firstborn be nearer to his heart than his treasures. So, if a teacher desires that his pupil should be a great man rather than a good one, or that he should acquire wealth rather than esteem, or that he should master the Latin and Greek languages rather than rule his own spirit, or attain to high official preferment rather than love the Lord his God with all his heart and his neighbor as himself, then he will goad him on by the deep-driven spur of emulation or any other motive until he outstrips his fellows at whatever peril to his moral nature. But if, on the other hand, the teacher esteems the greatness of humility above the greatness of ambition, if he prefers mediocrity or even obscurity with uprightness and independence of soul to princely fortune or regal power without them, if, in fine, he would see his pupil dispensing blessings among the lowliest walks of life rather than blazing athwart the sky with a useless splendor, then he will forego the brilliant recitation, the talented essay, the annual prize, the college honor, rather than win them by any incentive which would jeopardize honor, veracity, or benevolence. But while there is such a practical diversity of opinion in regard to what constitutes the highest destination of our nature, even in a worldly point of view, we cannot expect a general concurrence of opinion as to the influences under which youthful character should be formed. Those who are intent upon ends which are so different can hardly agree as to means— a discussion, however, of these unsettled questions, in a spirit of kindness and candor, may lead to a convergence, if not a coincidence, of opinion. End of section 38. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 39 of Annual Reports to the Massachusetts Board of Education. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ninth Annual Report, 1845, Part 6 Having spoken of the temptations that encompass our children in regard both to the manner and the motive of their studies and recitations, I wish to add a few remarks in regard to the final examinations of the schools. From the moment when school is opened, it ought to be understood that each day is equally a day of preparation for the closing visit of the committee. It ought to be understood that every absence and every tardiness, every instance of idleness and of inattention, is so much of time and of effort withdrawn from that preparation. At all times, by every means, in every form, the expectation is to be extinguished, the idea is to be annihilated, that special preparation as the school draws towards its close, on a few pages or a few lessons, 
can atone for or conceal any want of studiousness or regularity as the term advances. Every pupil should be made clearly to see and deeply to feel that his fortune is in his own hands, that the responsibility of his future appearance rests upon himself, that no arts or devices are to be made use of either to conceal his ignorance or to display his knowledge, that his mind will be submitted for inspection not on its bright side only, but on all sides, and that it will be useless for him to expect to shine on that occasion with only a radiant beam of light thrown across it here and there, while wide intervals of darkness lie between. Above all, will the teacher who wishes to keep the moral character of his scholars pure and stainless beware of encouraging or tolerating any imposition upon the committee? He will not turn the last few days of school into a season of rehearsal for the examination. He will not indicate lessons or pages or questions that are to be specially conned for the occasion. To be guilty of any such artifice, with a view to make the school appear better than it is, is to corrupt the minds of his pupils. To the conscientious teacher, the formation of such a conspiracy, whether tacit or express, between himself and his pupils, will be the abominable thing which his soul hateth. It is true that strong temptation may be set a teacher, and solicit him to deviate from the course of rectitude by an unfair preparation of his school. All laudable and honorable motives unite with the dictates of self-interest to make him desire the approval of the committee and of his employers generally, and, what is more, such fraudulent preparations have not been uncommon in former times, so precedent can be pleaded for them. It is well known that a few years ago some teachers used to cast the parts among their scholars as much as they were ever cast in a play. The scholars committed those portions assigned to them to memory. The committee and parents attended, and listened with apparent delight to recitations which proceeded with such volubility, the answers often given before the questions were put. And when the day was over, all parties, teacher, committee, parents, and children— congratulated each other upon the success and brilliancy of the farce. Were such a course so common as to be understood to mean nothing, much of its mischief would be taken away. But at the present day it is not so. Universally, an examination is now understood to be an assaying of the value of the school. All, therefore, who are now guilty of any counterfeiting of the image and superscription of knowledge— like other counterfeiters, conceal it if they can. Hence, any one who ventures upon such a course now is a teacher of evil and not of good. Standing before his charges in the sacred character of a moral guide, he guides to immorality. Considering the immaturity of the children and the deference with which they naturally look up to him, he is not so much the accomplice in a fraud as the originator and instigator of it. By presenting the alluring side of wrong to unsophisticated minds, he creates, rather than connives at, its commission. And by one such practical example, he neutralizes a volume of formal moralizing. Few things in a teacher's conduct furnish a more fair or more certain test of the question whether he has a lively and sensitive conscience, or has no standard of duty higher than the mere conventional rules and observances. It is in the power of the school committee to uphold and to perpetuate this loss to the minds and this demoralization of the hearts of the pupils, or at once and utterly to annul it. If, when visiting the school for the first time, they announce that they shall themselves conduct the closing examination, that however much or however little ground the classes may undertake to cultivate, they will be liable to be taken to any part of that ground— to show in what condition they have left it, and that they will be examined on the subject rather than on the book. If this be done, the pupils will study throughout the whole term, with a very different object in their minds from what they would otherwise do. They will perceive at once that if they devote special attention to a few lessons, or a few sections, to the neglect of the rest, the neglected portions may be the very ones on which they will be questioned, and that the probability of their being taken up on a less prepared part will be in the ratio of the extent of that part. Such a course, too, will furnish a teacher with one of the most palpable arguments in favor of the steady and persevering application of his pupils. 
At the examination, everything as far as possible should be rescued from the dominion of chance. No pupil should feel that he can escape by what is called good luck, or suffer by bad luck. Hence, examinations by written or printed questions are better than by oral, for in such a case the question can be put to all, and a comparison of all the different answers will be an impartial test of relative attainments. In arithmetic, the identical questions contained in the textbook should not be put, but equivalent ones. As grammar pertains to language, there is a special propriety in requiring answers to be given in writing, in order to determine whether a pupil who can parse glibly and cite all the rules can write any better English than one who has never opened a grammatical textbook. When proficiency in handwriting is made one of the tests or titles for deserving rank or rewards, it is alleged that some children begin their copybooks by writing a few pages in a style inferior to their actual ability for the dishonest purpose of appearing to have made more improvement during the term than they really have done. To prevent this, some committees have adopted the expedient of providing themselves with one or more specimen books for each school, in which all the writers are required to write at the end of the term. This specimen is then compared with the specimen of the preceding year, and the real progress of the writer is determined by the comparison. In this case, no inferior specimen can be prepared as a foil to set off against its fellow. In deprecating the devices and stratagems of the pupils against their teacher, we should be no less earnest in deprecating all devices and stratagems of the teacher against the pupil. There should be no arts to entrap on his side, any more than arts to evade on theirs. He should practice the utmost vigilance, but vigilance is as opposite to circumvention as a friendly visit to ask for an explanation is to eavesdropping. Let the teacher, then, never descend to sly watchings or insidious questionings, but let his countenance, his manner, and his language bespeak frankness in himself and confidence in his pupils. The atmosphere between him and them should be sunny and genial, unclouded by suspicion and unchilled by distrust. Were it always sunlight, there would be no thievish owls nor felon foxes. As like begets like— Confidence or unworthy suspicion in the teacher will beget confidence or unworthy suspicion in the school. It is sometimes tauntingly asked by the opponents of our common school system why this boasted institution does not yield more abundant harvests of virtue, why the young men and the young women who come from our public schools are not nobler specimens of whatever is pure in feeling and exemplary in conduct, I feel no disposition to retort upon such sinister inquirers by asking the question what they themselves have ever done to elevate these schools to a condition from which purer influences might be expected to flow. But another inquiry will answer their inquiry, and dispel the ominous doubtings which it suggests. Let this startling question then be first answered. What is the relative amount of time and attention devoted to the moral culture of our children in school as compared with that which is devoted to the intellect? Follow the routine exercises of our schools for a single term, or rather take a broad survey of the whole course of instruction, from the day when the little child first crosses the threshold of the schoolhouse, to the day when, on the verge of manhood or womanhood, the young man and the young woman bid it farewell to enter upon some of the varied duties of life. What innumerable lessons have been set! How many recitations have been performed! What a graduated series of books has been read, for the purpose of leading the young mind upward, step by step, along the ascent of knowledge! What questionings and repetitions of questionings, to the hundredth time, and what reviews, and reviewing of things reviewed. But on the other hand, how comparatively sterile of instruction has all this course of years been in the duties of children to each other, in the mutual duties of brothers and sisters, in filial duties, in the duties of the talented towards those less highly endowed by nature, of those who are well clad towards those who are clad in the homely garb of poverty, of the well-formed towards the deformed, 
or the sufferers under any physical privation. And indeed, in that vast range of civil and social duties which awaits each of them in after life, and of the duty of love to their heavenly Father, and of obedience to his laws, what has been said against the passions of pride and cupidity and envy and revenge? What expositions have been made of the inherent detestableness of profaneness and obscenity and falsehood, or of the retinue of calamities that come in the train of intemperance and gaming? Has arithmetic been so taught as to show the folly of buying lottery tickets as a means of obtaining wealth? In teaching grammar, has a reference to the grammatical blunders and solecisms of the ignorant been accompanied by such humane and benevolent inculcations as will inspire all the learners with a desire to seek out ignorance to enlighten it, or have the errors of unavoidable ignorance been so ridiculed and contemned that all the class will be led to vie with each other in jeering at the unfortunately innocently ignorant whenever they may meet them? In teaching history, have the criminality of nine-tenths of all the wars ever waged, and the unspeakable sufferings they've inflicted upon mankind been portrayed? Or, on the other hand, have victorious armies and blood-stained conquerors been held up as objects of admiration? Who can rejoice at the proficiency of the children in their studies, if, when the school is dismissed, the older ones gather themselves hastily into some corner to draw a lottery, though it should involve only the value of a knife or a pencil case, or if the younger ones are seen to leap the fences to explore the woods and fields that they may rob birds' nests, or if those of any age trespass upon the neighboring orchards to purloin the fruit. Are our children taught in school the duty of restoring lost articles which they may have found, or the infamousness of cheating the post office by sending concealed letters or substitutes for letters, or the iniquity of adulterating commodities for sale, or defrauding in weight or measure, or the cruelty and sinfulness of slander and detraction. Where these things are neglected, the children may be well trained in reading and writing and arithmetic, but they are not trained in the way they should go. Such children may make powerful and crafty and worldly prosperous men, but they will not become men of unspotted and stainless lives." They are not preparing themselves to do as they would be done by. They are not learning to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. There is another fact which deepens and aggravates to an alarming extent the evil here spoken of. I refer to the mode often used in imparting even the pittance of moral instruction that is given. Since the time of Pestalozzi there has been scarcely any difference of opinion among the leading educators of Europe or America as to the true and philosophical method of instruction. With one consent, their decision is in favor of the exhibitory, explanatory, and inductive method. This method is the opposite of the dogmatic. The latter method consists in laying down abstract rules, formulas, or theorems in a positive, authoritative manner, and requiring the forms of words in which these abstractions are expressed to be committed to memory. Of course, the principle embodied in these forms of words is to be received by the learner whether he understands it or not, and without any inquiry on his part whether it be true or false. But on the Pestalozzian method, nothing which lies beyond the reach of intuition is asserted without being explained. If a complex idea is affirmed, it is analyzed into its elements— if an abstruse one is introduced, it is illustrated, if practicable, by some sensible object. If not susceptible to illustration by any sensible object, some anecdote or narrative is related, or some combination of circumstances supposed which will make it intelligible. When the subject matter will admit, there is an actual exhibition of the thing spoken of. If the thing spoken of cannot be exhibited, there is explanation founded on the exhibition of some analogous thing. Should the lesson refer to any common or simple substance, a specimen is exhibited, as in the case of minerals, metals, fruits, manufactures, and so forth. To a child who has never seen a mountain, a hill may be made a unit of measure for explaining a mountain's height and extent. So of a brook to one who has never seen a river, and of a pond to one who has never seen a lake or an ocean. 
if a centaur or sphinx or mermaid be referred to, the teacher draws the likeness of one upon the blackboard or exhibits an engraving. In case of a complex object, as a machine, a ship, a fort, or an Indian pagoda, some miniature model or at least some pictorial representation is produced, and made the basis or framework of the conceptions that are to be founded upon it and callocated around it. When the thing to be taught is not an object of the senses, but of the mind only, especially when that thing lies remote from elements or first principles, this method requires that the learner's mind should be conducted through all the intermediate stages of progress, until it arrives at the point where the complex or abstract idea can be understood, and then, and not till then, should it be brought forward. In fine, this method requires that individuals should be introduced before species, species before genera, and so forth. But the dogmatic method begins with the most comprehensive generalizations, and runs the risk of the pupils obtaining any knowledge of particulars afterwards. In the one case, the learner is expected to receive blindly what is dictated to him, while the other method exhibits, explains, illustrates, exemplifies, and educes, and then submits the whole to the learner's intelligence to be received or discarded. After this statement of the points of distinction between the Pestalozian and the dogmatic method, it would be only an illustration of the former, were an example of each to be given. Suppose, then, that a foreign gentleman should send his son to Boston under the care of a tutor, in order that he might become acquainted with the city and its vicinity, and learn something of its public works, its institutions, and its distinguished men. According to the dogmatic method, when the strangers should have arrived and taken their lodgings, the tutor would obtain a guide-book for his pupil. In a series of lessons he would see that the peninsular shape, the territorial extent, the statistics of population, commerce, education, and so forth— were well studied and recited. The boundaries of the city, Charles River on the north, the ocean on the east, and the interior on the south and west, would be learned. The pupil would be taught to name the principal streets, bridges, and railroads, probably in an alphabetical order, until they could be volubly repeated. A directory would be put into his hands, with a mark against the names of those men whose distinction entitled them to a place in his memory— he would be told that in the city or in its vicinity there are an asylum for the insane, an institution for the blind, a navy yard, Bunker Hill Monument, Dorchester Heights, Lexington and Concord Battlegrounds, and so forth. These facts, and such as these, would be deposited in his memory, reviewed and rehearsed, until they could all be called up at will and then the parties would re-embark, congratulating themselves that the object of their mission had been successfully accomplished. This is the dogmatic method. On the other hand, suppose the tutor to instruct his pupil on the exhibitory, explanatory, and inductive plan. For the first lesson, he takes him to the dome of the State House, the highest point in the metropolis, and one which commands a splendid panorama of the city and its suburbs, there, before a single object is pointed out, before a single glance at the broad and varied scene is allowed, the points of the compass are determined. If the sun be visible, this is done by an observation consisting of but two elements, the position of the sun and the hour of the day. First, a general survey is allowed, in order to impress the mind with a general conception of outline and extent. This is in analogy to that summary description of the nature, the advantages, and the pleasures of a study, which a teacher should always give to his class whenever a new branch is introduced. Then a single class of objects is selected for attention, suppose it to be public buildings, and as the one from whose observatory they are looking is the central point from which the bearings and distances of all the rest are to be estimated, it is first considered— then the other great public edifices and structures are taken in their order, the Quincy Market, the public buildings at South Boston, the Blind Institution, the colleges, the hospitals, Bunker Hill Monument, the Navy Yard, the lighthouses, and the forts in the harbor. When the most interesting of this class of objects are completed, after such reflections and explanations and perhaps pencilings as may be deemed necessary— 
the eye is withdrawn from the whole, the parties retire, and the pupil is required to reproduce from his recollection, in the form of a map, the objects that he has examined with their apparent distances, positions, and so forth. In succeeding lessons, given from the same elevated point, other objects and neighboring towns are pointed out. Here the telescope is used. The bridges and the six lines of railroad radiating from the city towards the south, west, and north are designated. After every lesson, a map of objects or localities is prepared, both for the purpose of determining the accuracy of the impression that was carried away and of deepening it in the mind. After such minuteness of detail as circumstances will allow, the same objects are visited and inspected, and their history, administration, amount of success or causes of failure, and so forth, are learned. The streets are learned by passing through them, the schools by visiting and questioning them, the state of commerce and merchandise from the wharves, the custom house, and the depositories, the manufactories by the amount and quality of their fabrics, the distinguished men by introduction, conversation, and personal intimacy, and historical events not merely by reading the narrative, but by visiting the scenes where they occurred, such as an inadequate representation of what may be called the Pestilosian method of instruction. Which of the two methods is most conducive to understanding the subject it is not difficult to decide? Now, it is but a few years since the dogmatic method was the one almost universally practiced in our schools in regard to intellectual instruction. Arithmetic was taught without oral exercises or the blackboard, geography without globes, maps, or map drawing, grammar by the endless repetitions of government and agreement, mood and tense, gender, number, and case, the children asserting ten thousand times the remarkable facts that he is masculine, she feminine, and it neuter, that one is the singular number, two, three, four, and all the rest plural, and so forth. But such a change has taken place in this respect, that at the present time there is not one of our first class of schools where the principles of arithmetic are not explained, where words are not defined and the meanings of the author paraphrased, poetry turned into prose, maps drawn, orthographical and grammatical exercises written, and generally the thing itself sought for and understood, instead of a mere babbling from memory of the words in which it is expressed. But in regard to moral subjects, I fear the dogmatic method still remains. Precepts, rules, abstruse principles, mere formulas of speech, without specification, without expansion, without illustration, without the living, glowing, inspiring spirit. Suppose that in arithmetical proportion the teacher should tell the pupil that, as the first term is to the second, so is the third to the answer, and there should stop. Would the pupil ever know how to work a sum in the rule of three? But the moral lesson, do as you would be done unto, is precisely analogous to the arithmetical one if it stops with the general injunction. The latter needs exemplification by instances as much as the former, and would profit as much by it. Yet under this head in the arithmetic, a hundred examples will be given. Under the moral axiom, not one. I cannot see why it is not as absurd to give a moral rule to a child without examples under it, as it is to give an arithmetical rule without examples under that. And if questions pertaining to business are selected in the one case, why should not questions pertaining to duty be selected in the other? Suppose the teacher of a normal school should prescribe, as a rule to future teachers, train up a child in the way he should go, and should there leave them without giving them any specific instructions as to what that way is, and by what means children can be trained that is accustomed to walk in it. How easy it would be to make accomplished teachers, if such a precept, comprehensive and perfect as the principle of it is, were all that is necessary. But such a rule requires years of exemplification and practice. It requires years of reading, reflection, and consultation with masters of the art. Under the rule, to do as we would be done unto, 
a thousand instances taken from the playground, the schoolroom, the domestic fireside, the pleasure party, the shop, the counting room, should be given. Under the rule, to love our neighbors as ourselves, the illustrations may be as numerous as all the interests and wants of life. How varied are those rights of property which come within the protection of the command, Thou shalt not steal, and those rights of character and of reputation that are embraced within the spirit of the prohibition, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Are these things of less consequence than the frivolous discussions of whether a and an and the are articles or adjectives? Are these momentous subjects, with all their finite and infinite bearings, to be postponed in order that we may have time to teach children not to spell labor and honor with the letter U, or public and music with the letter K, or when to reduplicate the final consonants of primitive words and when not? How can a child be led to love the Lord his God with all his heart, unless in the first place he has a heart which has been trained to love what is good? and in the second place, unless some of those glorious attributes of his Maker which are fitted to excite his love are unfolded to his perceptions. How can a child love God while he knows nothing of him but the name, and has perhaps heard that name spoken more frequently in profaneness or blasphemy than in reverence? Is it of more consequence for a child to know the specks of islands in the Indian or Pacific Oceans than it is to know the reason why he is taught to say that God is good, and that his tender mercies are over all his works. Is it more important that a child should be taught the anomalies of our arbitrary language, than that he should be instructed in the beneficence of his heavenly Father, who has created the sun for his warmth and light, and the earth for his dwelling place, who robes nature in beautiful colors for the gratification of his eye, and surrounds him with an atmosphere which is an undecaying medium of communication with his friends, and, like a vast instrument of music, is forever ready to be played upon for the delight of his ear, whose skill and power are made known in the formation of his body, and whose bounty in the abundance that sustains it, whose munificence in the bestowment of his faculties with their adaptations to happiness, and who has given him in the words and life of the Saviour, a perfect rule and a perfect example. If there be nothing in orthography or etymology or syntax of superior value to an upright life, or better becoming an immortal being, than devout feelings towards his Maker, why should the former be allowed to dispossess the latter and usurp their place? The natural conscience needs training in order to discern the distinctions between right and wrong, in the same manner that the intellect needs training in regard to addition and subtraction, or substantive and verb, or latitude and longitude, or republics and monarchies. No man, then, has any right to oppose our system of common schools, because the children who come from them are not as honest as they are intelligent, and as benevolent as they are sagacious, until our teachers are as competent and faithful in teaching their pupils humanity and morality, and in training them to the practice of the social virtues, as they are in teaching them the common branches of study, and in training them for the business of life. When the voice of public opinion shall imperatively demand as high a degree of culture for the moral as for the intellectual nature, and teachers shall bestow it, all opposition to our schools will be destroyed, for the opponents themselves will be reformed into advocates." The unexpected length to which this report has already extended admonishes me to bring it to a close, although in so doing I am obliged to omit other and kindred topics to which I would gladly advert. Instead of generalizing on the subject of morals, or vainly attempting to embellish their inherent beauty and loveliness, I have preferred to set forth in the preceding pages, with some minuteness and detail, the principal dangers to which our children are exposed as they are passing through our schools, and I have endeavored to help the conscientious teacher in the discharge of his duties to those children by setting up a few waymarks and beacons along their perilous path. This, however, is a subject heretofore uninvestigated, so far as I know, by any writer on education. Like other pioneers, I must doubtless have made a very imperfect survey of the extensive field I have entered— all the more imperfect because it is so extensive. 
but I devoutly hope that what has now been said may prove sufficient to incite others to make more complete explorations, until every precipice and pitfall that besets the pathway of the rising generation, in their common pursuit of knowledge, may be not only discovered, but surmounted, with warning signals too conspicuous to be unnoticed. Directly and indirectly, the influences of the Board of Education have been the means of increasing to a great extent the amount of religious instruction given in our schools. Moral training, or the application of religious principles to the duties of life, should be its inseparable accompaniment. No community can long subsist unless it has religious principle as the foundation of moral action, nor unless it has moral action as the superstructure of religious principle. Not at present, any more than in the days of the Jewish theocracy, does the strength of a nation consist in the number of its horsemen, or its chariots, or its mighty men of valor, but in those who fear the Lord and work righteousness. Travelers inform us that in some of the vast deserts of the eastern continent, the course of the wayfarers across the trackless waste is marked by the bleaching bones of mighty caravans that had perished on their way in traversing this desolate expanse. Spread out upon the arid sands, or heaped in mounds, these relics of the dead give warning of the dangers by which they had been overwhelmed. The pilgrim troop or merchant company, as they pass along and behold these eloquent memorials of others' fate, are admonished to press on with vigor, that they may reach the place of safety. Even thus, along the track of time, for thousands of years, do historic memorials, like vast monumental piles upon the right hand and upon the left, make known to us the causes of the decline and fall of ancient and modern republics. They fell through the ignorance and debasement of the people that composed them. But for these, Greece, having revivified her spirit by the genius of Christianity, and turned her pantheon into a temple of the living and true God, might to this day have spread far more than her ancient happiness and splendor over those beautiful regions where now the Mohammedan bears sway. And but for these, Rome might have adopted the principles of that purer faith which was preached to her by the Apostle to the Gentiles, and saved the world from the thousand years of unspeakable horror which the Dark Ages inflicted upon it. Happy will our young republic be, if, forewarned by the perdition of others, she avoids their fate by avoiding the causes that incurred it. End of Section 39 Recording by Maria Casper Section 40 of Annual Reports to the Massachusetts Board of Education by Horace Mann. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Tenth Annual Report, 1846, Part 1. Gentlemen, to write a history of popular education in Massachusetts would be a work of great interest and of little difficulty. Such a history, however, seems not to have been contemplated, and therefore would not be warranted, by those resolves of the legislature under which the following pages are prepared. The resolves provide only for the republication of so much of his, the late secretary's, tenth annual report, as, with the requisite additions and alterations, will exhibit a just and correct view of the common school system of Massachusetts and the provisions of law relating to it. An adequate idea of this system, however, can hardly be obtained without a brief reference to its origin, and to those great fundamental principles which its authors and supporters seem rather to have tacitly assumed than to have fully expounded. The Pilgrim Fathers who colonized Massachusetts Bay made a bolder innovation upon all pre-existing policy and usages than the world had ever known since the commencement of the Christian era. They adopted special and costly means to train up the whole body of the people to industry, to intelligence, to virtue, and to independent thought. The first entry in the public record book of the town of Boston bears the date 1634, seventh month, day one. The records of the public meetings for the residue of that year pertain to those obvious necessities that claimed the immediate attention of an infant settlement. 
but in the transactions of a public meeting held on the thirteenth day of April, 1635, the following entry is found. Likewise, it was then generally agreed upon that our brother Philemon Permont, or Perment, shall be entreated to become schoolmaster for the teaching and nurturing of children with us. Mr. Permont was not expected to render his services gratuitously. Doubtless he received fees from parents. But the same records show that a tract of thirty acres of land at Muddy River was assigned to him, and this grant, two years afterwards, was publicly confirmed. About the same time, an assignment was made of a garden plot to Mr. Daniel Maud, schoolmaster, upon the condition of building thereon, if need be. From this time forward, these golden threads are thickly inwoven in the texture of all the public records of Boston. It is not unworthy of remark that a word of beautiful significance, which is found in the first record on the subject of schools ever made on this continent, has now fallen wholly out of use. Mr. Permont was entreated to become a schoolmaster, not merely for the teaching, but for the nurturing of children. If, as is supposed, this word, now obsolete in this connection, implied the disposition and the power on the part of the teacher, as far as such an object can be accomplished by human instrumentality, to warm into birth, to foster into strength, and to advance into precedence and predominance all kindly sympathies towards men, all elevated thoughts respecting the duties and the destiny of life, and a supreme reverence for the character and attributes of the Creator, then how many teachers have since been employed who have not nourished the children committed to their care? In 1642, the general court of the colony, by a public act, enjoined upon the municipal authorities the duty of seeing that every child within their respective jurisdictions should be educated. Nor was the education which they contemplated either narrow or superficial. By the terms of the Act, the selectmen of every town were required to have a vigilant eye over their brethren and neighbors, to see first that none of them shall suffer so much barbarism in any of their families as not to endeavor to teach by themselves or others their children and apprentices so much learning as may enable them perfectly to read the English tongue and obtain a knowledge of the capital laws upon penalty of twenty shillings for each neglect therein. Such was the idea of barbarism entertained by the colonists of Massachusetts Bay more than two centuries ago. Tried by this standard, even at the present day, the regions of civilization become exceedingly narrow, and many a man who now blindly glories in the name and in the prerogatives of a Republican citizen would, according to the better ideas of the Pilgrim Fathers, be known only as the barbarian father of barbarian children. The same act further required that religious instruction should be given to all children, and also that all parents and masters do breed and bring up their children and apprentices in some honest, lawful calling, labor, or employment, either in husbandry or some other trade profitable for themselves and the commonwealth, if they will not or cannot train them up in learning to fit them for higher employments. Thus were recognized and embodied in a public statute the highest principles of political economy and of social well-being, the universal education of children, and the prevention of drones or non-producers among men. By the same statute, the selectmen and magistrates were empowered to take children and servants from the custody of those parents and masters who, after admonition, were still negligent of their duty in the particulars above mentioned, and to bind them out to such masters as they should deem worthy to supply the place of the unnatural parent, boys until the age of twenty-one and girls until that of eighteen. The law of 1642 enjoined universal education, but it did not make education free, nor did it impose any penalty upon municipal corporations for neglecting to maintain a school. The spirit of the law, however, worked energetically in the hearts of the people, for in Governor Winthrop's journal, 
History of New England, Volume 2, page 215, Savage's Edition, under date of 1645, we find the following. Divers free schools were erected, as at Roxbury, for maintenance whereof every inhabitant bound some house or land for a yearly allowance for ever, and at Boston, where they made an order to allow fifty pounds to the master, and a house and thirty pounds to an usher, who should also teach to read and write and cipher, and Indians' children were to be taught freely, and the charge to be by yearly contribution, either by voluntary allowance, or by rate of such as refused, etc., and this order was confirmed by the general court. Other towns did the like, providing maintenance by several means. It is probable, however, that some towns, owing to the sparseness of their population and the scantiness of their resources, found all the monies in their treasury too little to pay the salary of a master, and surrounded by dangers as they were from the ferocity of the aborigines and the inclemency of the climate, believed that not an eye could be spared from watching nor a hand from labor, even for so sacred a purpose as that of instruction, and therefore they failed to sustain a school for the teaching and nurturing of their children. But in all these privations and disabilities, the government of the colony saw no adequate excuse for neglecting the one thing needful. They saw and felt that if learning were to be buried in the graves of their forefathers, in church and commonwealth, then they had escaped from the house of bondage and swam an ocean and braved the terrors of the wilderness in vain. In the year 1647, therefore, a law was passed making the support of the schools compulsory and education both universal and free. By this law, every town containing fifty householders was required to appoint a teacher to teach all such children as shall resort to him to write and read, and every town containing one hundred families or householders was required to set up a grammar school, whose master should be able to instruct youth so far as they may be fitted for the university. The penalty for non-compliance with the above requirements was five pounds per annum. In 1671 the penalty was increased to ten pounds per annum, in 1683 to 20 pounds, and in 1718 to 30 pounds for every town containing 150 families, to 40 pounds for every town containing 200 families, and so on pro rata for towns containing 250 or 300 families. The penalty was increased from time to time to correspond with the increasing wealth of the towns, all forfeitures were appropriated to the maintenance of the public schools. It is common to say that the Act of 1647 laid the foundation of our present system of free schools, but the truth is it not only laid the foundation of the present system, but in some particulars it laid a far broader foundation than has since been built upon, and reared a far higher superstructure than has since been sustained. Modern times have witnessed great improvements in the methods of instruction and in the motives of discipline, but in some respects the ancient foundation has been narrowed and the ancient superstructure lowered. The term grammar school in the old laws always meant a school where the ancient languages were taught and where youth could be fitted for the university. Every town containing one hundred families or householders was required to keep such a school. Were such a law in force at the present time, there are not more than twelve towns in the Commonwealth which would be exempt from its requirement, but the term grammar school has wholly lost its original meaning, and the number of towns and cities which are now required by law to maintain a school where the Greek and Latin languages are taught, and where youth can be fitted for college, does not exceed thirty. The contrast between our ancestors and ourselves in this respect is most humiliating. Their meanness in wealth was more than compensated by their grandeur of soul. The institution of a free school system on so broad a basis, and of such ample proportions, appears still more remarkable when we consider the period in the world's history at which it was originated, and the fewness and poverty of the people by whom it was maintained. 
In 1647, the entire population of the colony of Massachusetts Bay is supposed to have amounted only to 21,000 souls. The scattered and feeble settlements were almost buried in the depths of the forest. The external resources of the people were small, their dwellings humble, and their raiment and subsistence scanty and homely. They had no enriching commerce, and the wonderful forces of nature had not then, as now, become gratuitous producers of every human comfort and luxury. The whole valuation of all the colonial estates, both public and private, would hardly have been equal to the inventory of many a private citizen of the present day. The fierce eye of the savage was nightly seen glaring from the edge of the surrounding wilderness, and no defense or succor save in their own brave natures was at hand. Yet it was then, amid all these privations and dangers, that the Pilgrim Fathers conceived the magnificent idea not only of a universal but of a free education for the whole people. To find the time and the means to reduce this grand conception to practice, they stinted themselves, amid all their poverty, to a still scantier pittance. Amid all their toils they imposed upon themselves still more burdensome labors, and amid all their perils they braved still greater dangers. Two divine ideas filled their great hearts, their duty to God and to posterity. For the one they built the church, and for the other they opened the school. Religion and knowledge— two attributes of the same glorious and eternal truth, and that truth the only one on which immortal or mortal happiness can be securely founded. It is impossible for us adequately to conceive the boldness of the measure which aimed at a universal education through the establishment of free schools. As a fact, it had no precedent in the world's history, and as a theory it could have been refuted and silenced by a more formidable array of argument and experience than was ever marshaled against any other institution of human origin. But time has ratified its soundness. Two centuries of successful operation now proclaim it to be as wise as it was courageous, and as beneficent as it was disinterested. Every community in the civilized world awards it the meed of praise— and states at home and nations abroad, in the order of their intelligence, are copying the bright example. What we call the enlightened nations of Christendom are approaching by slow degrees to the moral elevation which our ancestors reached at a single bound, and the tardy convictions of the one have been assimilating through a period of two centuries to the intuitions of the other." The establishment of free schools was one of those grand mental and moral experiments whose effects could not be developed and made manifest in a single generation. But now, according to the manner in which human life is computed, we are the sixth generation from its founders, and have we not reason to be grateful both to God and man for its unnumbered blessings? The sincerity of our gratitude must be tested by our efforts to perpetuate and to improve what they established. The gratitude of the lips only is an unholy offering. In surveying our vast country, the rich savannas of the south and the almost interminable prairies of the west, that great valley where, if all the nations of Europe were set down together, they could find ample subsistence— the ejaculation involuntarily bursts forth, why were they not colonized by men like the Pilgrim Fathers? As we reflect how different would have been the fortunes of this nation, had those states, already so numerous, and still extending circle beyond circle, had been founded by men of high, heroic, Puritan mold, how different in the eye of a righteous heaven, how different in the estimation of the wise and good of all contemporary nations— how different in the fortunes of that vast procession of the generations which are yet to rise up over all those wide expanses, and to follow each other to the end of time! As we reflect upon these things, it seems almost impious to repine at the ways of providence. Resignation becomes laborious, and we are forced to choke down our murmurings at the will of heaven." Is it the solution of this deep mystery that our ancestors did as much in their time as it is ever given to one generation of men to accomplish, and have left to us and to our descendants the completion of the glorious work they began? 
The alleged ground upon which the founders of our free school system proceeded when adopting it did not embrace the whole argument by which it may be defended and sustained. Their insight was better than their reason. They assumed a ground, indeed, satisfactory and convincing to Protestants, but at that time only a small portion of Christendom was Protestant, and even now only a minority of it is so. The very ground on which our free schools were founded, therefore, if that were the only one, would have been a reason, with more than half of Christendom, for their immediate abolition. In later times, and since the achievement of American independence, the universal and ever-repeated argument in favor of free schools has been that the general intelligence which they are capable of diffusing, and which can be imparted by no other human instrumentality, is indispensable to the continuance of a republican government. This argument, it is obvious, assumes, as a postulatum, the superiority of a republican over all other forms of government. And as a people, we religiously believe in the soundness both of the assumption and of the argument founded upon it. But if this be all, then a sincere monarchist, or a defender of arbitrary power, or a believer in the divine right of kings, would oppose free schools for the identical reasons we offer in their behalf. A perfect demonstration of our doctrine, that free schools are the only basis of republican institutions, would be the perfection of proof to his mind that they should be immediately exterminated. Admitting, nay, claiming for ourselves the substantial justness and soundness of the general grounds on which our system was originally established and has since been maintained, yet it is most obvious that unless some broader and more comprehensive principle can be found, the system of free schools will be repudiated by whole nations as impolitic or dangerous, and even among ourselves, all who deny our premises will, of course, set at naught the conclusions to which they lead. Again, the expediency of free schools is sometimes advocated on grounds of political economy. An educated people is always a more industrious and productive people. Knowledge and abundance sustain to each other the relation of cause and effect. Intelligence is a primary ingredient in the wealth of nations. Where this does not stand at the head of the inventory, the items in a nation's valuation will be few, and the sum at the foot of the column insignificant. The moralist, too, takes up the argument of the economist. He demonstrates that vice and crime are not only prodigals and spendthrifts of their own, but defrauders and plunderers of the means of others that they would seize upon all the gains of honest industry and exhaust the bounties of heaven itself without satiating their rapacity for new means of indulgence, and that often in the history of the world whole generations might have been trained to industry and virtue by the wealth which one enemy to his race has destroyed. And yet, notwithstanding these views have been presented a thousand times with irrefutable logic, and with a divine eloquence of truth which it would seem that nothing but combined stolidity and depravity could resist, there is not at the present time, with the exception of the states of New England and a few small communities elsewhere, a country or a state in Christendom which maintains a system of free schools for the education of all its children. Even in the state of New York, with all its noble endowments, the schools are not free. I believe that this amazing dereliction from duty, especially in our own country, originates more in the false notions which men entertain respecting the nature of their right to property than in anything else. In the district school meeting, in the town meeting, in legislative halls, everywhere, the advocates for a more generous education could carry their respective audiences with them in behalf of increased privileges for our children, were it not instinctively foreseen that increased privileges must be followed by increased taxation. Against this obstacle, argument falls dead. The rich man, who has no children, declares that the exaction of a contribution from him to educate the children of his neighbor is an invasion of his rights of property. The man who has reared and educated a family of children 
denounces it as a double tax when he is called upon to assist in educating the children of others also, or, if he has reared his own children without educating them, he thinks it peculiarly oppressive to be obliged to do for others what he refrained from doing even for himself. Another, having children, but disdaining to educate them with the common mass, withdraws them from the public school, puts them under what he calls selector influences, and then thinks it a grievance to be obliged to support a school which he contemns. Or, if these different parties so far yield to the force of traditionary sentiment and usage, and to the public opinion around them, as to consent to do something for the cause, they soon reach the limit of expense at which their admitted obligation or their alleged charity terminates. It seems not irrelevant, therefore, in this connection, and for the purpose of strengthening the foundation on which our free school system reposes, to inquire into the nature of a man's right to the property he possesses, and to satisfy ourselves respecting the question whether any man has such an indefeasible title to his estates, or such an absolute ownership of them, as renders it unjust in the government to assess upon him his share of the expenses of educating the children of the community, up to such a point as the nature of the institutions under which he lives and the well-being of society require. I believe in the existence of a great, immortal, immutable principle of natural law or natural ethics, a principle antecedent to all human institutions, and incapable of being abrogated by any ordinance of man, a principle of divine origin, clearly legible in the ways of providence, as those ways are manifested in the order of nature and in the history of the race, which proves the absolute right to an education of every human being that comes into the world, and which, of course, proves the correlative duty of every government to see that the means of that education are provided for all. In regard to the application of this principle of natural law, that is, in regard to the extent of the education to be provided for all at public expense, some differences of opinion may fairly exist under different political organizations. But under our republican government it seems clear that the minimum of this education can never be less than such as is sufficient to qualify each citizen for the civil and social duties he will be called to discharge. Such an education as teaches the individual the great laws of bodily health, as qualifies for the fulfillment of parental duties, as is indispensable for the civil functions of a witness or a juror, as is necessary for the voter in municipal and in national affairs, and finally as is requisite for the faithful and conscientious discharge of all those duties which devolve upon the inheritor of a portion of the sovereignty of this great republic. The will of God, as conspicuously manifested in the order of nature and in the relations which he has established among men, founds the right of every child that is born into the world to such a degree of education as will enable him, and as far as possible will predispose him, to perform all domestic, social, civil, and moral duties upon the same clear ground of natural law and equity as it founds a child's right upon his first coming into the world to distend his lungs with the use of a portion of the common air, or to open his eyes to the common light, or to receive that shelter, protection, and nourishment which are necessary to the continuance of his bodily existence. And so far is it from being a wrong or a hardship to demand of the possessors of property their respective shares for the prosecution of this divinely ordained work, that they themselves are guilty of the most far-reaching injustice when they seek to resist or to evade the contribution the complainers are the wrongdoers. The cry, Stop, thief, comes from the thief himself. To anyone who looks beyond the mere surface of things, it is obvious that the primary and natural elements or ingredients of all property consist in the riches of the soil, in the treasures of the sea, in the light and warmth of the sun, in the fertilizing clouds and streams and dews, in the winds, 
and in the chemical and vegetative agencies of nature. In the majority of cases, all that we call property, all that makes up the valuation or inventory of a nation's capital, was prepared at the creation and was laid up of old in the capacious storehouses of nature. For every unit that a man earns by his own toil or skill, he receives hundreds and thousands, without cost and without recompense, from the all-bountiful giver. A proud mortal, standing in the midst of his luxuriant wheat fields or cotton plantations, may arrogantly call them his own. Yet what barren wastes they would be, did not heaven send down upon them its dews and rains, its warmth and its light, and sustain for their growth and ripening the grateful vicissitude of the seasons? It is said that from eighty to ninety per cent of the very substance of some of the great staples of agriculture are not taken from the earth, but are absorbed from the air, so that these productions may more properly be called fruits of the atmosphere than of the soil. Who prepares this elemental wealth? Who scatters it like a sower through all the regions of the atmosphere, and sends his richly freighted winds as his messengers to bear to each leaf in the forest and to each blade in the cultivated field the nourishment which their infinitely varied needs demand. Aided by machinery, a single manufacturer performs the labor of hundreds of men. Yet what could he accomplish without the weight of the waters which God causes ceaselessly to flow, or without those gigantic forces which he has given to steam? And how would the commerce of the world be carried on, were it not for those great laws of nature, of electricity, of condensation, and of rarefaction, that give birth to the winds, which in the conformity to the will of heaven, and not in obedience to any power of man, forever traverse the earth, and offer themselves as an unchartered medium for interchanging the products of all the zones, these few references show how vast a proportion of all the wealth which men presumptuously call their own, because they claim to have earned it, is poured into their lap, unasked and unthanked for, by the being so infinitely gracious in his physical as well as in his moral bestowments. But for whose subsistence and benefit were these exhaustless treasuries of wealth created? Surely not for any one man— nor for any one generation, but for the subsistence and benefit of the whole race, from the beginning to the end of time. They were not created for Adam alone, nor for Noah alone, nor for the first discoverers or colonists who may have peopled any part of the earth's ample domain. No, they were created for the race collectively, but to be possessed and enjoyed in succession as the generations one after another should come into existence, equal rights with a successive enjoyment of them. If we consider the earth and the fullness thereof as one great habitation or domain, then each generation, subject to certain modifications for the encouragement of industry and frugality, which modifications it is not necessary here to specify, has only a life lease on them. There are certain reasonable regulations, indeed, in regard to the outgoing and the incoming tenants, regulations which allow to the outgoing generation a brief control over their property after they are called upon to leave it, and which also allow the incoming generations to anticipate a little their full right of possession. But subject to these regulations, nature ordains a perpetual entail and transfer from one generation to another of all property in the great, substantive, enduring elements of wealth, in the soil, in metals and minerals, in precious stones and in more precious coal and iron and granite, in the waters and winds and the sun, and no one man nor any one generation of men has any such title to or ownership in these ingredients and substantials of all wealth that his right is invaded when a portion of them is taken for the benefit of posterity. This great principle of natural law may be illustrated by a reference to some of the unstable elements in regard to which each individual's right of property is strongly qualified in relation to his contemporaries, 
even while he has the acknowledged right of possession. Take the streams of water or of the wind for an example. A stream, as it descends from its sources to its mouth, is successively the property of all those through whose land it passes. My neighbor who lives above me owned it yesterday while it was passing through his land. I own it today while it is descending through mine, and the contiguous proprietor below will own it tomorrow while it is flowing through his, as it passes onward to the next. But the rights of these successive owners are not absolute and unqualified. They are limited by the rights of those who are entitled to the subsequent possession and use. When a stream is passing through my land, I may not corrupt it so that it shall be offensive or valueless to the adjoining proprietor below. I may not stop it in its downward course, nor divert it into any other channel so that it shall leave his channel dry. I may lawfully use it for various purposes, for agriculture as in irrigating lands or watering cattle, for manufactures as in turning wheels, etc., but in all my uses of it I must pay regard to the rights of my neighbors lower down. So no two proprietors, nor any half-dozen proprietors, by conspiring together, can deprive an owner who lives below them all of the ultimate right which he has to the use of the stream in its descending course. We see here, therefore, that a man has certain qualified rights, rights of which he cannot lawfully be divested without his own consent, in a stream of water before it reaches the limits of his own estate, at which latter point he may somewhat more emphatically call it his own. And in this sense, a man who lives at the outlet of a river, on the margin of the ocean, has certain incipient rights in those fountain sources that well up from the earth at a distance of thousands of miles. So it is with the ever-moving wind. No man has a permanent interest in the breezes that blow by him and bring healing and refreshment on their wings. Each man has a temporary interest in them. From whatever quarter of the compass they may come, I have a right to use them as they are passing by me. Yet that use must always be regulated by the rights of those other participants and co-owners whom they are moving forward to bless. It is not lawful, therefore, for me to corrupt them, to load them with noxious gases or vapors by which they will prove valueless or detrimental to him, whomever he may be, towards whom they are moving. In one respect, indeed, the winds illustrate our relative rights and duties even better than the streams. In the latter case, the rights are not only successive, but always in the same order of priority— those of the owner above necessarily preceding those of the owner below, and this order is unchangeable except by changing the ownership of the land itself to which the rights are appurtenant. In the case of the wind, however, which may blow from every quarter of the heavens, I may have the prior right today, but with a change in their direction my neighbor may have it tomorrow." If, therefore, today, when the wind is going from me to him, I should usurp the right to use it to his detriment, tomorrow, when it is coming from him to me, he may inflict retributive usurpation upon me. The light of the sun, too, is subject to the same benign and equitable regulations. As the waves of this ethereal element pass by me, I have a right to bask in their genial warmth or to employ their quickening powers. But I have no right, even on my own land, to build up a wall mountainously high that shall eclipse the sun to my neighbor's eyes. Now all these great principles of natural law, which define and limit the rights of neighbors and contemporaries, are incorporated into and constitute a part of the civil law of every civilized people, and they are obvious and simple illustrations of the great proprietary laws by which individuals and generations hold their rights in the solid substance of the globe, in the elements that move over its surface, and in the chemical and vital powers with which it is so marvelously endowed. As successive owners on a river's bank have equal rights to the waters that flow through their respective domains, 
subject only to the modification that the proprietors nearer the stream's source must have precedence in the enjoyment of their rights over those lower down, so the rights of all the generations of mankind to the earth itself, to the streams that fertilize it, to the winds that purify it, to the vital principles that animate it, and to the reviving light, are common rights, though subject to similar modifications in regard to the preceding and succeeding generations of men. They did not belong to our ancestors in perpetuity. They do not belong to us in perpetuity. And the right of the next generation in them will be limited and defeasible like ours. As we hold these rights subject to the claim of the next generation, so will they hold them subject to the claims of their immediate successors, and so on to the end of time. And the savage tribes that roam about the head springs of the Mississippi have as good a right to ordain what use shall be made of its copious waters, when in their grand descent across a continent they shall reach the shores of arts and civilization, as any of our predecessors had, or as we ourselves have, to say what shall be done in perpetuity with the soil, the waters, the winds, the light, and the invisible agencies of nature, which must be allowed on all hands to constitute the primary and indispensable elements of wealth. Is not the inference irresistible, then, that no man, by whatever means he may have come into possession of his property, has any natural right, any more than he has a moral one, to hold it or to dispose of it, irrespective of the needs and claims of those who, in the august processions of the generations, are to be his successors on the stage of existence. Holding his rights subject to their rights, he is bound not to impair the value of their inheritance, either by commission or by omission. Generation after generation proceeds from the creative energy of God. Each one stops for a brief period upon the earth, resting, as it were, only for a night, like migratory birds upon their passage, and then leaving it forever to others, whose existence is as transitory as its own. And the migratory flocks of waterfowl which sweep across our latitudes in their passage to another clime have as good a right to make a perpetual appropriation to their own use of the lands over which they fly— as any one generation has to arrogate perpetual dominion and sovereignty for its own purposes over that portion of the earth which it is its fortune to occupy during the brief period of its temporal existence. Another consideration bearing upon this arrogant doctrine of absolute ownership or sovereignty has hardly less force than the one just expounded, we have seen how insignificant a portion of any man's possessions he can claim in any proper and just sense to have earned, and that in regard to all the residue he is only taking his turn in the use of a bounty bestowed in common by the giver of all, upon his ancestors, upon himself, and upon his posterity, a line of indefinite length of which he is but a point. But this is not the only deduction to be made from his assumed rights. The present wealth of the world has an additional element in it. Much of all that is capable of being earned by man has been earned by our predecessors, and has come down to us in a solid and enduring form. We have not erected all the houses in which we live, nor constructed all the roads on which we travel, nor built all the ships in which we carry on our commerce with the world. We have not reclaimed from the wilderness all the fields whose harvests we now reap. And if we had no precious metals or stones or pearls, but such as we ourselves had dug from the mines or brought up from the bottom of the ocean, our coffers and our caskets would be empty indeed. But even if this were not so, whence came all the arts and sciences, the discoveries and the inventions, without which, and without a common right to which, the valuation of the property of a whole nation would scarcely equal the inventory of a single man, without which, indeed, we should now be in a state of barbarism. Whence came the knowledge of agriculture, without which we should have so little to reap, or a knowledge of astronomy, without which we could not traverse the oceans, or a knowledge of chemistry and mechanical philosophy, 
without which the arts and the trades could not exist. Most of all of this was found out by those who have gone before us. Some of it has come down to us from a remote antiquity. Surely all these boons and blessings belong as much to posterity as to ourselves. They have not descended to us to be arrested and consumed here, or to be sequestered from the ages to come. Cato and Archimedes and Kepler and Newton and Franklin and Arkwright and Fulton and all the bright host of benefactors to science and art did not make or bequeath their discoveries or inventions to benefit any one generation, but to increase the common enjoyments of mankind to the end of time. So of all the great lawgivers and moralists who have improved the civil institutions of the state, who have made it dangerous to be wicked, or far better than this, have made it hateful to be so. Resources developed and property acquired after all these ages of preparation, after all these facilities and securities, accrue not to the benefit of the possessor only, but to that of the next and all succeeding generations. Surely these considerations limit still more extensively that absolutism of ownership which is so often claimed by the possessors of wealth. But sometimes the rich farmer, the opulent manufacturer, or the capitalist, when sorely pressed with his natural and moral obligation to contribute a portion of his means for the education of the young, replies, either in form or in spirit, my lands, my machinery, my gold, and my silver are mine. May I not do what I will with my own? There is one supposable case, and only one, where this argument would have plausibility. If it were made by an isolated, solitary being, a being having no relation to a community around him, having no ancestors to whom he had been indebted for ninety-nine parts in every hundred of all he possesses, and expecting to leave no posterity after him, it might not be easy to answer it. If there were but one family in this western hemisphere, and only one in the eastern hemisphere, and these two families bore no civil or social relations to each other, and were to be the first and last of the whole race, it might be difficult, except on very high and almost transcendental grounds, for either one of them to show good cause why the other should contribute to help educate children not his own. And perhaps the force of the appeal for such an object would be still further diminished if the nearest neighbor of a single family upon our planet were as far from earth as Uranus or Sirius. In self-defense or in selfishness, one might say to the other, What are your fortunes to me? You can neither benefit nor molest me. Let each of us keep to his own side of the planetary spaces. But is this the relation which any man amongst us sustains to his fellows? In the midst of a populous community, to which he is bound by innumerable ties, having had his own fortune and condition almost predetermined and foreordained by his predecessors, and being about to exert upon his successors as commanding an influence as has been exerted upon himself, the objector can no longer shrink into his individuality and disclaim connection and relationship with the world at large. He cannot deny that there are thousands around him on whom he acts and who are continually reacting upon him. The earth is much too small and the race is far too numerous to allow us to be hermits, and therefore we cannot adopt either the philosophy or the morals of hermits." All have derived benefits from their ancestors, and all are bound, as by an oath, to transmit those benefits, even in an improved condition, to posterity. We may as well attempt to escape from our own personal identity as to shake off the threefold relation which we bear to others, the relation of an associate with our contemporaries, of a beneficiary of our ancestors, and of a guardian to those who, in the sublime order of providence, are to succeed us. Out of these relations manifest duties are evolved. The society of which we necessarily constitute a part must be preserved, and in order to preserve it we must not look merely to what one individual or one family needs, but to what the whole community needs. 
not merely to what one generation needs, but to the wants of a succession of generations. To draw conclusions without considering these facts is to leave out the most important part of the premises. A powerfully corroborating fact remains untouched. Though the earth and the beneficent capabilities with which it is endued belong in common to the race, yet we find that previous and present possessors have laid their hands upon the whole of it, have left no part of it unclaimed and unappropriated. They have circumnavigated the globe, they have drawn lines across every habitable portion of it, and have partitioned amongst themselves not only its whole area or superficial contents, but have claimed it down to the center and up to the concave, a great inverted pyramid for each proprietor, so that not an unclaimed rood is left either in the caverns below or in the aerial spaces above, where a new adventurer upon existence can take unresisted possession. They have entered into a solemn compact with each other for the mutual defense of their respective allotments. They have created legislators and judges and executive officers who denounce and inflict penalties even to the taking of life, and they have organized armed bands to repel aggression upon their claims. Indeed, so grasping and rapacious have mankind been in this particular, that they have taken more than they could use, more than they could perambulate and survey, more than they could see from the top of the masthead or from the highest peak of the mountain. There was some limit to their physical power of taking possession, but none to the exorbency of their desires. Like robbers who divide their spoils before they know whether they shall find a victim, men have claimed a continent while still doubtful of its existence, and have spread out their title from ocean to ocean before their most adventurous pioneers had ever seen a shore of the realms they coveted. The whole planet, then, having been appropriated, there being no waste or open lands from which the new generations may be supplied as they come into existence, have not those generations the strongest conceivable claim upon the present occupants for that which is indispensable to their well-being? They have more than a preemptive, they have a possessory right to some portion of the issues and profits of that general domain, all of which has been thus taken up and appropriated. A denial of this right by the present possessors is a breach of trust, a fraudulent misuse of power given and of confidence implied. On mere principles of political economy, it is folly. On the broader principles of duty and morality, it is embezzlement. It is not at all in contravention of this view of the subject that the adult portion of society does take and must take upon itself the control and management of all existing property until the rising generation has arrived at the age of majority. Nay, one of the objects of their doing so is to preserve the rights of the generation which is still in its minority. Society, to this extent, is only a trustee managing an estate for the benefit of a part owner or of one who has a reversionary interest in it. This civil regulation, therefore, made necessary even for the benefit of both present and future possessors, is only in furtherance of the great law under consideration. Coincident, too, with this great law, but in no manner superseding or invalidating it, is that wonderful provision which the Creator has made for the care of offspring in the affection of their parents. Heaven did not rely merely upon our perceptions of duty toward our children and our fidelity in its performance. A powerful, all-mastering instinct of love was therefore implanted in the parental, especially in the maternal breast, to anticipate the idea of duty and to make duty delightful. Yet the great doctrine founded upon the will of God, as made known to us in the natural order and relation of things, would still remain the same, even though all this beautiful portion of our moral being whence parental affection springs were a void and a non-entity. Emphatically would the obligations of society remain the same for all those children who have been bereaved of parents, or who, worse than bereavement, have only monster parents of intemperance or cupidity, 
or of any other of those forms of vice that seem to suspend or obliterate the law of love in the parental breast. For these, society is doubly bound to be a parent, and to exercise all that rational care and providence which a wise father would exercise for his own children. End of Section 40 Recording by Maria Casper Section 41 of Annual Reports to the Massachusetts Board of Education by Horace Mann This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Tenth Annual Report, 1846, Part 2 If the previous argument began with sound premises and has been logically conducted, then it has established this position, that a vast portion of the present wealth of the world either consists in or has been immediately derived from those great natural substances and powers of the earth which were bestowed by the Creator alike on all mankind, or from the discoveries, inventions, labors, and improvements of our ancestors, which were alike designed for the common benefit of all their descendants. The question now arises, at what time is this wealth to be transferred from the preceding to a succeeding generation? At what point are the latter to take possession of it, or to derive a benefit from it? Or at what time are the former to surrender it in their behalf? Is each existing generation, and each individual of an existing generation, to hold fast to his possessions until death relaxes his grasp? Or is something of the right to be acknowledged, and something of the benefit to be yielded beforehand? It seems too obvious for argument that the latter is the only alternative. If the incoming generation have no rights until the outgoing generation have actually retired, then is every individual that enters the world liable to perish on the day he is born. According to the very constitution of things, each individual must obtain sustenance and succor as soon as his eyes open in quest of light, or his lungs gasp for his first breath of air. His wants cannot be delayed until he himself can supply them. If the demands of his nature are ever to be answered, they must be answered years before he can make any personal provision for them, either by the performance of any labor or by any exploits of skill. The infant must be fed before he can earn his bread. He must be clothed before he can prepare garments. He must be protected from the elements before he can erect a dwelling. And it is just as clear that he must be instructed before he can engage or reward a tutor. A course contrary to this would be the destruction of the young, that we might rob them of their rightful inheritance. Carried to its extreme, it would be the act of Herod, seeking in a general massacre the life of one who was supposed to endanger his power. Here, then, the claims of the succeeding generation, not only upon the affection and care, but upon the property of the preceding one, attach. God having given to the second generation as full and complete a right to the incomes and profits of the world as he has given to the first, and to the third generation as full and complete a right as he has given to the second, and so on while the world stands, it necessarily follows that children must come into a partial and qualified possession of these rights by the paramount law of nature as soon as they are born. No human enactment can abolish or countervail this paramount and supreme law, and all those positive and often arbitrary enactments of the civil code, by which, for the encouragement of industry and frugality, the possessor of property is permitted to control it for a limited period after his decease, must be construed and executed in subservience to this sovereign and irrepealable ordinance of nature. Nor is this transfer always, or even generally, to be made in kind, but according to the needs of the recipient. The recognition of this principle is universal. A guardian or trustee may possess lands, while the ward or owner under the trust may need money, or the former may have money, while the latter need raiment or shelter. The form of the estate must be exchanged if need be, and adapted to the wants of the receiver. 
The claim of a child, then, to a portion of pre-existent property begins with the first breath he draws. The newborn infant must have sustenance and shelter and care. If the natural parents are removed or parental ability fails, in a word, if parents either cannot or will not supply the infant's wants, then society at large, the government having assumed to itself the ultimate control of all property, is bound to step in and fill the parent's place. To deny this to any child would be equivalent of a sentence of death, a capital execution of the innocent, at which every soul shudders. It would be a more cruel form of infanticide than any which is practiced in China or in Africa. But to preserve the animal life of a child only, and there to stop, would be not the bestowment of a blessing or the performance of a duty, but the infliction of a fearful curse. A child has interests far higher than those of mere physical existence. Better that the wants of its natural life should be disregarded than that the higher interests of the character should be neglected. If a child has any claim to bread to keep him from perishing, he has a far higher claim to knowledge to preserve him from error and its fearful retinue of calamities. If a child has any claim to shelter to protect him from the destroying elements, he has a far higher claim to be rescued from the infamy and perdition of vice and crime. All moralists agree, nay, all moralists maintain, that a man is as responsible for his omissions as for his commissions, that he is as guilty of the wrong which he could have prevented but did not, as for that which his own hand has perpetrated. They then who knowingly withhold sustenance from a newborn child, and he dies, are guilty of infanticide. And by the same reasoning, they who refuse to enlighten the intellect of the rising generation are guilty of degrading the human race. They who refuse to train up children in the way they should go are training up incendiaries and madmen to destroy property and life and to invade and pollute the sanctuaries of society. In a word, if the mind is as real and substantive a part of human existence as the body, then mental attributes during the periods of infancy and childhood demand provision, at least as imperatively as bodily appetites. The time when these respective obligations attach corresponds with the periods when the nurture, whether physical or mental, is needed. As the right of sustenance is of equal date with birth, so the right to intellectual and moral training begins at least as early as when children are ordinarily sent to school. At that time, then, by the irrepealable law of nature, every child succeeds to so much more of the property of the community as is necessary for his education. He is to receive this, not in the form of lands or of gold and silver, but in the form of knowledge and a training to good habits. This is one of the steps in the transfer of property from the present to the succeeding generation. Human sagacity may be at fault in fixing the amount of property to be transferred or the time when the transfer should be made to a dollar or to an hour, but certainly in a republican government the obligation of the predecessors and the right of the successors extend to and embrace the means of such an amount of education as will prepare each individual to perform all the duties which devolve upon him as a man and a citizen. It may go further than this point. Certainly it cannot fall short of it. Under our political organization, the places and the processes where this transfer is to be provided for and its amount determined are the district school meeting, the town meeting, legislative halls, and conventions for establishing and revising the fundamental laws of the state. If it be not done there, society is false to its high trusts, and any community, whether national or state, that ventures to organize a government or to administer a government already organized, without making provision for the free education of all its children, dares the certain vengeance of heaven, and in the squalid forms of poverty and destitution, in the scourges of violence and misrule, in the heart-destroying corruptions of licentiousness and debauchery, and in political profligacy and legalized perfidy, 
in all the blended and mutually aggravated crimes of civilization and of barbarism, will be sure to feel the terrible retributions of its delinquency. I bring my argument on this point, then, to a close, and I present a test of its validity, which, as it seems to me, defies denial or evasion. In obedience to the laws of God, and to the laws of all civilized communities, society is bound to protect the natural life of children, and this natural life cannot be protected without the appropriation and use of a portion of the property which society possesses. We prohibit infanticide under penalty of death. We practice a refinement in this particular. The life of an infant is inviolable even before he is born, and he who feloniously takes it even before birth is as subject to the extreme penalty of the law as though he had struck down manhood in its vigor, or taken away a mother by violence from the sanctuary of home where she blesses her offspring. But why preserve the natural life of a child? Why preserve unborn embryos of life? If we do not intend to watch over and to protect them, and to expand their subsequent existence into usefulness and happiness— as individuals, or as an organized community, we have no natural right, we can derive no authority or countenance from reason, we can cite no attribute or purpose of the divine nature for giving birth to any human being and then inflicting upon that being the curse of ignorance, of poverty and of vice with all their attendant calamities. We are brought then to this startling but inevitable alternative— the natural life of an infant should be extinguished as soon as it is born, or the means should be provided to save that life from being a curse to its possessor. And therefore every state is morally bound to enact a code of laws legalizing and enforcing infanticide, or a code of laws establishing free schools. The three following propositions, then, describe the broad and ever-during foundation on which the common school system of Massachusetts reposes, that successive generations of men, taken collectively, constitute one great commonwealth. The property of this commonwealth is pledged for the education of all its youth, up to such a point as will save them from poverty and vice, and prepare them for the adequate performance of their social and civil duties. The successive holders of this property are trustees, bound to the faithful execution of their trust by the most sacred obligations, and embezzlement and pillage from children and descendants have not less of criminality and have more of meanness than the same offenses when perpetrated against contemporaries. Recognizing these eternal principles of natural ethics— the Constitution of Massachusetts, the fundamental law of the state, after declaring, among other things, in the preamble to the first section of the fifth chapter, that the encouragement of arts and sciences and all good literature tends to the honor of God, the advantage of the Christian religion, and the great benefit of this and other United States of America, then proceeds in the second section of the same chapter— to set forth the duties of all future legislators and magistrates in the following noble and impressive language. Wisdom and knowledge, as well as virtue, diffused generally among the body of the people, being necessary for the preservation of their rights and liberties, and as these depend on spreading the opportunities and advantages of education in the various parts of the country and among the different orders of the people, it shall be the duty of legislatures and magistrates in all future periods of this commonwealth to cherish the interests of literature and the sciences and all seminaries of them, especially the University of Cambridge, the public schools and grammar schools in the towns, and to encourage private societies and public institutions, rewards and immunities for the promotion of agriculture, arts, sciences, commerce, trade, manufactures, and a natural history of the country, to countenance and inculcate the principles of humanity and general benevolence, public and private charity, industry and frugality, honesty and punctuality in their dealings, sincerity, good humor, and all social affections and generous sentiments among the people. 
See also Revised Statutes, Chapter 23, Section 7. Massachusetts is parental in her government. More and more, as year after year rolls by, she seeks to substitute prevention for remedy and rewards for penalties. She strives to make industry the antidote to poverty and to counterwork the progress of vice and crime by the diffusion of knowledge and the culture of virtuous principles. She seeks not only to mitigate those great physical and mental calamities of which mankind are the sad inheritors, but also to avert those infinitely greater moral calamities which form the disastrous heritage of depraved passions. Hence it has long been her policy to endow or to aid asylums for the cure of disease. She succors and maintains all the poor within her borders, whatever may have been the land of their nativity. She founds and supports hospitals for restoring reason to the insane, and even for those violators of the law whom she is obliged to sequestrate from society, she provides daily instruction and the ministrations of the gospel at the public charge. To those who, in the order of nature and providence, have been bereft of the noble faculties of hearing and of speech, she teaches a new language, and opens their imprisoned minds and hearts to conversation with men and communion with God. And it hardly transcends the literal truth to say that she gives sight to the blind. For the remnants of those aboriginal tribes who for so many ages roamed over this land without cultivating its soil, or elevating themselves in the scale of being, her annual bounty provides good schools, and when the equal, natural, and constitutional rights of the outcast children of Africa were thought to be invaded, she armed her courts of judicature with power to punish the aggressors. The public highway is not more open and free for every man in the community than is the public schoolhouse for every child, and each parent feels that a free education is as secure a part of the birthright of his offspring as heaven's bounties of light and air. The state not only commands that the means of education shall be provided for all, but she denounces penalties against all individuals and all towns and cities, however populous or powerful they may be, that shall presume to stand between her bounty and its recipients. In her righteous code, the interception of knowledge is a crime, and if parents are unable to supply their children with books, she becomes a parent and supplies them. The policy of the state promotes not only secular but religious instruction, yet in such a way as leaves to every individual the right of private judgment and the sacred freedom of conscience. Public sentiment exceeds and excels the law. Annually vast sums are given for eleemosynary and charitable purposes, to promote the cause of temperance, to send the gospel to the heathen, to diffuse the doctrines of peace, which are the doctrines of the Prince of Peace. For public free education alone, including the direct outlay of money and the interest on capital invested, Massachusetts expends annually more than a million of dollars. To support religious institutions for the worship of God and the salvation of men, she annually expends more than another million and what she gives away in the various forms of charity far exceeds a third sum of equal magnitude. She explores the world for new objects of beneficence, and so deep and common is the feeling which expects and prompts all this, that she is gradually changing and ennobling the definition of a cardinal word in the language of morals, doing what no king or court with all their authority nor royal academy with all its sages and literary men, can do. She is changing the meaning of charity into duty. For the support of the poor, nine-tenths of whose cost originate with foreigners or come from one prolific vice, whose last convulsive energies she is now struggling to subdue, she annually pays more than $300,000. For the support and improvement of public highways, she pays a much larger sum, and within the last dozen or fourteen years she has invested a capital in railroads, within and without the state, of nearly or quite sixty millions of dollars. Whence come her means to give, each returning year, more than a million of dollars to public education, 
more than another million to religion, more than a third to ameliorate and succor the afflicted and the ignorant at home, and to bless in distant lands those who sit in the region and shadow of death. How does she support her poor, maintain her public ways, and contribute such vast sums for purposes of internal improvement, besides maintaining her immense commercial transactions with every zone in the world? Has she a vast domain? Her whole territory would not make a courtyard of respectable dimensions to stand in front of many of the states and territories belonging to the Union. Does she draw revenues from conquered provinces or subjugated realms? She conquers nothing, she subdues nothing, save the great elemental forces of nature, which God gives freely whenever and wherever they are asked for, in the language of genius and science, and in regard to which no profusion or prodigality to one can diminish the bounty always ready for others. Does she live by the toil of a race of serfs and vassals whom she holds in personal and hereditary bondage, by one comprehensive and sovereign act of violence, seizing upon both body and soul at once, and superseding the thousand acts of plunder which make up the life of a common robber? Every man who treads her sacred soil is free, all are free alike, and within her borders, for any purpose connected with human slavery, iron will not be welded into a fetter. Has she rich mines of precious metals? In all her coffers there is not a drachma of silver or of gold which has not been obtained by the sweat of her brow or the vigor of her brain. Has she magazines of mineral wealth embedded in her earth? Or are her soil and climate so spontaneously exuberant that she reaps luxuriant harvests from uncultivated fields? Alas, the orator has barbed his satire by declaring her only natural productions to be granite and ice. Whence, then, I ask again, comes her wealth? I do not mean the gorgeous wealth which is displayed in the voluptuous and too often enervating residences of the affluent— but that golden mean of property, such as Agur asked for in his perfect prayer, which carries blessings in its train to thousands of householders, which spreads solid comfort and competence through the dwellings of the land, which furnishes the means of instruction, of social pleasures and refinement, to the citizens at large, which saves from the cruel sufferings and the more cruel temptations of penury. The families, scattered over her hills and along her valleys, have not merely a shelter from the inclemencies of the seasons, but the sanctuary of a home. Not only food, but books are spread upon their tables. Her commonest houses have the means of hospitality. They have appliances for sickness, and resources laid up against accident and the infirmities of age. Whether in her rural districts or her populous towns— a wandering, native-born beggar is a prodigy, and the twelve millions of dollars deposited in her savings institutions do not more loudly proclaim the frugality and providence of the past than they foretell the competence and enjoyments of the future. One copious, exhaustless fountain supplies all this abundance. It is education, the intellectual, moral, and religious education of the people. Having no other minds to work, Massachusetts has mined into the human intellect, and from its limitless resources she has won more sustaining and enduring prosperity and happiness than if she had been founded upon a stratification of silver and gold reaching deeper down than geology has yet penetrated. From her high religious convictions she has learned that great lesson, to set a value upon time— Regarding the faculties as a gift of God, she has felt bound both to use and to improve them. Mingling skill and intelligence with the daily occupations of life, she has made labor honorable, and as a necessary consequence, idleness is disgraceful. Knowledge has been the ambition of her sons, and she has reverenced and venerated the purity and chastity of her matrons and her daughters. At the hearthstone, at the family table, and at the family altar, on all those occasions where the structure of youthful character is builded up, these sentiments of love for knowledge and of reverence for maidenly virtue have been builded in, 
and where they stand, so wrought and mingled with the fibers of being, that none but God can tell which is nature and which is education, which we owe primarily to the grace of heaven, and which to the cooperating wisdom of the institutions of men. Verily, not as we ought have we obeyed the laws of Jehovah, or imitated the divine example of the Saviour, and yet, for such imperfect obedience and distant imitation as we have rendered, God has showered down manna from the heavens, and opened a rock whence flow living waters to gladden every thirsty place. He who studies the present or the historic character of Massachusetts will see, and he who studies it most profoundly will see most clearly, that whatever of abundance, of intelligence, or of integrity— whatever of character at home or of renown abroad she may possess, all has been evolved from the enlightened and at least partially Christianized mind, not of a few, but of the great masses of her people. They are not the result of outward riches or art brought around it, or laminated over it, but of an awakened inward force, working energetically outwards, and fashioning the most intractable circumstances to the dominion of its own desires and resolves. And this force has been awakened, and its unspent energies replenished, more than from all things else, by her common schools. When we witness the mighty achievements of art, the locomotive taking up its burden of a hundred tons, and transporting it for hundreds of miles between the rising and the setting sun, the steamboat cleaving its rapid way triumphant over wind and tide, the power loom yielding products of greater richness and abundance in a single day than all the inhabitants of Tyre could have manufactured in years, the printing press which could have replaced the Alexandrian library within a week after it was burnt, the lightning not only domesticated in the laboratories of the useful arts, but employed as a messenger between distant cities, and galleries of beautiful paintings quickened into life by the sunbeams. When we see all these marvels of power and of celerity, we are prone to conclude that it is to them we are indebted for the increase of our wealth and for the progress of our society. But were there any statistics to show the aggregate value of all the thrifty and gainful habits of the people at large, the greater productiveness of the educated than of the brutified laborer, the increased power of the intelligent hand, and the broad survey and deep intuition of the intelligent eye, could we see a ledger account of the profits which come from forethought, order, and system, as they preside over all our farms, in all our workshops, and emphatically in all the labors of our households, we should then know how rapidly their gathered units swell into millions upon millions, the skill that strikes the nail's head instead of the finger's ends, the care that mends a fence and saves a cornfield, that drives a horseshoe nail and secures both rider and horse, that extinguishes a light and saves a house, the prudence that cuts the coat according to the cloth, that lays by something for a rainy day, and that postpones marriage until reasonably sure of a livelihood, the forethought that sees the end from the beginning, and reaches it by the direct route of an hour instead of the circuitous gropings of a day, the exact remembrance impressed upon childhood to do the errand as it was bidden, and more than all, the economy of virtue over vice, of restrained over pampered desires. These things are not set down in works on political economy, but they have far more to do with the wealth of nations than any laws which aim to regulate the balance of trade, or any speculations on capital and labor, or any of the great achievements of art. That vast variety of ways in which an intelligent people surpass a stupid one, and an exemplary people an immoral one, has infinitely more to do with the well-being of a nation than soil or climate, or even than government itself, excepting so far as government may prove to be the patron of intelligence and virtue. From her earliest colonial history, the policy of Massachusetts has been to develop the minds of all her people, and to imbue them with the principles of duty. To do this work most effectually, she has begun it with the young. If she would continue to mount higher and higher toward the summit of prosperity, 
she must continue the means by which her present elevation has been gained. In doing this, she will not only exercise the noblest prerogative of government, but will cooperate with the Almighty in one of his sublimest works. The Greek rhetorician Longinus quotes from the Mosaic account of the creation what he calls the sublimest passage ever uttered. God said, Let there be light, and there was light. From the center of black immensity, effulgence burst forth. Above, beneath, on every side, its radiance streamed out, silent, yet making each spot in the vast concave brighter than the line which the lightning pencils upon the midnight cloud. Darkness fled, as the swift beams spread onward and outward in an unending circumfusion of splendor. Onward and outward still they move to this day, glorifying through wider and wider regions of space the infinite author from whose power and beneficence they sprang. But not only in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, did he say, Let there be light. Whenever a human soul is born into the world, its creator stands over it and again pronounces the same sublime words, Let there be light. Magnificent indeed was the material creation, when suddenly blazing forth in mid-space the new-born sun dispelled the darkness of the ancient night. But infinitely more magnificent is it when the human soul rays forth its subtler and swifter beams, when the light of the senses irradiates all outward things, revealing the beauty of their colors, and the exquisite symmetry of their proportions and forms, when the light of reason penetrates to their invisible properties and laws, and displays all those hidden relations that make up all the sciences, when the light of conscience illuminates the moral world, separating truth from error and virtue from vice. The light of the newly kindled sun indeed was glorious. It struck upon all the planets and waked into existence their myriad capacities of life and joy. As it rebounded from them, it showed their vast orbs all wheeling, circle beyond circle, in their stupendous courses. The sons of God shouted for joy. That light sped onward, beyond Sirius, beyond the Pole Star, beyond Orion and the Pleiades, and is still speeding onward into the abysses of space. But the light of the human soul flies swifter than the light of the sun, and outshines its meridian blaze. It can embrace not only the sun of our system, but all suns and galaxies of suns. Ay, the soul is capable of knowing and of enjoying him who created the suns themselves. And when these starry lusters that now glorify the firmament shall wax dim and fade away like a wasted taper, the light of the soul shall still remain. Nor time, nor cloud, nor any power but its own perversity shall ever quench its brightness. Again, I would say that whenever a human soul is born into the world, God stands over it and pronounces the same sublime fiat, Let there be light. And may the time soon come when all human governments shall cooperate with the divine government in carrying this benediction and baptism into fulfillment. End of section 41 Recording by Maria Casper Section 42 of Annual Reports to the Massachusetts Board of Education by Horace Mann. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eleventh Annual Report, 1847, Part 1. Gentlemen, the incontestable progress which the cause of popular education is making in Massachusetts and in some of the other states of our Union is a subject for hearty congratulation among ourselves and for devout gratitude to heaven. It cannot be denied that the cause has won to itself most able and earnest advocates who are in no way officially connected with it, but who cherish it from the purest motives of duty and philanthropy. But it happens to this, as to all other good causes, that some of its professed friends— have attached themselves to it from collateral and some from sinister motives. It is equally true that the cause has enemies. 
although in this community there are but few who dare to make open proclamation of their hostility. But opponents are all the more formidable when their opposition is secret. Their measures of counteraction are not the less efficient because they are indirect and hide their origin under specious pretenses. There is a third class who have no faith in the utility of education— they number it among what they are pleased to call the utopian schemes of reform with which the age is teeming, and they regard with an ill-concealed suspicion either the honesty of purpose or the soundness of intellect of those who are laboring to uphold its banner and to bear it forward. There are those also who suspect in education the existence of some unknown and mystical power, which, should it once obtain the ascendancy, would bear the community onward they know not whither, and having some ism or ology of their own, by which, provided all civil institutions and nature herself will succumb to their dictation, they can forthwith extricate the world from all its troubles, and carry it forward in the directest line, and with the swiftest speed to a millennial goal, they discard an agency whose power they can neither control nor comprehend." And lastly, there are those who array themselves against education solely from mercenary motives, because of the one or two mills upon the dollar which its support subtracts from their property. To meet the opposition and the indifference originating in these and similar prejudgments, the subject of education has been very much agitated, particularly in the northern portion of our country, within the last dozen years, there can be no hazard in affirming that far more has been spoken and printed, heard and read on this theme within the last twelve years than ever before were at all put together since the settlement of the colonies. The consequence certainly has been a very marked development of the merits of the subject, and a corresponding opening or expansion of the public mind for their recognition. To many sensible men it has come like a revelation— inspiring hopes for the amelioration of mankind and for the perpetuity of our institutions, which they had never dreamed of before. There are thousands of persons amongst us whose once darkened minds have been so quickened with life and illuminated with wisdom on this subject as to beget an intolerable impatience under old imperfections, a perception of which has made rest impossible and the pleasures of home uncomfortable, until within their respective spheres they had effected a reform. In order to make this subject more intelligible to the common mind, as well as to conform to broad distinctions which nature herself has established, it has been considered under a threefold aspect. First, as embracing the proper care and training of the body, that its health and longevity may be secured. Second, as cultivating the faculties by which we perceive, compare, analyze, and combine, remember, reason, and perceive natural fitness and the beauty of things, so that we may know more of the world in which we are placed, and of the glorious attributes of its Maker, and so that by more faithfully harmonizing our conduct with its laws, we may the better enjoy its exquisite adaptations to our welfare. And thirdly, as fashioning our moral nature into some resemblance to its divine original, subordinating our propensities to the law of duty, expanding our benevolence into a sentiment of universal brotherhood, and lifting our hearts to the grateful and devout contemplation of God. In pursuance of these fundamental ideas, it has been shown by the authority of the highest medical men in the country that even in the present imperfect state of physiological science, more than one-half of all the cases of bodily disability and disease, more than one-half of all the pains and expenditures of sickness, more than one-half of all the cases of premature death, that is, of death under the age of seventy years, are the consequence of sheer ignorance." not of any irrepealable decree of fatality necessitating their existence, independently of our consent and cooperation, 
what of our own brutish ignorance of the conditions of health and life to which our bodies have been subjected by their Maker. And I desire also to be here understood as not including in this moiety of unnecessary suffering and of untimely death a single one of that extensive class of cases which result from a slavish submission to some tyrannous appetite, such as intemperance, for instance, where the knowledge, even if we possessed it, might be overborne in a conflict with the sensual desire. But I mean maladies, pains, and death, which a bad man would be as quick to avoid as a good one, which every sane man would desire to escape from, as he would from blindness or deafness, the gout or the toothache. Even were ignorance, then, to be classed among the greatest luxuries of life, it would be found too costly an indulgence to be borne by an economical people. The indispensableness of education to worldly prosperity has also been demonstrated. An ignorant people not only is, but must be a poor people. They must be destitute of sagacity and providence, and, of course, of competence and comfort. The proof of this does not depend upon the lessons of history, but on the constitution of nature. No richness of climate, no spontaneous productiveness of soil, no facilities for commerce, no stores of gold or of diamonds garnered in the treasure chambers of the earth, can confer even worldly prosperity upon an uneducated nation. Such a nation cannot create wealth of itself, and whatever riches may be showered upon it will run to waste. The ignorant pearl divers do not wear the pearls they win. The diamond hunters are not ornamented by the gems they find. The miners for silver and gold are not enriched by the precious metals they dig. Those who toil on the most luxuriant soils are not filled with the harvests they gather. All the choicest productions of the earth, whether mineral or vegetable, wherever found or wherever gathered, will in a short time, as by some secret and resistless attraction, make their way into the hands of the more intelligent. Within the last four centuries the people of Spain have owned as much silver and gold as all the other nations of Europe put together. Yet at the present time poor indeed is the people who have less than they." The nation which produced more of the raw material and manufactured from it more fine linen than all contemporary nations are now the most ragged and squalid in Christendom. Let whoever will sow the seed or gather the fruit, intelligence will consume the banquet. It must be admitted, indeed, that when the people composing any particular state or country are compared with each other, the wisest are not always the wealthiest. This natural law, like others, is liable to fluctuations and disturbances from artificial and arbitrary institutions. Primogeniture, entail, monopoly, may derange its action. Yet even here, as if to add confirmation to the general principle, it is always found that the families of inferior mind who inherit wealth, and the imbecile sovereigns or rulers who inherit power, owe their elevation to the greatness of some ancestor whose mental superiority not only won preeminence for himself, but for his descendants also. Where wealth or social position has not been earned or won by the possessors themselves, it is the representative of some ancestral talent whose force is not yet expended. Who that visited the late mechanics fair in the city of Boston was not bewildered by the number and diversity of the products of inventive genius and skill there exhibited. To the common observer it was a profusion producing confusion. What would be the result and sum total of a mechanics fair among a tribe in the interior of Africa or among the aborigines of our western wilderness, hardly more than a stone hatchet, a flint-headed arrow, a stick burned at the end and sharpened into a spear, and a few yards of tawdry wampum. Yet the variety and richness of the one, compared with the poverty and rudeness of the other, would be but feeble symbols of the relative power and weakness of the minds from which they sprung. And whence came the vast, wonderful intellectual superiority? It came from the old slate and pencil, the bit of chalk and the bit of board, planed or unplaned, 
the spelling book and the reading book, which have been found in every household through all our borders, from the time of the first rude huts which went up amid winter and storm about Plymouth Rock, which have been the companions and playthings of every nursery, and the business things of every schoolroom, for more than two centuries, until the children, as if by force of hereditary instinct, seem to look round inquiringly after them almost as soon as they are born. These are the acorns whence the majestic forest has sprung. If the difference between persons dwelling in the same community and living side by side be less striking to the senses, it is not less instructive to the reason. In my fifth annual report, I presented the testimony of some of the most eminent and successful businessmen amongst us, proving from business data and beyond controversy that labor becomes more profitable as the laborer is more intelligent, and that the true mint of wealth, the veritable coinage of the country, is not to be found in magnificent government establishments at Philadelphia or New Orleans, but in the humble schoolhouse. On the occasion referred to, one of our most sagacious manufacturers declared, not only in accordance with the conclusions of his own reason, but as the result of an actual experiment, that the best cotton mill in New England, if worked by operatives so low in the scale of intelligence as to be unable to read and write, would never yield the proprietor a profit, that the machinery would soon be worn out, the owner impoverished, and the operatives themselves left penniless. Another witness, for a long time superintendent of many work people, made the following striking remark. So confident am I that production is affected by the intellectual and moral condition of help, that whenever a mill or a room should fail to give the proper amount of work, my first inquiry, after that respecting the condition of the machinery, would be as to the character of the help, and if the deficiency remained any great length of time, I am sure I should find many who had made their marks upon the payroll, being unable to write their names." and I should be greatly disappointed if I did not, upon inquiry, find a portion of them of irregular habits and suspicious character. Is it not, in fact, most palpably demonstrable, from a comparison of the nature of man with the powers and properties of the material universe in which he is placed, that he was designed to reach a point of intellectual and moral elevation far higher than any which the most favored people on the earth have yet attained? A material world, active with such invisible energies, and constantly displaying such fitful changes as belong to our planet, would be the most cruel prison-house to beings capable of perceiving its aspects, but incapable of understanding its laws. The superiority of our affective and sympathetic faculties over those possessed by the lower orders of creation would only render us so much the more miserable and defenseless, if we had not the faculties of reason and judgment also, by which we are able to bring ourselves into harmony with surrounding circumstances. Without knowledge, our present lives would be far more wretched than those of the brutes which perish, for we should be vulnerable on all sides, capable of suffering the keenest pain, while incapable of avoiding its causes. The revolution of the seasons would inflict want and debasement upon the whole race if we could not foresee their vicissitudes and provide for their varying necessities. Comets and eclipses are fitted in their very natures to shed consternation and dismay upon the hearts of men, until the intellect comes in to explain the sublime order that produces them. To the savage, thunder and lightning are tokens of divine wrath while to the Christian philosopher they are only emphatic and vivid proofs of the greatness and wisdom of God. To the enlightened mind a tempest or a whirlwind is only a tempest or a whirlwind, but a barbarian dreads them a thousand times more for the anger of the gods which they denote, and for the evils they portend, than for any actual injuries which they inflict. The auroras of the north, so beautiful to the eye of science, have shaken myriads of hearts with fear. That numerous and various class of phenomenon which we call optical illusions are sources of the direst terror to the ignorant, while they gratify a philosophic curiosity with the purest delight. 
In short, we know that all the wonders and glories which nature displays in her majestic course are only sources of superstition to those who have not learned her sublime laws, darkening the already darkened mind, debasing the debased, and terrifying the affrighted. It seems impossible that a benevolent being could have gifted the human race with its high faculties if he had not provided for and ordained their development and edification. All the other orders of animated nature are adapted to their condition. But a human soul, quickened by irrepressible impulses of curiosity, subject to the illusions of hope and to the agonies of fear, but with no power to unriddle the mysteries by which it is encompassed, with no power to realize the hopes spontaneously springing up within it, or to emancipate itself from the bondage of fear, such a soul would be forever the trembling slave of nature, while nature would be a tyrant over it, deaf and remorseless. Whatever name might be given to the place of its habitation, it would be a habitation of unquenchable fire. Knowledge and a highly developed and highly trained reason are to the temporal necessities of man what instinct is to the brute. But instinct is complete, perfect, self-active, while knowledge and reason can never reach any adequate height without vigorous self-effort and copious instruction from others. Far better, therefore, would it have been for mankind had they never been elevated in the scale of existence above the simian tribe, the ape, the monkey, or the baboon, than that they should have been endowed with the faculties of memory, of hope, of fear, and of imagination, without an adequate ability to derive wisdom from past experience and to make provision for future necessities. There is no earthly power but education, which by supplying these wants can rescue the human race from sinking as much below the brute creation as they were designed to rise above it. So, too, if the practice of equity, virtue, and benevolence were not possible for the race, its condition would be far more deplorable than that of any horde of wild beasts that ever prowled through a wilderness or hid themselves for ambush in the depths of a jungle. Even tigers and wolves, with all their ferocity, can inflict but a transitory pain upon each other or upon the weaker races around them. The most ingenious of all the animals have never invented machines to torture those of their own or of an inferior order. The iron boot, the thumb screw, the rack, the faggot, are dreadful realities in natural history, but the infamy of their invention and their use belongs not to the brute creation. Brutes cannot build ships and cross oceans to despoil and enslave a defenseless kindred race in another hemisphere— nor can they forge any fetters, whether of iron or of the law, which shall bind in remorseless bondage not only the victim himself, but generations of his descendants. Brutes cannot bereave each other of their natural instincts, cannot make the mother forget her young, the mated pair assail each other's lives, or the offspring lay patricidal hands upon its parent, by transforming the choicest fruits of the earth into poison, and selling this poison for ignominious gain. The most selfish and ignoble races that ever flew through the air or swam in the sea never availed themselves of the accidental possession of power to establish orders of patrician and plebeian, or of lord and commoner, and thus to doom one portion of their number to perform all the toil and bear all the burdens of the tribe, while they themselves monopolized all its leisure and its luxuries. What a spectacle would be presented if a few individuals of some family of insects, gathering themselves into conclave upon some spire of grass in the middle of a vast plain, or upon some leaf in a boundless forest, should there presume not only to adjudicate upon all the purposes of creation and all the mysteries of eternity— but should denounce imprisonment and torture, the faggot and the scaffold, upon all who would not bow to their authority, and avow assent to their conclusions. There are tribes of the brute creation, it is true, which prey upon other tribes, but it is only for the satisfaction of a physical want, and when their hunger is appeased, their fierceness subsides. 
but not in the north, where their rage is wetted by arctic cold, nor in the south, where their blood is fevered by tropical heat, do they ever inflict upon a victim the lifelong solitude of a dungeon, or gratuitously burn his body and heap contempt upon his ashes for not believing as they believe, or for not acknowledging as the great spirit of the universe the idol which they may have set up. If, then, I say, it had not been a part of the divine determination in the creation of our race, that its terrible propensities should be controlled, and its higher susceptibilities advanced into supremacy, zoology has yet to discover the species of animals so vile, so wretched, so mutually predacious, that mankind has not reason to envy them. If posterity is to be what history shows us that nineteen-twentieths of all the preceding world have been, what not less than four-fifths of it now are, then is man not the noblest but the ignoblest work of creation, the accursed and not the favored of heaven. Not believing in such a destiny, I believe there is a way to avoid it. Having proved, then, in former reports, by the testimony of wise and skilled men, that disease may be supplanted by health, bodily pain by enjoyment, and premature death by length of life, merely by the knowledge and practice of a few great physiological principles, such as every person can easily master before the age of sixteen years, and having also shown, by testimony equally authentic and satisfactory, that intelligence, cooperating with the bounties of nature, is sufficient to secure comfort and competence to all mankind, I propose to myself in the residue of this report the still more delightful task of showing, by proofs equally unexceptionable and convincing, that the great body of vices and crimes which now sadden and torment the community may be dislodged and driven out from amongst us by such improvements in our present common school system as we are abundantly able immediately to make. During the last summer, in order to make a clear and full presentation of the subject to those persons whose testimony I wished to obtain, I prepared a circular, setting forth with as much precision and completeness as possible certain specific emendations of our present school system, only such emendations, however, as we can readily make, and appealing to the experience and judgment of the persons addressed to know what would be the results were the system to be so amended. This circular was sent to teachers, highly competent to give evidence on so important a subject, competent from their science and from their personal experience, from the sobriety of their judgment and from their freedom from any motive to overstate facts or to deduce inferences too broad for the premises on which they were founded. In fine, the circular was sent to persons whose elevated character and whose extended personal acquaintance with the subject matter on which they testify place them above denial, cavil, or suspicion. The circular and the answers to it follow. Circular. Two blank. I desire to obtain the opinion of teachers who are both scientific and practical on a subject of great importance to the cause of popular education. Your long experience in school keeping, the great number of children whom you have had under your care, and your well-earned reputation as an instructor and trainer of youth, prompt me to apply to you for answers to the subjoined inquiries. My general object is to obtain such an opinion as your experience will authorize you to give, respecting the efficiency in the formation of social and moral character of a good common school education conducted on the cardinal principles of the New England systems. In other words, how much of improvement in the upright conduct and good morals of the community we might reasonably hope and expect if all our common schools were what they should be, what some of them now are, and what all of them, by means which the public is perfectly able to command, may soon be made to become. As we look around us, we see that society is infested by vices, both small and great. The value of life is diminished, and even life itself is sometimes made burdensome and odious, 
by the existence amongst us of pests and nuisances in human form, whom the law forbids us to destroy, and whom, with all our efforts, we are unable wholly to reform. Were we permitted to hunt out and exterminate from society a wicked or mischievous man, as we would a prowling wolf from the sheepfold, or could we apply the sovereign antidote of extinction to a pestilent brood of children whom profligate parents are about to send forth into the world, we might then secure ourselves in a summary manner from present fears and from future annoyance. So, too, if we could arrest the momentum of long habit, or win back to the paths of virtue those who, by their frequent tread, have worn the highways of vice both smooth and broad, we should then have access to a milder, though a more laborious, remedy. But the common sentiments of mankind would revolt at any proposal to prevent all violations of the moral code by extinguishing the life of the violators, and all history and experience afford concurrent proof that the inbred habits of grown men and women, their accustomed trains of thought and of action, are mainly beyond the control of secondary causes. Hence it is that a great part of the legislation of every state and nation, a vast majority of the decisions of all legal tribunals, and a still larger proportion of all the labors and expenditures of philanthropic and Christian men, have been devoted to the punishment of positive wrong, or to the vain attempt to repair its nameless and numberless mischiefs. Could these wrongs and mischiefs be prevented, our descendants would inherit a new earth. The classes of common offenses by which society is vexed and tormented are numerous, but the individual acts of commission under the respective classes are absolutely incomprehensible save by the omniscient, there is a detestable practice of profane swearing, which is motiveless and gratuitous wickedness. This is a vice which neither gives any property to a poor man, nor any luxury to a rich one. It degrades even the clown to a lower state of vulgarity, and it would render the presence even of the most polished gentleman offensive and disgusting, if it were ever possible for a gentleman to be guilty of it though greatly restricted at the present day in its destructive agency, and gradually withdrawing itself from the more respectable and intelligent classes to the two extremes of society, to the luxuriously rich and the self-made poor, yet the vice of intemperance still exists amongst us. Wherever it invades, it eats out the substance of families, not only consumes the means of educating children, but eradicates also the very disposition to educate them. It involves the innocent in the sufferings of the guilty, even torturing them with superadded pangs of shame which the guilty do not feel, and according to the divinely ordained laws of our physical being, it visits the iniquities of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation, by sowing in their constitution the seeds of inordinate desires." Below that degree of slander or defamation which the law denounces as punishable, there exists such an amount of censoriousness and detraction as often estranges acquaintances, dissolves friendships, introduces discord into neighborhoods and communities, and sometimes entails hereditary animosities upon families and circles which might otherwise be blessed by harmony and peace." nor can the gross and cowardly offense of lying be omitted from this odious catalogue. This vice includes in its very nature so much of the assassin and the dastard that it lurks to inflict secret blows, or only ventures abroad when large numbers, bound together by strong ties of passion or of interest, impart mutual confidence and boldness in the prosecution of a common object." Hence a private individual who is known as a liar is detested, scorned, and shunned, while profligate political defamers and sectarian zealots, inspired by a common sentiment of ambition or of intolerance, and keeping themselves in countenance by their numbers and their partisanship, welcome this vice as an ally and rejoice in the successes obtained by its aid. No patriotism is proof against the rancor of party spirit, no piety or good works against the rage and blindness of religious bigotry. 
in pecuniary transactions, the temptations to overreaching, to exorbitance, and to actual dishonesty are yielded to with a most lamentable frequency. The buyer takes advantage of the necessity of the seller, and obtains a transfer of his property for a small part of its value, or sometimes, by adroit management and preliminary scheming, he creates the necessity which places the victim within the jaws of his avarice. The seller knowingly overstates the quantity, the quality, or the value of the commodities he sells, and perhaps takes advantage of the ignorance or credulity of the purchaser to obtain a price which he knows to be exorbitant and inequitable. The employer often avails himself of the necessity of the employed to obtain his services for less than they are worth. He summons in hunger and cold and the sufferings of a dependent family as advisers in helping to make an unrighteous bargain and as sureties for its performance. Men without any pecuniary resources which they can call their own embark in hazardous speculations where if the rash adventure should chance to prove successful, they will pocket all the gain, but should it turn out to be disastrous, their creditors must suffer all the loss. In some of the commercial countries of Europe, a merchant's insolvency affects his moral character hardly less than his pecuniary credit. If a bankrupt cannot show that his deficiency of means was occasioned by some disaster which he could not control— or by some loss which he could not reasonably be expected to foresee, he forfeits his mercantile standing amongst honorable dealers, and can retrieve his character only by actual proof of returning or of newly created honesty. A second failure, unexplained and unatoned for, brands with disgrace, and expels not more from the traffic than from the companionship of honorable men." The above classes of wrongdoing, together with many others of a kindred nature, are regarded by the law as minor offenses. Some of them it does not undertake to punish. Yet from their widespread prevalence and great frequency, they perhaps inflict as large an aggregate of evil upon society as those of a more heinous and formidable character, but of less frequent occurrence. In regard to the offenses of a graver nature— such as come under the head of crimes or felonies, the condition of our country compares favorably with that of any other part of Christendom. Especially will this remark appear true if we consider the slight amount of preventive force made use of in any part of our Union to deter from actual transgression, and, as a general rule, the lightness of the penal sanctions held up as a terror to evil doers. Yet that there does exist amongst us an appalling amount of criminality of this deeper dye, that flagrant offenses against the rights of property, of person, of reputation, and of life are perpetrated, is proved by the records of our criminal courts, and by the mournful procession of convicts and felons whom we see on their way to our penitentiaries and other receptacles prepared for the guilty." Including all classes of offenders, both the less and the more flagitious, it is undeniable that there exists amongst us a multitude of men of whom it may be truly said that it would be better for the community had they never been born, or had they died in childhood, before their propensities for evil had been developed, or before they had gone abroad to disturb the peace of society and to destroy that sense of security which every honest man is entitled to feel." To thin the ranks of this host of enemies to the welfare of the race, or to cripple the evil energies of those who could not be wholly reclaimed, has been the object of philanthropists and sages from the beginning of time. Their efforts, however, have been expended a millionfold more upon the old than upon the young, and a millionfold more also in the way of punishment than of prevention. Among the republics of ancient times, a few wise and sagacious men did clearly perceive the bearing of education upon character, and, of course, upon innocence and guilt, both personal and public. But among the masses of the people, there never existed any settled and operative conviction of this truth, and not a single year can be pointed out in all their long annals, where a majority of those who held the reins of government and framed the laws of the state rose to any practical or even theoretic conception of the grand idea 
that the vital intelligence or the stupidity, the integrity or the dishonesty of the people at large, will be measured and bounded by the kind and degree of the education imparted to its children, just as the zones upon the earth's surface are measured and bounded by the amount of sunlight which is shed upon them. In modern times, this relation of early education to adult character has been more clearly and generally recognized as being what it truly to a very great extent is, a relation between cause and effect. As one means of establishing this truth, many earnest well-wishers of their race have made extensive collections of what are called the statistics of education and crime. The inmates of large penal establishments have been subjected to a personal examination in order to ascertain whether a greater proportion of them than of the community at large from which they were taken were wholly ignorant of letters. In this investigation, the comparison has been made between those who were able both to read and write, and those who could perform neither or but one of these operations. I will not dwell here upon the amazing absurdity of any definition of the word education, whose spirit or whose terms are satisfied by the mere ability to read and write. Reading and writing may be, and among this class of persons they usually are, mere mechanical processes, and how such attainments should ever have been dignified by the name of education, or confounded with that noble culture of the soul which pours the noonday illumination of knowledge upon the midnight darkness of ignorance, which seeks to enthrone the moral faculties over all animal desires and propensities, and to make the entire course of instruction subservient to the great duties of love to God and love to man, how an absurdity so extravagant and now so obvious could ever have been committed can be explained only by reference to the low and unworthy ideas of education which once prevailed. The naked capacity to read and write is no more education than a tool is a workman, or a telescope is a Laplace or a Leverrier. To possess the means of education is not the same as to possess the lofty powers and immunities of education, any more than to possess the pen of a poet is to possess a poet's skill and faculty divine, or than the possession of the gospel is the possession of that liberty wherewith Christ maketh his disciples free. And that reading and writing are only instruments or means to be used in education is a truism now so intuitively obvious as to disdain argument. And hence it is that of two persons, one of whom can barely write his name or spell out a paragraph in a newspaper, while to the mind of the other the contents of all manuscripts and all libraries have no more existence than non-entity has to his senses, it would be hazardous to affirm that the chances of the former for a virtuous life are much superior to those of the latter. Nor do the best authorities dispel all the clouds of doubt which hang over this question. Some writers maintain that crime actually increases in proportion to the diffusion of the rudiments of knowledge, provided the knowledge which is diffused stops with the mere rudiments. I think, however, it must be conceded that the preponderance of names and of statistical results does, on the whole, clearly favor the opinion that crime recedes as knowledge advances, and that as the full-risen sun enables a traveler to see his path and to avoid the dangers that beset it, so the first and faintest gleaming of the morning light helps him to discover his way and to shun its perils. It must also be remembered that when great numbers are taken as the basis of comparison, all of whom possess the rudiments of knowledge, it will always happen that some of them will possess more than the rudiments. Hence, taking whole communities together, I believe the legitimate and inevitable conclusion to be that every advance in knowledge amongst a people is pro tanto an invasion of the dominion of crime. For years past, however, although I have carefully scrutinized these so-called statistics of education and crime, and am convinced that they do establish a distinction between the two classes, one of which can read and write, while the other can do neither of these things or but one of them, 
in regard to their relative exemption from crime or exposure to it, yet I have never been able to bring myself to present these schedules to our people as an argument in favor of that elevated and ennobling education to which it is their duty to aspire. I have felt that by so doing the argument would be shorn of half its power by the feebleness of the proofs brought to sustain it. It would be like exhibiting a taper to prove the existence of light while surrounded by the sun's effulgence. Our present state of society, the form of government under which we live, the improvable faculties with which we have been endowed by our Maker, and the solemn destiny that awaits us, all demand vastly more than a knowledge of the nature and power of letters and the just method of spelling words, and the mechanical ability to imitate with a pen their written and printed signs. Yet this degrading idea of education, which was first conceived in reference to the ignorant classes of Europe, has been to some extent adopted and acted upon in our own country. The last census of the United States, taken by authority of a law of Congress, and in compliance with a provision of the Federal Constitution, proceeded upon this European fallacy. It virtually adopted the old line of distinction between education and ignorance, for it required an enumeration of all persons over twenty years of age who were unable to read and write. The results have been published, and they are now embodied with the permanent statistics of the country. Towns, counties, and states are classed. Their condition is mentioned with honor or with opprobrium according to their relative position above or below this absurd standard of knowledge and culture. It is inevitable that this legislative sanction of such a standard, this naturalization of it, so to speak, should have a most baneful effect in debasing public opinion upon the subject. Facts of an interesting nature are presented, it is true, but their tendency is to rob education of all its noblest attributes. But though the public mind always tends strongly to conform its modes of thinking to legal definitions, and to subscribe to opinions sanctioned by high authority, yet the common sense of the community, especially in the more educated states of the Union, has outgrown these contracted notions, and has claimed for the word education a far ampler and loftier significance. All intelligent thinkers upon this subject now utterly discard and repudiate the idea that reading and writing, with a knowledge of accounts, constitutes education. The lowest claim which any intelligent man now prefers in its behalf is that its domain extends over the threefold nature of man, over his body, training it by the systematic and intelligent observance of those benign laws which secure health, impart strength, and prolong life, over his intellect, invigorating the mind, replenishing it with knowledge, and cultivating all those tastes which are allied to virtue, and over his moral and religious susceptibilities also, dethroning selfishness, enthroning conscience, leading the affections outward in good will towards men, and upward in gratitude and reverence to God. In thousands of reports prepared by school committees, in frequent addresses and lectures delivered on public occasions, in all educational documents emanating from high official sources, and in every work pretending to scientific accuracy or to any comprehensive outline of the subject, these sacred and majestic attributes have been set forth, and it has been demonstrated hundreds of times over that the effect of a sound education of the people must not accidentally but necessarily, not occasionally but always, be to repress the commission of crime and to promote the diffusion of human happiness— and that to act in conscious defiance or disregard of these truths is treachery to the best interests of our fellow men, and impiety towards the author of the moral universe. But notwithstanding all that has been said, and so well said, as to the moral power of education in reforming the world, there have still been a vagueness and an indefiniteness in regard to the extent of that power, which have shorn argument and eloquence of much of their strength. Nowhere have its advocates set forth distinctly and specifically 
how much they believe can be accomplished by it. When an alleged improvement is presented to a judicious man, he wishes to know whether and to what extent its benefit will exceed its cost. A capitalist will not aid a new enterprise with his money until he is satisfied of the profitableness of the investment, nor will a manufacturer purchase new machinery unless he is convinced that it will do better work in the same time or equal work in less. It seems to me that the time is now arrived when the friends of this cause should plant themselves on a more conspicuous position, when surveying the infinite of wretchedness and crime around them, before which the stoutest heart is appalled and humanity stands aghast, they should proclaim the power and the prerogatives of education to rescue mankind from their calamities. Founding themselves upon evidence that cannot be disputed, and fortifying their conclusions by the results of personal experience, they should proclaim how far the miseries of men can be alleviated, and how far the dominion of crime can be overthrown, by such a system of education as it is perfectly practicable for every civilized community forthwith to establish, and thus they should awaken the conscience of the public to a sense of its responsibility. The idea will be more distinctly presented under an inquiry like the following. Under the soundest and most vigorous system of education which we can now command, what proportion or percentage of all the children who are born can be made useful and exemplary men, honest dealers, conscientious jurors, true witnesses, incorruptible voters or magistrates, good parents, good neighbors, good members of society. In other words, with our present knowledge of the art and science of education, and with such new fruit of experience as time may be expected to bear, what proportion or percentage of all children must be pronounced irreclaimable and irredeemable, notwithstanding the most vigorous educational efforts which in the present state of society can be put forth in their behalf. What proportion or percentage must become drunkards, profane swearers, detractors, vagabonds, rioters, cheats, thieves, aggressors upon the rights of property, of person, of reputation, or of life, or, in a single phrase, must be guilty of such omissions of right and commissions of wrong that it would have been better for the community had they never been born. This is a problem which the course of events has evolved and which society and the government must meet. If, with such educational means and resources as we can now command, 80, 90, 95, or 99 percent of all children can be made temperate, industrious, frugal, conscientious in all their dealings, prompt to pity and instruct ignorance instead of ridiculing it and taking advantage of it, public-spirited, philanthropic, and observers of all things sacred. If, I say, any given proportion of our children by human efforts and by such a divine blessing as the common course of God's providence authorizes us to expect, can be made to possess these qualities and to act from them, then, just so far as our posterity shall fall below this practicable exemption from vices and crimes, and just so far as they shall fail to possess these attainable virtues, just so far will those who frame and execute our laws, shape public opinion, and lead public action, be criminally responsible for the difference. I can conceive of no moral proposition clearer than this. Society, in its collective capacity, is the possessor of all the knowledge and the owner of all the property in existence. Governments have been organized and are invested with power to use any needful amount of this property for purposes of education, and by holding out adequate inducements and remuneration, they can command the services of the highest talent. Here, then, duty and the means to perform it come together. The only remaining question is, how much can be done? For in a cause and for a purpose like this, nothing which can actually be done can be guiltlessly omitted. If it is proved with a reasonable degree of certainty that ninety-nine, ninety-five, ninety, eighty, or any other given percentage of all children can be rescued from vice and crime 
and can be so educated and trained as to become valuable citizens, but the state refuses or declines to do this work, then the state itself becomes a culprit, and before the great moral judge who is seated on the throne of the universe, it must stand a spectacle of shame and guilt, like one of its own inferior culprits before its own judicial tribunals. With these preliminary observations, which seemed to be necessary in order to a full exposition of the object I have in view, I proceed to submit the following specific inquiries, and to request your answer to them. 1. How many years have you been engaged in school-keeping, and whether in the country or in populous towns or cities? 2. About how many children have you had under your care, of which sex and between what ages? 3. Should all our schools be kept by teachers of high intellectual and moral qualifications, and should all the children in the community be brought within these schools for ten months in a year, from the age of four to that of sixteen years, then what proportion, what percentage of such children as you have had under your care could, in your opinion, be so educated and trained that their existence on going out into the world would be a benefit and not a detriment, an honor and not a shame to society? Or to state the question in a general form, if all children were brought within the salutary and auspicious influences I have here supposed, what percentage of them should you pronounce to be irreclaimable and hopeless? Of course, I do not speak of imbeciles or idiots, but only of rational and accountable beings. You will perceive that in certain respects I am supposing no change in the present condition of society— I am taking families as they now are, and am allowing all of the unfavorable as well as the favorable influences of the old upon the young to continue to operate, at least for a time, as heretofore. Nor do I suppose any sudden transforming change in cooperative and auxiliary institutions, such as the Sabbath school, the pulpit, and so forth— although it is certain that such a state of things as is here outlined would gradually impart new vigor to all that advances the progress of society, while it would impair the force of all that retards it. On the other hand, however, I am supposing two great changes. I am supposing all our children to be placed under the care of such a class of men and women as we now honor by the appellation of first-class or first-rate teachers— of such teachers as are able in the schoolroom both to teach and to govern, and who out of the schoolroom will be animated by a missionary spirit in furthering the objects of their sacred vocation. I have also supposed that all the children in the community shall be brought under the forming hands of such teachers from the age of four to that of sixteen for ten months in each year. While, therefore, the above supposition leaves children exposed in many cases to pernicious family and social influences under which they are now suffering, it assumes that all the children when out of school shall meet only such children as are enjoying the same high training, the same daily installation of moral principles as themselves. My supposition allows a continuance of the same family adult influences— at least until these shall be supplanted by the better influences of the rising generation, action and reaction hastening results, because these influences are facts which no earthly power can cause to be immediately changed. But I have supposed this noble company of teachers, this length of schools, and this universality of attendance, because these are reforms on the present condition of things which can be effected without any great delay, at the farthest a very few years, being an ample allowance for the completion of such a change. To reduce my third question, then, within its narrowest limits, and to make it as definite and precise as possible, suppose yourself to be stationed as a school teacher in a place similar to any of those in which you have before labored, Suppose yourself, too, to be surrounded by teachers fully as capable and zealous in all respects as yourself— and suppose further that all the children are brought under your care or theirs as above specified, 
that is, for a period of twelve years, or from four to sixteen, and ten months in each year. And will you then please to declare what proportion or percentage of those under your own care you believe could be turned out the blessing and not the bane, the honor and not the scandal of society, and on what proportion or percentage, the complement of the other, would your experience compel you to pronounce the doom of hopelessness and irreclaimability? Very truly and sincerely yours, Horace Mann. End of section 42. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 43 of Annual Reports to the Massachusetts Board of Education by Horace Mann. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eleventh Annual Report, 1847, Part 2. I extract from the replies to this circular only the specific answers to the circular. Letter from John Griscom, Esquire, Burlington, New Jersey, 8th month, 27th, 1847. My esteemed friend, my belief is that under the conditions mentioned in this question, not more than two percent would be irreclaimable nuisances to society, and that ninety-five percent would be supporters of the moral welfare of the community in which they resided. With teachers properly trained in normal schools, and with such a popular disposition towards schools as wise legislation might effect, nineteen-twentieths of the immoralities which afflict society might, I verily believe, be kept under hatches or eradicated from the soil of our social institutions. Every step in such a progress renders the next more easy. This is proved not only on the grand scale of comparing country with country and state with state, but district with its adjacent district and neighborhood with neighborhood. Finally, in the predicament last stated in the circular, and supposing the teachers to be imbued with the gospel spirit, I believe there would not be more than one-half of one percent of the children educated on whom a wise judge would be compelled to pronounce the doom of hopelessness and irreclaimability. In nothing which I have advanced has it been my intention to advocate any sectarian instruction in our schools, or anything adverse to the statutory limits of the Massachusetts school system. I therefore expressly disavow any intention to recommend truths or doctrines as part of the moral instruction to be given in public schools, which any believer in the Bible would reasonably deem to be sectarian. I am, with true esteem, thy friend, John Griscom. Letter from D. P. Page, Esquire. State Normal School, Albany, New York, November twentieth, 1847. Honorable Horace Mann. Dear Sir, Could I be connected with a school furnished with all the appliances you name, where all the children should be constant attendants upon my instruction for a succession of years, where all my fellow teachers should be such as you propose, and where all the favorable influences described in your circular should surround me and cheer me, even with my moderate abilities as a teacher, I should scarcely expect— after the first generation of children submitted to the experiment, to fail in a single case to secure the results you have named. But I should not forgive myself, nor think myself longer fit to be a teacher, if, with all the aids and influences you have supposed, I should fail in one case in a hundred to rear up children who, when they should become men, would be honest dealers, conscientious jurors, good witnesses, incorruptible voters or magistrates, good parents, good neighbors, good members of society, or, as you express it in another place, who would be temperate, industrious, frugal, conscientious in all their dealings, prompt to pity and instruct ignorance instead of ridiculing it and taking advantage of it, public-spirited, philanthropic, and observers of all things sacred— and negatively, who would not be drunkards, profane swearers, detractors, vagabonds, rioters, cheats, thieves, aggressors upon the rights of property, of person, of reputation, or of life, 
or guilty of such omissions of right and commissions of wrong that it would be better for the community had they never been born. With sincere regard, your friend, D. P. Page. Letter from Solomon Adams, Esquire, Boston, November 24th, 1847. Honorable Horace Mann, my dear sir, one, I have been engaged in this profession twenty-four years, the first five years in the country, the remainder of the time in a city. Two, my whole number of pupils is a little below two thousand. The last nineteen years my pupils have been females, previously both sexes. If a well-conducted education produces benevolence, justice, truth, patriotism, love to God and love to man, in one case, the same education, in the same circumstances, will produce the same results in all cases. The results for which we look and labor sometimes fail, not because the great law of uniformity is at fault, but by reason of counteracting causes which may escape our most careful scrutiny. Does the failure impair our confidence in the uniformity of moral causes and effects? The moment this law fails, every cord that binds society together is sundered. Society is disintegrated. Every social enactment by which society attempts to regulate its members, every motive by which one man hopes to influence another, assumes this uniformity. It is the hinge on which all social influences turn. Without it, we could not shape moral means to moral ends. To destroy it, to doubt it, would be the moral unhingement of society. In this great law are the teacher's hopes and encouragements. The great outline of the means he is to employ is well defined. It is his province to bring all those moral appliances to bear upon the soul which are suited to lead it into harmony with truth and with God, to train it to the perception and love of truth and goodness. In doing this, the faithful teacher is a co-worker with God, and may confidently look to the author of all good to give the crowning blessing to his strenuous endeavors. There are those, and I confess myself of the number, who believe and feel that all human endeavors, unaided by an influence from on high, will prove fruitless so far as the highest wants of the immortal spirit are concerned. Yet those who feel so can tell us of no way in which they are authorized to expect such an influence, and of no way in which it is exerted even by almighty power, except through the instrumentality of truth presented to the mind. There might as well be a conflagration without fire, or a flood without fluid. I confess I do not see how our different theological views can essentially alter our modes of instruction— we are all to train the young in the way in which they should go, giving line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, waiting for and expecting precious fruit. The fruit may ripen slowly. From day to day you may not be able to see any progress. This holds true both in moral and intellectual training. But by comparing distant intervals, progress is perceptible. At length a result comes which repays all the teacher's labor and inspires new courage for new efforts. You ask for my own experience. This is my apology for alluding with freedom to myself. Permit me to say that in very many cases, after laboring long with individuals almost against hope, and sometimes in a manner, too, which I can now see was not always wise— I have never had a case which has not resulted in some good degree, according to my wishes. The many kind and voluntary testimonials given years afterwards by persons who remembered that they were once my wayward pupils are among the pleasantest and most cheering incidents of my life. So uniform have been the results when I have had a fair trial and time enough that I have unhesitatingly adopted the motto, Never Despair. Parents and teachers are apt to look for too speedy results from the labors of the latter. The moral nature, like the intellectual and physical, is long and slow in reaching the full maturity of its strength. I was told a few years since, by a gentleman who knew the history of nearly all my pupils for the first five years of my labor, 
that not one of them had ever brought reproach upon himself or mortification upon friends by a bad life. I cannot now look over the whole list of my pupils and find one who had been with me long enough to receive a decided impression, whose life is not honorable and useful. I find them in all the learned professions and in the various mechanical arts. I find my female pupils scattered as teachers through half the states of the Union, and as the wives and assistants of Christian missionaries in every quarter of the globe. So far, therefore, as my own experience goes, so far as my knowledge of the experience of others extends, so far as the statistics of crime throw any light upon the subject, I should confidently expect that ninety-nine in a hundred, and I think even more, with such means of education as you have supposed, and with such divine favor as we are authorized to expect, would become good members of society, the supporters of order and law and truth and justice and all righteousness. That I may not be misunderstood, allow me to add a few explanatory remarks. I have no confidence in the reformatory power of education into which moral and religious influences do not enter. I assume, as anyone having the slightest acquaintance with your writings and teachings on this subject knows that you do, that the three great classes of powers, the physical, the intellectual, and the moral, shall each receive its proper training. And then I feel authorized to look confidently for that providential blessing which will secure the high results already alluded to. Without such a training, I have no right to expect the blessing of heaven or a good result. I do not fulfill the conditions on which such results are promised. It is to be feared, yea, to be for a lamentation, that comparatively few of teachers, and fewer still of the community, have looked upon a school education as anything more than a very limited intellectual training, leaving physical and moral culture to take care of themselves. The school laws of Massachusetts have always contemplated other attainments and vastly higher ends. Yet it so happens that that part of the law has been best remembered and acted on, which speaks of reading, writing, and the elements of arithmetic. These have been insisted on, chiefly, with reference to their direct application to the business and traffic of life, as if it were the chief end of man to count coppers, pocket them, and keep them. While the law contemplates these elementary attainments as merely the beginnings and inlets to all the treasures of wisdom, how many have looked upon them as the education of the boy and the man? Very truly your obedient friend and servant, S. Adams. Letter from Rev. Jacob Abbott, New York City, June 25, 1847. Honorable Horace Mann, Dear Sir, 1. I have been engaged in the practical duties of teaching for about ten years, chiefly in private schools in Boston and New York. 2. I have had under my care, for a longer or shorter time, probably nearly 800 pupils. They have been of both sexes, and all ages from 4 to 25. 3. If all our schools were under the charge of teachers possessing what I regard as the right intellectual and moral qualifications— and if all the children of the community were brought under the influence of these schools for ten months in the year, I think that the work of training up the whole community to intelligence and virtue would soon be accomplished as completely as any human end can be obtained by human means. I do not think, however, that so far as the formation of the habits of virtue in the young is concerned— the accomplishment of the result depends upon either the intellectual powers or attainments of the teacher, or upon the amount of formal moral instruction which he gives to his pupils. Knowledge alone has but little tendency to affect the feelings and principles of the heart, and formal moral instruction, except as auxiliary to other influences, has very little power, according to my experience, over the consciences and characters of the young. The true power of the teacher in giving to his pupils good characters in future life seems to me to lie in his forming them to the practice of virtue while under his charge by the influence of his own personal character and actions. To do this, however, he must have the right character himself. 
he must be governed in all that he does by high and honorable principles of action. He must be really benevolent and kind. He must take an honest interest in his pupils, not merely in their studies and general characters, but in all their childish thoughts and feelings, in the difficulties they encounter, in their temptations and trials, in their sports, in their contentions, in their troubles, in everything, in fact, that affects them. He must, in a word, feel a strong interest and sympathy for them in the thousand difficulties and discouragements they must encounter in slowly finding their way, with all their ignorance and inexperience, to their place in the complicated and bewildering maze of human life. A teacher who takes this sort of interest in his pupils will understand them and sympathize with them, in a way which will at once command their kind regard and give him a powerful and, in the view of others, a very mysterious ascendancy over their minds. They feel as if he was upon their side, taking their part, as it were, against the difficulties and dangers and troubles which surround them. Thus he becomes one of them, a sharer in their enjoyments, a partaker of their feelings. They come to him with confidence— he plans their amusements, he joins them in conversation, he settles their disputes. They see on what principles he acts, and they catch themselves the same mode of action from him by a kind of sympathy. They imbibe his sentiments insensibly and spontaneously, not because he enunciates them or proves them in lectures, but because he exhibits them in living reality, in his conversation and conduct. This sort of sympathetic action between heart and heart has far greater influence among all mankind than formal teachings and exhortations. It is the life and spirit of virtue in contradistinction from the letter and form. If all the children of this land were under the charge of such teachers for six hours in the day and ten months in the year, and were to continue under these influences for the usual period of instruction in schools— I do not see why the result would not be that in two generations substantially the whole population would be trained up to virtue, to habits of integrity, fidelity in duty, justice, temperance, and mutual good will. It seems to me that this effect would take place in all cases except where extremely unfavorable influences out of school should counteract it which I think would hardly be the case except in some districts in the more populous cities. I am very respectfully yours, Jacob Abbott. Letter from F. A. Adams, Esquire. Orange, New Jersey, December eleventh, 1847. Honorable Horace Mann. Dear Sir, I do not hesitate to express the conviction that there is no agency which society can exert through the government capable of exerting so great a moral influence for the rising generation as the steady training of the young in the best schools. In reply to the specific inquiry in your circular, what proportion of our youth would probably, under the advantages of schooling presupposed in the circular, fail of fulfilling honorably their social and moral obligations in society, I would say that in the course of my experience for ten years, in teaching between three and four hundred children, mostly boys, I have been acquainted with not more than two pupils, in regard to whom I should not feel a cheerful and strong confidence in the success of the proposed experiment. In regard to these two cases, I should not despair, but should have a strong preponderance of fear that under the best influences such as you have supposed they would still remain wedded to low and mischievous habits." From their peculiar temperament, there was much reason to suppose that a life of steady and hard labor would do for them much in a moral point of view which the influences of school could not accomplish. The class of youth I have had under my care would, in some respects, afford a better than average chance for the success of the experiment, as they in all cases have been exempt from the evils of poverty— in other respects, however, this exemption was counterbalanced by habits of self-indulgence, which could not have existed had the pecuniary means been wanting. I remain, dear sir, with sincere respect and esteem, yours, F. A. Adams. Letter from E. A. Andrews, Esquire, 
New Britain, Connecticut, December 8, 1847. Honorable Horace Mann, dear sir, in reply to your first and second questions, permit me simply to remark that I have been connected with the Department of Education, either as pupil or as teacher, for more than fifty years. I have instructed both in the country and in cities. In the former, I have, for the most part, had the charge of only a few select pupils. In the latter, for about twenty years, I was connected with large institutions of instruction. I have no means of determining with any tolerable approach to accuracy the whole number of my pupils, nor the proportion of each sex. I do not hesitate to express my conviction that such an education as your question supposes, continued for so long a period as twelve years, and including all the children of the community, would remove a very large portion of the evils with which society is now burdened. I need not say that I would be far from attributing so important results to any system of merely intellectual training, or even to the most perfect combination of intellectual, physical, and moral discipline, to the exclusion of that which is strictly religious. Such a qualification of my meaning might have been necessary, on account of the limited sense in which the word education is often used, had not the necessity been removed by the express terms of the conditions annexed to the question in your circular. It may indeed be feared that society is not yet fully prepared to put forth the effort necessary to accomplish so desirable a result. But I cannot believe that the time is very remote when its attainment will be considered an object of paramount importance. It cannot be that the millions of intelligent men found in this and in other Christian countries can much longer permit their feelings to be enlisted and the resources of the communities to which they belong to be employed in promoting objects of far inferior value, while the advantages of a good system of general education are in so great a degree overlooked. If, as I fully believe, it is in the power of the people of any state, by means so simple as your question supposes, and so completely in their own power as these obviously are, so to change the whole face of society in a single generation, that scarcely one or two percent of really incorrigible members shall be found in it, it cannot be that so great a good will continue to be neglected, and the means for its attainment unemployed. In forming our estimate of the probability of so important a result as I have supposed, it must not be forgotten that, simple as are the means now proposed for its attainment, they have never been employed, so far as I know, in any extended community whose experience is on record. In Scotland, and of late in Prussia, a considerable approximation has been made towards reaching the supposed conditions, and with benefits, it is believed, fully corresponding with the degree of perfection of their respective systems. The common schools of New England, which have done so much to elevate her character, have still fallen immeasurably short of the conditions supposed. With all their acknowledged defects, however, the instances, I believe, are few, in which those who have been trained in them from childhood to the close of the period usually allotted to education in these schools, have afterwards, on mingling with the world, proved to be incorrigibly vicious, a burden rather than a benefit to society. The records of our criminal courts and the doors of our penitentiaries have seldom been opened to those who in childhood had been in regular daily attendance for ten or twelve years upon the exercises of our common schools, however imperfect these schools may have been in their organization, and notwithstanding all the evil influences of uneducated associates to which the pupils have been exposed when out of school. The cell of the convict has, on the contrary, been almost uniformly occupied by those who have enjoyed few of the benefits of our common schools, and even the tenants of our poorhouses, it is believed, have in most instances belonged to the same unfortunate class. Very truly yours, E. A. Andrews. Letter from Roger S. Howard, Esquire Thetford, Vermont, September 1, 1847 Honorable Horace Mann, Dear Sir, Judging from what I have seen and do know, if the conditions you have mentioned were strictly complied with, 
if the attendance of the scholars could be as universal, constant, and long-continued as you have stated, if the teachers were men of those high intellectual and moral qualities, apt to teach and devoted to their work, and favored with that blessing which the word and providence of God teach us always to expect on our honest, earnest, and well-directed efforts in so good a cause, on these conditions and under these circumstances, I do not hesitate to express the opinion that the failures need not be, would not be, one per cent. Else what is the meaning of that explicit declaration in the Bible, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it? I am aware that the opinion I have expressed above may by some be considered extravagant, but I have not formed or expressed it without deliberation. During all my experience as a teacher, I have never known the scholar, whom, if brought within the reach of these salutary and auspicious influences for the length of time named, I should now be willing to believe or dare to pronounce utterly hopeless and irreclaimable. I do not mean to say that I never failed, but I do say that in some of the most difficult and desperate cases I have ever met with as a teacher— the result of direct, special, and persevering effort was such as to create the conviction that with more zeal, patience, and perseverance, and especially with the favoring influences above alluded to, success would have been certain and complete. And this conviction became more settled and strong the longer I continued to teach. The power of a truly enlightened and Christian system of common school education is but little understood or appreciated, when parents shall begin to feel, as they ought, its importance, when the community generally shall be willing to make the necessary efforts and sacrifices, and when teachers of the requisite literary qualifications and of high moral aims shall enter upon the work with a martyr's zeal, conscious that every day they are making deathless impressions upon immortal minds, then shall we see, as I believe, results which will greatly surpass the highest expectations of the most ardent and enthusiastic advocates of popular education. But I am occupying more space than I intended, and will only add that I am, dear sir, very respectfully and truly yours, Roger S. Howard. Letter from Miss Catherine E. Beecher Brattleboro, August twentieth, 1847 Honorable Horace Mann, dear sir, in reference to the questions you propose, I would reply that I have been engaged directly and personally as a teacher about fifteen years in Hartford, Connecticut, and Cincinnati, Ohio. I have had a few classes of quite young children under my care for the purpose of making some practical educational experiments, but most of my pupils in age have ranged from twelve to twenty. I have had pupils from every state in the Union, and though I have no precise records, I think the number cannot be less than a thousand. I have ever considered intellectual culture as subordinate to the main end of education, which is the formation of that character, which Jesus Christ teaches to be indispensable to the eternal well-being of our race. Excepting the few classes of young children before named, my efforts have been directed to measures for reforming bad and supplying good habits and principles in minds already more or less developed by education, and this I consider a much more difficult work than the right training of minds as yet uninjured by pernicious influences. In reference to the work of reforming miseducated minds, I have found that the noblest constructed minds— when greatly mismanaged, are the most liable to become the worst, while at the same time they most readily yield to reformatory measures. So that, as a general rule, with exceptions, of course, I should expect to do the most to the worst class of pupils, and in some cases to make finer characters from this class, than from those who, possessing less excitable temperaments, have not fallen so far." I should also remark that in the results I should anticipate in the case to be supposed hereafter, my chief hope of success would rest on the proper application of those truths and motives which distinguish the teachings of Jesus Christ from what is called natural religion, 
and by modes of presentation more simple and practical than I have ever seen fully adopted, or than I ever adopted myself when a practical teacher. With these preliminaries, which I hope will be carefully pondered, and borne in mind as indispensable, I will now suppose that, could it be so arranged, that in a given place containing from ten to fifteen thousand inhabitants in any part of our country where I ever resided, that all of the children at the age of four shall be placed six hours a day for twelve years under the care of teachers having the same views that I have, and having received that course of training for their office that any state in this union can secure to the teachers of its children. Let it be so arranged that all these children shall remain till sixteen under these teachers, and also that they shall spend their lives in this city, and I have no hesitation in saying I do not believe that one, no, not a single one, would fail of proving a respectable and prosperous member of society. Nay, more, I believe every one would, at the close of life, find admission into the world of endless peace and love. I say this solemnly, deliberately, and with the full belief that I am upheld by such imperfect experimental trials as I have made or seen made by others. But more than this, I am sustained by the authority of heaven, which sets forth this grand palladium of education. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. This sacred maxim surely presents the divine imprimatur to the doctrine that all children can be trained up in the way they should go, and that when so trained they will not depart from it. Nor does it imply that education alone will secure eternal life without supernatural assistance, but it points to the true method of securing this indispensable aid. In this view of the case, I can command no language strong enough to express my infinite longings that my countrymen, who as legislators have the control of the institutions, the laws, and the wealth of our physically prosperous nation, should be brought to see that they now have in their hands the power of securing to every child in the coming generation a life of virtue and usefulness here, and an eternity of perfected bliss hereafter. How, then, can I express or imagine the awful responsibility which rests upon them, and which hereafter they must bear before the great judge of nations, if they suffer the present state of things to go on, bearing, as it does, thousands and hundreds of thousands of helpless children in our country, to hopeless and irretrievable ruin? Respectfully yours, C. E. Beecher Postscript all I anticipate, as stated in my communication, may come to pass, without any departure from your statutory regulations in regard to religious instruction, as I understand these statutes, and as I suppose them to be understood by the great body of those who formed them, and of those who are bound by them. C. E. B. The above answers are not choice specimens selected from among many, they are all I have received, and every person to whom the circular was sent was pleased to answer it. From conversations held at different times with many other teachers, I believe the amount of testimony might have been very much increased, though no confirmation can be needed of its authority. The witnesses here introduced certainly possess all the requisites to entitle them to implicit credence. Their character for honor and veracity repels the idea of distrust. Years of experience in different places and the training of children in great numbers qualify them in point of knowledge to speak with authority, and they are exempt from any imaginable bias to warp or color the truth. From time immemorial it has been customary for parliaments and other legislative bodies to commit important practical subjects to committees and through their instrumentality to obtain the testimony of learned and skilled men on the matter of inquiry. Sometimes witnesses are heard at the bar of the House, that is, before the legislative body by whom the inquiry was instituted. Now I have desired in the present case to introduce testimony of such credibility and cogency that no legislative committee could report against it, and no legislative body could act against it, 
without incurring a historic odium either for want of intelligence or want of integrity. So, too, by the rules of the common law, all questions of fact are decided by the intervention of a jury. In ancient times, when the character of juries was very different from what it is now, they sometimes gave a corrupt verdict, that is, a verdict so contradictory to the evidence as to be of itself proof that they had discarded the testimony adduced, and been governed by some dishonest motive in their own breasts. A jury convicted of this offense was said to be attainted. Its members were punished by a fine, and rendered infamous ever after. It was my intention in the present case to introduce evidence of such authority and directness, as if submitted to a jury and rejected by them, would, under the ancient law referred to, subject them to the penalties of an attaint. There is one quality or characteristic common to all the witnesses whose testimony I above introduced, which, as it seems to me, I am not only justified in stating, but which it would be inexcusable to withhold. All of them, without exception, are well-known believers in a theological creed, one of whose fundamental articles is the depravity of the natural heart. They hold, in a literal sense, and with regard to all mankind, that the innate affections or dispositions of the soul are not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, until another influence emanating from the Godhead, and equal in itself to an act of creation, shall have renewed them. With this private belief of the witnesses, of course, neither the Board of Education nor any man or body of men have aught to do, unless indeed it be to affirm their right to hold it, in common with every other man's right either to agree with them or to dissent from them. But as bearing upon the point under consideration, the fact is most important. It adds great cogency to their testimony, and invests it, as it were, with a compulsory power. For if those who believe that the human heart is by nature alienated from God— that its innate relation to the Holy One is that of natural repulsion and not of natural attraction, nor even of neutrality, if they, from their own experience in the education of youth, believe that our common school system, under certain practicable modifications, can rear up a generation of men who will practice towards their fellow men whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report— then surely a rational community can need no additional evidence or motive to impel it to the work of reform. And all those, if such there are, who believe that moral evil comes from the abuse or misuse of powers in themselves good, and not from any inborn or original predilection for wrong, may well take courage, and may tender their heartiest cooperation in furthering an enterprise— which, even under fundamental postulates the most adverse, promises results so glorious. If those who believe that there is a principle of evil in the human soul, lying back of consciousness, incorporated as an original element into its constitution, beginning to be when the spirit itself began to be, and growing with it through all the primordial stages of its growth, which indeed belongs to the antenatal period of every descendant of Adam as much as spottedness belongs to an unborn leopard before it has a skin, or venom to an unhatched cockatrice before it has a sting. If those who believe this do nevertheless believe that our common school system, with certain practicable modifications, can send out redeeming and transforming influences— which shall expel ninety-nine hundredths of all the vices and crimes under which society now mourns and agonizes, then those who dissent from the belief that the natural heart is thus organically intractable and perverse will be all the more ready to proclaim the ameliorating power of education, and will all the more earnestly labor for its diffusion. And the crowning beauty of the whole is that Christian men of every faith may cordially unite in carrying forward the work of reform, however various may be their opinions as to the cause which has made that work necessary, just as all good citizens may unite in extinguishing a conflagration, though there may be a hundred conflicting opinions as to the means or the men that kindled it. 
In short, it may be difficult to determine which class will act under the more conscience-moving motives, those who hold to a total depravity or corruption of the human heart, but still believe it can be emancipated from worldly vices and crimes by such instrumentalities as we can readily command, or those who hold that heart to be naturally capable of good as well as evil, and who therefore believe not only that a still larger proportion of the race can be rescued from the dominion of wrongdoing, but that a consummation so glorious can be reached at a still earlier period, and with a less expenditure of effort. But this divine result of staying the desolating torrent of practical iniquity, by drying up its fountainhead in the bosoms of the young, is promised only on the antecedents or performance of certain prescribed conditions. These conditions are the three following. 1. That the public schools shall be conducted on the cardinal principles of the present New England systems. 2. That they shall all be taught for a period of ten months in each year by persons of high intellectual and moral qualifications, or, in other words, that all the teachers shall be equal in capacity and in character to those whom we now call first-rate or first-class teachers, and, three, that all the children in the commonwealth shall attend school regularly, that is, for the ten months each year during which they are kept, from the age of four to that of sixteen years. As it is on the performance of these conditions that the renovation of society is predicated, it is, of course, necessary to show that they are practicable conditions. I therefore proceed to consider, and as I trust, to establish their practicality. 1. The first condition, namely that the schools shall be conducted on the cardinal principles of the New England systems, is already satisfied. The Massachusetts school system represents favorably the systems of all the New England states, not one of them has an element of prosperity or of permanence, of security against decay within, or the invasion of its rights from without, which ours does not possess. Our law requires that a school shall be sustained in every town in the state, even the smallest and the poorest not being accepted, and that this school shall be as open and free to all the children as the light of day or the air of heaven." No child is to be met on the threshold of the schoolhouse door to be asked for money, or whether his parents are native or foreign, or whether or not they pay a tax, or what is their faith. The schoolhouse is common property. All about it are enclosures and hedges indicating private ownership and forbidding intrusion, but here is a spot which even rapacity dares not lay its finger upon. The most avaricious would as soon think of monopolizing the summer cloud as it comes floating up from the west to shed its treasures upon the thirsty earth, as of monopolizing these fountains of knowledge. Public opinion, that sovereign in representative governments, is in harmony with the law. Not unfrequently there is some private opposition, and occasionally it avows itself and assumes an attitude of hostility— but perseverance on the part of the friends of progress always subdues it, and the success of their measures eventually shames it out of existence. The law requires all public schools to be kept by a teacher whose literary and moral qualifications have been examined and approved by a committee chosen for the purpose by the people themselves. Not less than the six following branches of knowledge are to be taught in every town— namely, orthography, reading, writing, English grammar, geography, and arithmetic. The teaching of good behavior, which includes all the courtesies of life and all the minor morals, is also expressly enjoined. These peremptory requisitions are the minimum, not the maximum. Any town may enlarge the course of studies to be pursued in its schools as much as it may choose, even to the preparation of young men for the university or for any branch of educated labor. It may also bestow an equivalent education upon the other sex. The law also contains a further provision, subject, however, to be set aside only by the express vote of a district or town, that in every school of more than fifty scholars in regular attendance, an assistant teacher shall be employed." 
although there is no statutory provision to this effect in any other of the New England states, yet the good sense of the community everywhere advocates this rule. Nor are the needs of the intellect alone provided for. In prescribing the education to be given to the moral nature, the law grows more earnest and impressive. Its beautiful and deep-toned language is, It shall be the duty of the President, professors, and tutors of the University at Cambridge, and of the several colleges, and of all preceptors and teachers of academies, and all other instructors of youth to exert their best endeavors to impress on the minds of children and youth committed to their care and instruction the principles of piety, justice, and a sacred regard to truth, love to their country, humanity, and universal benevolence, sobriety, industry, and frugality, chastity, moderation, and temperance, and those other virtues which are the ornament of human society— and the basis upon which a republican constitution is founded, and it shall be the duty of such instructors to endeavor to lead their pupils, as their ages and capacities will admit, into a clear understanding of the tendency of the above-mentioned virtues to preserve and perfect a republican constitution, and secure the blessings of liberty, as well as to promote their future happiness— and also to point out to them the evil tendency of the opposite vices. But lest any individual or body of individuals, forgetful of the divine precept to do unto others as they would be done unto, should seize upon this statutory injunction, or upon some part of it, as a pretext for turning the schools into proselytizing institutions, the law rears a barrier against all sectarian encroachments. That which is calculated to favor the tenets of any particular sect of Christians is excluded from the schools. The use of the Bible in schools is not expressly enjoined by the law, but both its letter and its spirit are in consonance with that use, and as a matter of fact I suppose there is not at the present time a single town in the commonwealth in whose schools it is not read. Whoever, therefore, believes in the sacred scriptures— has his belief in form and in spirit in the schools, and his children read and hear the words themselves which contain it. The administration of this law is entrusted to the local authorities in the respective towns. By introducing the Bible, they introduce what all its believers hold to be the rule of faith and practice. And although, by excluding theological systems of human origin— they may exclude a peculiarity which one denomination believes to be true, they do but exclude what other denominations believe to be erroneous. Such is the present policy of our law for including what all Christians hold to be right, and for excluding what all except some one party hold to be wrong. If it be the tendency of all parties and sects to fasten the mind upon what is peculiar to each— and to withdraw it from what is common to all, these provisions of the law counterwork that tendency. They turn the mind toward that which produces harmony, while they withdraw it from the sources of discord. And thus, through the medium of our schools, that song which ushered in the Christian era, Peace on Earth and Good Will to Men, may be taken up and continued through the ages. End of Section 43 Recording by Maria Casper Section 44 of Annual Reports to the Massachusetts Board of Education by Horace Mann This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 11th Annual Report, 1847, Part 3 the first condition, then, not only may be, but actually is, complied with in the school system of Massachusetts, as now established and administered. The second condition requires that all our schools shall be kept for ten months in each year by persons of high intellectual and moral qualifications, by persons equal in capacity and in character, to those whom we now call first-class or first-rate teachers. This condition supposes two things, which, as yet, we are very far from having attained. The question is, are they attainable? 
In regard to teachers, it supposes such an improvement as shall advance all those who are now behind what we call the front rank, until they shall come upon a line with it. Of course, if this be done, some will be found in advance of this line, for it can never happen with regard to all of the members of any profession that they will stand precisely abreast. It supposes also that all our schools shall be kept for ten months each year. The questions, then, for consideration under this head are two, namely, one, is there, in the community at large, sufficient natural endowment or capacity from which, by appropriate training and cultivation, the requisite number of teachers possessing the supposed qualifications can be prepared? And, two, can the towns and the state, separately or as co-partners, bear the expense of maintaining the required class of teachers for the required length of time? Is not the first question answered in the affirmative by observation and experience? For the last two generations, with exceptions comparatively few, all of the eminent men of our state, whether men of letters, physicians, lawyers, clergymen, legislators, or judges, have taught school, more or less, during the early part of their lives. Now it is no disparagement to say, respecting those who constitute, at present, our best class of teachers, that they are not superior in endowments or natural capacity, in industry or in versatility of genius, to a vast number of their predecessors, who, having labored for a limited period in this field, at length abandoned it in quest of some other occupation truly known to be more lucrative and falsely supposed to be more honorable. It is no unauthorized assumption, then, to say that great numbers of those who left the employment of school-keeping for something deemed to be more eligible would, had they continued in it, have won the honor of standing in the foremost rank of this noble profession. In the second place, to prove that there is no lack of natural talent in existence from which to form the supposed class of teachers, I may refer to the general history and experience of mankind in all other departments of human effort. No new calling has ever reached such an elevation as to ensure honor and emolument to its professors, which has not, without delay, attracted to itself an adequate number of followers." Witness the intrinsically odious profession of arms, a profession so odious that those have been held worthy of a special reward, who resisted the natural love of ease and instinct of self-preservation to encounter its hardships and perils. So also has it been in regard to commerce and the useful arts. And in those truly dignified and honorable professions, the legal and clerical, where the mind is the object to be acted upon, as well as the agent to act, the supply has generally exceeded the demand. Now, could the business of education take its stand in public estimation, by the side of the most honorable and lucrative callings in life, we are authorized by all the experience of mankind to conclude that it would soon cluster around itself an amount of talent, erudition, and genius— at least equal to what has ever adorned any other avocation among civilized men. But independently of personal knowledge and of historic experience, may not a conclusive argument in support of the general position be drawn from the energy and versatility with which, as we all know, nature has gifted the minds of her children? In the variety and strength of the capacities belonging to the race— there must be the means or instruments by which providence can accomplish every good work. Somewhere in each generation the powers exist by which the generation that is to succeed it may be advanced another stage along the radiant pathway of improvement. But in the whole of the past history of the world, no generation has yet existed whose faculties have not to a very great extent lain dormant, to say nothing of the perversion of those which have been developed. But our free institutions cherish growth. The future with us is not to be measured by the past. 
the mind of the masses, which for so many ages has been crippled, and fettered after it was crippled, is here unbound. Under the stimulus applied to native vigor, talent and genius start up as naturally as vegetation in the spring. The desire of bettering one's condition springs from a universal instinct in the human mind. With us, every man sees that the gratification of this desire is within his reach. Including the lifetime of a single generation, that is, within the last forty or fifty years, there is not a school district in Massachusetts, however obscure, which has shown any interest in the character of its schools, that has not sent out one or more men who have become conspicuous in some of the honorable positions of society. They are found throughout the Union wherever enterprise or talent is rewarded. Those districts, and still more those towns where common schools have been an object of special regard, have sent forth many such men. While visiting different parts of the state for the last ten years— Facts in sufficient numbers to make a most interesting and instructive book have come to my knowledge, showing that those districts and towns where special pains have been exerted, and special liberality bestowed, in behalf of common schools, have supplied a proportion of all the distinguished men of the vicinity, corresponding to the superior excellence of the early education afforded them. So, on the other hand, Neglectful towns and districts have been comparatively barren of eminent men. The great ears of corn will not grow on sand hills. Great men will not spring up in an atmosphere void of intellectual nutrition. Nature observes a law in this respect in regard to her spiritual as well as her physical productions. Now, although something has been done in Massachusetts for the culture and expansion of the common mind— yet indefinitely more may be done. Even were it admitted, therefore, that the State had not been able in past times to supply the requisite number of teachers of the highest grade, it would by no means follow that she could not do so in the future. The intrinsically noble profession of teaching has most unfortunately been surrounded by an atmosphere of repulsion rather than attraction— Young men of talent are generally determined by two things in selecting an employment for life. The first of these is the natural tendency of the mind, its predisposition towards one pursuit rather than towards another. In this way, nature often predetermines what a man shall do, and to make her purpose inevitable, she kneads it, as it were, into the stamina of his existence— she does not content herself with standing before his will, soliciting or tempting him to a particular course, but she stands behind his will, guiding and propelling it, so that from birth he seems to be projected towards his object like a well-aimed arrow to its mark. Those in whom the love of beautiful forms, colors, and proportions predominates are naturally won to the cultivation of the fine arts or to some branch of the useful arts most congenial to the fine. Those who have a great fondness for botany and chemistry, and to whom physiological inquiries are especially grateful, become physicians. Persons enamored of forensic contests, roused by their excitement and panting for the eclat which their victories confer, betake themselves to the study of the law and become advocates. The clerical profession is composed of men whose minds are deeply imbued and penetrated with the religious sentiment, and who ponder profoundly and devoutly upon the solemn concerns of an hereafter. This constitutional or moral affinity for one sphere of employment rather than for another predetermines many minds in choosing the object of their pursuit for life. It is like the elective attractions of the chemist existing beforehand and only awaiting the contiguity of the related substances to make their secret affinities manifest. But this natural tendency is often subjected to a disturbing or modifying force, and it yields to this force the more readily as it is itself less intense and dominant. All minds have a desire, more or less energetic, for pleasure, for wealth, for honor, 
or for some of that assemblage of rewards which obtains such willing allegiance from mankind. Hence the internal inborn impulse is often diverted from the specific object to which it naturally points, and is lured away to another object, which, from some collateral or adventitious reason, promises a readier gratification. There is also a class of minds, of vigorous and varied capacities, which stand nearly balanced between different pursuits, and which, therefore, may be turned by slight circumstances in any one of many directions. They are like fountains of water rising on a table-land, whose channels may be so cut as to cover either of its slopes with fertility. Now the qualities which predispose their possessor to become the companion, guide, and teacher of children are good sense, lively religious sensibilities, practical, unaffected benevolence, a genuine sympathy with the young, and that sunny, genial temperament which always sees its own cheerfulness reflected from the ever-open mirror of a child's face. The slightest exercise of good sense makes it apparent that any one year of childhood will exert a more decisive control over future destiny than any ten years afterwards. The religious and benevolent elements seize instinctively upon the promise made to those who train up children in the way they should go. The love of children casts a pleasing illusion over the mind in regard to everything they do, if indeed it be an illusion, and not a truth above the reach of the intellect, elevating their puerile sports into dignity, hailing every step in their progress as though it were some grand discovery in science, and grieving over their youthful wanderings or backslidings with as deep a sorrow as is felt for the turpitude of a full-grown man, or for the heaven-defying sins of a nation. So that genial, joyous, ever-smiling temperament, which sees only rainbows where others see clouds, and which is delighted by the reflection of itself when coming from one child's face, will never tire of its labors when the same charming image perpetually comes back from the multiplying glasses of group after group of happy children, ever varying but always beautiful. Now I think we have abundant reason to believe that a sufficient number of persons, bearing from the hand of nature this distinctive image and superscription of a school-teacher, are born into the world with every generation. But the misfortune is that when they arrive at years of discretion, and begin to survey the various fields of labor that lie open before them, they find that the noblest of them all, and the one, too, for which they have the greatest natural predilection, is neither honored by distinction nor rewarded by emolument. They see that if they enter it, many of their colleagues and associates will be persons with whom they have no congeniality of feeling, and who occupy a far less elevated position in the social scale than that to which their own aspirations point. If they go through the whole country and question every man, they cannot find a single public school teacher who has acquired wealth by the longest and most devoted life of labor. They cannot find one who has been promoted to the presidency of a college or to a professorship in it, nor one who has been elected or appointed to fill any distinguished civil station. Hence, in most cases, the adventitious circumstances which surround the object of their preference repel them from it or, if they enter the profession, it is only for a brief period and for some collateral purpose, and when their temporary end is gained, they sink it still lower by their avowed or well-understood reasons for abandoning it. Such is the literal history of hundreds and of thousands who have shown, or are now shining, in other walks of life, but who would have shown with beams far more creative of human happiness had they not been struck from the sphere for which nature pre-adapted them. Look at the average rate of wages paid to teachers in some of the pattern states of the Union. In Maine, it is $15.40 per month to males, and $4.80 to females. In New Hampshire, it is $13.50 per month to males, and $5.65 to females. 
in Vermont it is $12 per month to males and $4.75 to females. In Connecticut it is $16 per month to males and $6.50 to females. In New York it is $14.96 per month to males and $6.69 to females. In Pennsylvania, it is $17.02 per month to males and $10.09 to females. In Ohio, it is $15.42 per month to males and $8.73 to females. In Indiana, it is $12 per month to males and $6 to females. In Michigan, it is $12.71 per month for males and $5.36 for females. Even in Massachusetts, it is only $24.51 per month to males and $8.07 to females. All of this is exclusive of board, but let it be compared with what is paid to cashiers in banks, to secretaries of insurance companies, to engineers upon railroads, to superintendents in factories, to customs house officers, navy agents, and so forth and so forth, and it will then be seen what pecuniary temptations there are on every side, drawing enterprising and talented young men from the ranks of the teacher's profession. Nor does the social estimation accorded to teachers much surpass the pecuniary value set upon their services, the nature of their calling debars them almost universally from political honors, which throughout our whole country have a factitious value so much above their real worth. Without entire faithlessness to their trust, they cannot engage in trade or commercial speculations. Modes of education have heretofore been so imperfect that I do not know a single instance where a teacher has been transferred from his school to any of those departments of educated labor in which such liberal salaries are now given. And thus it is that the profession at large, while it enjoys but a measured degree of public respect, seems shut out from all the paths that lead to fortune or to fame. No worldly prize is held up before it, and in the present condition of mankind how few there are who will work exclusively for immortal reward." It supposes the possession of only very low faculties to derive pleasure from singing the praises of a martyr, but to be the martyr oneself requires very high ones. Hence it is, as was before said, that when the aspiring and highly endowed youth of our country arrive at years of discretion and begin to survey the varied employments which lie spread out before them, they find that the noblest of them all presents the fewest external attractions. Those whose natural or acquired ambition seeks for wealth go into trade. The mechanical genius applies himself to the useful arts. The politically ambitious connect themselves with some one of those classes from which public officers are usually selected. Medicine attracts those who have the peculiar combination of tastes congenial to it, those who ponder most upon the ways of God to men minister in sacred things. Who, then, are left to fill the most important position known to social life? A few remain whose natural tendencies in this direction are too vehement to be resisted or diverted. A somewhat larger number, who have no strong predilection for one sphere of exertion rather than for another, and to whom, under the circumstances peculiar to each, school-keeping is as eligible as any other employment. But many, very many, the great majority, engage in it not for its own sake, but only to make it subservient to some ulterior object, or, with humiliation, it is said, perhaps only to escape from manual labor. The profession of school-keeping, then, as a profession, has never had an equal chance with its competitors— on the one hand, it has been resorted to by great numbers whose only object was to make a little money out of it and then abandon it. And on the other, its true disciples, those who might have been and should have been its leaders in priesthood, 
have been lured and seduced away from it by all the more splendid prizes of life. Even though, therefore, the profession of school-keeping has not been crowded by learned and able men, devoting their energies and their lives to its beneficent labors, this fact wholly fails to prove that nature does not produce, with each generation, a sufficient number of fit persons, who under an equitable distribution or apportionment of honors and rewards for meritorious services, would be found pre-adapted for school-keeping, in the same way that Newton was for mathematics, or Pope for poetry, or Franklin for the infallibility of his common sense. Indeed, the proportion of good teachers whom we now have, notwithstanding all their discouragements against entering, and their seducements for leaving the profession, seem demonstrative of the contrary. Thus far the argument has proceeded upon the basis that the required number of teachers possessing the high grade of qualifications supposed must equal the present number such as they are. But it is almost too obvious to need mentioning that if the qualifications of the teachers were to be so greatly enhanced, and if the term of the schools so materially lengthened, as is proposed, teaching would then really become a profession— and the same teachers would keep school through the year. Instead, therefore, of changing from male teachers in the winter to females in the summer, back again to males in the winter, and so on alternately, the children of each school suffering under a new stepfather or a new stepmother each half-year, they would enjoy the vastly improved system of continuous training under the same hands, this would diminish by almost one-half the required number of teachers for our schools. The poorer half would be discarded, the better half retained. Surely under these circumstances, if a sufficient number of the very highest class of teachers could not be found, it would not be owing to any parsimony of nature in withholding the endowments, but to our unpardonable niggardliness in not cultivating and employing them. Feeling now authorized to assume that the first proposition has been satisfactorily established, it only remains to be considered under this head whether the community at large, the towns separately, or the towns and the state by joint contributions, can afford to make such compensation as shall attract to this field of labor the high order of teachers supposed, and shall requite them generously for their services." To induce persons of the highest order of talent to become teachers, and to deter good teachers from abandoning the profession, its emoluments must bear some close analogy to those which the same persons could command in other employment. The case, too, as presented in the circular, and upon which the evidence has been obtained, supposes the schools to continue for ten months in each year. Although in many large towns the schools are now kept more than this portion of the year, yet their average length for the whole state is but eight months. The increased expense, then, both of the longer term and of the more liberal compensation, must be provided for. Can the community sustain this expense? Let us suppose for a moment that ninety-nine per cent of our whole community should be temperate, honest, industrious, frugal people, conscientious in feeling and exemplary in conduct, is it not certain that two grand pecuniary consequences would immediately follow, namely a vast gain in productive power and a vast saving in the criminal destruction and loss of property? Either of these sources of gain would more than defray the increased expenses of the system, which, according to the evidence I have obtained, would ensure both. The current expenses last year for the education of all the children in the state between the ages of four and sixteen was three dollars and fourteen cents on average for each one. Look into the police courts of our cities in the morning, and especially on Monday morning when the ghastly array of drunkards is marched in for trial. A case may not occupy ten minutes— and yet the fine, costs, and expenses would educate two children for a year in our public schools at the present rate, or one child at double the present rate. 
the expenses incurred in punishing the smallest theft that is committed exceed the present cost of educating a child in our schools for a year. A knave who proposes to obtain goods by false pretenses will hardly aim at making less than a thousand dollars by his speculation. There are more than one hundred and fifty towns in Massachusetts, that is about half the whole number in the state, in each of which the annual appropriation for all its schools is less than one thousand dollars. A burglar or highway robber will seldom peril his life without the prospect of a prize which would educate five hundred or a thousand children for a year. An incendiary exhibits fireworks at an expense which would educate all the children of many a school district in the state, from the age of four to that of sixteen, while the only reward he expects is that of stealing a few garments and trinkets during the conflagration. In a single city in the state, consisting of sixteen or seventeen thousand inhabitants, it was estimated by a most respectable and intelligent committee that the cost of alcoholic drinks during the last year far exceeded the combined cost of all the schools and all the churches in it, although for both religion and education it is a highly liberal city. The police expenses alone of the city of New York are about half a million a year, but all these are but a part of the sluiceways through which the hard-earned wealth of the people is wasted. What shall be said of those stock swindles and bank failures, whose capitals of hundreds of thousands of dollars are embezzled in fair business transactions, whose vaults, sworn to be full of specie or bullion, remind one, on inspection, not merely of a pecuniary but of a philosophical vacuum, what of those epidemic speculations in land, often fairy land, though void of both beauty and poetry, where fortunes change hands as rapidly as if dependent upon the throw of a gambler's dice? And what of those enormous peculations by government defaulters, where more money is engulfed by one stupendous fraud than Massachusetts expends for the education of all her children in a year? All this devastation and loss the public bears with marvelous, with most criminal composure. The people at large stand by the wreck-covered shore where so many millions are dashed in pieces and sunk, and seem not to recognize the destruction. And, what is infinitely worse, there are those who rejoice in the howl of the tempest and the shrieks of the sufferers, because they can grow rich by plundering only here and there, a fragment of property from the dead or the defenseless. By charity, by direct taxes, by paying twenty or thirty per cent more for every article or necessity of life than it is equitably worth, by bad debts, by the occasional and involuntary contribution of a pocket-book, a watch, a horse, a carriage, a ship, or a cargo, to which the robber and the barator help themselves by paying premiums for insurance, and in a hundred other ways, the honest and industrious part of the people not only support themselves, but supply the mighty current of wealth that goes to destruction through these floodgates of iniquity. The people do not yet seem to see that all the cost of legislating against criminals, of the judges and prosecuting officers, of jurors and witnesses to convict them, of building houses of correction and jails and penitentiaries for restraining and punishing them, is not a hundredth part of the grand total of expenditure incurred by private and social immoralities and crimes. The people do not yet seem to see that the intelligence and the morality which education can impart is that beneficent kind of insurance which by preventing losses obviates the necessity of indemnifying for them, thus saving both premium and risk. What is engulfed in the vortex of crime in each generation would build a palace of more than oriental splendor in every school district in the land, would endow it with a library beyond the ability of a lifetime to read, would supply it with apparatus and laboratories for the illustration of every study, and the exemplification of every art, and munificently requite the services of a teacher worthy to preside in such a sanctuary of intelligence and virtue. But the prevention of all that havoc of worldly goods which is caused by vice, 
transfers only one item from the loss to the profit side of the account. Were all idle, intemperate, predatory men to become industrious, sober, and honest, they would add vast sums to the inventory of the nation's wealth instead of subtracting from it. Let any person take a single town, village, or neighborhood and look at its inhabitants individually with the question in his mind how many of them are producers and how many are non-producers. That is, how many, either by the labor of the body or the labor of the mind, add value and dignity to life, and how many barely support themselves. And I think he will often be surprised at the smallness of the number by whose talent and industry the storehouses of the earth are mainly filled, and all the complicated business of society is principally managed. Could we convert into co-workers for the benefit of mankind all those physical and spiritual powers of usefulness, which are now antagonists or neutrals, the gain would be incalculable. Add the above two items together, namely the saving of what the vicious now squander or destroy, and the wealth which as virtuous men they would amass, and the only difficulty presented would be to find in what manner so vast an amount could be beneficially disposed of. But it is not to be disguised, whatever reforms may be instituted, that the cost of crime cannot at once be prevented. For a season, therefore, and until the expenses of education shall arrest and supersede the expenses of guilt, both must be borne. I wish to state the difficulty without extenuation. The question, then, is, can both be temporarily borne? The appropriations for which the towns voluntarily taxed themselves last year for the current expenses of the schools, that is, for the wages and board of the teachers and for fuel, were $662,870.57. Adding the income of the surplus revenue when appropriated for the support of schools, it was $670,628.13. The valuation of the state I suppose to be not less than $450 million. Last year's tax, therefore, for the current expenses of the schools was less than one mill and a half on the dollar, less than one mill and a half on a thousand mills. Taking the average of the state, then, no man was obliged to pay more than one six hundred and sixty-sixth part of his property for this purpose or rather such would have been the case had there been no poll tax, had the whole tax been levied on property alone. At this rate it would take 666 years for all the property of the state to be once devoted to this purpose. And does not the portion of our worldly interests which is dependent upon public schools bear a greater ratio to the whole of those interests than one in 666? I need not argue this point, for who, out of an insane asylum, or even of the curable classes in it, will question the fact? Who will say that the importance of this interest, as compared with all the earthly interests of mankind, is not infinitely greater than this? Who will say that, to secure so precious an end as the diffusion of almost universal intelligence and virtue, and the suppression, with an equal degree of universality, of ignorance and vice, it would not be expedient to do as the Bishop of Landaff once proposed that the British nation should do, in an eventful crisis of its affairs, vote away, by acclamation, one half of all the wealth of the kingdom. But there is no need of carrying our feelings or our reason to this pitch of exaltation. There is no need of any signal or unwanted sacrifice. There is no need of a devotion of life, as is done in battle. There is no need of periling fortunes, as is done every day in trade. There is no need that any man in the community should lose one day from his life, or one hour from his sleep, or a comfort from his wardrobe or his table. Three times more than is now expended, that is, four and a half mills on every thousand mills of the property of the state, or only one part in 222, 
instead of one in 666, would defray every expense and ensure the result. Regarded merely as a commercial transaction, a pecuniary enterprise whose elements are dollars and cents alone, there is not an intelligent capitalist in the state who would not, on the evidence here adduced, assume the whole of it and pay a bonus for the privilege. When the state was convinced of the lucrativeness and general expediency of a railroad from Worcester to its western border, it bound itself at a word to the amount of five millions of dollars. And I suppose it be now the opinion of every intelligent man in the Commonwealth that when the day of payment shall arrive, the road itself, in addition to all the collateral advantages which it will have conferred, will have paid for itself, and will then forever remain not merely a monument of wisdom, but a reward for sagacity. Yet what is a railroad, though it does cut down the mountains and lift up the valleys, compared with an all-embracing agency of social and moral reform, which shall abase the pride of power and elevate the lowliness of misfortune? And those facilities for travel which supersede the tediousness of former journeyings and the labor of transportation, what are they when compared with the prevention of that lamentation, mourning, and woe which come from the perpetration of crime? When the city of Boston was convinced of the necessity of having a supply of pure water from abroad for the use of its inhabitants, it voted three millions of dollars to obtain it and he would be a bold man who would now propose a repeal of that ordinance, though all past expenditures could be refunded. Yet all the schoolhouses in Boston, which it has erected during the present century, are not worth a fourth part of this sum. For the supply of water the city of New York lately incurred an expenditure of thirteen millions of dollars, Admitting, as I most cheerfully do, that the use of water pertains to the moral as well as to the ceremonial law, yet our cities have pollutions which water can never wash away, defilements which the baptism of a moral and Christian education alone can remove. There is not an appetite that allies men to the brutes, nor a passion for vain display which makes him more contemptible than any part of the irrational creation which does not cost the country more every year than such a system of schools as would, according to the evidence I have exhibited, redeem it almost entirely from its follies and its guilt. Consider a single factitious habit of our people, which no one will pretend adds any degree to the health or length of life or decency of manners of the nation. I mean the smoking of tobacco. It is said on good authority that the annual expenditure in this country for the support of this habit is ten millions of dollars. And if we reflect that this sum, averaged upon all the people, would be only half a dollar apiece, the estimate seems by no means extravagant. Yet this is far more than is paid to the teachers of all the public schools in the whole United States. Were nations to embark in the cause of education for the redemption of mankind, as they have in that of war for their destruction, the darkest chapters in the history of earthly calamities would soon be brought to a close. But where units have been grudged for education, millions have been lavished for war. While for the one purpose mankind have refused to part with superfluities, for the other they have not only impoverished themselves, but levied burdensome taxes upon posterity." The vast national debts of Europe originated in war, and but for that scourge of mankind they never would have existed. The amount of money now owed by the different European nations is said on good authority to be six billion three hundred eighty-seven million dollars. Of this inconceivable sum, the share of Great Britain is about four billion dollars. In round numbers, eight hundred million pounds sterling, of France seven hundred eighty million dollars, of Russia and Austria three hundred million dollars each, of Prussia one hundred million dollars, and the debts of the minor powers increase this sum to six billion three hundred eighty-seven million dollars. 
The national debt of Great Britain now amounts to more than one hundred forty dollars for every man, woman, and child in the three kingdoms. Allowing six persons to each family, it will average more than eight hundred and fifty dollars to every household, a sum which would be deemed by thousands and tens of thousands of families in that country to be a handsome competence, nay, wealth itself, if it were owing to instead of from them. It is estimated that during the twenty-two years preceding the general peace of 1815, the unimaginable sum of six billion two hundred fifty million pounds of sterling, or thirty billion dollars, had been expended in war by nations calling themselves Christian, an amount of wealth many fold greater than has ever been expended for the same purpose by all the nations on the globe whom we call savage since the commencement of the Christian era. The earth itself could not be pawned for so vast a sum as this, were there any pawnbroker's office which would accept such a pledge. Were it to be set up at auction in the presence of fierce competitors for the purchase, it would not sell for enough to pay its war bills for a single century. The war estimates of the British government even for the current year of peace, are eighty-five million dollars, and the annual interest on the national debt incurred by war is at least one hundred twenty million dollars more, or more than two hundred million dollars for a common and on the whole a very favorable year. Well might Christ in the Beatitudes pronounce his emphatic benediction upon the peacemakers— we have emulated in this country the same gigantic scale of expenditure for the same purpose. Since the organization of the federal government in 1789, the expense of our military and naval establishments and equipments, in round numbers, is seven hundred million dollars. Two of our ships of the line have cost more than two million dollars. The value of the arms accumulated at one time in the arsenal in Springfield in this state was two million dollars. The military academy at West Point has cost more than four million dollars. In our town meetings and in our school district meetings, wealthy and substantial men oppose the granting of fifteen dollars for a school library and of thirty dollars for both library and apparatus, while at West Point they spend fifty dollars in a single lesson at target firing and the government keeps a hundred horses and grooms and blacksmiths to take care of them as an indispensable part of the apparatus of the academy. The pupils at our normal schools, who are preparing to become teachers, must maintain themselves. The cadets at the academy receive twenty-eight dollars a month during their entire term as a compensation for being educated at the public expense. Adding bounties and pensions to wages and rations, I suppose the cost of a common foot soldier in the army cannot be less than $250 a year. The average cost of female teachers for the public schools of Massachusetts last year was only $13.60 a month, inclusive of board, or at a rate which would give $163.20 for the year. But the average length of the schools was but eight months, so that the cost of two common soldiers is nearly that of five female teachers. The annual salary of a colonel of dragoons in the United States Army is $2,206, of a brigadier general $2,958, of a major general $4,512, that of a captain of a ship of the line when in service $4,500, and even when off-duty it is two thousand five hundred dollars. There are but seven towns in Massachusetts where any teacher of a public school receives so high a salary as one thousand dollars, and in four of these towns only one teacher receives this sum. Had my purpose been simply to show the pecuniary ability of the people at large to give the most generous compensation— to such a company of accomplished, high-minded, noble teachers as would lift the race at once out of the pit of vice and ignorance and superstition, as safely and as tenderly as a mother bears her infant in her arms, 
had my purpose been merely to show this pecuniary ability, then I have already said too much. But my design was not merely to carry conviction to the minds of those who would contest this fact, but to make the denial of it ridiculous. But the consummation of this reformatory work is not promised except upon the performance of a third condition, namely that all the children in the state between the ages of four and sixteen years shall be brought into the school for ten months in each year. In other words, while the schools are kept, the attendance of all the children upon them, with one or two exceptions to be hereafter noticed, must be regular. Since the keeping of registers in our schools has made known the enormous amount of absences from them, there is but one subject which has excited greater alarm or given rise to louder complaints. Teachers complain of this absence because, while it increases their labors, it diminishes their success. Indeed, it makes entire success an impossibility. Parents who do send their children regularly to school complain of it, because the tardy and the occasional comers are a dead weight upon the progress of those who are uniformly present and prompt. Committees complain of it in behalf of the towns which they represent, because it lowers the general standard of intelligence among the people, and because, taken on an average for the whole state, it incurs a total loss of from one-third to one-half of all the money which is annually levied by taxation for the support of the schools. Men of wealth, who have no children to send to school, or who for any reason send none, complain of it, because, though they may be willing to be taxed for the education of all, yet they are not willing to be taxed to have their money taken and thrown away. They think it, and with good reason, too, to be an intolerable hardship, to be first confronted with the argument that they are bound to secure the general intelligence and morality of the people— through the instrumentality of schools, and when they have acknowledged the validity of this argument, and cheerfully paid their money, to have the very men who so argued and so claimed turn upon them and say, We are still at liberty to throw your money away by keeping our children at home. And though you must keep the school regularly for us, we have a right to use it irregularly, or not at all, as we please." Thus the delinquents, where they owe apology and repentance, retort with indignity and persevere in injustice. I cannot believe that our people will always, or even long, submit to this enormous abuse, now made known to them by well-authenticated documents. For an economical people, who form political parties on the subject of expenditures by the government, and make retrenchment a watchword— for a people whose legislature sometimes debates for days together whether the salary of an officer shall be a few hundred dollars more or less, to continue to throw away, as was done last year, more than two hundred thousand dollars on account of voluntary, gratuitous, and in most cases wanton absences from school, is not credible. For a people who are sufficiently proud, to say the least, of their general intelligence— and who are sincerely anxious to perpetuate and improve their moral character, to be willing to forfeit one-third part of all the blessings of their free school system without any necessity or any plausible pretext, is not to be believed. This great evil must be dealt with according to its magnitude. Violent diseases demand energetic remedies— it would be as unwise in a state as in an individual to allow its precautions to diminish while its dangers increase, to sleep more quietly as the peril becomes more imminent. When we know that a malady is dangerous and that a remedy is at hand, wisdom dictates its speedy application. End of Section 44 Recording by Maria Casper Section 45 of Annual Reports to the Massachusetts Board of Education by Horace Mann. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 11th Annual Report, 1847, Part 4. 
I propose, then, to consider the objections that may possibly be urged to the regular attendance of all our children upon school for ten months in each year, from the age of four to that of sixteen years. I believe them to be by no means insurmountable, nay, that their formidableness will wholly disappear if subjected to a candid examination. 1. It may be said that there is a class of parents amongst us who depend partially upon the labor of their children for the support of their families, and who are too poor to forego the earnings of these children for ten months in the year and for twelve years of their minority. With regard to a portion of the class of parents referred to, this suggestion would have a foundation in fact. With regard to another portion of them, it would have no such foundation. It is well known that a class of parents exists amongst us who work their children that they may themselves be idle, who coin the health, the capacities, and the future welfare of their own offspring into money, which money, when gained, is not expended for the necessities or the comforts of life, but is wasted upon appetites that brutify and demonize their possessor. The objections of this class against permitting their children to be educated at the public expense are not legitimate. It would be infinitely better for them, for their families, and for the public, if they were cut off from these means of sinful indulgence. It would improve their condition still further if they were obliged to be industrious, even though coerced to labor by the goad of hunger and cold. The best of all conditions for them would be that they should themselves labor for the support of their children at school, where those intellectual and virtuous habits would be formed, and that filial piety inculcated, which would lead the children in after years to return to the parents with a generous requital the favors that they had received. There is doubtless another portion of this general class, with whom the alleged necessity for their children's earnings, as a part of the means for family support, is no pretense. The number and age of the family, sickness, misfortune, or other cause, may render this or some other resource indispensable to the procurement of the necessities and decencies of life. I would not underrate the number or the necessity of this class of persons. They have claims upon our warmest sympathies. But I have reason to believe that the class itself is not a very large one. Where the heads of the family enjoy good health, where they may have the assistance of their children, who are of an age able to render it, for several hours each day, for one or two entire half-days each week, and for two months uninterrupted each year, the circumstances must be peculiar where industry and frugality, with such favors as the honest and praiseworthy poor may always count upon from their better-conditioned neighbors, will not supply the means of a comfortable subsistence. Still, cases of necessity do and will exist, and where the need is not supplied by individual charity, there is no other alternative but to do it at the public expense. This would introduce no new principle into our legislation. It would be only a moderate but highly beneficial extension of an existing one. Our laws now provide for physical destitution, whatever may be its cause, and they enjoin upon school committees the duty of furnishing all needful school books at the expense of the respective towns, to all children whose parents are unable to procure them. The question then arises, what degree of destitution, and there is no propriety in restricting this to physical destitution, makes it expedient for a wise government to interfere and afford relief? Poor laws, as we understand the term, are of modern origin. They were not only unknown to all barbarous nations, but to most Christian and civilized ones until a recent period. In England they date from the reign of Elizabeth. In Scotland, although in a small class of extreme cases legal relief may have been rendered, yet poor laws can hardly be said ever to have had any effective existence in that country. In Ireland they were unknown until recently. In this country they are almost coeval with our colonial settlements. But there neither is nor ever has been any legal standard of poverty. 
the degree of destitution which shall entitle the sufferer to relief is not a fixed quantity, like the statutory length of a yard or the Winchester bushel. The general notions of men as to what constitutes poverty range between wide extremes according to their prevalent style of living, their enlightenment, and their benevolence. It is said that when the present king of France heard that the income of the Jewish banker in London amounted only to some hundreds of dollars each hour, he expressed his deep grief at learning that he was so poor. With us, he who can command a comfortable shelter, decent clothes, and a sufficient supply of wholesome food for himself and family, excites no special commiseration for his poverty. While there are places upon the earth where a potato a day is considered an independent fortune, now, between these extremes, what shall the true definition of poverty be? So the line which divides poverty from competence is not a stationary but a movable one. The laws themselves change, and the same law on a question like this will be made to speak a very different language under different administrators. In favor of the militia or of the country's defense, the law exempts from attachment, execution, and distress, whether for debt or for taxes, the uniform, arms, ammunition, and accoutrements, which officers, non-commissioned officers, and privates are required to possess. In favor of the common sentiments of humanity, our law also exempts from attachment and execution, not only wearing apparel, but a great variety of articles of household furniture, bedsteads, beds, bedding, an iron stove, fuel, and other commodities to the value of fifty dollars, also a cow, six sheep, one swine, and two tons of hay, also the tools and implements used by a debtor in his trade, not exceeding fifty dollars in value, and also rites of burial and tombs used as repositories for the dead. Our legislation on this subject has been humanely progressive, as may be seen by reference to Statutes 1805, Chapter 100, 1813, Chapter 172, 1822, Chapter 93, Section 8, 1832, Chapter 58, 1838, Chapter 145, etc. In a neighboring state, by a late law, a portion of the debtor's homestead is also brought within the same rule. In favor of learning and religion, all school books and Bibles used in a family are also exempted from attachment and execution for debt. And was before said, all school children destitute of school books are first supplied with them at the public expense, and where the parents are unable to reimburse the cost, the supply is gratuitous. Massachusetts has from time to time founded and endowed hospitals for the insane, and she makes annual and liberal appropriations for the education of the blind and the deaf and dumb. She is now engaged in erecting a noble institution for the reformation of juvenile delinquents, and a commission instituted by her is inquiring at the present time into the condition of idiots, which unfortunate, repulsive, and hitherto outcast portion of the community, it is not to be doubted she will soon gather together, and in imitation of the noble example set by France, Switzerland, and Prussia, will educate to cleanliness, to decency, and to no inconsiderable degree of positive enjoyment and usefulness. Each one, too, of all these great movements, when carried out into execution, has proved economical as well as philanthropic and Christian. What striking results in proof of this are exhibited by the statistics of the State Lunatic Hospital at Worcester, According to the last report of that institution, which Dr. Woodward made, the average expense of twenty-four old cases, taking the first twenty-four on the list and not selecting them or taking them at random, was $1,945.83 each, their aggregate expense $46,700, while the average expense of the same number of recent cases taking the last on the list, who were discharged, cured, was $41.53 each, and their aggregate expense, $996.75. So 
so that the whole expense of twenty-four recent cases was but about one-half as much as one old one. The hospital already has far more than paid for itself by the saving it has effected, because without it all the new cases would have been old ones. I present these economical aspects of the subject by no means because I deem them to be the most important, but because all over the world there is a large class of persons with whom the pecuniary argument is the most persuasive and eloquent, and who will be induced to lend their services in aid of great social ameliorations only when they find that humanity is economy and that godliness is great gain in a worldly sense. They will then enlist, for the sake of the great gain, though quite indifferent as to the other quality. When I have been asked by persons from the fertile and exuberant regions of our own country, or from transatlantic nations, how it is that with our ungenerous soil and uncongenial clime we are pecuniarily able to support these various and costly establishments, my answer has been that we are able because we do support them. But the question recurs, what is poverty? What is that straightness of circumstances which, for educational purposes, would require a wise and profound statesman, and of course the state itself, to interpose and to supply those means for the education of the child which the parent is unable to render? It being proved that if all our children were to be brought under the benign influences of such teachers as the state can supply, from the age of four years to that of sixteen, and for ten months in each year, that ninety-nine in every hundred of them can be rescued from uncharitableness, from falsehood, from intemperance, from cupidity, licentiousness, violence, and fraud, and reared to the performance of all the duties and to the practice of all the kindnesses and courtesies of domestic and social life, made promoters of the common weal instead of subtractors from it, this being proved, I respectfully and with deference submit to the board and through them to the legislature and to my fellow citizens at large that every man is poor in an educational sense who cannot both spare and equip his children for school for the entire period above specified, and that while he remains thus poor it is not only the dictate of generosity and Christianity but it is the wisest policy and the profoundest statesmanship, too, to supply from the public treasury, municipal or state or both, whatever means may be wanted to make certain so glorious an end. These principles and this practice the divine doctrines of Christianity have always pointed at, and a progressive civilization has now brought us into proximity to them. How is it that we can call a man poor, because his body is cold, and not because his highest sympathies and affections have been frozen up within him in one polar and perpetual winter from his birth. Hunger does not stint the growth of the body half so much as ignorance dwarfs the capacities of the mind. No wound upon the limbs or gangrene of vital organs is a thousandth part so terrible as those maladies of the soul that jeopard its highest happiness and defeat the end for which it was created. And infinitely aggravated is the case where children are the sufferers, where moral distempers are inflicted upon them by parents, or are inherited by them from ancestors, where they are born into an atmosphere saturated with the infection of crime, where vice obtrudes itself upon every sense, and presses inward through every pore, to be imbibed and copied, just as the common air forces itself into the nostrils to be breathed, and where, in their early imitative transgressions, they are no more consciously guilty than in the heaving of their lungs in an act of respiration. Were a ship in mid-ocean to be overtaken by a storm, to be dismantled, dismasted, and reduced to an unmanageable hulk, and while its crew were famishing, and in momentary danger of foundering, were another ship to pass within hail, but to refuse all succor and deliverance, should we not justly regard that deed as an enormous atrocity? But what moral difference does it make whether we pass by our perishing neighbor on the sea or on the dry land? 
the pitfalls of perdition on shore are deeper and far more terrible, and are inhabited by direr monsters than any ocean caves. Now it is the children of the man who, through sickness or other misfortune, has not the means fully and thoroughly to educate them for the duties of life, who represent this perishing and foundering crew, and the man who has the superfluities or even an independency of means, but refuses to aid in giving these children an education sufficient for all the common responsibilities of life, he is the hardened mariner who sails recklessly by, and sees the helpless sufferers engulfed in the wake of his own proud vessel. On this point, then, are we not authorized to conclude, in the first place, that the cases are comparatively few where parents cannot afford to forego the earnings of their children, and to send them to school for the length of time and with the regularity proposed, and, in the second place, were the cases of destitution far more numerous than they are, that there is still an abundance of means as well as an obvious duty on the part of the public to supply all deficiencies. Assuming the value of all the property in the state to be four hundred and fifty millions of dollars, the simple interest upon it alone at six per cent and without any addition from earnings is twenty-seven millions annually. The industrial statistics of the state show that its income, from all its occupations and trades, is more than a hundred millions of dollars annually, and even this does not include improvements upon its wharves, bridges, roads, or lands. Must such a state pair and clip and scrimp and dole out its means with a niggardly hand when unfolding the mortal and the immortal capacities of its children? 2. But though the means for supporting the schools are abundant, and though the earnings of children as a part of the family's daily livelihood may be foreborn in one class of cases and made up in another, a further question still remains. Can the state itself afford to forego these juvenile services? Can the machinery be operated, the shoes bound, the type set, the errands and chores done, and the doorbells tended, if all children under sixteen years of age are withdrawn from the performance of these kinds of service for ten months each year? Miners under sixteen are let out to corporations to be employed in manufacturing establishments. They are taken into the families of the wealthy and forehanded as under-servants. A few are employed as errand boys in the offices and shops of the cities, and in several of the lighter handicrafts they are put to regular labor. There are no exact data by which to determine the number of children so employed in the state. Compared with the whole number of children in it between the ages of four and sixteen, I suppose it to be inconsiderable, so inconsiderable indeed that if their services in these employments were henceforth to be wholly discontinued, it would subtract hardly an appreciable fraction from the aggregate products of our labor and machinery. A highly intelligent gentleman who has been engaged in manufacturing business for many years informs me that the company with which he is associated now employs 3,119 persons, namely 2,571 in five cotton mills, 450 in two machine shops, and 98 in one woolen mill. In the cotton mills, 346 persons are employed who are under 16 years of age, equal to 13%. In the machine shops there are none. In the woolen mill there are six, or six per cent. The average for the whole is about eleven per cent. He adds, I am of the opinion that this statement may be taken as a fair representation, in regard to age, of the persons in these several establishments. Very few are under fifteen. This class of labor is not profitable to the employer, and, except in particular cases, is only employed from motives of charity. From my recollection of the labor required in print works, he was formerly extensively engaged in printing calicoes, I am inclined to think the proportion of persons under sixteen is not greater than the average in the mills and shops before mentioned. Here, then, is a statement worthy of implicit reliance respecting the largest branch of labor in which those children are employed, 
who, on the proposed reformatory plan, would be sent to school. Can a substitute be found for this juvenile labor? In the first place, if that class of parents who now coin into money their children's highest capacities for usefulness and enjoyment, that they themselves may live in idleness and intemperance, were peremptorily deprived of this source of gain, they could perform a portion of the labor now exacted of the children, or, if not capable of performing this particular kind of labor, they could at least do some other work, and thus set free a class of persons who could perform it. In the second place, manufacturers could employ, at a slightly enhanced price, a few more adults, or more persons over the age of sixteen. I trust that no liberal-minded manufacturer would object to employing older help, at the present time, on the plea of non-remunerating returns. But, thirdly, a consideration of more significance than all the rest, the children who had enjoyed such a school development and training as we are now supposing, would go into the mills after the completion of their educational course, with physical and intellectual ability to help, and a moral inability to harm, which of itself would be far more than compensation for all the loss of their previous absence. Take any manufacturer whose mind has ever wandered even by chance to a contemplation of the only true sources and securities of wealth, and what would he not give to have all of his operatives transformed at once into men and women of high intelligence and unswerving morality, to have them become so faithful and honest that they would always turn out the greatest quantity and the best quality of work, without the trouble and expense of watching and weighing and counting and superintending, that they would be as careful of his machinery as though it were their own, that they would never ask or accept more in payment than their just due, that they would always consult their employer's interest and never sacrifice it from motives of personal ease or gain or ill-will. I have been told by one of our most careful and successful manufacturers that upon substituting in one of his cotton mills a better for a poorer educated class of operatives, he was enabled to add twelve or fifteen per cent to the speed of his machinery without any increase of damage or danger from the acceleration. Here there was a direct gain of twelve or fifteen per cent, a larger percentage than that of the supposed whole number of children under sixteen years of age in all our factories. And this gain was effected, too, without any additional investment of capital or any increased expense for board. The gain from improved morals would far exceed that from increased intelligence. On the whole, then, if all children under sixteen years of age were withdrawn from the factories for ten months of each year in order to be sent to school, there is reason to believe that the aggregate amount of fabrics produced by those mills would not be diminished even a yard. The above considerations have special reference to children employed in factories. I have selected this department of labor because I suppose that at least as many children under sixteen are let out to service in factories, as in all the other branches of business taken together. But the same views, with inconsiderable modifications, will apply to all others. It will be seen at a glance, therefore, that the contemplated diversion of children from manual labor to mental and moral pursuits will not be such as to impair the industrial resources of the state or to diminish the marketable value of its products. But there is one remark which applies alike to all these classes of employers. They use the services of children not their own. Now it must be conceded that there exists a well-grounded reluctance on the part of free governments to any such interference with parental relations as is not made necessary by the nature of the government itself or by the criminal conduct or culpable neglect of the parents. But those who employ other men's children for their own profit cannot entrench themselves behind the sacredness of parental rights. Their object is their own personal gain. A lawful and laudable object, it is true, when pursued by justifiable means, but one which cannot sanction for a moment the infliction of a positive injury upon any child, or the deprivation of any privilege essential to his well-being, 
or to the permanence and prosperity of the Republic. The Republic, indeed, if true to itself, can never allow any of its members to do what will rebound to its own injury, and where no parental title can be alleged, the assertion of any right over the labor of children has as little foundation in natural justice or equity as the tyrant's claim to the toil of his vassals. How can any man, having any claim to the character, I will not say of a Christian or a philanthropist, but to the vastly lower one of a patriot, use the services of a child in his household, his shop, his office, or his mill, when he knows that he does it, at the sacrifice, to say the least, of that child's highest earthly interests. How can any man seek to enlarge his own gain, or to pamper his own luxurious habits, by taking the bread of intellectual and moral life from the children around him? I can anticipate but one objection more having any aspect of plausibility— it may be said that although the schools should be kept for the proposed length of time by teachers ennobled with all the intellectual and moral attributes contemplated, yet there are persons capable, like brutes, of bringing children into the world, but impervious to those moral considerations which should impel them to train up those children in the way they should go, and that in regard to this class of parents— some coercive measures may be necessary to secure the attendance of their children at school. I admit this. But is coercion a new idea in a community where there are houses of correction and jails and state prisons and the gallows? Surely bolts and bars, granite walls and strangulating hemp are strange emblems of the voluntary principle— Massachusetts has at the present moment about two thousand persons under lock and key, nineteen twentieths of whom, had they been blessed with a good common school education, would, according to the testimony I have adduced, be now useful and exemplary citizens, building up instead of tearing down the fabric of public welfare. With a population of between eight hundred thousand and nine hundred thousand, she has at least five thousand police officers and magistrates, armed with power to seize and restrain and bring to trial and punishment any transgressors of those laws which she has paid many other thousands for enacting. Does it not argue, then, a perversion of intellect, or an obliquity of the moral sense, to contend that a child, for the purposes of being blessed by the influences of a good school, cannot be taken from a parent who is preparing him to become at least a private, if not an officer, in the great army of malefactors, while it is conceded that by and by, when this same child becomes a parent, he may then be taken from his children, imprisoned, put to hard labor, or put to death. So far as force is concerned, so far as any supposed invasion of private rights is concerned, does not the greater contain the lesser a thousand times over? If the state can send a sheriff's posse to take a man from his own bed at midnight and carry him to jail, to trial, and to execution, does it require a greater extension or bolder use of its prerogatives for the same state to send a kind moral guardian to take a child from the temptations of the street or the haunts of wickedness, and bring him within the benign influence of a good school? Should it be said that, in the case of the adult offender, there has been a forfeiture of civil rights by some overt act of violation, while in the case of the child the violation is prospective only, I reply that nothing is more common than to arrest and imprison men on probable suspicion merely, nothing is more common than to hold men to bail in a sum proportionate to the suspected offense, and when a man gives proof that he intends to do a wrong, and is only awaiting a favorable opportunity to execute his intention, nothing is more common than to put him under bond for good behavior. Every child who is not receiving a good education comes at least within these latter categories. He is an object of violent suspicion. The presumption is strong that he will not make a good citizen, that in some form or other he will get his living out of the earnings of his fellow men, or offend against their welfare. If the commonwealth, then, has the right to imprison an adult, 
or hold him to bail on suspicion, or to bind him over to keep the peace and be of good behavior, has it not an equal, nay, a superior right, to demand guarantees for the child's appearance upon the stage of manhood, there to answer to the great duties that shall be required of him as a citizen? And a good education is surely better security than any bail bond that was ever executed. Has not the state a right to bind each child to his good behavior by imparting to him the instruction, and by instilling into his mind the principles of virtue and religion, by which he shall be twice bound or doubly fastened, for such is the etymological meaning of the word religion, to perform with intelligence and uprightness his social and political duties when he becomes a man? Nor is our legislation without numerous precedents in favor of securing education, even at the expense of coercive measures. These precedents are scattered along our annals from the earliest periods of our colonial existence. The colonial law of 1642, after premising that forasmuch as the good education of children is of singular behoof and benefit to any commonwealth, ordered that the select men of every town shall have a vigilant eye over their brethren and neighbors, to see, first, that none of them shall suffer so much barbarism in any of their families, as not to endeavor to teach by themselves or others, their children and apprentices, so much learning as may enable them perfectly to read the English tongue, and knowledge of the capital laws. And it imposed upon parents what in those times was a heavy penalty for neglect." By the law of 1671, the selectmen were again required to see that all children and youth be taught to read perfectly the English tongue, have knowledge in the capital laws, etc. So the laws of the Plymouth Colony, after setting forth, that whereas many parents and masters, either through an over-respect to their own occasions and business, or not duly considering the good of their children and servants, have too much neglected their duty in their education whilst they are young and capable of learning, proceeded to make substantially the same requirements as were made by the above-mentioned provisions in the laws of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and then declared that if any parents or masters, after warning and admonition, should still remain negligent in their duty, whereby children and servants may be in danger to grow barbarous, rude, or stubborn, and so prove pests instead of blessings to the country, then a fine of ten shillings shall be levied upon the goods of such negligent parent or master. If, after three months subsequent to the levying of this fine, no due care shall be taken and continued for the education of such children and apprentices, then a fine of twenty shillings was to be levied. And lastly, if in three months after that there be no reformation of said neglect, then the select men, with the help of two magistrates, shall take such children and servants from them, the parents, and place them with some masters for years, boys till they come to twenty-one and girls to eighteen years of age, which will more strictly educate and govern them according to the rules of the order. Nor were the above enactments a dead letter, the earlier judicial and municipal records show that when the natural parent broke from the ties of consanguinity and duty by neglecting the education of his children, the law interfered and provided a civil parent for them. Modern legislation, it is true, has greatly relaxed the stringency of these provisions. No adequate substitute is to be found for them in our present educational code— and already neglected childhood is avenging itself upon society by its manhood of crime, not unfrequently by its precocity in crime, long before the years of manhood have been reached. Compulsory enactments, however, still attest that all the spirit of our ancestors is not yet gone. Our laws provide, in various cases, that minor children may be bound out to service, males to the age of twenty-one years, and females to the age of eighteen years, but in all cases it is to be stipulated in the contract that they shall be taught to read, write, and cipher. Stubborn children may be committed to the house of correction. Children in the city of Boston, under the age of sixteen years, 
whose parents are dead, or, if living, do from vice and any other cause neglect to provide suitable employment for or to exercise salutary control over them, may be sent by the court to the House of Reformation. By the late act establishing the State Reform School, male convicts under sixteen years of age may be sent to this school from any part of the Commonwealth, to be there instructed in piety and morality, and in such branches of useful knowledge as shall be adapted to their age and capacity. The inmates may be bound out, but in executing this part of their duty, the trustees shall have scrupulous regard to the religious and moral character of those to whom they are to be bound, to the end that they may secure to the boys the benefit of a good example and wholesome instruction, and the sure means of improvement in virtue and knowledge, and thus the opportunity of becoming intelligent, moral, useful, and happy citizens of the commonwealth. Manufacturers and overseers in manufacturing establishments are prohibited under a penalty from employing any child in their factories under fifteen years of age who has not attended some day school for a specified portion of the year within which he may be so employed, and they are also prohibited from employing any child under twelve years of age more than ten hours a day under any circumstances. In the case of fires, of explosive commodities, of contagious diseases, of immigrant passengers from infected countries, and so forth, the law vests its officers with plenary and summary powers to save the Republic from detriment. Paley has said, that to send an uneducated child into the world is injurious to the rest of mankind. It is little better than to turn out a mad dog or a wild beast into the streets. It is difficult to conceive why he thought it to be any better, since one uneducated vicious man may do infinitely more harm to the world than all the rabid dogs or wild beasts that ever existed. Much as we may need energetic remedies against contagious diseases— we need them against contagious vices more, and quarantine laws in favor of moral health are the most necessary of all sanitary regulations. But I forbear to press further considerations of this character upon the attention of the board. I hope that the great majority of our people will rather wonder why such an argument should be deemed necessary, rather than be disposed to question its conclusions." Having now surveyed, somewhat at length, the various points pertaining to this subject, a brief recapitulation may not be amiss. The basis on which it is suggested that our public school system shall be put is carefully defined in the circular. In some important particulars no change is necessary, as our practice has already reached the point of theoretic excellence. Such are the unconditional rights of all children to enter the school— or their entire exemption from rate bills or any capitation tax, either as a condition precedent or subsequent on their attending school, the range of studies which may be taught, the provision for moral and religious instruction, with guarantees against its abuse, and so forth. But in other respects, important improvements are contemplated. No cardinal or organic change in the system itself but only a progression in a course already begun. Such are more befitting qualifications of teachers for the great work they undertake, the maintenance of all the schools for a period of ten months in each year, instead of the present average of eight months, and, as a necessary consequence, the appropriation of money sufficient to sustain the prolonged school and to pay the better qualified teachers." And finally, the gathering into the schools, during their entire term, of all the children in the community between the ages of four and sixteen years. From the comprehensiveness of this last condition, it is obvious that all cases of sickness, casualty, or other reasonable cause of absence must be accepted. And it is equally clear that when any parent or guardian prefers to educate his children at home or in a private school, he should be allowed to do so, the means of education to be left wholly optional with every one, provided assurance be given to the State that the end is attained. So far as the proposed changes involve the appropriation of more money, 
it has been shown that the state possesses not only a sufficiency but a redundancy of wealth for this purpose. Besides, when once in operation, the system will be found not merely a self-supporting one, but one yielding large revenues, both saving and producing many times more than it will cost, requiting a single expenditure by a manifold remuneration. So far as the higher mental and moral attributes in teachers will be required, reasons have been offered to show that nature, or the common course of providence, supplies an abundance of intellectual power and moral capability, but that, through our present misuse and maladministration of those noble qualities, they are either lost by neglect of culture, or diverted to less worthy pursuits. There is no more iron in the world now than there ever was. We have only discovered how to use it more advantageously, for steamboats, for railroads, for machinery, and a thousand mechanical purposes. And thus, in point of mere pecuniary value, we have given it the first rank among the precious metals. There is no more water flowing down our streams now than there was centuries ago, but we have just found out how to make it saw timber, grind wheat, and make cloth, and already it does a thousand times more work than all our twenty millions of people could do by their own assisted strength, should every man vie with his neighbor in the severity of his toil and the amount of his productions. There are no more individual particles of electricity in the air or in the earth today than there always have been, for ever since the creation there has been an inconceivable host of these particles, a multitude deriding all human power of computation, which have careered round the earth by laws of their own, each one being as distinct from all the rest, and having as separate and independent an existence as one wild horse upon the prairies has from another. Long ago science learned how to catch and confine these natural racers, but it was not until our day that she discovered how to take them, one, ten, a hundred, or a thousand, and dispatch them as messengers to distant cities, to make them the common carriers of intelligence, whom no pursuers can overtake, no bribe can corrupt, nor robbers despoil. Thus it is with the capacities of the human mind. By the bounty of providence they may be employed and made sufficient for the greatest work of reform, it is through our blindness and perversity that they are not yet used to achieve their sublime purposes. Like the iron, like the gravity of falling water, like the electric coursers, they too have the power of conferring unimaginable blessings upon the race. But as yet they have only been very partially enlisted in the highest services of humanity. On the third point— that which contemplates the regular attendance of all the children upon the school, with certain specified exceptions, and even their compulsory attendance in a class of extreme cases, I rely upon legal precedents and analogies, upon the necessity which is imposed upon a republican government if it means to keep itself republican, and upon the broad principle that a parent who neglects to educate his child up to the point proposed proves that he has taken the parental relation upon himself without any corresponding idea of its solemnity, and thus, by the non-performance of his parental duties, forfeits his parental rights. The coincidence of the results, too, to which the witnesses have come, is, on its face, a very remarkable circumstance. But it is rendered still more remarkable by the fact that they made their statements without any concert or comparison of views, and in entire independence of each other. The proof, therefore, is not cumulative merely, but its cogency is raised to a mathematical power equal to the number of the witnesses. Such, then, is a condensed view or summary of the testimony given by credible and trustworthy witnesses on a subject so unspeakably important. The judicial mind cannot fail to observe that the section of country whence these results of experience have been gathered is large, embracing all the states north and east of Pennsylvania. The schools have been both public and private, in town and country, have consisted of both sexes and all ages, and have contained children from all the states in the Union, 
they have embraced thousands and thousands of youth of the land, and commencing at a point of time now more than fifty years gone by, they reach in unbroken continuity to the present day. We have, therefore, no isolated or solitary case, illogically generalized, and made to yield an inference too broad for its premises. Nor is it to be forgotten that each of the witnesses, in theological character, is a sincere believer in such an innate natural condition of the human heart as opposes the most formidable obstacles to success in moral training. Sovereign, indeed, must be the influences which can educe exemplary lives and a well-ordered society, from a race each one of whom could say literally, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me, in a race whose alienation from the righteous law of God is supposed to antedate volition or even consciousness, and to be mingled and inbred with the primary corpuscles of being. It was no disrespect to the many able and eminent teachers of a different religious faith, which deterred me from propounding the same questions to them, and soliciting the results of their experience. But it was because I wished to know what was deemed to be practicable by those who would see the greatest difficulties to be overcome before success could be achieved. While, therefore, their statements were solicited respecting the moral efficacy or potentiality of schools conducted on the cardinal principles of the New England systems, yet it was my wish that each one should make his own theological views manifest on the face of his communication, so that governors and legislators and all leaders of public opinion might see how much was believed to be attainable, even while contending against the most formidable obstacles. I reasoned thus, that if those who believe the battleground to be most nearly inaccessible, and the enemy's entrenchments to be most nearly impregnable, and his power to be most nearly invincible, do still believe that victory can be won, then all would say there should be no sleep in the camp until the war cry is rung and the hand-to-hand -hand struggle is begun. But I must not disguise the fact, nor in any way divert attention from it, that universality of education, either public or private, is a substantive part of the plan here proposed, and indispensable to its successful working. Indeed, I should have thought it nugatory and trifling to ask the opinion of any teacher about attainable results, had this condition been omitted from the scheme. Had it been stipulated or supposed, as a preliminary of the plan, that one per cent only of the children might be left out of the schools, doubtless the witnesses would have made a deduction of at least five per cent from their estimate of results— they would have felt bound to make an allowance not only for the abandoned class themselves, but for the poisonous influence of that class upon the rest. Doubtless every advance in the qualification of teachers, and in gathering more and more of the children within the renovating influences of the schools, will yield a great reward of mental and moral benefits. But universality in the end to be accomplished— demands universality in the means to be employed. If a contagious or infectious distemper were to break out in any quarter of the city, and all of its victims but one were to be removed, though this removal would abate something from the malignant type of the disease, and contract the circle of its ravages, yet who would feel secure while even one should remain to impart the virus by contact or radiate its noxious effluvia? In moral, no less than in physical maladies, the security of each is conditioned on the security of all. The confidence of every rational man must be impaired respecting the prospective virtue of his own children, while the children of his neighbor are vicious. And for the comprehensive meaning of the word neighbor, Christ is our authority. I thank God there can be no safety for any until there is safety for all." Were the sky to be opened and a voice to address us audibly from the heavens, it could not proclaim more articulately than is done by the common course of divine providence, that God has made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and that therefore, being by the law of consanguinity one brotherhood and one body, 
no one member of this body can suffer, but all the members must suffer with it, and no one member can be truly honored, but all the members must rejoice with it. Where men are religious, therefore, this principle appeals to their religion and enforces all its dictates. Where men are not religious, but have only an enlightened selfishness, it invokes that selfishness to do good to others for the reflected benefits upon itself. And thus it leaves only to pursue a different course those who are both morally selfish and intellectually blind. Hence any system of education which does violence to this great principle of universal benevolence, which circumscribes itself within the limits of a family, a caste, a party, or a sect, is but human weakness wrestling against divine power, and under whatever specious disguises it may mask itself, it is only mortal selfishness, seeking by feigned and counterfeited compliances to cajole out of heaven blessings promised only to those who do unto others as they would that others should do unto them. What right has any man or body of men to make the second table of the law of less account than the first, or to delude themselves with the belief that they love the Lord their God with all their heart, while they do not love their neighbor as themselves? If God is our Father, then all men must be our brethren. I believe it would not only be practicable, but easy for the legislature, at its ensuing session, now so soon to be commenced, to initiate a series of measures, which in a very brief period would carry us through the earlier stages of this contemplated reform, measures which would command the ready assent of a vast majority of the citizens of Massachusetts, and would thus leave but few of those unnatural cases, of those parents who are not parents, to be dealt with compulsively. In concluding this report, I shall not attempt to heighten the effect of the evidence and the argument which have been submitted by any effort to describe the blessedness of that state of society which the universal application of this reformatory agency would usher in. Such an endeavor would be vain. He who would do this must first behold the scenes and be thrilled by the joys he would delineate. He must borrow the language of the paradise he would describe. And more than this, he must be able to depict the depth and fierceness of the pains which have been inflicted by the crimes of mankind, not only upon the guilty perpetrators themselves, but upon the innocent circles of their families and friends, the terrors of the conscience-stricken malefactor, the sorrow and shame of children bemoaning a parent's guilt, the madness of the mother at the ruin of her child, the agony which brings down a father's gray hairs with sorrow to the grave, the pangs of fraternal and sisterly affection, to which a stain upon a brother's or sister's name is a dark spot upon the sun of life, which spreads and deepens until it eclipses all the light of existence, all the varied cries of this mingled wail of distress which have been heard in all lands and at all times, from the death of Abel to the present hour, all these he must have power to describe who would describe the blessedness of a deliverance from them. There is one consideration, however, which I cannot forbear to introduce, because it appeals alike to all those various and oftentimes conflicting classes of men who are endeavoring in so many different ways to ameliorate the condition of mankind. Will not a moment's reflection convince them all that, so far as human instrumentality is concerned, education encompasses, pervades, and overrules all their efforts, grants them whatever triumphs they may achieve, and sets bounds to their successes which they cannot overpass? Why does the advocate of temperance every time he returns upon his circuit of beneficence, find his way again blocked up with the prostrate victims of inebriation? Why so long in both hemispheres have the divinest appeals of the advocate for peace been drowned by the din of mustering squadrons and the clarion of war? Why does the opponent of slavery, before he can strike the fetters even from one victim, see other fetters riveted upon the limbs of many more? Why do our moral reform societies and our home mission societies call annually for more money and more laborers, 
wherewith to enter the ever-enlarging fields, as they open before them, of licentiousness and of irreligion. Why do those rich and powerful associations formed for evangelizing the heathen world see the very ships which carry out the gospel and its heralds, freighted also with idols made in Christian lands for those heathen to buy and to worship as true gods, laden with a liquid poison, too, which sinks its victims to such a depth of debasement as to make common heathenism enviable? Why is it that the political parties into which our country is divided persist year after year in solemnly and unceasingly charging each other with heinous and premeditated offenses against the fundamental principles of our government and the highest welfare of the people, charges which, if true, must brand the accused with infamy, and if untrue, the accusers? So far as the members of any one of these various parties are lovers of truth, of righteousness, and of peace, let them be asked what is the reason why they accomplish so little, and why so much ever remains to be done. And they will answer, and answer truly, that they do not fail through lack of reason or of authority, but because of blindness of mind or perversity of heart in those whom they address. The admonitions of history, the precepts of the gospel, the attributes of the deity are all on their side, but they are not heard, because they speak to adders' ears. They are not felt, because their words of fire fall upon stony hearts. It is not, therefore, better or more arguments that they need, but men capable of appreciating the argument. Their eloquence is sufficiently electric and powerful, were it not for the flintiness of the hearts that glance off its lightnings. They want men whose intellects are not blind to the most radiant truths, whose consciences are not as the nether millstone, whose prejudices have not become fossilized. The merits of the divinest cause may be all cancelled by the demerits of the hearers, as the innocence of Christ was no better than guilt at the unholy tribunal of Pilate. But in universal education, every follower of God and friend of humankind will find the only sure means of carrying forward that particular reform to which he is devoted. In whatever department of philanthropy he may be engaged, he will find that department to be only a segment of the great circle of beneficence of which universal education is the center and circumference, and it is only when these segments are fitly joined together that the wheel of progress can move harmoniously and resistlessly onward. Whether, therefore, he is struggling on the one hand to emancipate society from the thraldom of some particular enormity, which to him seems more flagitious than all the rest, or whether, on the other hand, he is striving to endue his age with some special virtue, in no way can he pursue his own peculiar aim so directly and so speedily as by preparing a generation of men, ninety-nine in every hundred of whom, even of the first subjects submitted to the experiment, shall be trained to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. And however a portion of my fellow mortals, or I myself, may feel in regard to the highest religious concernments of the soul, I trust there are none who believe that such an education as is here contemplated would be an obstacle and not an aid to the reception of divine truth. I trust there are none who would not readily adopt the language of Mr. Page in his letter above cited, where he says, I am fully of the opinion that the right of expectation of a religious character would be increased very much in proportion to the excellence of the training given, since God never ordains means which he does not intend to bless. End of section 45 Recording by Maria Casper Section 46 of Annual Reports to the Massachusetts Board of Education by Horace Mann. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Twelfth Annual Report, 1848, Part 1. Gentlemen, Massachusetts may be regarded either as a state by herself, or as a member of a mighty and yet increasing confederacy of states. 
In the former capacity, she has great and abiding interests which are mainly dependent upon her own domestic or internal policy. In the latter relation, her fate depends upon the will of her partners in the association. Hence, although in regard to all nations the Minister for Foreign Affairs is the officer of first importance in the state, yet in regard to our own Commonwealth the Home Department has decided precedence. As an individual state, the geographical extent of Massachusetts and her civil and social interests will remain the same. But when compared, or rather contrasted, with the vast domain and the magnificent and overshadowing interests of the whole Union, she is, and from year to year must be, growing relatively less and less and less. At the epoch of the Revolution she was one of thirteen states— now she is one of thirty. Even so late as 1790, when the first census of the United States was taken, there were but three states whose population exceeded hers. Deducting slaves, of whom she had none, there were but two. Her population at that time amounted to about one-tenth part of the population of the whole Union. It is now much below one-twentieth. At the time, too, of the adoption of the Federal Constitution, the area of Massachusetts bore some assignable and palpable proportion to that of the whole United States. The Mississippi was then the western boundary of the nation. Now our domain not only extends to the Pacific, but stretches through almost seventeen degrees of latitude upon that ocean. Florida then lay between us and the Gulf of Mexico— and the gates of the Mississippi River being liable at any time to be closed against the western states, their only unobstructed egress to the Atlantic was through eastern ports. Now the Gulf is our southern boundary, and the Mississippi and its tributaries, with their more than 16,000 miles of waters navigable by steam, afford a channel capacious enough to drain the west of its vast productions— and then, with the refluent tide of commerce, to supply their demands for foreign merchandise. Territorially considered, the loss of Cape Cod, or of one of the few acres that compose the islands of Nantucket and the Vineyard, would be greater to Massachusetts than the loss of Massachusetts would be to the Union. Our native and beloved state, indeed, seems contracting and dwindling away so fast as to suggest the idea of its more careful perambulation, to see if some clandestine and rapacious neighbor has not incurred the curse of the Mosaic Law by removing our landmarks inward and inward. It is only by taking Massachusetts as a unit, and comparing her area with that of other states in the Union— that we can realize how narrow and diminutive she is becoming. Ohio and Kentucky could each be divided into five states, and each of those ten be larger than our own. New York, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Tennessee would each make considerably more than six states, or the whole of them more than forty-two states of the size of Massachusetts, Michigan, Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin, Georgia, and Arkansas are each equal in territory to seven such states as ours, amounting to another group of forty-two. Virginia and Florida are each equal to more than eight, Missouri is equal to nine, and Texas alone, according to the boundaries now claimed by her, would make forty-four such states. Taking an official estimate of the area of the United States— exclusive of the portion lately acquired from Mexico, it is divisible into 376 such states as Massachusetts. The territory ceded by the treaty with Mexico, which was ratified on the 30th day of May last, exclusive of what is claimed by Texas, would make more than 72 states of equal dimensions. Hence it is plain that Massachusetts, territorially considered, constitutes, not exceeding in round numbers, one four hundred and forty-eighth part of the union to which she belongs, or far less than the proportion which a single degree bears to the three hundred and sixty degrees of a circle. 
the bull's hide mentioned in Virgil's epic would nearly enclose her. In other elements of national greatness, in mineral resources, in productiveness of soil, and in natural facilities for internal intercourse, she falls far below even this insignificant fraction. She has not an inland bay, not a navigable river, no gold is scattered among her sands, granite is her best mineral, and ice the only pearl to be found in her waters. So far, too, as political power founded on numbers is concerned, Massachusetts is shrinking hardly less rapidly than in the relative compass of her borders. Out of 230 representatives in the National Congress, she has but 10. And the next census, now so soon to be taken, will seriously reduce this meager proportion. In the first Congress, she had 8 out of 65, or 1 in 8 and a fraction, instead of 1 in 23 as at present, with waning prospects for the future. In the presidential election of the current year, she gives but 12 out of 290 votes. In choosing electors, therefore, in declaring war and in making peace, and in all the mighty interests, political and moral, that depend upon war and peace, in the deep pecuniary stake which every commercial and manufacturing people have in questions of foreign commerce and domestic currency, and in all civil, military, and diplomatic appointments which require the concurrence of the Senate, Massachusetts is at the mercy of her sisters. And if those sisters become imperious and aggressive, as some of them give significant tokens of becoming, she must succumb and suffer, like the abused Cordelia among the haughty Gonerals and Regans of the family. This picture is no fancy sketch. It is drawn from the original without the exaggeration of a color or a line. We are confronted by these stern realities, these incontrovertible facts. And no illusions of a poetic temperament, no complacent retrospection over periods of past renown, can avert or delay our impending fate. Like the foolish bird which supposes it can avoid danger by hiding its head from its pursuer, we may hide our eyes and avert our thoughts from all contemplation of the fortunes that await us, but those fortunes will nevertheless overtake us with a speed that we cannot escape from, and a resistlessness that we cannot overcome. What, then, shall save our native and beloved state from vanishing quite away, from being unknown in the councils of the nation, and lost to the history of the world? In our domestic legislation, and in all our social relationships, what policy shall prevail, and by what spirit shall we be animated, in order to avert so deplorable a fate? Has not every patriot, every worthy son of a pilgrim sire, an answer at hand? If Massachusetts can no longer challenge respect on account of her numbers, she must challenge it on account of her character. If she is no longer visible by her magnitude, she must become so by her light. She must be like Hesper, fairest of all the train of night, and compensate for the diminutiveness of her size by the intenseness of her brilliancy. Let us reflect, then, in the first place, that Massachusetts has an absolute as well as a relative existence. She exists for her present people and for their posterity, as well as for the Union at large. Though relatively declining, when compared with the whole country, yet there is an actual and constant increase in her numbers. Within her narrow borders she will soon have a million of people, and what finite power can adequately comprehend the joys and sorrows the hopes and fears, the honor or shame, of a million of human beings belonging to the same generation, or sum up the fearful aggregate of happiness or misery for themselves and their descendants. Let us thank heaven, too, that there are other standards of greatness besides vastness of territory, and other forms of wealth besides mineral deposits or agricultural exuberance. Though every hill were a Potosi, Though every valley like that of the Nile were rank with fatness, yet might a nation be poor in the most desperate sense, benighted in the darkness of barbarism, and judgment stricken of heaven for its sins. A state has local boundaries which it cannot rightfully transcend, 
but the realm of intelligence, the sphere of charity, the moral domain in which the soul can expand and expatiate, are illimitable, vast and boundless as the omnipresence of the being that created them. Worldly treasure is of that nature that rust may corrupt, or the moth destroy, or thieves steal. But even upon the earth there are mental treasures which are unapproachable by fraud, impregnable to violence, and whose value does not perish, but is redoubled with the using. A state, then, is not necessarily fated to insignificance because its dimensions are narrow, nor doomed to obscurity and powerlessness because its numbers are few. Athens was small, yet low as were her moral aims, she lighted up the whole earth as a lamp lights up a temple. Judea was small, but her prophets and her teachers were, and will continue to be, the guides of the world. The narrow strip of half-cultivable land that lies between her eastern and western boundaries is not Massachusetts, but her noble and incorruptible men, her pure and exalted women, the children in all her schools, whose daily lessons are the preludes and rehearsals of the great duties of life, and the prophecies of future eminence. These are the state. Under the providence of God, our means of education are the grand machinery by which this raw material of human nature can be worked up into inventors and discoverers, into skilled artisans and scientific farmers, into scholars and jurists, into the founders of benevolent institutions, and the great expounders of ethical and theological science. By means of early education, these embryos of talent may be quickened, which will solve the difficult problems of political and economical law. And by them, too, the genius may be kindled, which will blaze forth in the poets of humanity. Our schools, far more than they have done, may supply the presidents and professors of colleges, and superintendents of public instruction all over the land, and send not only into our sister states, but across the Atlantic, the men of practical science to superintend the construction of the great works of art. Here, too, may those judicial powers be developed and invigorated, which will make legal principles so clear and convincing as to prevent appeals to force. And should the clouds of war ever lower over our country— some hero may be found, the nursling of our schools, and ready to become the leader of our armies, that best of all heroes, who will secure the glories of a peace, unstained by the magnificent murders of the battlefield. The fortunes of a state depend upon antecedent causes, working with greater or less energy through longer or shorter periods of time. By virtue of this universal law, the future condition of the people of Massachusetts will be modified, and to a great extent determined, by the force of causes now put in operation. Enlightened reason discerns the connection between cause and effect. It measures the efficiency of causes, and thus, to a great extent, it is able to adopt and adapt means to the accomplishment of designed ends. Feeble and erring as is the reason of man, yet in this attribute, far more nearly than in any other, does he preserve the divine image in which he was originally formed. Supposing matter to have been first created by the fiat of the Almighty, a substantial and beautiful analogy may be traced between the methods pursued by the Creator and the creature in the formation of the works of their hands. When the fullness of time for creating the parent of the human race had arrived, we must suppose the idea or archetype of a man to have existed in the divine mind as really as the dust of the earth from which he was to be formed existed in his hand, and that, in obedience to the sovereign volition, all the elements of which man is composed, the oxygen, the hydrogen, the nitrogen, the carbon, and all the rest— were brought together and were arranged into his hundreds of bones and of muscles, his thousands of blood vessels and his millions of nerves, in fine, into his limbs and into the manifold apparatus of his senses, into that wonderful organ, the heart, and if anything can surpass the heart as a miracle of creative power, into that still more wonderful organ, the brain." We must suppose, I say, that the elements for the formation of this work were assigned each to its appropriate place, 
until God saw the noble and majestic structure of the human form before him, perfect in all its parts. At a vast distance, but still in humble imitation of the divine processes, does man proceed for the completion of every work of his hands. The architect, for instance, through the medium of his senses, acquires a knowledge of all the various properties of all the substances which enter into the construction of an edifice. By his reason he discovers the special uses and capabilities of all the materials to be employed. Then, in the solitude of his closet, or in the darkness of midnight, he revives in his mind the images of all the substances and ingredients necessary to his work. He measures and arranges and combines the ideas of them. He applies to them the architectural laws of fitness, proportion, and strength, until, at last, the grand conception of the edifice, whether sacred temple or human dwelling, rises in his mind, complete from foundation to turret. He brings together and adjusts the ideas of things, just as an omnipotent arm would bring together and adjust the ponderous things themselves. After this he orders the materials to be collected from their respective localities, it may be from different quarters of the globe, the wood from the forest, the marble from the quarry, the iron from the mine, the bricks from the clay pit, the glass, the furniture, the tapestry, and so forth, each from its place, until that ideal image which had before risen up in the silent recesses of his mind now stands forth in full and majestic proportions, embodied in visible and enduring substance, and supplying for centuries to come a fit place for the dwelling of man or for the worship of God. So, when the Garden of Eden was planted, and when every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for use was made to grow out of the ground, we must suppose that the Creator, proceeding upon the perfect ideas already in his mind, mingled together in due proportion those few chemical elements which in their various combinations make up the almost infinite variety of the vegetable world, until all of nourishment and perfume and beauty which enters into our imagination of paradise clustered and glowed and bloomed around, and filled the air with its sweets. In like manner the gardener, who wishes to bring together within a narrow compass specimens of the various plants and flowers that grow between the equator and the Arctic, first acquires a knowledge of whatever he would cultivate. He classifies them and arranges all the classes in his mind according to their respective natures. He encloses and prepares his grounds, and then he gathers together seed and plant and vine, indigenous and exotic. On some he pours a double portion of the sun, some he removes into the shade, others he buries in darkness to imitate the growth of caverns, and others still he surrounds with ice to reproduce the dwarfish vegetation of the frigid zone. For some he prepares a soil dry as an Arabian desert, and for others he makes an artificial pool, until that which at first was only a bodiless creation of the fancy in the mind of the designer becomes a utility and an embellishment, sustaining the life and ministering to the luxury of men. Now it is the especial province and function of the statesman and the lawgiver, of all those indeed whose influence molds or modifies public opinion, to study out the eternal principles which conduce to the strength, wisdom, and righteousness of a community, to search for these principles as for hidden riches, to strive for them as one would strive for his life, and then to form public institutions in accordance with them. And he is not worthy to be called a statesman, he is not worthy to be a lawgiver or leader among men, who, either through the weakness of his head or the selfishness of his heart, is incapable of marshalling in his mind the great ideas of knowledge, justice, temperance, and obedience to the laws of God, on which foundation alone the structure of human welfare can be erected, who is not capable of organizing these ideas into a system, and then of putting that system into operation as a mechanic does a machine. This is the only true statesmanship. The chief men in society, whether they derive their preeminence from birth or wealth or office, or superiority in natural endowments, 
are mainly responsible for the institutions they leave behind them, because it is in their power to form or conform those institutions according to their own ideas of excellence. The leading spirits of one of the great nations of antiquity had no higher idea of female excellence than that of personal beauty and the attractions of voluptuousness, and hence their brightest and most boasted female ornament was a courtesan. The leading spirits of that other ancient nation, whose perpetual and disgraceful boast it was that it had conquered the whole world, were proud to trace back their ferocious lineage, through patrician and regal blood, to the wolf that suckled their founder, a tradition which, whether fact or fiction, is full of allegorical truth. The founders of communities contemporaneous with our own, and now component parts of this republic, filled their veins at their birth with the cancerous blood of slavery, which has now spread itself over and corrupted the whole organism. And yet the tormented sufferer contends for his disease as for his life, fights for the devil that rends him, because, as he affirms, the exorcism of the evil spirit will be death to himself. For centuries a leading feature in the policy of Great Britain towards Ireland was the utter abolition of all education which did not conform to the government standard of theology and was not administered by teachers of its own choosing. None but a Protestant was allowed to keep a school. From 1709 to 1782, any Roman Catholic who should presume to be a schoolmaster or assistant to a schoolmaster, or even a tutor in a private family, was to be transported, and if the party returned, then he was to be adjudged guilty of high treason, and to be hung, drawn, and quartered. A great portion of the present agony of starving, diseased, distracted Ireland is directly referable to the ignorance which has resulted from those imperial interdicts against knowledge. No other act of British oppression has been so fatal in driving sanity out of the head and kindness out of the heart of that maddened country as the cruel laws by which every child in Ireland was prohibited from nourishing himself with a grain of knowledge, unless he would swallow with it a scruple of theology. These are a few specimens taken from the great storehouse of history, showing how those who enact laws and organize public institutions predetermine the fate of the masses. And are not all those who control legislation and lead public opinion among ourselves adjured by these admonitions of history, as well as by the voice of conscience and the precepts of Christianity, to form a model idea of a healthy, industrious, frugal, temperate, wise Christian commonwealth, and then to exert all their faculties and all their activities in turning this idea into a living reality. Without undervaluing any other human agency, it may be safely affirmed that the common school, improved and energized as it can easily be, may become the most effective and benignant of all the forces of civilization. Two reasons sustain this position. In the first place, there is a universality in its operation, which can be affirmed of no other institution whatever. If administered in the spirit of justice and conciliation, all the rising generation may be brought within the circle of its reformatory and elevating influences. And in the second place, the materials upon which it operates are so pliant and ductile as to be susceptible of assuming a greater variety of forms than any other earthly work of the Creator. The inflexibility and ruggedness of the oak, when compared with the lithe sapling or the tender germ, are but feeble emblems to typify the docility of childhood when contrasted with the obduracy and intractableness of man. It is these inherent advantages of the common school, which in our own state have produced results so striking from a system so imperfect and an administration so feeble. In teaching the blind and the deaf and dumb, in kindling the latent spark of intelligence that lurks in an idiot's mind, and in the more holy work of reforming abandoned and outcast children, education has proved what it can do by glorious experiments. These wonders it has done in its infancy, and with the lights of limited experience. 
But when its faculties shall be fully developed, when it shall be trained to wield its mighty energies for the protection of society, against the giant vices which now invade and torment it, against intemperance, avarice, war, slavery, bigotry, the woes of want, and the wickedness of waste, then there will not be a height to which these enemies of the race can escape, which it will not scale, nor a titan among them all, whom it will not slay. I proceed, then, in endeavoring to show how the true business of the schoolroom connects itself and becomes identical with the great interests of society. The former is the infant, immature state of those interests, the latter their developed adult state. As the child is father to the man, so may the training of the schoolroom expand into the institutions and fortunes of the state. Physical Education in the worldly prosperity of mankind, health and strength are indispensable ingredients. Reflect for a moment what an inroad upon the comfort of a family and its means of support is a case of chronic sickness or debility in a single one of its members. Should a farmer contract to support and to continue to pay his laborer, or a manufacturer his operative, whether able or unable to work, they would demand a serious abatement of wages as a premium for that risk. But whatever drawback a sick member would be to the pecuniary prosperity of a family, or a sick laborer to that of an employer bound to support him, just such a drawback is a sick or disabled member of the community to the financial prosperity of the state to which he belongs. The amount of loss consequent upon such sickness or disability may not be drawn out of the public treasury, but it is subtracted from the common property of the state in a way still more injurious than if the same amount of gold were taken from the public coffers by warrant of the executive. Money so taken would be transferred to another hand, but it would still exist. But the want of health and strength is a dead loss to the community, and whenever the next valuation is taken, there will be a corresponding deficit in the aggregate of national property. Hence, every citizen, as such, is pecuniarily interested in the health and strength of all his fellow citizens. It is right, therefore, that he should look upon them all, not only as a benevolent and Christian man would do, pitying and succoring their misfortunes, but he should look upon them also as a man of business, as one who contributes, or is bound to contribute, to a reserved fund from which all the non-producing sick and valetudinary are supported. Men see this community of interests plainly enough when the sickness comes in the form of a pestilence, and decimates and redecimates a city, arresting all the currents of business, gathering the well about the sickbed or the hearse, or scattering them abroad with fear. But in the aggregate of its periods of sickness, and in the number of its victims, the plague itself is less destructive to human life than the ordinary and stereotyped causes of mortality, which familiarity has bereft of their terrors. It is the concentration of its havoc that makes pestilence terrific. This concentration men's senses can perceive, and therefore they are affrighted. But to the eye of reason, that is most alarming which is most injurious, and it is this eye with which a statesman or philosopher should look when he takes a survey of human interests. Leaving out, then, for the present purpose, all consideration of the pains of sickness and the anguish of bereavement, the momentous truth still remains that sickness and premature death are positive evils for the statesman and political economist to cope with. The earth, as a hospital for the diseased, would soon wear out the love of life. And if but half of mankind were sick, famine from non-production would speedily threaten the whole. Now, modern science has made nothing more certain than that both good and ill health are the direct result of causes mainly within our own control. In other words, the health of the race is dependent upon the conduct of the race. The health of the individual is determined primarily by his parents, secondarily by himself. 
the vigorous growth of the body, its strength and its activity, its powers of endurance and its length of life on the one hand, and dwarfishness, sluggishness, infirmity, and premature death on the other, are all the subjects of unchangeable laws. These laws are ordained of God, but the knowledge of them is left to our diligence, and the observance of them to our free agency. These laws are very few, they are so simple that all can understand them, and so beautiful that the pleasure of contemplating them, even independent of their utility, is a tenfold reward for all the labor of their acquisition. The laws, I repeat, are few. The circumstances, however, under which they are to be applied, are exceedingly various and complicated. These circumstances embrace the almost infinite varieties of our daily life. Exercise and rest, sleeping and watching, eating, drinking, and abstinence, the affections and passions, exposure to vicissitudes of temperature, to dryness and humidity, to the effluvia and exhalations of dead animal or decaying vegetable matter. In fine, they embrace all cases where excesses, indiscretions, or exposures may induce disease, or where exercise, temperance, cleanliness, and pure air may avert it. Hence it would be wholly impossible to write out any code of rules and regulations applicable to all cases. So, too, the occasions for applying the laws to new circumstances recur so continually that no man can have a mentor at his side in the form of a physician or physiologist to direct his conduct in new emergencies. Even the most favored individual, in ninety-nine cases in a hundred, must prescribe for himself. And hence the uncompromising necessity that all children should be instructed in these laws, and not only instructed, but that they should receive such a training during the whole course of pupillage as to enlist the mighty forces of habit on the side of obedience, and that their judgment also should be so developed and matured that they will be able to discriminate between different combinations of circumstances, and to adapt in each case the regimen to the exigency. Looking to the various disorders and disabilities, which, as every one's experience or observation shows him, do invade and prostrate the human frame, some may be slow to believe that all men, or even the majority of them, will ever be able to administer to those which fall to their share. But in the first place, it may be remarked that a judicious course of physical training, faithfully observed through all the years of infancy, childhood, and adolescence, will avert a vast proportion of the pains and distempers that now besiege and subdue the human system or some of its vital organs, and hence that one may safely be ignorant of symptoms and of remedies which he will never have occasion to recognize or to use, as one who seeks a residence remote from wild beasts has no practical occasion to know how they are hunted. And in the next place, that if every one does not know in all cases how to prescribe for himself, yet he may always know what part of his machinery is out of order, and how necessary it is to apply promptly to a repairer. Even such a degree of anatomical knowledge as enables one to point out the suffering organ is of great value. For doubtless not merely children, but ignorant men, have killed themselves by giving a false location to their malady, or, which is the same kind of error, have caused their physician so to prescribe as to inflict disease on a sound organ instead of healing a diseased one. It is not every one that can inform the dentist which tooth is the offender. But to the objection that all men and women cannot be physicians, the decisive answer is that the physician must be acquainted with the laws of disease which are countless in number and are ever developing new symptoms. But the sound man or woman needs to be acquainted only with the laws of health, which are few, and whose results, though acting upon different systems, are substantially uniform. The pharmacopoeia of the physician embraces nearly all minerals and all vegetables, and several of the more offensive classes of the animal kingdom, with the various mechanical and chemical combinations which can be formed from or among them. 
but the whole pharmacopoeia of the healthy man comprises but little more than pure water and pure air, simple viands, vegetables, and bread. In quality they are as different as in number, as different as the sweet and savory contents of storeroom and larder, from those acrid and mephitic substances which make the druggist's warehouse a universal conservatory of particular abominations. Is it too much, then, to say that the leaders of society, whether makers of law or creators of fashion and custom, are bound by the most solemn obligations of duty, as well as by interest, to curtail the ravages of sickness and untimely death, and as far as possible to make health and longevity the common property of men. The civil government takes cognizance of pauperism, and men of worldly substance are obliged to bear its expenses. The disabilities of ill health and the pecuniary losses by early death are among the leading causes of pauperism. He, therefore, who would prevent the latter must prevent the former. The civil government exercises penal jurisdiction over crimes and over the grosser vices, and is it not true that many of those morbid appetites and unnatural desires that seek to assuage their longings by indulgence and excess have their origin in the action of a distempered body upon the mind, rather than of the mind upon the body? Indeed, how often have pure and pious hearts encountered a relentless antagonist to their highest and most devout resolves and aspirations in the pruriences and hankerings of the body in which they were imprisoned. Many a waspish man would become amiable if he could be hung on a new set of nerves. Many a misanthropic disposition would warm into kindliness could the acrid humors of the body be evaporated or washed away. The dyspeptic contends with evil spirits, blue and black, against whom the eupeptic bears an invincible charm. The civil government, too, is bound to provide for the insane, both for the security of the sane and for the recovery or amelioration of the insane. The diseases incident to several bodily organs give direct birth to insanity. A disease of the brain induces it at once. Indeed, insanity is often only an exacerbation of some bodily disorder. As a brook swells into a river, so the inflammation of certain organs matures into insanity. General health would greatly reduce the size of those deplorable necessities of an imperfect civilization, hospitals for the insane. In extraordinary emergencies, governments do not hesitate to interfere for preventing the spread of contagion, and for excluding the media through which diseases are propagated. When sudden pestilence breaks out in a city, the infected district is put under a bar of non-intercourse with the healthy. When a crew of men or a cargo of merchandise arrives from an infected port, a quarantine is enforced. In these cases the civil magistracy acts under the impulse of fear. But has not government a capacity of reflection and foresight as well as a susceptibility to fear? Is a civilized government of modern times to be classified with those orders of existence that have propensity and appetite merely, but not reason and providence? If not, then surely is the government bound to do all it can against the wastings of ill health and the havoc of unnecessary death and it is bound to use equal vigilance whether these calamities invade us from abroad or are born of home-bred ignorance and folly. And as has been before intimated, who does not know that the aggregate suffering and loss from general and diffused causes of ill health are infinitely greater than from the sudden eruption or outbreak of all the contagions and epidemics with which we are ever afflicted? For this greater evil, then, society is bound to provide, not a remedy, but something better than a remedy, a preventive. Intelligence and obedience would be an antidote sovereign in its efficacy and universal in its applicability. Now it is beyond all question that with the rarest exceptions every child in the commonwealth may be endued with this intelligence, and what is equally important, trained to conforming personal habits. 
enlightened by knowledge and impelled by the force of early and long-continued habit, he would not only see the reasonableness of adapting his regimen to his condition in the varying circumstances of life, but he would feel a personal interest in doing so, as men now feel a personal interest in procuring the gratifications of money or of power. Habit and knowledge will coincide. They will draw in the same direction. They will not be antagonists, as is now so generally the case with those adult men who acquire sound knowledge after the bad habits have been enthroned, the blind force of the latter, spurning all the arguments and warnings of the former. This work may be mainly done during the period of nonage or before children are emancipated from parental control. Let a child wash himself all over every morning for sixteen years, and he would as soon go without his breakfast as without his bath. This is but a specimen of the effect of a long-continued observance of nature's health regulations. Not only will a general knowledge of human physiology or the laws of health do much to supersede the necessity of a knowledge of pathology or the laws of disease, but the former is as much better than the latter as prevention is better than remedy, as much better as all the comforts and securities of an unburned dwelling are than two-thirds of its value in money from the insurance office. A general diffusion of physiological knowledge will save millions annually to the state. It will gradually revolutionize many of the absurd customs and usages of society, conforming them more and more to the rules of reason and true enjoyment, and withdrawing them more and more from the equally vicious extremes of barbarism and of artificial life. It will restrain the caprices and follies of fashion in regard to dress and amusement, and subordinate its ridiculous excesses to the laws of health and decency. It will reproduce the obliterated lines that once divided day and night. It will secure cleanliness and purity more intimate and personal than any laundress can supply. It will teach men to eat that they may live, instead of living that they may eat. When Satan approaches in that form in which he has hitherto been most seductive and successful, the form of intoxicating beverages, those who wear the talisman of this science will have an antidote against his temptations. It is a lesson of unspeakable importance to learn that nourishment and not pleasure is the primary object of food. God, indeed, in his benevolence, has made the reception of this food not only reparative but pleasant, but to lose sight of the first object in a brutish desire for the second is voluntarily to alter our position in the scale of being, and from the rank of men to descend to the order of beasts. Physiology would reverse the ancient fable and transform men into swine who now sit at Epicurean tables and drink of the Circean cup. Every intelligent man deplores the almost universal condition of our dwelling-houses and public edifices, which have been built without regard to the necessities of the human system for pure air. Were physiology universally understood, no man would think of erecting a mansion without an apparatus for its thorough ventilation at all times, any more than without windows for the admission of light." Apertures and flues for the ingress and egress of air into and from sitting-rooms and sleeping-rooms are as necessary to the architectural idea of a well-finished house as nasal orifices are to the anatomical idea of a man, and a dwelling without the means of ventilation is as incomplete and as unsightly as a man without a nose. A knowledge of this science would establish a new standard of beauty, the classic standard of the Greeks, in which strength was a primary and indispensable element, and it would demonstrate the unspeakable folly and guilt of those matrimonial alliances where hereditary disease and even insanity itself are wedded, and the health, mind, and happiness of a family of children are sacrificed for the mercenary object of a dowry. But an immunity from expense, privation, pain, and bereavement is not the only boon connected with health and longevity. Sound health is not merely the negation of ill, it is a medium through which alone we can gain access to many invaluable blessings. It enhances every pleasure, and is indispensable to the full performance of almost every duty. 
The elements environ us with the fatal dangers against which health is our only preserver. The vicissitudes of the climate must be encountered. We have no power to arrest the north wind that congeals by its cold, nor the south that dissolves by its heat. The humidity of one part of the year and the aridness of another are equally beyond human control. As our planet wheels around the sun, now turning up our hemisphere to its vertical and fervid rays, and now by its oblique position reducing temperature to the opposite extreme, we have no choice but to attend its circuit and abide its changes. It is certain that nothing but health will enable us to survive exposure to these natural extremes. A thousand causes exist, too, which engender impurity in the air we breathe, we ourselves being the principal. Nothing but knowledge can enable us to eliminate the grossest of these noxious ingredients, and nothing but health to resist the poison of those which remain. The waste constantly going on in the particles that compose our bodies lays us under an ever-recurring necessity to replenish their exhausted substance by the reception of food. And here, if the food we take in is not subjected to the transforming and assimilating power of the alimentary organs, a power which is wholly lost with the loss of health, it will prove our destruction. Each of our organs is an avenue through which death may invade us, and innumerable deaths, that is, innumerable agencies, each one of which has the power of causing death, hold perpetual siege at every avenue, and watch for an opportunity to enter and destroy. And yet air and nourishment, heat and cold, moisture and dryness, we must encounter, and we must have, for they are the permanent conditions of our being. How intelligible, then, and how authoritative does the doctrine become, that high health, and high health alone, is harmony with nature. A person without high health is just as much at war with nature as a guilty soul is at war with the Spirit of God, and the struggles of our frail bodies against the resistless might of the elements will be as unavailing as that of our souls against the retributions of omnipotence. The capacities of the body for resisting the force of the elements and for appropriating and assimilating the substances around it into its own substance is one thing. Its capacities for labor are another. Let any man who has fallen from a state of vigorous health to that of a valetudinary compare his standard of a day's work in the one state with that in the other, and he can then form a better estimate of the value of the health that measures the difference between the two conditions. Sound health opens new and more lucrative employments to its possessor. Ill health often closes a career of the highest usefulness, and though the mind may have been prepared by splendid natural endowments and by years of study and experience to lead forward the race in the march of civilization, yet it is stricken down in the midst of its beneficence by the assaults of disease— and thus the onward movement of humanity is arrested or becomes retrograde and must wait through another cycle for another leader. What great works in art, in science, and in morals have been left unfinished or unattempted by reason of the slow decays or the sudden extinction of health and of life? When any man of sense has an important work to perform, the first thing he does is to provide a fitting instrument— a tool, a machine, or whatever it may be, with which the work can be done. Health is the prime instrument for the performance of all the labors of life. One more idea is inseparable from this subject. When the religious man reflects that our bodies are God's workmanship, he sees that the laws impressed upon them can be no less than God's laws— if these laws, then, are God's laws, we are bound to recognize and obey them. We are bound to obey a law which God has impressed upon the body, on the same principle that we are bound to obey a law which he has impressed upon the soul. And here, how pertinent and forcible is the great idea which has been set forth so distinctly by a late writer, that when we know a law to be God's law, it matters not by what means we may have arrived at the knowledge, the law becomes imperatively and equally binding upon us. Between the law of the body and the law of the soul, 
there may indeed sometimes arise what we call a conflict of duty, when the subordinate obligation of the former must yield to the supremacy of the latter, but this refers to relative importance and not to inherent obligation. My general conclusion, then, under this head, is that it is the duty of all the governing minds in society, whether in office or out of it, to diffuse a knowledge of these beautiful and beneficent laws of health and life throughout the length and breadth of the state, to popularize them, to make them, in the first place, the common acquisition of all, and through education and custom the common inheritance of all, so that the healthful habits naturally growing out of their observance shall be inbred in the people, exemplified in the personal regimen of each individual, incorporated into the economy of every household, observable in all private dwellings and in all public edifices, especially in those buildings which are erected by capitalists for the residence of their workpeople, or for renting to the poorer classes, obeyed by supplying cities with pure water, by providing public baths, public walks, and public squares, by rural cemeteries, by the drainage and sewerage of populous towns, and by whatever else may promote the general salubrity of the atmosphere. In fine, by a religious observance of all these sanitary regulations with which modern science has blessed the world. For this thorough diffusion of sanitary intelligence, the common school is the only agency. It is, however, an adequate agency. Let human physiology be introduced as an indispensable branch of study into our public schools. Let no teacher be approved who is not a master of its leading principles, and of their applications to the varying circumstances of life. Let all the older classes in the schools be regularly and rigidly examined upon this study by the school committees, and a speedy change would come over our personal habits, over our domestic usages, and over the public arrangements of society. Temperance and moderation would not be such strangers at the table. Fashion, like European sovereigns, if not compelled to abdicate and fly, would be forced to compromise for the continued possession of her throne by the surrender to her subjects of many of their natural rights. A sixth order of architecture would be invented, the hygienic, which, without subtracting at all from the beauty of any other order, would add a new element of utility to them all. The health regulations of cities would be issued in a revised code, a code that would bear the scrutiny of science." And as the result and reward of all, a race of men and women, loftier in stature, firmer in structure, fairer in form, and better able to perform the duties and bear the burdens of life, would revisit the earth. The minikin specimens of the race, who now go on dwindling and tapering from parent to child, would reascend to manhood and womanhood. Just in proportion as the laws of health and life were discovered and obeyed, would pain, disease, insanity, and untimely death cease from among men. Consumption would remain, but it would be consumption in the active sense. End of section 46. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 47 of Annual Reports to the Massachusetts Board of Education by Horace Mann. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Twelfth Annual Report, 1848, Part 2 Intellectual Education as a Means of Removing Poverty and Securing Abundance Another cardinal object which the government of Massachusetts and all the influential men in the state should propose to themselves is the physical well-being of all the people, the sufficiency comfort, competence of every individual in regard to food, raiment, and shelter. And these necessities and conveniences of life should be obtained by each individual for himself, or by each family for themselves, rather than accepted from the hand of charity or extorted by poor laws. It is not averred that this most desirable result can in all instances be obtained, but it is nevertheless the end to be aimed at. True statesmanship and true political economy, 
not less than true philanthropy, present this perfect theory as the goal, to be more and more closely approximated by our imperfect practice. The desire to achieve such a result cannot be regarded as an unreasonable ambition, for though all mankind were well fed, well clothed, and well housed, they might still be but half civilized. Poverty is a public as well as a private evil. There is no physical law necessitating its existence. The earth contains abundant resources for ten times, doubtless for twenty times, its present inhabitants. Cold, hunger, and nakedness are not, like death, an inevitable lot. There are many single states in this union which could supply an abundance of edible products for the inhabitants of the thirty states that compose it. There are single states capable of raising a sufficient quantity of cotton to clothe the whole nation, and there are other states having sufficient factories and machinery to manufacture it. The coal fields of Pennsylvania are sufficiently abundant to keep every house in the land at the temperature of sixty-five degrees for centuries to come. Were there to be a competition, on the one hand, to supply wool for every conceivable fabric, and on the other to wear out these fabrics as fast as possible, the single state of New York would beat the whole country. There is indeed no assignable limit to the capacities of the earth for producing whatever is necessary for the sustenance, comfort, and improvement of the race. Indigence, therefore, and the miseries and degradations incident to indigence, seem to be no part of the eternal ordinances of heaven. The bounty of God is not brought into question or suspicion by its existence, for man who suffers it might have avoided it. Even the wealth which the world now has on hand is more than sufficient to supply all the rational wants of every individual in it. Privations and sufferings exist, not from the smallness of its sum, but from the inequality of its distribution. Poverty is set over against profusion. In sum, all healthy appetite is cloyed and sickened by repletion, while in others the stomach seems to be a supernumerary organ in the system, or, like the human eye or human lungs before birth, is waiting to be transferred to some other region where its functions may come into use. One gorgeous palace absorbs all the labor and expense that might have made a thousand hovels comfortable. That one man may ride in carriages of oriental luxury, hundreds of other men are turned into beasts of burden. To supply a superfluous wardrobe for the gratification of one man's pride, a thousand women and children shiver with cold, and for every flash of the diamonds that royalty wears, there is a tear of distress in the poor man's dwelling. Not one Lazarus but a hundred sit at the gate of Dives. Tantalus is no fiction. The ancient one might have been fabulous, but the modern ones are terrible realities. Millions are perishing in the midst of superfluities. According to the European theory, men are divided into classes, some to toil and earn, others to seize and enjoy. According to the Massachusetts theory, all are to have an equal chance for earning and equal security in the enjoyment of what they earn. The latter tends to equality of condition, the former to the grossest inequalities. Tried by any Christian standard of morals, or even by any of the better sort of heathen standards, can any one hesitate for a moment in declaring which of the two will produce the greater amount of human welfare, and which, therefore, is the more conformable to the divine will? The European theory is blind to what constitutes the highest glory as well as the highest duty of a state— its advocates and admirers are forgetful of that which should be their highest ambition, and proud of that which constitutes their shame. How can any one possessed of the attributes of humanity look with satisfaction upon the splendid treasures, the golden regalia deposited in the Tower of London or in Windsor Palace, each an India in itself, while thousands around are dying of starvation, or have been made criminals by the combined forces of temptation and neglect. 
The present condition of Ireland cancels all the glories of the British crown. The present conception which symbolizes the nationality of Great Britain as a superb temple, whose massive and grand proportions are upheld and adorned by the four hundred and thirty Corinthian columns of the aristocracy, is turned into a loathing and a scorn when we behold the five millions of paupers that cower and shiver at its base. The galleries and fountains of Versailles, the Louvre of Paris, her Notre-Dame and her Madeleine, though multiplied by thousands in number and in brilliancy, would be no atonement for the hundred thousand Parisian ouvriers without bread and without work. The galleries of painting and of sculpture at Rome, at Munich, or at Dresden, which body forth the divinest ideals ever executed or ever conceived, are but an abomination in the sight of heaven and of all good men, while actual living beings, beings that have hearts to palpitate and nerves to agonize and affections to be crushed or corrupted, are experimenting all around them upon the capacities of human nature for suffering and for sin. Where standards like these exist and are upheld by counsel and by court, by fashion and by law, Christianity is yet to be discovered, at least it is yet to be applied in practice to the social condition of men. Our ambition as a state should trace itself to a different origin, and propose to itself a different object. Its flame should be lighted at the skies, its radiance and its warmth should reach the darkest and coldest abodes of men. It should seek the solution of such problems as these. To what extent can competence displace pauperism? How nearly can we free ourselves from the low-minded and the vicious, not by their expatriation, but by their elevation? To what extent can the resources and powers of nature be converted into human welfare, the peaceful arts of life be advanced, and the vast treasures of human talent and genius be developed? How much of suffering in all its forms can be relieved? Or, what is better than relief, how much can be prevented? Cannot the classes of crimes be lessened, and the number of criminals in each class diminished? Our exemplars, both for public and for private imitation, should be the parables of the lost sheep and the lost piece of silver. When we have spread competence through all the abodes of poverty, when we have substituted knowledge for ignorance in the minds of the whole people, when we have reformed the vicious and reclaimed the criminal, then may we invite all neighboring nations to behold the spectacle and say to them, in the conscious elation of virtue, Rejoice with me, for I have found that which was lost. Until that day shall arrive, our duties will not be wholly fulfilled, and our ambition will have new honors to win. But is it not true that Massachusetts, in some respects, instead of adhering more and more closely to her own theory, is becoming emulous of the baneful examples of Europe? The distance between the two extremes of society is lengthening instead of being abridged. With every generation, fortunes increase on the one hand, and some new privation is added to poverty on the other. We are verging towards those extremes of opulence and of penury, each of which unhumanizes the human mind. A perpetual struggle for the bare necessities of life, without the ability to obtain them, makes men wolfish. Avarice, on the other hand, sees in all the victims of misery around it, not objects for pity and succor, but only crude materials to be worked up into more money. I suppose it to be the universal sentiment of all those who mingle any ingredient of benevolence with their notions on political economy, that vast and overshadowing private fortunes are among the greatest dangers to which the happiness of the people in a republic can be subjected. Such fortunes would create a feudalism of a new kind, but one more oppressive and unrelenting than that of the Middle Ages— the feudal lords in England and on the continent never held their retainers in a more abject condition of servitude 
than the great majority of foreign manufacturers and capitalists hold their operatives and laborers at the present day. The means employed are different, but the similarity in results is striking. What force did then, money does now. The villain of the Middle Ages had no spot of earth on which he could live, unless one were granted to him by his lord. The operative or laborer of the present day has no employment, and therefore no bread, unless the capitalist will accept his services. The vassal had no shelter but such as his master provided for him. Not one in five thousand of English operatives or farm laborers is able to build or own even a hovel, therefore they must accept such shelter as capital offers them. The baron prescribed his own terms to his retainers. Those terms were peremptory, and the serf must submit or perish. The British manufacturer or farmer prescribes the rate of wages that he will give to his workpeople. He reduces those wages under whatever pretext he pleases, and they too have no alternative but submission or starvation. In some respects, indeed, the condition of the modern dependent is more forlorn than that of the corresponding serf class in former times. Some attributes of the patriarchal relation did spring up between the lord and his lieges to soften the harsh relations subsisting between them. Hence came some oversight of the condition of children, some relief in sickness, some protection and support in the decrepitude of age, but only in instances comparatively few have kindly offices smoothed the rugged relation between British capital and British labor. The children of the working people are abandoned to their fate, and notwithstanding the privations they suffer and the dangers they threaten, no power in the realm has yet been able to secure them an education, and when the adult laborer is prostrated by sickness or eventually worn out by toil and age— the poorhouse, which has all along been his destination, becomes his destiny. Now, two or three things will doubtless be admitted to be true beyond all controversy in regard to Massachusetts. By its industrial condition and its business operations, it is exposed, far beyond any other state in the Union, to the fatal extremes of overgrown wealth and desperate poverty— its population is far more dense than that of any other state. It is four or five times more dense than the average of all the other states taken together. And density of population has always been one of the proximate causes of social inequality. According to population and territorial extent, there is far more capital in Massachusetts, capital which is movable and instantaneously available, than in any other state in the Union, and probably both these qualifications respecting population and territory could be omitted without endangering the truth of the assertion. It has recently been stated in a very respectable public journal, on the authority of a writer conversant with the subject, that from the last of June 1846 to the first of August 1848, the amount of money invested by the citizens of Massachusetts in manufacturing cities, railroads, and other improvements, is fifty-seven millions of dollars, of which more than fifty has been paid in and expended. The dividends to be received by citizens of Massachusetts from June 1848 to April 1849 are estimated by the same writer at ten millions, and the annual increase of capital at little short of twenty-two millions. If this be so, are we not in danger of naturalizing and domesticating among ourselves those hideous evils which are always engendered between capital and labor, when all the capital is in the hands of one class, and all the labor is thrown upon another? Now surely nothing but universal education can counterwork this tendency to the domination of capital and the servility of labor— if one class possesses all the wealth and the education, while the residue of society is ignorant and poor, it matters not by what name the relation between them may be called. The latter, in fact and in truth, will be the servile dependents and subjects of the former. 
but if education be equally diffused, it will draw property after it by the strongest of all attractions. For such a thing never did happen, and never can happen, as that an intelligent and practical body of men should be permanently poor. Property and labor in different classes are essentially antagonistic, but property and labor in the same class are essentially fraternal. The people of Massachusetts have in some degree appreciated the truth, that the unexampled prosperity of the state, its comfort, its competence, its general intelligence and virtue, is attributable to the education, more or less perfect, which all its people have received. But are they sensible of a fact equally important? Namely, that it is to this same education that two-thirds of the people are indebted for not being today the vassals of as severe a tyranny in the form of capital as the lower classes of Europe are bound to in the form of brute force. Education, then, beyond all other devices of human origin, is the great equalizer of the conditions of men, the balance-wheel of the social machinery. I do not here mean that it so elevates the moral nature as to make men disdain and abhor the oppression of their fellow-men. This idea pertains to another of its attributes." but I mean that it gives each man the independence and the means by which he can resist the selfishness of other men. It does better than to disarm the poor of their hostility towards the rich. It prevents being poor. Agrarianism is the revenge of poverty against wealth. The wanton destruction of the property of others, the burning of hay-ricks and corn-ricks, the demolition of machinery because it supersedes hand-labor, the sprinkling of vitriol on rich dresses, is only agrarianism run mad. Education prevents both the revenge and the madness. On the other hand, a fellow feeling for one's class or caste is the common instinct of hearts not wholly sunk in selfish regard for person or for family. The spread of education, by enlarging the cultivated class or caste, will open a wider area over which the social feelings will expand. And if this education should be universal and complete, it would do more than all things else to obliterate factitious distinctions in society. The main idea set forth in the creeds of some political reformers or revolutionizers is that some people are poor because others are rich. This idea supposes a fixed amount of property in the community, which by fraud or force or arbitrary law is unequally divided among men. And the problem presented for solution is how to transfer a portion of this property from those who are supposed to have too much to those who feel and know that they have too little. At this point both their theory and their expectation of reform stop. But the beneficent power of education would not be exhausted even though it should peaceably abolish all the miseries that spring from the coexistence side by side of enormous wealth and squalid want. It has a higher function. Beyond the power of diffusing old wealth, it has the prerogative of creating new. It is a thousand times more lucrative than fraud, and adds a thousandfold more to a nation's resources than the most successful conquest. Knaves and robbers can obtain only what was before possessed by others. But education creates and develops new treasures, treasures not before possessed or dreamed of by anyone. Had mankind been endowed only with the instincts and faculties of the brute creation, there are hundreds of the irrational tribes to which they would have been inferior, and of which they would have been the prey. Did they with the other animals roam in a common forest, how many of their fellow tenants of that wood would overcome them by superior force, or outstrip them by greater fleetness, or circumvent them by a sharper cunning? There are but few of the irrational tribes whose bodies are not better provided with the means of defense or attack than is the body of a man. The claws and the canine teeth of the lion and of the whole tiger family the beak and talons of the eagle and the vulture, the speed of the deer and of other timid races, are means of assault or of escape 
far superior to any we possess. And all the power which we have, like so many of the reptile and insect classes, of secreting a deadly venom, either for protection or for aggression, has relation to moral venom and not to physical. In a few lines, nowhere surpassed in philosophic strength and beauty, Pope groups together the remarkable qualities of several different races of animals, the strength of one class, the genial covering of another, the fleetness of a third. He brings vividly to our recollection the lynx's vision of excelling keenness, the sagacity of the hound that reads a name or a sign in the last vanishing odor of a footprint, the exquisite fineness of the spider's touch, and that chemical nicety by which the bee discriminates between honey and poison in the same flower cup. He then closes with an interrogatory which has human reason both for its subject and its object. The powers of all subdued by thee alone, is not thy reason all these powers in one? When Pope, now a little more than a century ago, mingled these beauties with his didactic strains, he had no conception, the world at that time had no conception, of other powers and properties, infinitely more energetic and more exhaustless than all which the animal races possess, to which the reason of man is in equivalent. It was not then known that God had endued the earth and the elements with energies and activities as much superior to those which animals or men possess, as the bulk and frame of the earth itself exceeds their diminutive proportions. It was not then known that the earth is a great reservoir of powers, and that any man is free to use any quantity of them if he will but possess himself of the key of knowledge, the only key but the infallible one by which to unlock their gates. At that time, if a philosopher wished to operate a mechanical toy, he could lift or pump a few gallons of water for a moving power, but it was not understood that nature, by the processes of evaporation and condensation, is constantly lifting up into the sky and pouring back upon the earth all the mass of waters that flow in all the rivers of the world, and that in order to perform the work of the world, the weight of all these waters might be used again and again in each one of their perpetual circuits. The power press and the power loom, the steamboat and the locomotive, the paper machine and the telegraph, were not then known. All these instruments of human comfort and aggrandizement, and others almost innumerable, similar to them, are operated by the energies and the velocities of nature." and had Pope grouped together all the splendid profusion and prodigality of her powers, he might still have appealed to man and said, Is not thy reason all these powers in one? To the weight of waters, the velocity of winds, the expansive force of heat, and other kindred agencies, any man may go, and he may draw from them as much as he pleases, without money and without price." or rather, I should say, any educated man may go. For nature flouts and scorns and seems to abhor an ignorant man. She drowns him and consumes him and tears him in pieces, if he but ventures to profane with his touch her divinely wrought machinery. Now these powers of nature, by being enlisted in the service of man, add to the wealth of the world. Unlike robbery or slavery or agrarianism, which aim only at the appropriation by one man or one class of the wealth belonging to another man or class. One man with a foudrinier will make more paper in a twelve-month than all Egypt could have made in a hundred years during the reign of the Ptolemies. One man with a power-press will print books faster than a million of scribes could copy them before the invention of printing. One man with an iron foundry will make more utensils or machinery than Tubal Cain could have made had he worked diligently till this time. And so in all the departments of mechanical labor, in the whole circle of the useful arts, these powers of nature are able to give to all the inhabitants of the earth, not merely shelter, covering, and food, but all the means of refinement, embellishment, and mental improvement. 
in the most strict and literal sense, they are bounties which God gives for proficiency in knowledge. The above ideas are beginning to be pretty well understood by all men of respectable intelligence. I have adverted to them not so much on their own account, but by way of introduction or preface to two or three considerations which certainly are not understood or not appreciated as they deserve to be. It is a remarkable fact that human progress, even in regard to the worldly interests of the race, did not begin with those improvements which are most closely allied to material prosperity. One would have supposed beforehand that improvements would commence with the near rather than with the remote. Yet mankind had made great advances in astronomy, in geometry, and other mathematical sciences— in the writing of history, in oratory, and in poetry, it is supposed by many to have reached the highest point of yet attained perfection, in painting and in sculpture, and in those kinds of architecture which may be called regal or religious, centuries before the great mechanical discoveries and inventions which now bless the world were brought to light. And the question has often forced itself upon reflecting minds, why there was this preposterousness, this inversion, of what would appear to be the natural order of progress? Why was it, for instance, that men should have learned the courses of the stars and the revolution of the planets before they found out how to make a good wagon-wheel? Why was it that they built the Parthenon and the Colosseum before they knew how to construct a comfortable, healthful dwelling-house? Why did they construct the Roman aqueducts before they constructed a sawmill? Or why did they achieve the noblest models in eloquence, in poetry, and in the drama, before they invented movable types? I think we have now arrived at a point where we can unriddle this enigma. The labor of the world has been performed by ignorant men, by classes doomed to ignorance from sire to son, by the bondmen and bondwomen of the Jews, by the helots of Sparta, by the captives who passed under the Roman yoke, and by villains and serfs and slaves of more modern times. The masters, the aristocratic or patrician orders, not only disdained labor for themselves and their children, which was one fatal mistake, but they supposed that knowledge was of no use to a laborer, which was a mistake still more fatal. Hence ignorance, for almost six thousand years, has gone on plying its animal muscles and dropping its bloody sweat, and never discovered any way, nor dreamed that there was any way, by which it might accomplish many times more work with many times less labor. And yet nothing is more true than that an ignorant man will toil all his life long, moving to and fro within an inch of some great discovery, and will never see it. All the elements of a great discovery may fall into his hands, or be thrust into his face, but his eyes will be too blind to behold it. If he is a slave, what motive has he to behold it? Its greater profitableness will not redound to his benefit, for another stands ready to seize all the gain. Its abridgment of labor will not conduce to his ease, for other toils await him. But the moment an intelligent man applies himself to labor, and labors for his own benefit or for that of his family, he begins to inquire whether the same task cannot be performed with less expenditure of strength, or a greater task with an equal expenditure. He makes his wits save his bones. He finds it easier to think than to work. Nay, that it is easier both to think and work than to work without thinking." He foresees a prize as the reward of successful effort, and this stimulates his brain to deep contrivance, as well as his arms to rapid motion. Taking for illustration the result of an experiment which has been actually made, let us suppose this intelligent laborer to be employed in moving blocks of squared granite, each weighing 1,080 pounds. To move such a block along the floor of a roughly chiseled quarry requires a force equal to 758 pounds. An ignorant man, therefore, must employ and pay several assistants 
or he can never move such a block an inch. But to draw the same block over a floor of planks will require a force of only 652 pounds. The expense of one assistant, therefore, might be dispensed with. Placed on a platform of wood and drawn over the same floor, a draft of 606 pounds would be sufficient. By soaping the two surfaces of the wood, the requisite force would be reduced to 182 pounds. Placed on rollers three inches in diameter, a force equal to 34 pounds would be sufficient. Substituting a wooden for a stone floor, and the requisite force is 28 pounds. With the same rollers on a wooden platform, 22 pounds only would be required. And now, by the invention and use of locomotives and railroads, a traction or draft of between three and four pounds is found to be sufficient to move a body weighing 1,080 pounds. Thus the amount of force necessary to remove the body is reduced about 200 times. Now take away from these steps the single element of intelligence, and each improvement would have been impossible. The ignorant man would never have discovered how nearly synonymous are freight and friction. If a savage will learn how to swim, he can fasten a dozen pounds weight to his back and transport it across a narrow river or other body of water of moderate width. If he will invent an axe or other instrument by which to cut down a tree, he can use the tree for a float and one of its limbs for a paddle, and can thus transport many times the former weight, many times the former distance. Hollowing out his log, he will increase what may be called its tonnage, or rather its poundage, and by sharpening its ends it will cleave the water both more easily and more swiftly. Fastening several trees together, he makes a raft, and thus increases the buoyant power of his embryo watercraft. Turning up the ends of small poles, or using knees of timber instead of straight pieces, and grooving them together, and filling up the interstices between them in some way, so as to make them watertight, he brings his rude raft literally into ship shape. Improving upon hull below and rigging above, he makes a proud merchantman to be wafted by the winds from continent to continent. But even this does not content the adventurous naval architect— he frames iron arms for his ship, and for oars affixes iron wheels capable of swift revolution, and stronger than the strong sea. Into iron-walled cavities in her bosom he puts iron organs of massive structure and strength, and of cohesion insoluble by fire. Within these he kindles a small volcano, and then, like a sentient and rational existence, this wonderful creation of his hands cleaves oceans, breasts tides, defies tempests, and bears its living and jubilant freight around the globe. Now take away intelligence from the shipbuilder, and the steamship, that miracle of human art, falls back into a floating log. The log itself is lost, and the savage swimmer bearing his dozen pounds upon his back alone remains." And so it is, not in one department only, but in the whole circle of human labors. The annihilation of the sun would no more certainly be followed by darkness than the extinction of human intelligence would plunge the race at once into the weakness and helplessness of barbarism. To have created such beings as we are, and to have placed them in this world without the light of the sun— would be no more cruel than for a government to suffer its laboring classes to grow up without knowledge. In this fact, then, we find a solution of the problem that so long embarrassed inquirers. The reason why the mechanical and useful arts, those arts which have done so much to civilize mankind, and which have given comforts and luxuries to the common laborer of the present day, such as kings and queens could not command three centuries ago, the reason why these arts made no progress, and until recently, indeed, can hardly be said to have had anything more than a beginning, is that the labor of the world was performed by ignorant men. As soon as some degree of intelligence dawned upon the workman, then a corresponding degree of improvement in his work followed. 
At first this intelligence was confined to a very small number, and therefore improvements were few, and they followed each other only after long intervals. They uniformly began in the nations and among the classes where there was most intelligence. The middle classes of England and the people of Holland and Scotland have done a hundred times more than all the Eastern Hemisphere besides. What single improvement in art or discovery in science has ever originated in Spain or throughout the vast empire of the Russias? But just in proportion as intelligence, that is education, has quickened and stimulated a greater and greater number of minds, just in the same proportion have inventions and discoveries increased in their wonderfulness and in the rapidity of their succession. The progression has been rather geometrical than arithmetical. By the laws of nature it must be so. If among ten well-educated children, the chance is that at least one of them will originate some new and useful process in the arts, or will discover some new scientific principle or some new application of one, then among a hundred such well-educated children there is a moral certainty that there will be more than ten such originators or discoverers of new utilities, for the action of the mind is like the action of fire. One billet of wood will hardly burn alone, though dry as suns and northwest winds can make it, and though placed in the range of a current of air. Ten such billets will burn well together, but a hundred will create a heat fifty times as intense as ten, will make a current of air to fan their own flame, and consume even greenness itself. For the creation of wealth, then, for the existence of a wealthy people and a wealthy nation, intelligence is the grand condition. The number of improvers will increase as the intellectual constituency, if I may so call it, increases. In former times, and in most parts of the world even at the present day, not one man in a million has ever had such a development of mind as made it possible for him to become a contributor to art or science. Let this development proceed, and contributions numberless and of inestimable value will be sure to follow. That political economy, therefore, which busies itself about capital and labor, supply and demand, interest and rents, favorable and unfavorable balances of trade, but leaves out of account the element of a widespread mental development, is naught but stupendous folly. The greatest of all the arts in political economy is to change a consumer into a producer, and the next greatest is to increase the producer's producing power, an end to be directly attained by increasing his intelligence. For mere delving, an ignorant man is but little better than a swine, whom he so much resembles in his appetites and surpasses in his powers of mischief. But there is a class of persons who are not unwilling to concede the advantages which education has over ignorance, both in the more rapid and perfect performance of all kinds of labor, and in the creation of all those mechanical instruments through which nature stands ready to do the work of the world. But while they acknowledge all this, they seem to think that the argument in favor of knowledge has lost much of its force, because mechanical ingenuity and scientific discovery must have nearly reached the outermost limit of possible advancement, that either the powers of nature are exhausted, or human genius is in its decrepitude. The past achievements of the mind excite their admiration, but not their hope. They are regarded as the measure of what man can perform, but not as the promise of what he is yet to perform. They are accepted not as a little earnest money, but as a full payment. Now the view which I am constrained to take of the history and destiny of man is exactly the contrary of this one. I hold all past achievements of the human mind to be rather in the nature of prophecy than of fulfillment, the first fruits of the beneficence of God in endowing us with the faculties of perception, comparison, calculation, and causality, rather than the full harvest of their eventual development. For look at the magnificent creation into which we have been brought, and at the adaptation of our faculties to understand, admire, and use it. 
all around us are works worthy of an infinite God, and we are led by irresistible evidence to believe that just so far as we acquire his knowledge, we shall be endued with his power. From history and from consciousness, we find ourselves capable of ever onward improvement, and therefore it seems to be a denial of first principles, it seems no better than impiety, to suppose that we shall ever become such finished scholars that the works of the all-wise will have no new problem for our solution, and will therefore be able to teach us no longer. Nor is it any less than impiety to suppose that we shall ever so completely enlist the powers of nature in our service, that exhausted omnipotence can reward our industry with no further bounties. This would be to suppose that we shall arrive at a period when our active and progressive natures will become passive and stationary, when we shall have nothing to do but to sit in indolent and inglorious contemplation of past achievements, and when, all aspirations having been lost in fruition, we shall have outlived the joys of hope and the rewards of effort, and no new glories will beckon us onward to new felicities. Neither our faculties nor their spheres of action seem to have been projected on any such narrow plan. Ever-expanding powers are within us, eternity lies before us, and an infinite being amidst his works is the adorable object of these faculties throughout this eternity. These, no height of attainment which our powers will ever reach, and no length of duration to which the cycles of eternity shall ever have run, will enable us to exhaust or fully to comprehend. To affirm the contrary would be to affirm that our finite minds can embrace and encircle their infinite author, as his mind embraces and encircles ours. Our relation to our Maker, then, is a moral phase of the problem of the asymptote, a line forever approaching a point which it can never reach. And if we believe in our individual capacity for indefinite improvement, why should we doubt the capacity of the race for continued progress as long as it dwells upon the earth? Can man, by searching, find out God in a physical sense any more than in a moral one? Or can all the generations of the race, by the longest and profoundest investigations, ever fathom the depths of eternal wisdom and power as they are incorporated into this earthly frame? However far, then, science and art may push their explorations, there will always be a frontier bounding their advances— there will always be a terra incognita beyond the regions they have surveyed, beyond the utmost verge of the horizon which the eye can see from the topmost pinnacle of existing discoveries. Each new adventurer can gain new trophies by penetrating still deeper into the illimitable solitudes where alone omnipotence dwells and works. The most perfect instrument, which the brightest genius of any age may ever construct, will be excelled by another instrument, made after a higher ideal of perfection by the brighter genius of a succeeding age. The most rapid processes of art known to any generation will be accelerated in the generation that shall follow it, and science will be found not only a plant of perennial growth, but in each succeeding age it will bear blossoms of a more celestial splendor and fruits of beneficence unknown before. Astronomers now tell us that the sun is not a stationary orb, fixed and immovable at one place in the heavens, as since the days of Copernicus it had been supposed to be, but that in some far-off region of immensity, at a distance wholly inconceivable by us, there is a central point of attraction around which our sun, with its attendant train of planets, is performing a magnificent revolution— just as within their narrow orbits the planets of our local system are revolving about the sun. They tell us further that the circumference of this solar orbit is so vast that during the six thousand years which are supposed to have elapsed since the creation of Adam, the sun has not yet traveled through so much as one of the three hundred and sixty degrees that make up its mighty circle— not through so much as one of those hundreds of astronomical spaces through which it must move before it will complete a single revolution. 
what number of these immense circuits the earth is destined to perform, or what part even of a single revolution it will accomplish, before it will meet with some such catastrophe as will unfit it to be the abode of a race like ours, we know not. But we have no reason to believe, even if the mighty years of the solar revolutions should equal the number of our terrestrial years since the creation of Adam, that the race will ever have exhausted the earth of all the latent capacities for ministering to the improvement and happiness of man with which God has endued it. No invention or discovery will ever be made upon which the author can stand and lift up his proud voice and exclaim, I have found the last miracle of the miracle-working God. Now so far as these natural and yet undeveloped resources of the earth are hereafter to be brought to light and made the ministering servants of human welfare, we suppose they are to be brought to light by the exercise of the human faculties, in the same way that all the scientific and mechanical improvements of past times have been brought to light, that is, by education. And the greater the proportion of minds in any community which are educated, and the more thorough and complete the education which is given them, the more rapidly through these sublime stages of progress will that community advance in all the means of enjoyment and elevation, and the more will it outstrip and outshine its less educated neighbors. The advance guard of education and intelligence will gather the virgin wealth of whatever region they explore as the reward of their knowledge, just as the Portuguese reaped the great harvest of the riches of India as their reward for discovering a new route to India. I know that it may be said, and said too not without a certain measure of truth, that when a more intelligent community has made a discovery in science, or devised or perfected the processes of any art, a less intelligent community by its side may adopt and copy them, and thus make the improvements their own by possession, though the invention belong to another. After a bold navigator has opened a new channel of commerce, and while he is gathering the first fruits of his sagacity, the stupid or the predatory may follow in his wake, and share the gains of the enterprise. Dr. Franklin may discover the uses of the lightning rod, but when once discovered, and the manner of its use exhibited, any half-taught son of Vulcan can make and erect one by copying the given model. When a schoolboy of New England has invented the cotton gin, or perfected cotton machinery, the slaves of the South, stupid and ignorant as cattle, according to the form of the statute in such cases made and provided, can operate them with a greater or less degree of success and profit. But there are two considerations which show how inferior the condition of the aping community must always be to that of the originating one. In the first place, all copying is in the nature of empiricism. The copyist operates blindly and not on principle, and therefore he is constantly exposed to failure. In untried emergencies he never knows what to do, for the light of example shines only in one direction— while it is the very nature of principle, like its divine author, to circumfuse its beams, and so to leave no darkness in any direction. And in the second place, even supposing the aping community to be able, after long delays and toils, to equal the originating one, still, before the period shall have elapsed which the pupil will require for studying out and copying the old lesson, his master will have studied out some new one, will have discovered some new improvement, diffusive of new utility, and radiant with new beauty, so that the distance will be kept as great as ever between him and the learner. The slave states of this union may buy cotton machinery made by the intelligent mechanics of the free states, and they may train their slaves to work it with more or less skill, but should they succeed ever so well, should they eventually become able to meet their entire home demand, it will nevertheless be true that in the meantime the new wants and refinements generated by the progress of the age will demand some new fabric, requiring for its manufacture either more ingeniously wrought machinery or greater skill in the operator, 
and thus will the more educated community forever keep ahead of the less educated one. The progress of mankind may be compared to an ascending spiral. In moving upward along the spiral, the less intelligent community will see the more intelligent one at a point above its head. It will labor on to overtake it, and making another toilsome circuit will at length reach the place where the victor had been seen. But lo, the victor is not there. He too has made a circuit along the ascending curve, and is still far aloft above the head of his pursuer. Another common idea is this. It is supposed that intelligence in workmen is relatively less important in agricultural labors than in the mechanical and manufacturing arts. The great agricultural staples of the country, corn, cotton, sugar, rice, and so forth, have been stigmatized, or at least characterized, as coarser products, therefore requiring less skill and science for their culture and improvement than the fabrics of the loom and the workshop. This may be true, but I am by no means convinced of its truth. It seems to me that there is as yet no adequate proof that skill and science, if applied to agriculture, would not yield practical benefits as copious and as wonderful as any that have rewarded the mechanician or the artisan in any department of their labors. Why vegetable growths, so exquisite in their organization, animated by the mysterious principle of life, and so susceptible of all the influences of climate, whether good or ill, why these should be called coarser than iron ore or other organized metals, or any kind of wealth that is found in mines, or why cotton or flax, wool or leather, wood or grain, should be denominated coarser before they have been deprived of the principle of life than after it, and before they have lost the marvelous power of assimilating inorganic matter to their own peculiar substance, it is not easy to perceive. May it not yet be found that a better knowledge of the laws that govern vegetable growth, a better knowledge of the properties and adaptations of different soils, a better knowledge of the conditions of fructification and germination, and of the mysterious chemistry that determines the quality of texture, color, flavor, and perfume, a better knowledge of the uncombined gases, and of the effect of light, heat, electricity, and other imponderable agents, upon the size, rapidity, and variegation of vegetable growths, in fine, a better knowledge of vegetable physiology, and of that too which may be called vegetable pathology, will redeem the whole circle of agricultural occupations from the stigma of requiring less intelligent cultivators than are required for other pursuits, and thus supply a new and irresistible argument in favor of diffusing a vastly increased amount of knowledge among our free field laborers and our rural population generally. The marvelous improvements which have been made under the auspices of the Massachusetts Horticultural Society in horticulture, floriculture, and pomology already betoken such a result. Now it is in these various ways that all the means of human subsistence, comfort, improvement, or what in one word we call wealth, are created. Additional wealth, new wealth, not another man's earnings, not another nation's treasures or lands, tricked away by fraud or wrested by force, but substantially, and for all practical purposes, knowledge created, mind created wealth, as much so as though we had been endued with a miraculous power of turning a granite quarry into a city at a word, or a wilderness into cultivated fields, or of commanding harvests to ripen in a day. To see a community acquiring and redoubling its wealth in this way, enriching itself without impoverishing others, without despoiling others, is it not a noble spectacle? And will not the community that gains its wealth in this way, ten times faster than any robber nation ever did by plunder, will not such a community be a model and a pattern for the nations, a type of excellence to be admired and followed by the world? Has Massachusetts no ambition to win the palm in so glorious a rivalry? But suppose that Massachusetts, notwithstanding her deplorable inferiority in all natural resources, as compared with other states, 
should be content to be their equal only in means of education, and in the development of the intelligence of her present children and her future citizens, down, down to what a despicable depth of inferiority would she suddenly plunge. Her ancient glory would become dim. No historian, no orator, no poet would rise up among her children. Her sons would cease, as now, to fill chairs in the halls of learning in more than half the states of the Union. Her jurists would no longer expound the laws of nature, of nations, and of states, to guide the judicial tribunals of the country. Her skilled artisans and master mechanics would not be sought for, wherever throughout the land educated labor is wanted. Her ship captains would be driven home from every ocean by more successful competitors. At home, a narrowing in the range of thought and action, a lowering of the tone of life and enterprise, a straightening in the means of living and of culture, a sinking in spirit and in all laudable and generous ambitions, the rearing of sons to obscurity and of daughters to vulgarity, would mark the incoming of a degenerate age, an age too ignorant to know its own ignorance, too shameless to mourn its degradation, and too spiritless even to rise with recuperative energy from its guilty fall. But little less disastrous would it be to stop where we are now, instead of pressing onward with invigorated strength to a further goal. What has been done is not the fulfillment or consummation of our work. It only affords better vantage ground from which our successors can start anew in a nobler career of improvement. And if there is any one thing for which the friends of humanity have reason to join in a universal song of thanksgiving to heaven, it is that there is a large and increasing body of people in Massachusetts who cannot be beguiled or persuaded into the belief that our common schools are what they may and should be and who with the sincerest good will and warmest affections toward the higher institutions of learning, are yet resolved that the education of the people at large, of the sons and daughters of farmers, mechanics, tradesmen, operatives, and laborers of all kinds, shall be carried to a point of perfection indefinitely higher than it has yet reached. End of section 47 Recording by Maria Casper